Section 1, Volume 3 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Translated by Richard Burton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barbara Clements The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Volume 3, Section 1 when it was the one hundred and twenty-fifth night, Shahrazad continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Aziz pursued to Taj al-Muluk. Then I entered the flower garden and made for the pavilion, where I found the daughter of Delilah the wily one, sitting with head on knee and hand to cheek. Her color was changed and her eyes were sunken, but when she saw me she exclaimed, Praise be Allah for thy safety! and she was minded to rise, but fell down for joy. I was abashed before her and hung my head. Presently, however, I went up to her and kissed her and asked, How knewest thou that I should come to thee this very night? She answered, I knew it not. By Allah, this whole year past I have not tasted the taste of sleep, but have watched through every night expecting thee, and such has been my case since the day thou winced out from me and I gave thee the new suit of clothes, and thou promised me to go to the hammam, and to come back. And so I sat awaiting thee that night, and a second night, and a third night. But thou camest not, till after so great a delay, and I ever expecting thy coming. For this is lover's way. And now I would have thee tell me what hath been the cause of thine absence from me this past year long. So I told her, and when she knew that I was married, her color waxed yellow, and I added, I have come to thee this night, but I must leave thee before day. Quoth she, Doth it not suffice her that she tricked thee into marrying her and kept thee prisoner with her a whole year? But she must also make thee swear by the oath of divorce that thou wilt return to her on the same night before morning, and not allow thee to divert thyself with thy mother or me nor suffer thee to pass one night with either of us away from her? How then must it be with one from whom thou hast been absent a full year? And I knew thee before she did. But Allah have mercy on thy cousin Aziza, for there befell her what never befell any, and she bore what none other ever bore, and she died by thy ill usage. Yet twas she who protected thee against me. Indeed, I thought thou didst love me, so I let thee take thine own way. Else had I not suffered thee to go safe in a sound skin, when I had it in my power to clap thee in jail, and even to slay thee. Then she wept with sore weeping, and waxed wroth and shuddered in my face with skin bristling, and looked at me with furious eyes. When I saw her in this case, I was terrified at her, and my side muscles trembled and quivered, for she was like a dreadful she gull an ogress in ire, and I like a bean over the fire. Then she said, Thou art of no use to me, now thou art married and hast a child, nor art thou any longer fit for my company. I care only for bachelors and not for married men. These profit us nothing, thou hast sold me for yonder stinking armful. But by Allah, I will make the whore's heart ache for thee, and thou shalt not live either for me or for her. Then she cried a loud cry, and ere I could think, up came the slave girls and threw me to the ground. And when I was helpless under their hands... She rose, and taking a knife, said, I will cut thy throat as they slaughter he-goats, and that will be less than thy desert, for thy doings to me and the daughter of thy uncle before me. When I looked to my life and found myself at the mercy of her slave women, with my cheeks dust-soiled, and saw her sharpen the knife, I made sure of death. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the one hundred and twenty-sixth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the wazir Dandan thus continued his tale to Zau al Makan. Then quoth the youth Aziz to Taj al Maluk, Now, when I found my life at the mercy of her slave women with my cheeks dust soiled, and I saw her sharpen the knife, I made sure of death and cried out to her for mercy. But she only redoubled in ferocity and ordered the slave girls to pinion my hands behind me, which they did and throwing me on my back, she seated herself on my middle and held down my head. Then two of them came up and squatted on my shin bones, whilst other two grasped my hands and arms, and she summoned a third pair and bade them beat me. 
so they beat me till I fainted and my voice failed. When I revived, I said to myself, "'Twere easier and better for me to have my gullet slit than to be beaten on this wise. And I remember the words of my cousin, and how she used to say to me, Allah, keep thee from her mischief. And I shrieked and wept till my voice failed, and I remained without power to breathe or to move. Then she again wetted the knife and said to the slave girls, Uncover him. Upon this the Lord inspired me to repeat to her the two phrases my cousin had taught me and had bequeathed to me. And I said, O oh, my lady, dost thou not know that faith is fair, unfaith is foul? When she heard this, she cried out and said, Allah pity thee, Aziza, and give thee paradise in exchange for thy wasted youth. By Allah, of a truth, she served thee in her lifetime and after her death, and now she hath saved thee alive out of my hands with these two saws. Nevertheless, I cannot by any means leave thee thus. But needs must I set my mark on thee, to spite yonder brazen-faced beast, who hath kept thee from me. Thereupon she called out to the slave women, and bade them bind my feet with cords, then said to them, Take seat on him. They did her bidding, upon which she arose and fetched a pan of copper, and hung it over the brazier, and poured into it oil of sesame, in which she fried cheese. Then she came up to me, and I still insensible and unfastening my bag trousers, tied a cord round my testicles, and giving it to two of her women, bade them trawl at it. They did so, and I swooned away, and was for an excess of pain in a world other than this. Then she came with a razor of steel and cut off my member masculine, so that I remained like a woman, after which she seared the wound with the boiling and rubbed it with a powder, and I the while unconscious. Now when I came to myself, the blood had stopped. So she bade the slave girls unbind me and made me drink a cup of wine. Then said she to me, Go now to her whom thou hast married and who grudged me a single night, and the mercy of Allah be on thy cousin Aziza, who saved thy life and never told her secret love. Indeed, hadst thou not repeated those words to me, I had surely slit thy wee's end. Go forth this instant to whom thou wilt, for I needed not of thee save what I have just cut off, and now I have no part in thee, nor have I any further want of thee or care for thee. So be gone about thy business and rub thy head, and implore mercy for the daughter of thine uncle. Thereupon she kicked me with her foot, and I rose, hardly able to walk, and I went little by little till I came to the door of our house. I saw it was open, so I threw myself within it, and fell down in a fading fit. Whereupon my wife came out, and lifting me up, carried me into the saloon, and assured herself that I had become like a woman. Then I fell into a sleep, and a deep sleep, and when I woke I found myself thrown down at the garden gate. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the one hundred and twenty-seventh night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the wazir Dandan pursued to King Zau al makan The youth Aziz thus continued his story to Taj al-Maluk. When I awoke and found myself thrown down at the garden gate, I rose groaning for pain and misery, and made my way to our home, and entering, I came upon my mother weeping for me, and saying, what I knew, O my son, in what land thou art. So I drew near and threw myself upon her, and when she looked at me and felt me, she knew that I was ill, for my face was colored black and tan. Then I thought of my cousin and all the kind offices she had been wont to do me, and I learned when too late that she had truly loved me. So I wept for her, and my mother wept also. Presently she said to me, O oh, my son, thy sire is dead. At this my fury against fate redoubled, and I cried till I fell into a fit. When I came to myself, I looked at the place where my cousin Aziza had been used to sit, and shed tears anew, till I all but fainted once more for excess of weeping. And I ceased not to cry and sob and wail till midnight, when my mother said to me, Thy father hath been dead these ten days. 
"'I shall never think of any one but my cousin Aziza,' replied I. "'And indeed I deserve all that hath befallen me, "'for that I neglected her who loved me with love so dear.' "'Asked she, What hath befallen thee?' "'So I told her all that had happened, and she wept a while. "'Then she rose and set some matter of meat and drink before me. "'I ate a little and drank, after which I repeated my story to her and told her the whole occurrence, whereupon she exclaimed, Praise be Allah, that she did but this to thee, and forbore to slaughter thee. Then she nursed me, and medicined me, till I regained my health, and when my recovery was complete, she said to me, O my son, I will now bring out to thee that which thy cousin committed to me in trust for thee, for it is thine. She swore me not to give it to thee, till I should see thee recalling her to mind, and weeping over her, and thy connection severed from other than herself. And I know that these conditions are fulfilled in thee. So she arose, and opening a chest, took out this piece of linen, with the figures of gazelles worked thereon, which I had given to Aziza in time past. And taking it, I found written therein these couplets. Lady of Beauty, Say who taught thee hard and harsh design To slay with longing love's excess This hapless lover thine. And thou fain dost remember me Beyond our parting day, Allah will know That thee and thee My memory never shall tine. Thou blamest me with bitter speech, Yet sweetest tis to me. Wilt generous be and deign one day To show of love a sign? I had not reckoned love contained so much of pine and pain, and soul distress until I came for thee to pain and pine. Never my heart knew weariness until that eve I fell in love with thee, and prostrate fell before those glancing eyne. My very foes have mercy on my case and moan therefore, but thou, O heart of Indian steel, all mercy dost decline. No, never will I be consoled by Allah, and I die nor yet forget the love of thee, though life in ruins lie. When I read these couplets, I wept with sore weeping, and buffeted my face. Then I unfolded the scroll, and there fell from it another paper. I opened it, and behold, I found written therein, Know, O son of my uncle, that I acquit thee of my blood, and I beseech Allah to make accord between thee and her whom thou lovest. But if aught befall thee, through the daughter of Delilah the wily. Return thou not to her, neither resort to any other woman, and patiently bear thine affliction. For were not thy fated life tied a long life, thou hadst perished long ago. But praise be Allah, who hath appointed my death day before thine. My peace be upon thee, preserve this cloth with the gazelles herein figured, and let it not leave thee, for it was my companion when thou was absent from me. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the one hundred and twenty-eighth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the wazir Dandan pursued to King Zaul al-Makan, and the youth Aziz continued to Taj al-Maluk. So I read what my cousin had written, and the charge to me which was, Preserve this cloth with the gazelles, and let it not leave thee. For it was my companion when thou wast absent from me. And Allah upon thee, if thou chance to fall in with her who worked these gazelles, hold aloof from her, and do not let her approach thee, nor marry her. And if thou happen not on her, and find no way to her, look thou consort not with any of her sex. Know that she who wrought these gazelles worketh every year a gazelle cloth, and dispatcheth it to far countries, that her report and the beauty of her broidery, which none in the world can match, may be brooded abroad. As for thy beloved, the daughter of Delilah the Wily, this cloth came to her hand, and she used to ensnare folk with it, showing it to them, and saying, I have a sister who wrought this. But she lied in so saying, Allah rend her veil. This is my parting counsel, and I have not charged thee with this charge, 
but because I know that after my death the world will be straightened on thee, and haply by reason of this thou wilt leave thy native land and wander in foreign parts, and hearing of her who wrought these figures, thou mayest be minded to foregather with her. Then wilt thou remember me, when the memory shall not avail thee, nor wilt thou know my worth till after my death. And lastly, learn that she who wrought the gazelles is the daughter of the king of the Camphor Islands, and a lady of the noblest. Now when I had read that scroll, and understood what was written therein, I fell again to weeping, and my mother wept because I wept, and I ceased not to gaze upon it, and to shed tears till nightfall. I abode in this condition a whole year, at the end of which the merchants with whom I am in this kafila prepared to set out from my native town, and my mother counseled me to equip myself and journey with them, so haply I might be consoled, and my sorrow be dispelled, saying, Take comfort, and put away from thee this morning, and travel for a year or two, or three, to the caravan return, when perhaps thy breast may be broadened and thy heart hardened. And she ceased not to persuade me with enduring words, till I provided myself with merchandise and set out with the caravan. But all the time of my wayfaring, my tears have never dried. No, never. And at every halting place where we halt, I open this piece of linen and look on these gazelles and call to mind my cousin Aziza and weep for her as thou hast seen. For indeed she loved me with dearest love and died oppressed by my unlove. I did her naught but ill, and she did me naught but good. When these merchants return from their journey, I shall return with them, by which time I shall have been absent a whole year. Yet hath my sorrow waxed greater, and my grief and affliction were but increased by my visit to the islands of Camphor and the castle of Crystal. Now these islands are seven in number, and are ruled by a king by name Sharaman, who hath a daughter called Dunya. And I was told that it was she who wrought these gazelles, and that this piece in my possession was of her embroidery. When I knew this, my yearning redoubled, and I burnt with the slow fire of pining, and was drowned in the sea of sad thought, and I wept over myself, for that I was become even as a woman, without manly tool like other men, and there was no help for it. From the day of my quitting the Camphor Islands, I have been tearful-eyed and heavy-hearted, and such hath been my case for a long while, and I know not whether it will be given to me to return to my native land and die beside my mother or not, for I am sick from eating too much of the world. Thereupon the young merchant wept and groaned and complained and gazed upon the gazelles, whilst the tears rolled down his cheeks in streams, and he repeated these two couplets. Joy needs shall come, a prattler gan to prattle. Needs cease thy blame, I was commoved to rattle. In time, quoth he, quoth I, tis marvellous. Who shall ensure my life, O cold of tattle? And he repeated also these. Well, Allah weets that since our severance day, I've wept till forced to ask of tears alone. Patience, the blamer cries. Thou'lt have her yet, quoth I, O blamer, where may patience one? Then said he, This, O king, is my tale. Hast thou ever heard one stranger? So Taj al-Maluk marveled with great marvel at the young merchant's story, and fire darted into his entrails on hearing the name of the lady Dunya and her loveliness, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section one of the book A Thousand Nights and a Night, volume three. Section two, volume three of the book of A Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of A Thousand Nights and a Night, volume three, section two. When it was the one hundred and twenty-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the wazir Dandan continued to Za al-Makin. Now when Taj al-Muluk 
heard the story of the young merchant, he marvelled with great marvel, and fire darted into his entrails on hearing the name of the lady Dunya, who, as he knew, had embroidered the gazelles, and his love and longing hourly grew, so he said to the youth, By Allah, that hath befallen thee, whose like never befell any save thyself. But thou hast the life term appointed, which thou must fulfil, and now I would fain ask of thee a question, quoth Aziz, and what is it? Quoth he, Wilt thou tell me how thou sawest the young lady who wrought these gazelles? Then he, O my lord, I got access to her by a slight, and it was this. When I entered her city with the caravan, I went forth and wandered about the garths till I came to a flower garden abounding in trees, whose keeper was a venerable old man, a sheikh stricken in years. I addressed him, saying, O ancient sir, whose may be this garden? And he replied, It belongs to the king's daughter, the Lady Dunya. We are now beneath her palace, and, when she is minded to amuse herself, she openeth the private wicket, and walketh in the garden, and smelleth the fragrance of the flowers. So I said to him, Favour me by allowing me to sit in this garden till she come. Haply may I enjoy a sight of her as she passeth. The sheikh answered, There can be no harm in that. Thereupon I gave him a dirham, or so, and said to him, Buy us something to eat. He took the money gladly, and opened the door, and, entering himself, admitted me into the garden, where we strolled and ceased not strolling till we reached a pleasant spot in which he bade me sit down and await his going and his returning. Then he brought me a somewhat of fruit, and, leaving me, disappeared for an hour, but after a while he returned to me, bringing a roasted lamb, of which we ate till we had eaten enough, my heart yearning the while for a sight of the lady. Presently, as we sat, the postern opened, and the keeper said to me, Rise and hide thee. I did so, and behold, the black eunuch put his head out through the garden wicket, and asked, O oh, sheikh, is there any one with thee? No, answered he, and the eunuch said, Shut the garden gate. So the keeper shut the gate, and lo, the lady Dunya came in by the private door. When I saw her, methought the moon had risen above the horizon and was shining. I looked at her a full hour, and longed for her as one of thirst longeth for water. After a while she withdrew and shut the door, whereupon I left the garden and sought my lodging, knowing that I could not get at her, and that I was no man for her, more especially as I was become like a woman having no manly tool. Moreover, she was a king's daughter, and I but a merchant man. So, how could I have access to the like of her, or to any other woman? Accordingly, when these my companions made ready for the road, I also made preparation, and set out with them. So we journeyed toward the city, till we arrived at the place ere we met with thee. Thou askest me, and I have answered, and these are my adventures, and peace be with thee. Now, when Taj al-Muluk heard that account, fires raged in his bosom, and his heart and thought were occupied love for the Lady Dunya, and passion and longing were sore upon him. Then he arose, and mounted horse, and taking Aziz with him, returned to his father's capital, where he settled him in a separate house and supplied him with all he needed in the way of meat and drink and dress. Then he returned him, and returned to his palace, and with tears trickling down his cheeks, for hearing oftentimes standeth instead of seeing and knowing, and he ceased not to be in this state till his father came in to him, and finding him wan-faced, lean of limb and tearful-eyed, knew that something had occurred to chagrin him, and said, O oh, my son, acquaint me with thy case, and tell me what hath befallen thee, that thy color is changed and thy body is wasted. So he told him all that had passed, and what tale he had heard of Aziz in the account of the princess Dunya, and how he had fallen in love with her on hearsay, without having set eyes on her. Quoth his sire, O oh, my son, she is the daughter of a king whose land is far from ours, so put away this thought, and go in thy mother's palace. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and seized her permitted say. When it was the one hundred and thirtieth day, she said, It has reached me, O auspicious king, that the wazir Dandan continued to Za al makin and the father of Taj al-Muluk spake to him on this wise. O son, her father is a king whose land is far from ours, so put away this thought, and go into thy mother's palace, where are five hundred maidens like moons, and whichsoever of them pleaseth thee, take her or else we will seek for thee in marriage some one of the king's daughters, fairer than the lady Dunya. Answered Taj al-Muluk, O father, I desire none other, for she it is who wrought the gazelles which I saw, 
and there is no help but that I will have her, else I will flee into the world and waste, and I will slay myself for her sake. Then said his father, Have patience with me, till I send to her sire and demand her in marriage, and win thee thy wish as I did for myself with thy mother. Haply Allah will bring thee to thy desire, and, if her parent will not consent, I will make his kingdom quake under with an army, whose rear shall be with me whilst its van shall be upon him. Then he sent for the youth Aziz and asked him, O my son, tell me, dost thou know the way to the Camphor Islands? He answered, Yes, and the king said, I desire of thee that thou fare with my wazir thither. Replied Aziz, I hear and obey, O king of the age. Whereupon the king summoned his minister and said to him, Devise me some device, whereby my son's affair may be rightly managed, and fare thou forth to the Camphor Islands, and demand of their king his daughter in marriage for my son, Taj al-Muluk. The wazir replied, Hearkening an obedience. Then Taj al-Muluk returned to his dwelling place, and his love and longing redoubled, and the delay seemed endless to him, and when the night darkened around him, he wept and sighed and complained and repeated this poetry. Dark falls the night, my tears unaided rail, and fiercest flames of love my heart assail. Ask thou the nights of me, and they shall tell, and I find aught to do but weep and wail. Night long awake, I watch the stars that while pour down my cheeks the tears like dropping hail. And lone and lorn, I'm grown with none to aid, for kith and kin the love lost lover fail. And when he had ended his reciting, he swooned away and did not recover his senses till the morning, at which time there came to him one of his father's eunuchs, and, standing at his head, summoned him to the king's presence. So he went with him, and to his father, seeing that his pallor had increased, exhorted him to patience, and promised him union with her he loved. Then he equipped Aziz and the wazir, and supplied them with presents, and they set out and fared on day and night, till they drew near the Isles of Camphor, where they halted on the banks of a stream, and the minister dispatched a message to acquaint the king of his arrival. The messenger hurried forwards, and had not been gone more than an hour, before they saw the king's chamberlains and emirs advancing towards them, to meet them at Parasang's distance from the city, and escort them into the royal presence. They laid their gifts before the king, and became his guests for three days. And on the fourth day, the wazir rose, and in going to the king, stood between his hands and acquainted him with the object which induced his visit, whereat he was perplexed for an answer, inasmuch as his daughter misliked men and disliked marriage. So he bowed his head groundwards a while, then raised it, and calling one of his eunuchs, said to him, Go to thy mistress, the lady Dunya, and repeat to her what thou hast heard, and the purport of this wazir's coming. So the eunuch went forth, and returning after a time, said to the king, O king of the age, when I went in to the lady Dunya and told her what I had heard, she was wroth with exceeding wrath, and rose at me with a staff, designing to break my head, so I have fled from her. And she said to me, If my father force me to wed him, whomsoever I wed will slay. Then said her sire to the wazir and Aziz, Ye have heard, and now ye know all, so let your king wot of it, and give him my salutations, and say that my daughter misliketh men, and disliketh marriage. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the one hundred and thirty-first night, she said, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that King Shahriman thus addressed the wazir and Aziz. Salute your king for me, and inform me of what ye have heard, namely, that my daughter misliketh marriage. So they turned away unsuccessful, and ceased not faring, until they rejoined the king and told him what had passed, whereupon he commanded the chief officers to summon the troops and get them ready for marching and campaigning. But the wazir said to him, O my liege lord, do not thus. The king is not at fault because, when his daughter learnt our business, she sent a message saying, If my father force me to wed, whomsoever I wed I will slay and myself after him. So the refusal cometh from her. When the king heard his minister's words, he feared for Taj al-Muluk, and said, Verily, if I make war on the king of the Camphor Islands, and carry off his daughter, she will kill herself, and it will avail me not. Then he told his son how the case stood, who hearing it said, O oh, my father, I cannot live without her, so I will go to her, and contrive to get at her, even though I die in the attempt, 
and this only will I do and nothing else. Asked his father, How wilt thou go to her? And he answered, I will go in the guise of a merchant. Then said the king, If thou need must go, and there is no help for it, take with thee the wazir and Aziz. Then he brought out money from his treasuries, and made ready for his son merchandise to the value of a hundred thousand dinars. The two had settled upon this action, and when the dark hours came, Taj al-Muluk and Aziz went to Aziz's lodging, and there passed that night, and the prince was heart-smitten, taking no pleasure in food or in sleep, for melancholy was heavy upon him, and he was agitated with longing for his beloved. So he besought the Creator that he would vouchsafe to unite with her, and he wept and groaned and wailed, and began versifying. Union, this severance ended, shall I see some day? Then shall my tears this love lorn lot of me portray. While night all care forgets, I only minded thee, and thou didst jar me wake, while all forgotful lay. And when his improvising came to an end, he wept with sore weeping, and Aziz wept with him, for that he remembered his cousin, and they both ceased not to shed tears till morning dawn, whereupon Taj al Muluk rose and went to farewell his mother in travelling dress. She asked him of his case, and he repeated the story to her, so she gave him fifty thousand gold pieces, and bade him adieu, and, as he fared forth, she put up prayers for his safety, and for his union with his lover and his friends. Then he betook himself to his father, and asked his leave to depart. The king granted him permission, and presenting him with the other fifty thousand dinars, bade set up a tent for him without the city, and they pitched a pavilion wherein the travellers abode two days. Then all set out on their journey. Now Taj al-Muluk delighted in the company of Aziz, and said to him, O oh, my brother, henceforth I can never part from thee, replied Aziz. I am of like mind, and fain I would die under thy feet. But, O oh, my brother, my heart is concerned for my mother. When we shall have won our wish, said the prince, there will be naught save what is well. Now the wazir continued charging Taj al-Muluk to be patient, while Aziz entertained him every evening with talk and recited poetry to him, and diverted him with histories and anecdotes. And so they fared on diligently night and day for two whole months, till the way became tedious to Taj al-Muluk, and the fire of desire redoubled on him, and he broke out. The road is lonesome, grow my grief and need, while on my breast love fires forever feed. Go of my hopes, sole object of my wish, by him who moulded man from drop of seed. I bear such loads of longing for thy love, dearest, as weight of all shum mountains exceed. O lady of my world, love does me die, no breath of light is left for life to plead. But for the union hope that lends me strength, my weary limbs were weak this way to speed. When he had finished his verses, he wept, and Aziz wept with him, from a wounded heart, till the minister was moved to pity by their tears, and said, O oh my lord, be of good cheer, and keep thine eyes clear of tears, there will be naught save what is well. Quoth Taj al-Muluk, O oh wazir, indeed I am weary of the length of the way, tell me how far we are yet distant from the city. Quoth Aziz, but a little way remaineth to us. Then they continued their journey, cutting across river vales and plains, woods and stony wastes. Till one night, as Taj al-Muluk was sleeping, he dreamt that his beloved was with him, and that he had embraced her and pressed her to his bosom. And he awoke, quivering, shivering with pain, delirious with emotion, and improvised these verses. Dear friend, my tears, I flow these cheeks adown, with longsome plain and pine, my sorrows crown. I plain like keening woman child bare fit, and as night falls like widow dove I groan, and blown the breeze from land where thou cost woan, I find o'er sunburnt earth sweet coolness blown. Peace be with thee, my love, while zephyr breathes, and cushet flies and turtle makes her moan. And when he had ended his versifying, the wazir came to him and said, Rejoice, this is a good sign. So be of good cheer, 
and keep thine eyes cool and clear, for thou shalt surely compass thy desire. And Aziz also came to him, and exhorted him to patience, and applied himself to divert him, talking with him, and telling him tales. So they pressed on, marching day and night, other two months, till there appeared to them one day at sunrise, some white thing in the distance, and Taj al-Muluk said to Aziz, What is yonder whiteness? He replied, O my lord, yonder is the castle of crystal, and that is the city thou seekest. At this the prince rejoiced, and they ceased not faring forwards, till they drew near the city, and, as they approached it, Taj al-Muluk joyed with exceeding joy, and his care ceased from him. They entered in traitor guise, the king's son being habited as a merchant of importance, and repaired to a great khan, known as the merchant's lodging. Quoth Taj al-Muluk to Aziz, Is this the resort of the merchants? And quoth he, Yes. "'Tis the con wherein I lodged before. "'So they alighted there, "'and making their baggage camels kneel, "'and loaded them and stored their goods in the warehouses. "'They abode four days for rest, "'when the wazir advised that they should hire a large house. "'To this they assented, "'and they found them a spacious house, "'fitted up for festivities, "'where they took up their abode, "'and the wazir and Aziz studied to devise some device "'for Taj al-Muluk, "'who remained in a state of perplexity, "'not knowing what to do.' Now the minister could think of nothing but that he should set up as a merchant on change and in the market of fine stuffs. So he turned to the prince and his companion and said to them, Know ye that if we tarry here on this wise, assuredly we shall not win our wish, nor attain our aim. But as something occurred to me, whereby, if Allah please, we shall find our advantage, replied Taj al-Muluk and Aziz, do what seemeth good to thee. Indeed, there is a blessing on the gray beard more specially on those who, like thyself, are conversant with the conduct of affairs. So tell us what occurreth to thy mind. Rejoiced the wazir, it is my counsel that we hire thee a shop in the stuff bazaar, where thou mayst sit to sell and buy. Every one, great and small, hath need of silken stuffs and other cloths. So if thou patiently abide in thy shop, thine affairs will prosper. Inshallah, more by token, as thou art comely of aspect. Make, however, Aziz thy factor, and set him within the shop, to hand thee the pieces of cloth and stuffs. When Taj al-Muluk heard these words, he said, This reed is right, and of right pleasant wrecking. So he took out a handsome suit of merchant's weed, and, putting it on, set out for the bazaar, followed by his servants, to one of whom he had given a thousand dinars, wherewith to fit up the shop. They ceased not walking till they came to the stuff market. And when the merchants saw Taj al-Muluk's beauty and grace, they were confounded and went about saying, Of a truth Rizwan hath opened the gates of paradise and left them unguarded, so that this youth of passing comeliness hath come forth. And others, peradventure this is one of the angels. Now when they went in among the traders, they asked for the shop of the overseer of the market, and the merchants directed them thereto. So they delayed not to repair thither and to salute him, and he and those who were with him rose to them, and seated them, and made much of them, because of the wazir, whom they saw to be a man in years, and of reverend aspect. And viewing the youths Aziz and Taj al-Muluk in his company, they said to one another, Doubtless our sheikh is the father of these two youths. Then quoth the wazir, Who among you is the overseer of the market? This is he, replied they, and behold, he came forward, and the wazir observed him, narrowly, and saw him to be an old man of grave and dignified carriage, with eunuchs and servants and black slaves. The syndic greeted them with the greeting of friends, and was lavish in his attentions to them. Then he seated them by his side, and asked them, Have ye any business which we may have the happiness of transacting? The minister answered, Yes, I am an old man, stricken in years, and have with me these two youths with whom I have travelled through every town and country, entering no great city without tarrying there a full year, that they might take their pleasure in viewing it and coming to know its citizens. Now I have visited your town, intending to sojourn here for a while. So I want thee a handsome shop in the best situation, wherein I may establish them, that they may traffic and learn to buy and sell and give and take, whilst they divert themselves with the sight of the place and become familiar with the usages of its people. 
quoth the overseer, there is no harm in that. And, looking at the two youths, he was delighted with them and affected them with warm affection. Now he was a great concierge of bewitching glances, preferring the love of boys to that of girls, and inclining to the sour rather than the sweet of love. So he said to himself, This, indeed, is fine game. Glory be to him who created and fashioned them out of vile water, and rising, stood before them like a servant to do them honor. Then he went out, and made ready for them a shop, which was in the very midst of the exchange. Nor was there any larger or better in the bazaar, for it was spacious and handsomely decorated, and fitted with shelves of ivory and ebony wood. After this he delivered the keys to the wazir, who was dressed as an old merchant, saying, Take them, O my lord, and Allah make it a blessed abiding place to thy two sons. The minister took the keys, and the three returning to the khan, where they had alighted, bade the servants transport to the shop all their goods and stuffs. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section two of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume Three. Recording by Chelsea Baker. Section three, Volume Three of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3, Section 3 When it was the one hundred and thirty-second night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the wazir took the shop keys, he went accompanied by Taj al-Muluk and Aziz to the Khan, and they bade the servants transport to the shop all their goods and stuffs and valuables of which they had great store worth treasures of money. And when all this was duly done, they went to the shop and ordered their stock and trade, and slept there that night. As soon as morning morrowed, the wazir took the two young men to the hammam bath, where they washed them clean, and then donned rich dresses and scented themselves with essences, and enjoyed themselves to the utmost. Now each of the youths was passing fair to look upon, and in the bath they were even as saith to the poet, Luck to the rubber, whose deft hand o'er these. A frame begotten twixt the lymph and light, he shows the thaumaturgy of his craft, and gathers musk in the form of camphorite. After bathing they left, and, when the overseer heard that they had gone to the hammam, he sat down to await the twain, and presently they came up to him like two gazelles. Their cheeks were reddened by the bath, and their eyes were darker than ever. Their faces shone, and they were as two lustrous moons, or two branches fruit-laden. Now when he saw them, he rose forthright, and said to them, O oh, my sons, may your bath profit you always. Whereupon Taj al-Muluk replied, with the sweetest of speech, Allah be bountiful to thee, O oh, my father. Why didst thou not come with us, and bathe in our company? Then they both bent over his right hand, and kissed it, and walked before him to the shop, to entreat him honorably, and show their respect for him, for that he was chief of the merchants in the market, and he had done them kindness in giving them the shop. When he saw their hips quivering as they moved, desire and longing redoubled on him, and he puffed and snorted and devoured them with his eyes, for he could not contain himself, repeating the while these two couplets. Here the heart reads a chapter of devotion pure, nor reads dispute if heaven and worship partner take, no wonder tis he trembles walking neath such weight, how much of movement that revolving spear must make. Furthermore, he said, I saw two charmers treading humble earth, two I must love, and tread they on mine eyes. When they heard this, they conjured him to enter the bath with them a second time. He could hardly believe his ears, and hastening thither, went in with them. The wazir had not yet left the bath, so when he heard of the overseer's coming, he came out and meeting him in the middle of the bath hall, invited him to enter. He refused. Thereupon Taj al-Muluk, taking him by the hand, walked on one side, and Aziz by the other, and carried him into a cabinet, and that impure old man submitted to them, whilst his emotion increased on him. He would have refused, albeit this was what he desired, but the minister said to him, They are thy sons, let them wash thee and cleanse thee. Allah preserve them to thee, exclaimed the overseer. By Allah, your coming and the coming of those with you bring down blessing and good luck upon our city. 
Then he repeated these two couplets. Thou camest, and green grew the hills anew, And sweetest bloom to the bridegroom threw, While aloud cried earth, and her earth-borns too, Hail and welcome, who comest with grace to undo. They thanked him for this, and Taj al-Mulk ceased not to wash him and to pour water over him, and he thought his soul in paradise. When they had made an end of his service, he blessed them and sat by the side of the wazir, talking but gazing the while on the use. Presently the servants brought them towels, and they dried themselves and donned their dress. Then they went out, and the minister turned to the syndic and said to him, O my lord, verily the bath is the paradise of this world, replied the overseer. Allah vouchsafe to thee such paradise, and health to thy sons, and guard them from the evil eye. Do ye remember aught that the eloquent have said in praise of the bath? Quoth Taj al-Muluk, I will repeat for thee a pair of couplets, and he recited. The life of the bath is the joy of man's life, save that time is short for us there to bide. A heaven were irksome it were to stay, a hell delightful at entering tide. When he ended his recital, quoth Aziz, And I also remember two couplets in praise of the bath. The overseer said, Let me hear them. So he repeated the following. A house where flowers from stones of granite grow, Seen at its best when hot with living lows. Thou deemst it hell, but here, forsooth, is heaven, And some like suns and moons within it show. And when he had ended his recital, his verses pleased the overseer, and he wondered at his words, and savoured their grace and fecundancy, and said to them, By Allah, ye possess both beauty and eloquence. But now listen to me, you twain. And he began chanting, and recited in song the following verses. O joy of hell and heaven, whose tormentry and quickens frame and soul with a lively gree. I marvel so delightsome house to view, and most when neath it kindled fires I see, sojourn of bliss to visitors withal, pools on them pour down tears unceasingly. Then his eyesight roamed, and browsed on the gardens of their beauty, and he repeated these two couplets. I went to the house of the keeper man, he was out, but others to smile began. I entered his heaven, and then his hell, and I said, Bless Malik, and bless Rizwan. When they heard these verses, they were charmed, and the overseer invited them to his house, but they declined and returned to their own place, to rest from the great heat of the bath. So they took their ease there, and ate and drank, and passed that night in perfect solace and satisfaction. Till morning dawned, when they arose from sleep, and making their lesser ablution, prayed the dawn, prayer and drank the morning draught. As soon as the sun had risen, and the shops and markets opened, they arose and were going forth from their place to the bazaar opened in their shop, which their servants had already furnished, after the handsome fashion, and had spread with prayer rugs and silken carpets, and had placed on the divans a pair of mattresses, each worth a hundred dinars. On every mattress they had disposed a rug of skin fit for a king and edged with a fringe of gold. In the middlemost the shop stood a third seat still richer, even as the place required. Then Taj al-Muluk sat down on one divan, and disease on another, whilst the wazir seated himself on that in the centre, and the servants stood before them. The city people soon heard of them and crowded about them, so that they sold some of their goods, and not a few of their stuffs, for Taj al-Muluk's beauty and loveliness had become the talk of the town. Thus they passed a trifle of time, and every day the people flocked to them and pressed upon them more and more, till the wazir, after extorting Taj al-Muluk to keep his secret, commended him to the care of Aziz and went home, that he might commune with himself alone and cast about for some contrivance which might profit them. Meanwhile, the two young men sat talking, and Taj al-Muluk said to Aziz, Happily someone will come from the Lady Dunya. So he ceased not expecting this chance days and nights, but his heart was troubled, and he knew neither sleep nor rest, for desire had got the mastery of him, and love and longing were sore upon him, so that he renounced the solace of sleep and abstained from meat and drink, Yet ceased he not to be like the moon on the night of fullness. Now one day he sat in the shop. Behold, there came up an ancient woman. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the one hundred and thirty-third night, she said, 
It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the wazir Dandan continued to Zaw al makin Now one day as Taj al-Muluk sat in his shop, behold, there appeared an ancient woman, who came up to him followed by two slave girls. She ceased not advancing till she stood before the shop of Taj al-Muluk and, observing his symmetry and beauty and loveliness, marveled at his charms and sweated in her petticoat trousers, exclaiming, Glory to him who created thee out of vile water, and made thee a temptation to all beholders. And she fixed her eyes on him and said, This is not a mortal. He is none other than an angel deserving the highest respect. Then she drew near and saluted him, whereupon he returned her salute and rose to his feet to receive her and smiled in her face, all this by a hint from Aziz, after which he made her sit down by his side and fanned her with a fan, till she was rested and refreshed. Then she turned to Taj al-Muluk and said, O my son, O thou art perfect in bodily gifts and spiritual graces, say me, art thou of this country? He replied, in voice the sweetest, and in tone of the pleasantest, By Allah, O my mistress, I was never in this land during my life till this time, nor do I abide here save by way of diversion. Rejoined she, May the grantor grant thee all honor and prosperity, and what stuffs hast thou brought with thee? Show me something passing fine, for the beauteous should bring nothing but what is beautiful. When he heard her words, his heart fluttered, and he knew their intermeaning. But Aziz made a sign to him, and he replied, I have everything thou canst desire, and especially I have goods that beset none but kings and kings' daughters. So tell me what stuff thou wantest, and for whom, that I may show thee what will be fitting for him. This he said, that he might learn the meaning of her words. And she rejoined, I want a stuff fit for the princess Dunya, daughter of King Shariman. Now when the prince heard the name of his beloved, he joyed with great joy, and said to Aziz, Give me a parcel. So Aziz brought it, and opened it before Taj al-Muluk, who said to the old woman, Select what will suit her, for these goods are to be found only with me. She chose stuffs worth a thousand dinars, and asked, How much is this? And she ceased not the while to talk with him, and rub what was inside her thighs with the palm of her hand. Answered Taj al-Muluk, Shall I higgle with the like of thee about this paltry price? Praised be Allah who hath acquainted me with thee. The old woman rejoined, Allah's name be upon thee. I commend thy beautiful face to the protection of the Lord of the daybreak. Beautiful face and eloquent speech. Happy she who lieth in thy bosom and clappeth thy waist in her arms and enjoyeth thy youth, especially if she be beautiful and lovely like thyself. At this, Taj al-Muluk laughed till he fell on his back and said to himself, O thou who fulfillest desires by means of pimping old women, they are the true fulfillers of desire. Then she asked, O my son, what is thy name? And he answered, My name is Taj al-Muluk, the crown of kings. Quoth she, This is indeed a name of kings and kings' sons, and thou art clad in merchants' clothes. Quoth Aziz, For the love of his parents and family bore him, and for the value they set on him, they named him thus. Replied the old woman, Thou sayest sooth. Allah guard you both from the evil eye and the envious, though hearts be broken by your charms. Then she took the stuffs and went her way. But she was amazed at his beauty and stature and symmetry, and she ceased not going till she found the lady Dunya, and said to her, O my mistress, I have brought thee some handsome stuffs. Quoth the princess, Show me that same. And the old woman, O apple of my eye, here it is. Turn it over and examine it. Now when the princess looked at it, she was amazed and said, O my nurse, this is indeed handsome stuff. I have never seen its like in our city. O my lady, replied the old nurse, he who sold it me is handsomer still. It would seem as if Rizwan had left the gates of paradise open in his carelessness and as if the youth who sold me this stuff had come bodily out of heaven. I would he might sleep this night with thee, and might lie between thy breasts. He hath come to thy city with these precious stuffs for amusement's sake, and he is a temptation to all who set eyes on him. The princess laughed at her words, and said, Allah afflict thee, O pernicious old hag, thou dotest, and there is no sense left in thee. Presently she resumed, Give me the stuff that I may look at it anew. 
So she gave it to her, and she took it again and saw that its size was small and its value great. It pleased her, for she had never in her life seen its like, and she exclaimed, By Allah, this is a handsome stuff. Answered the old woman, O oh my lady, by Allah, if thou sawest the owner, thou wouldst know him for the handsomest man on the face of the earth. Quoth the lady Dunya, Didst thou ask him if he had any need, that he might tell us and we might satisfy it? But the nurse shook her head and said, The Lord keep thy sagacity. By Allah, he hath a want. May thy skill not fail thee. What, is any man free from wants? Rejoined the princess. Go back to him and salute him, and say to him, Our land and town are honored by thy visit, and, if thou hast any need, we will fulfill it to thee, on our head and eyes. So the old woman at once returned to Taj al-Muluk, and when he saw her his heart jumped for joy and gladness, and he rose to his feet before her, and, taking her hand, seated her by his side. As soon as she was rested, she told him what Princess Dunya had said, and he on hearing it joyed with exceeding joy. His breast dilated to the full. Gladness entered his heart, and he said to himself, Verily, I have my need. Then he asked the old woman, Haply, thou wilt take her a message from me, and bring me her answer? And she answered, I hear it and obey. So he said to Aziz, Bring me an ink case, and paper and a brazen pen. And when Aziz brought him what he sought, he hent the pen in hand, and wrote these lines of poetry. I write to thee, O fondest hope, a writ, Of grief that severance on my soul cloth lay. Saith its first line within my heart, Is O, oh. its second, love and longing on me pray. Its third, my patience waste is fades my life. Its fourth, not shall my pain and pine allay. Its fifth, when shall mine eyes enjoy thy sight? Its sixth, Say, when shall dawn our meeting day? And lastly, by way of subscription, he wrote these words. This letter is from the captive of captivation, prisoned in the hold of longing expectation, wherefrom is no emancipation, but in anticipation and intercourse and in unification, after absence and separation. For from the severance of friends he loveth so fain, he suffered love pangs and pining pain. Then his tears rushed out, and he indicted these two couplets. I write thee, love, the while my tears pour down, nor cease they ever pouring thick and fleet, yet I despair not of my God, whose grace haply some day will grant us twain to meet. Then he folded the letter and sealed it with his singlet ring, and gave it to the old woman, saying, Carry it to the Lady Dunya. Quoth she, To hear is to obey. Whereupon he gave her a thousand dinars, and said to her, O oh, my mother, accept this gift from me as a token of my affection. She took both from him and blessed him, and went her way, and never stinted walking, till she went in to the Lady Dunya. Now when the princess saw her, she said to her, O oh, my nurse, what is it he asketh of need, that we may fulfill his wish to him? Replied the old woman, O oh, my lady, he sendeth thee this letter by me, and I know not what is in it and handed it to her. Then the princess took the letter and read it, and when she understood it, she exclaimed, Whence cometh and whither goeth this merchant man that he durst address such a letter to me? And she slapped her face, saying, Whence are we that we should come to shopkeeping? Oh, wah, oh, wah! By the Lord, but that I fear almighty Allah, I had slain him. And she added, Yeah, I had crucified him over his shop door. Asked the old woman, what is in this letter to vex thy heart and move thy wrath on this wise? Doth it contain a complaint or of oppression, or demand for the price of the stuff? Answered the princess, Woe to thee! There is none of this in it, not but words of love and endearment. This is all through thee, otherwise whence should this Satan know me? Rejoined the old woman, O my lady, thou sittest in thy high palace, and none may have access to thee. No, not even the birds of the air. Allah keep thee, and keep thy youth from blame and reproach. Thou needest not care for the barking of dogs, for thou art a princess, the daughter of a king. Be not wroth with me that I brought thee this letter, knowing not what was in it. But I opine that thou send him an answer, and threaten him with death, and forbid this foolish talk. 
Surely he will abstain and not dare do the like again. Quoth the Lady Dunya, I fear that, if I write to him, he will desire me the more. The old woman returned, When he heareth thy threats and promise of punishment, he will desist from his persistence. She cried, Here with the ink case and paper and brazen pen. And when they brought them, she wrote these couplets. O thou for who thy wakeful nights wouldst claim my love to boon, for what of pining thou must feel in tribulation, dost thou, fond fool and proud of sprite, seek meeting with the moon? Say, did man ever win his wish to take in his arms the moon? I counsel thee, from soul cast out the wish that dwells therein, and cut that short which threatens thee with sore risk over soon. And to such talk thou dare return, I bid thee to expect From me such awful penalty as suiteth froward loon. I swear by him who moulded man from gout of clotted blood, Who lit the sun to shine by day and lit for night the moon. And thou return to mention that thou spakest in thy pride, Upon a cross of tree for boon I'll have thee crucified. Then she folded the letter, and handing it to the old woman, said, Give him this, and say him, Cease from this talk. Hearkening and obedience, replied she, and taking the letter with joy, returned to her own house, where she passed the night, and when morning dawned she betook herself to the shop of Taj al-Muluk, whom she found expecting her. When he saw her, he was ready to fly for delight, and when she came up to him, he stood to her on his feet and seated her by his side. Then she brought out the letter and gave it to him, saying, Read what is in this adding, When Princess Dunya read thy letter she was angry, but I coaxed her and jested with her till I made her laugh, and she had pity on thee, and she hath returned thee an answer. He thanked her for her kindness, and bade Aziz give her a thousand gold pieces. Then he perused the letter, and understanding it, fell to weeping a weeping so sore that the old woman's heart was moved to wrath for him, and his tears and complaints were grievous to her. Presently she asked him, O oh, my son, what is there in this letter to make thee weep? Answered he, She hath threatened me with death and crucifixion, and she forbiddeth me to write to her. But if I write not, my death were better than my life. So take thou my answer to the letter, and let her work her will. Rejoined the old woman, By the life of thy youth, needs must I risk my existence for thee, that I may bring thee to thy desire and help thee to win what thou hast at heart? And Taj al-Muluk said, Whatever thou dost, I will requite thee for it, and do thou weigh it in the scales of thy judgment, for thou art experienced in managing matters, and skilled in reading the chapters of the book of intrigue. All hard matters to thee are easy doings, and Allah can bring about everything. Then he took a sheet of paper, and wrote thereon these improvised couplets. Yestern my love with slaughter menaced me, but sweet were slaughter and death foreordained. Yes, death is sweet for lover doomed to bear, Long life rejected, injured, and constrained. By Allah, deign to visit friendless friend. Thy thrall am I, and like a thrall am chained. Mercy, O lady mine, for loving thee, Who loveth noble soul, should be assained. Then he sighed heavy sighs, and wept till the old woman wept also, and presently taking the letter, she said to him, Be of good cheer, and cool thy eyes and clear, for needs must I bring thee to thy wish. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 3 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3 Recording by Chelsea Baker Section 4, Volume 3 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3, Section 4. When it was the one hundred and thirty-fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king that when Taj al-Muluk wept, the old woman said to him, Be of good cheer, and cool eyes and clear, for needs must I bring thee to thy wish. 
Then she rose and left him on coals of fire, and returned to Princess Dunya, whom she found still showing on her changed face rage at Taj al-Muluk's letter. She gave her his second letter, whereat her wrath redoubled, and she said, Did I not say he would desire us the more? Replied the old woman, What thing is this dog that he should aspire to thee? Quoth the princess, Go back to him and tell him that, if you write me after this, I will cut off his head. Quoth the nurse, Write these words in a letter, and I will take it to him, so that his fear may be the greater. She took a sheet of paper and wrote thereon these couplets. Ho thou, whose past and bygone wrists regardest with uncare, Thou who to win thy meeting prize dost over slowly fare, In pride of spirit thinkest thou to win the star of Soa? Albe thou not reach the moon which shines through upper air. How darest thou expect to win my favours, Hope to clip upon a lover's burning breast My lance like shape and rare? Leave this thy purpose, lest my wrath come down on thee some day. A day of wrath shall hoary turn the partings of thy hair. Then she folded the letter and gave it to the old woman, who took it and repaired to Taj al Mulut. When he saw her, he rose to his feet and exclaimed, May Allah never bereave me of the blessing of thy coming. Quoth she, Take the answer to thy letter. He took it and reading it, wept with sore weeping and said, I long for some one to slay me at this moment and send me to my rest, for indeed death were easier to me than this my state. And then he took ink case and pen and paper and wrote a letter containing these two couplets. O hope of me, pursue me not with rigour and disdain. Dine thou to visit lover white in love of thee is drowned. Deem not a life so deeply wronged I longer will endure. My soul for severance from my friend divorced is from unsound. Lastly, he folded the letter and handed it to the old woman, saying, Be not angry with me, though I have wearied thee to no purpose. And he bade Aziz give her the other thousand ducats, saying, O my mother, needs must this letter result in perfect union or utter severance. Replied she, O my son, by Allah I desire not but thy weal, and it is my object that she be thine, for indeed thou art the shining moon, and she the rising sun. If I do not bring you together, there is no profit in my existence, and I have lived my life till I have reached the age of ninety years in the practice of wile and intrigue. So how should I fail to unite two lovers, though in defiance of right and law? Then she took leave of him, having comforted his heart, and ceased not walking till she went to the Lady Dunya. Now she had hidden the letter in her hair, so when she sat down by the princess she rubbed her head and said, O oh, my lady, maybe thou wilt untwist my hair not, for it is a time since I went to the hammam. The king's daughter bared her arms to the elbows, and, letting down the old woman's locks, began to loose the knot of back hair, when out dropped the letter, and the Lady Dunya, seeing it, asked, What is this paper? Quoth the nurse. As I sat in the merchant's shop, this paper must have stuck to me. Give it to me, that I may return it to him. Possibly it containeth some account whereof he hath need. But the princess opened it and read it, and, when she understood it, she cried out, This is one of thy manifold tricks, and hast thou not reared me, I would lay violent hands on thee this moment. Verily Allah hath inflicted me with this merchant, but all that hath befallen me with him is on thy head. I know not from what country this one can have come. No man but he would venture to affront with me thus. And I fear lest this my case get abroad, more by token as it concerneth one who is neither my kin nor of my peers. Rejoined the old woman, None would dare speak of this for fear of thy wrath and for awe of thy sire. So there can be no harm in sending him an answer. Quoth the princess, O my nurse, verily this one is a perfect Satan. How durst he use such language to me and not dread the sultan's rage? Indeed, I am perplexed about his case. If I ordered him to be put to death, it were unjust. And if I leave him alive, his boldness will increase. Quoth the old woman, Come, write him a letter. It may be he will desist in dread. So she called for paper and ink case and pen and wrote these couplets. Thy folly drives thee on, the long I chid, writing in verse, How long shall I forbid? For all forbiddle thou persistest more, and my soul grace it is to keep it hid. Then hide thy love, nor ever dare reveal, 
for in thou speak of thee I'll soon be rid. If to thy silly speech thou turn anew, Raven shall croak for thee the wold amid, And death shall come and beat thee down ere long, Put out of sight and bury neath an earthen lid. Thy folk, fond fool, thou'lt leave for thee to mourn, And through their lives to sorrow all forlorn. Then she folded the letter and committed it to the old woman, Who took it, and returning to Taj al-Muluk gave it to him. When he read it, he knew that the princess was hard-hearted, And that he should not win access to her, so he complained of his case to the wazir, and besought his counsel. Quoth the minister, Know thou that naught will profit thee save that thou write to her, and invoke the retribution of heaven upon her. And quoth the prince, O my brother, O Aziz, do thou write to her as if my tongue spake, according to thy knowledge? So Aziz took a paper, and wrote these couplets. By the five shakes, O Lord, I pray deliver me, let her for whom I suffer bear like misery. Thou knowest how I fry in flaming low of love, while she I love hath not a ruth or clemency. How long shall I, despite my pain, her feelings spare? How long shall she wreck tyranny, o'er weakling me? In pains of never ceasing death I grieve. O Lord, thine aid, none other helping hand I see. How fain would I forget her, and forget her love. But how forget when love jarred patience death to dree? O thou who hinderest love to joy fair meeting tide, Say, art thou safe from time and fortune's jealousy? Art thou not glad and blessed with happy life? While well, I, from folk and country, for thy love am doomed to flee? Then Aziz folded the letter and gave it to Taj al-Muluk, who read it and was pleased with it. So he handed it to the old woman, who took it and went in with it to Princess Dunya. But when she read it and mastered the meaning thereof, she was enraged with great rage, and said, All that hath befallen me cometh by means of this ill-omened old woman. Then she cried out to the damsels and eunuchs, saying, Seize this old hag, this accursed trictress, and beat her with your slippers. So they came down upon her, till she swooned away, and when she came to herself, the princess said to her, By the Lord, old wicked woman, did I not fear almighty Allah, I would slay thee. Then quoth she to them, Beat her again. And they did so till she fainted a second time, whereupon she bade them drag her forth and throw her outside the palace door. So they dragged her along her face and threw her down before the gate. But as soon as she revived, she got up from the ground and, walking and sitting by turns, made her way home. There she passed the night till morning, when she arose and went to Taj al-Muluk and told them all that had occurred. He was distressed at this grievous news and said, O oh my mother, hard indeed to us is that which hath befallen thee. But all things are according to fate and man's lot. Replied she, Be of good cheer, and keep thine eyes cool and clear, For I will not give over striving Till I have brought thee and her together, And made thee enjoy this wanton Who hath burned my skin with beating. Asked the prince, Tell me what caused her to hate men. And the old woman answered, It arose from what she saw in a dream. And what was this dream? Twas this. One night, as she lay asleep, she saw a fowler spread his net upon the ground, and scatter wheat grain around it. Then he sat down hard, and not a bird in the neighborhood, but flocked to his toils. Amongst the rest she beheld a pair of pigeons, male and female. And whilst she was watching the net, behold, the male bird's foot caught in the meshes, and he began to struggle, whereupon all the other birds took fright and flew away. But presently his mate came back, and hovered over him, then alighted on the toils, unobserved by the fowler, and fell to pecking with her beak and pulling at the mesh in which the male bird's foot was tangled, till she released the toes and they flew away together. Then the fowler came up, mended his net, and seated himself afar off. After an hour or so the birds flew back and the female pigeon was caught in the net, whereupon all the other birds took fright and scurried away, and the male pigeon fled with the rest and did not return to his mate. But the fowler came up and took the female pigeon and cut her throat. The princess awoke, troubled by her dream, and said, all males are like this pigeon, worthless creatures, and men in general lack grace and goodness to women. When the old woman had ended her story, the prince said to her, O oh my mother, I desire to have one look at her, though it be my death, so do thou contrive me some contrivance for seeing her. She replied, Know that she hath under her palace windows a garden wherein she taketh her pleasure, and thither she resorteth once in every month by the private door. After ten days, 
the time of her thus going forth to divert herself will arrive. So when she is about to visit the garden, I will come and tell thee, that thou mayst go thither and meet her. And look thou leave not the garden, for happily, and she see thy beauty and loveliness, her heart will be taken with love of thee. And love is the most potent means of union. He said, I hear and obey. Whereupon he and Aziz rose and left the shop, and, taking the old woman with them, showed her the palace where they lodged. Then said Taj al-Muluk to Aziz, O my brother, I have no need of the shop now, having fulfilled my purpose of it, so I give it to thee, with all that is left in it, for thou hast come abroad with me, and hast left thy native land for my sake. Aziz accepted his gift, and then they sat conversing, while the prince questioned him of the strange adventures which had befallen him, and his companion acquainted him with the particulars thereof. Presently they went to the wazir, and, reporting to him Taj al-Muluk's purpose, asked him, What is there to be done? Let us go to the garden, answered he. So each and every donned richest clothes and went forth, followed by three white slaves to the garden, which they found thick with thickets, and railing its rails. And when they saw the keeper sitting at the gate, they saluted him with a solemn, and he returned their salute. Then the wazir gave him a hundred gold pieces, saying, Pray thee, take this small sum and fetch us somewhat to eat, for we are strangers, and I have with me these two lads, whom I wish to divert. The gardener took the sequins and said to them, Enter and amuse yourself in the garden, for it is all yours, and sit down till I bring you what food you require. So he went to the market while the wazir and Taj al-Muluk and Aziz entered the garden. And shortly after leaving for the bazaar, the gardener returned with a roasted lamb and cotton white bread, which he placed before them, and they ate and drank. Thereupon he served up sweetmeats, and they ate of them, and washed their hands, and sat talking. Presently the wazir said to the garth keeper, Tell me about this garden. Is it thine, or dost thou rent it? The sheikh replied, It doth not belong to me, but to our king's daughter, the princess Dunya. What be thy monthly wages? asked the wazir, and he answered, One denier, and no more. Then the minister looked round about the garden, and, seeing in its midst a pavilion tall and grand but old and disused, said to the keeper, O elder, I am minded to do here a good work, by which thou shalt remember me, replied the other. O my lord, what is the good work thou wouldst do? Take these three hundred diners, rejoined the wazir, when the keeper had heard speak of the gold. He said, O my lord, what so thou wilt do? So the wazir gave him the monies, saying, Inshallah, we will make a good work in this place. Then they left him and returned to their lodging, where they passed the night, and when it was the next day, the minister sent for a plasterer and a painter and a skillful goldsmith, and furnishing them all the tools they wanted, carried them to the garden, where he bade them whitewash the walls of the pavilion and decorate it with various kinds of paintings. Moreover, he sent for golden lapis lazuli and said to the painter, Figure me on the wall, at the upper end of this hall, a man fowler with his nets spread and birds falling into them, and a female pigeon entangled in the meshes by her bill. And when the painter had finished the picture on the side, the wazir said, Figure me on the other side, a similar figure, and represent the she-pigeon alone in the snare, and the fowler seizing her and setting the knife to her neck, and draw on the third side wall a great raptor clutching the male pigeon, her mate, and digging talons into him, the artist did his bidding. And when he and the others had finished the designs, they received their hire and went away. Then the wazir and his companions took leave of the gardener, and returned to their place, where they sat down to converse. And Taj al-Muluk said to Aziz, O my brother, recite me some verses. Perchance it may broaden my breast, and dispel my dolors, and quench the fire flaming in my heart. So Aziz chanted with sweet modulation these couplets. Whatever they say of grief to lovers came, I, weakling I, can single-handed claim and seek thou watering spot my streaming eyes, for floods that thirst would quench however it flame. Or wouldst view what ruin love has wrought, with ruthless hands, then see this wasted frame. And his eyes ran over with tears, and he repeated these couplets also. Who loves not swan neck and gazelle-like eyes, yet claims to know life's joys, I say he lies. And love is mystery, none avail to learn, save he who loveth in pure loving wise. All in my heart ne'er lighten of this love, nor rob the wakefulness these eyelids prize. Then he changed the mode of song and sang these couplets. Ibn Sina, in his cannon cloth opine, 
Lover's best cure is found in merry song, in meeting lover of a like degree. Dessert and garden, wine draughts long and strong, I choose another who of thee might cure, while well, force and fortune aided well and long. But ah, I learnt love's mortal ill, wherein Ibn Sina's recipe is fond and wrong. After hearing them to the end, Taj al-Muluk was pleased with his verses and wondered at his eloquence and the excellence of his recitation, saying, Indeed, thou hast done away with somewhat of my sorrow. Then quoth the wazir, Of a truth, there occurred to those of old what astoundeth those who hear it told, quoth the prince. If thou canst recall aught of this kind, pray thee let us hear thy subtle lines and keep up the talk. So the minister chanted in modulated song these couplets. Indeed I deem thy favours might be bought by gifts of golden things that joy the sprite, and ignorantly thought thee light of love. When can thy love lie low, the highest most might, until I saw thee choosing one, that one, loved with all favour, crowned with all delight? Then what I thou, by spite, canst ne'er be won, and under wing my head I hid from sight, and in this nest of passion made my wone, wherein I nestle morning, noon, and night. So far concerning them, but as regards the old woman, she remained shut up from the world in her house, till it befell that the king's daughter was taken with a desire to divert herself in the garden. Now she had never been wont to do so, save in company with her nurse. Accordingly she sent for her, and made friends with her, and soothed her sorrow, saying, I wish to go forth to the garden, that I may divert myself with the sight of its trees and fruits, and broaden my breast with the scent of its flowers, replied the old woman. I hear and obey, but first I would go to my house, and soon I will be with thee. The princess rejoined, Go home, but be not long absent from me. So the old woman left her, and, repairing to Taj al-Muluk, said to him, Get thee ready, and don thy richest dress, and go to the garden, and find out the gardener, and salute him, and then hide thyself therein. To hear is to obey, answered he, and she agreed with him upon a signal, after which she returned to the lady Dunya. As soon as she was gone, the wazir and Aziz rose, and robed Taj al-Muluk in a splendid suit of royal raiment worth five thousand dinars, and girt his middle with a girdle of gold set with gems and precious metals. Then they repaired to the garden, and found seated at the gate the keeper, who, as soon as he saw the prince, sprang to his feet and received him with all respect and reverence, and opening the gate said, Enter and take thy pleasure in looking at the garden. Now the gardener knew not that the king's daughter was to visit that place that day, but when Taj al-Muluk had been a little while there, he heard a hubbub, and ere he could think, out issued the eunuchs and damsels by the private wicket. The gardener, seeing this, came up to the prince, informed him of her approach, and said to him, O oh my lord, what is to be done? The princess Dunya, the king's daughter, is here, replied the prince. Fear not, no harm shall befall thee, for I will hide me somewhere about the garden. So the keeper exhorted him to the utmost prudence, and went away. Presently the princess entered the garden with her damsels and with the old woman, who said to herself, If these eunuchs stay with us, we shall not attain our end. So quoth she to the king's daughter, O my lady, I have somewhat to tell thee, which shall ease thy heart. Quoth the princess, Say what thou hast to say. O my lady, rejoined the old woman, Thou hast no need of these eunuchs at a time like the present, nor wilt thou be able to divert thyself at thy knees. Whilst they are with us, so send them away. And the lady Dunya replied, Thou speakest sooth. Accordingly she dismissed them, and presently began to walk about. Whilst Taj al-Muluk looked upon her, and fed his eyes on her beauty and loveliness. But she knew it not, and every time he gazed at her, he fainted by reason of her passing charms. The old woman drew her by converse till they reached the pavilion which the wazir had been be decorated. When the princess entered and cast a glance round, and perceived a picture of the birds, the fowler, and the pigeon, whereupon she cried, Exalted be Allah! This is the very counterfeit presentment of what I saw in my dream. She continued to gaze at the figures of the birds and the fowler with his net, admiring the work, and presently she said, O oh, my nurse, I have been wont to blame and hate men, but look now at the fowler who hath slaughtered the she-bird who set free her mate, who was minded to return to her and aid her to escape when the bird of prey met him and tore him to pieces. Now the old woman feigned ignorance to her and ceased not to occupy her in converse till they drew near the place where Taj al-Muluk lay hidden. Thereupon she signalled to him to come out and walk under the windows of the pavilion, and, 
as the lady dunya stood looking from the casement behold her glance fell that way and she saw him and nothing his beauty of face and form said to the old woman o my nurse whence cometh yonder handsome youth replied the old woman i know nothing of him save that i think he must be some great king's son for he attaineth comeliness and excess and extreme loveliness and the lady dunya fell in love with him to distraction the spells which bound her were loosed and her reason was overcome by his beauty and grace and his fine stature and proportions strongly excited her desire sexual so she said o oh my nurse this is indeed a handsome youth and the old woman replied thou sayest sooth my lady and signalled to taj al muluk to go home and now desire and longing flamed in him and he was distraught for love yet he went away and took leave of the gardener and returned to his place obeying the old woman and not daring to cross her when he told the wazir and aziz that she had signalled him to depart they exhorted him to patience saying did not the ancient dame know that there was an object to be gained by thy departure she had not signalled thee to return home such was the case with taj al muluk the wazir and aziz but as regards the king's daughter the lady dunya desire and passion redoubled upon her she was overcome with love and longing and said to her nurse i know not how i shall manage a meeting with this youth but through thee exclaimed the old woman i take refuge with allah from satan the stoned thou who art averse from men how come it then that thou art thus afflicted with hope and fear of this young man yet by allah none is worthy of thy youth but he quoth the lady dunya o my nurse further my cause and help me to forgather with him and thou shalt have of me a thousand dinars and a dress of honour worth as much more but if thou aid me not to come at him i am a dead woman in every sooth replied the ancient dame go thy palace and leave me to diverse means for bringing you twain together i will throw away my life to content you both so the lady dunya returned to her palace and the old woman betook herself to taj al muluk who when he saw her rose to receive her and entreated her with respect and reverence making her sit by his side then she said the trick hath succeeded and told him all that had passed between herself and the princess he asked her when is our meeting to be and she answered to-morrow so he gave her a thousand dinars and a dress of like value and she took them and stinted not walking till she returned to her mistress who said to her o oh, my nurse what news of the beloved replied she i have learnt where he liveth and i will bring him to thee to-morrow at this the princess was glad and gave her a thousand dinars and a dress worth as much more and she took them and returned to her own place where she passed the night till morning then she went to taj al muluk and dressing him in woman's clothes said to him follow me and sway from side to side as thou steppest and hasten not thy pace nor take heed of any who speaketh to thee and after thus charging him she went out and the prince followed her in woman's attire and she continued to charge and encourage him by the way that he might not be afraid nor ceased walking till they came to the palace gate she entered in the prince after her and she led him on passing through doors and vestibules till they had passed seven doors as they approached the seventh she said to him hearken thy heart and when i call out to thee and say o damsel pass on do not slacken thy pace but advance as if about to run when thou art in the vestibule look to thy left and thou wilt see a saloon with doors count five doors and enter the sixth for therein is thy desire asked taj al muluk and whither wilt thou go and she answered nowhere shall i go except that perhaps i may drop behind thee and the chief eunuch may detain me to chat with him she walked on and he behind her till she reached the door where the chief eunuch was stationed and he seeing taj al muluk with her dressed as a slave girl said to the old woman what business hath this girl with thee replied she this is a slave of whom the lady dunya hath heard that she is skilled in different kinds of work and she hath a mind to buy her rejoined the eunuch i know neither slave girls nor any one else and none shall enter here without my searching according to the king's commands and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say end of section four of the book of a thousand nights and a night volume three Recording by Chelsea Baker Section 5, Volume 3 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Translated by Richard Burton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org 
Recording by Filippo Joachim. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3, Section 5. When it was the one hundred and thirty-fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the chamberlain eunuch cried to the old woman, I know neither slave, girl, nor any one else, and none shall enter here without my searching him, according to the king's commands. Then quoth she, feigning to be angry, I thought thee a man of sense and good breeding, but if thou be changed, I will let the princess know of it, and tell her how thou hinderest her slave girl. And she cried out to Taj al-Muluk, saying, Pass on, O damsel. So he passed on into the vestibule, as she bade him, whilst the eunuch was silent and said no more. The prince counted five doors, and entered the sixth, where he found the princess Dunya standing and awaiting him. As soon as she saw him, she knew him and clasped him to her breast, and he clasped her to his bosom. Presently the old woman came in to them, having made a pretext to dismiss the princess's slave girls for fear of disgrace. And the Lady Dunya said to her, Be thou our doorkeeper. So she and Taj al-Muluk abode alone together, and ceased not kissing and embracing and twining leg with leg till dawn. When day drew near, she left him, and shutting the door upon him, passed into another chamber, where she sat down as was her wont, whilst her slave women came in to her, and she attended to their affairs, and conversed with them. Then she said to them, Go forth from me now, for I wish to amuse myself in privacy. So they withdrew, and she betook herself to Taj al-Muluk, and the old woman brought them food, of which they ate, and returned to amorous dalliance till dawn. Then the door was locked upon him, as on the day before, and they ceased not to do thus for a whole month. This is how it fared with Taj al-Muluk and the Lady Dunya. But as regards the wazir and Aziz, when they found that the prince had gone to the palace of the king's daughter, and there delayed all the while, they concluded that he would never return from it, and that he was lost for ever. And Aziz said to the wazir, O my father, what shall we do? He replied, O my son, this is a difficult matter, and except we return to his sire and tell him, he will blame us therefore. So they made ready at once, and forthright set out for the green land and the country of the two columns, and sought Sulaiman Shah's capital. And they traversed the valleys night and day, till they went in to the king, and acquainted him with what had befallen his son, and how from the time he entered the princess's palace they had heard no news of him. At this the king was as though the day of doom had dawned for him, and regret was sore upon him, and he proclaimed a holy war throughout his realm. After which he sent forth his host without the town, and pitched tents for them, and took up his abode in his pavilion, whilst the levies came from all parts of the kingdom. For the subjects loved him by reason of his great justice and beneficence. Then he marched with an army walling the horizon, and departed in quest of his son. Thus far concerning them, but as regard Taj al-Muluk and the Lady Dunya, the two remained as they were half a year's time, whilst every day they redoubled in mutual affection, and love and longing and passion and desire so pressed upon Taj al-Muluk, that at last he opened his mind and said to her, Know, O beloved of my heart and vitals, that the longer I abide with thee, the more love and longing and passion and desire increase in me, for that I have not yet fulfilled the whole of my wish. Asked she, What then wouldst thou have, O light of my eyes and fruit of my vitals, 
if thou desire aught beside kissing and embracing and entwining of legs with legs, do what pleaseth thee. For by Allah no partner hath any part in us. But he answered, It is not that I wish. I would fain acquaint thee with my true story. Know then that I am no merchant, nay, I am a king, the son of a king, and my father's name is the supreme king Sulaiman Shah, who sent his wazir ambassador to thy father, to demand thee in marriage for me. But when the news came to thee, thou wouldst not consent. Then he told her his past from first to last, nor is there any avail in the twice told tale. And he added, And now I wish to return to my father, that he may send an ambassador to thy sire, to demand thee in wedlock for me, so we may be at ease. When she heard these words, she joyed with great joy, because it suited with her own wishes, and they passed the night on this understanding. But it so befell by the decree of destiny that sleep overcame them that night, above all nights, and they remained till the sun had risen. Now at this hour King Shariman was sitting on his cushion of estate, with his emirs and grandees before him, when the syndic of the goldsmiths presented himself between his hands, carrying a large box, and he advanced, and opening it in the presence of the king, brought out therefrom a casket of fine work worth a hundred thousand dinners, for that which was therein of precious stones, rubies, and emeralds, beyond the competence of any sovereign on earth to procure. When the king saw this, he marvelled at its beauty, and turning to the chief eunuch, with with whom the old woman had had to do, said to him, O Kafur, take this casket and wend with it to the princess Dunya. The castrato took the casket, and repairing to the apartment of the king's daughter, found the door shut and the old woman lying asleep on the threshold. Whereupon said he, What, sleeping at this hour? When the old woman heard the eunuch's voice, she started from sleep and was terrified and said to him, Wait till I fetch the key. Then she went forth and fled for her life. Such was her case. But as regards the epicene, he, seeing her alarm, lifted the door off its hinge pins, and entering, found the Lady Dunya with her arms round the neck of Taj al-Muluk, and both fast asleep. At this sight he was confounded, and was preparing to return to the king, when the princess awoke, and seeing him, was terrified, and changed color, and waxed pale, and said to him, O Kafur, veil thou what Allah hath veiled. But he replied, I cannot conceal aught from the king, and locking the door on them, returned to Shariman, who asked him, Hast thou given the casket to the princess? Answered the eunuch, Take the casket, here it is, for I cannot conceal aught from thee. Know that I found a handsome young man by the side of the princess, and they two asleep in one bed and in mutual embrace. The king commanded them to be brought into the presence, and said to them, What manner of thing is this? And being violently enraged, seized the dagger and was about to strike Taj al-Muluk with it, when the Lady Dunya threw herself upon him, and said to her father, Slay me before thou slayest him. The king reviled her, and commanded her to be taken back to her chamber. Then he turned to Taj al-Muluk, and said to him, Woe to thee! Whence art thou? Who is thy father, and what hath emboldened thee to debauch my daughter? replied the prince. Know, O king, that if thou put me to death, thou art a lost man. 
and thou and all in thy dominion will repent the deed. Quoth the king, How so? And quoth Taj al-Muluk, Know that I am the son of King Sulaiman Shah, and ere thou knowest it, he will be upon thee with his horse and foot. When King Shariman heard these words, he would have deferred killing Taj al-Muluk, and would rather have put him in prison, till he should look into the truth of his words. But the wazir said to him, O king of the age, it is my opinion that thou make haste to slay this gallows bird, who dares debauch the daughters of kings. So the king cried to the headsman, Strike off his head, for he is a traitor. Accordingly, the herdsman took him and bound him fast and raised his hand to the emirs, signing to consult them, a first and a second signal, thinking thereby to gain time in this matter. But the king cried in anger to him, How long wilt thou consult the others? If thou consult them again, I will strike off thine own head. So the headsman raised his hand till the hair of his armpit showed, and was about to smite his neck. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the one hundred and thirty-sixth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the headsman raised his hand to smite off his head, when, behold, loud cries arose, and the folk closed their shops, whereupon the king said to her headsman, Wait a while, and dispatched one to learn the news. The messenger fared forth, and presently returned and reported. I saw an army like the dashing sea, and its clashing surge, and their horses curveting, till earth trembleth with the tramp, and I know no more of them. When the king heard this, he was confounded, and feared for his realm, lest it should be torn from him. So he turned to his minister and said, Have not any of our army gone forth to meet this army? But ere he had done speaking, his chamberlains entered with messengers from the king who was approaching, and amongst them the wazir who had accompanied Taj al-Muluk. They began by saluting the king, who rose to receive them and bade them draw near, and asked the cause of their coming. Whereupon the minister came forward from amongst them and stood before him and said, Know that he who hath come down upon thy realm is no king like unto the kings of yore and the sultans that went before. And who is he? asked the shariman. And the wazir answered, He is the lord of justice and loyalty, the brute of whose magnanimity the caravans have blazed abroad, the sultan Suleiman Shah, lord of the green land, and the two columns, and the mountains of Ispan. He who loveth justice and equity, and hateth oppression and iniquity. And he saith to thee, that his son is with thee and in thy city, his son, his heart's very core, and the fruit of his loins. And if he find him in safety, his aim is won, and thou shalt have thanks and praise. But if he have been lost from thy realm, or if aught of evil have befallen him, look thou for ruin and the wasting of thy reign, for this thy city shall become a ward wherein the raven shall croak. Thus have I done my errand to thee, and peace be with thee. Now when King Shariman heard from the messenger these words, his heart was troubled, and he feared for his kingdom. So he cried out for his grandees and ministers, chamberlains and lieutenants. And when they appeared, he said to them, Woe to you! Go down and search for the youth. Now the prince was still under the headsman's hand, 
but he was changed by the fright he had undergone. Presently the wazir, chancing to glance around, saw the prince on the rug of blood and recognized him. So he arose and threw himself upon him, and so did the other envoys. Then they proceeded to lose his bonds, and they kissed his hands and feet, whereupon Taj al-Muluk opened his eyes, and recognizing his father's wazir and his friend Aziz, fell down a fainting for excess of delight in them. When King Shariman made sure that the coming of this army was indeed because of this youth, he was confounded and feared with great fear. So he went up to Taj al-Muluk, and kissing his head, said to him, O my son, be not wroth with me, neither blame the sinner for his sin, but have compassion on my gray hairs, and waste not my realm. Whereupon Taj al-Muluk drew near unto him, and kissing his hand, replied, No harm shall come to thee, for indeed thou art to me as my father, but look that not befall my beloved, the Lady Dunya. Rejoined the king, O my lord, fear not for her, not but joy shall betide her. And he went on to excuse himself, and made his peace with Suleyman Shah's wazir, to whom he promised much money, if he would conceal from the king what he had seen. Then he bade his chief officers take the prince with them and repair to the hammam and clothe him in one of the best of his own suits and bring him back speedily. So they obeyed his bidding and bore him to the bath and clad him in the clothes which King Shariman had set apart for him and brought him back to the presence chamber. When he entered, the king rose to receive him and made all his grandees stand in attendance on him. Then Taj al-Muluk sat down to converse with his father's wazir and with Aziz, and he acquainted them with what had befallen him, after which they said to him, During that delay we returned to thy father and gave him to know that thou didst enter the palace of the princess and didst not return therefrom, and thy case seemed doubtful to us. But when thy sire heard of this, he mustered his forces. Then we came to this land, and indeed our coming hath brought to thee relief in extreme case, and to us great joy. Quoth he, Good fortune hath attended your every action, first and last. While this was doing, King Shariman went in to his daughter, Princess Dunya, and found her wailing and weeping for Taj al-Muluk. Moreover, she had taken a sword and fixed the hilt to the ground, and had set the point to the middle of her heart between her breasts. And she bent over the blade, saying, Needs must I slay myself, and not survive my beloved. When her father entered and saw her in this case, he cried out to her, saying, O princess of king's daughters, hold thy hand, and have ruth on thy sire, and the folk of thy realm. Then he came up to her, and continued, Let it not be that an ill thing befall thy father for thy sake. And he told her the whole tale, that her lover was a son of king Suleyman Shah, and sought her to wife, and he added, the marriage waiteth only for thy consent. Thereat she smiled and said, Did I not tell thee that he was a son of the Sultan? By Allah, there is no help for it but that I let him crucify thee on a bit of wood worth two pieces of silver. Replied the king, O oh, my daughter, have mercy on me. So Allah have mercy on thee rejoined she, Up with you, and make haste, and go bring him to me without delay. Quoth the king, On my head and eyes be it. 
and he left her, and going in hastily to Taj al-Muluk, repeated her words in his ear. So he arose and accompanied the king to the princess, and when she caught sight of her lover, she took hold of him and embraced him in her father's presence, and hung upon him and kissed him, saying, Thou hast desolated me by thine absence. Then she turned to her father and said, Sawest thou ever any that could do hurt to the like of this beautiful being, who is moreover a king, the son of a king, and of the free-born, guarded against ignoble deeds? Thereupon King Shariman went out shutting the door on them with his own hand. And he returned to the wazir and to the other envoys of Suleyman Shah, and bade them inform their king that his son was in health and gladness, and enjoying all delight of life with his beloved. So they returned to King Suleyman, and acquainted him with this, whereupon King Shariman ordered largesse of money and vivers to the troops of King Suleyman Shah. And when they had conveyed all he had commanded, he bade be brought out an hundred coursers, and a hundred dromedaries, and a hundred white slaves, and a hundred concubines, and a hundred black slaves, and a hundred female slaves. All of which he forwarded to the king as a present. Then he took horse with his grandees and chief officers, and rode out of the city in the direction of the king's camp. As soon as Sultan Suleyman Shah knew of his approach, he rose and advanced many paces to meet him. Now the wazir and Aziz had told him all the tidings, whereat he rejoiced and cried, Praise be to Allah who hath granted the dearest wish of my son. Then King Suleyman took King Shariman in his arms and seated him beside himself on the royal couch, where they conversed a while and had pleasure in each other's conversation. Presently food was set before them, and they ate till they were satisfied, and sweet meats and dried fruits were brought, and they enjoyed their dessert. And after a while came to them Taj al-Muluk, richly dressed and adorned, and when his father saw him, he stood up and embraced him and kissed him. Then all who were sitting rose to do him honor, and the two kings seated him between them, and they sat conversing a while, after which quoth King Suleyman Shah to King Shariman, I desire to have the marriage contract between my son and thy daughter drawn up in the presence of witnesses, that the wedding may be made public, even as is the custom of kings. I hear and I obey, quoth King Shariman, and thereon summoned the Kazi and the witnesses, who came and brought out the marriage contract between Taj al-Muluk and the Lady Dunya. Then they gave bakshish of money and sweetmeats, and lavished incense and essences. And indeed it was a day of joy and gladness, and all the grandees and soldiers rejoiced therein. Then King Shariman proceeded to Dawr and equip his daughter. And Taj al-Muluk said to his sire, Of a truth, this young man Aziz is of the generous and hath done me a notable service, having borne weariness with me. And he hath travelled with me, and hath brought me to my desire. He ceased never to show sufferance with me, and exhort me to patience, till I accomplished my intent. And now he hath abided with us two whole years, and he cut off from his native land. So now I purpose to equip him with merchandise, that he may depart hence with a light heart, for his country is near hand. Replied his father, Right is thy read. 
so they made ready an hundred loads of the richest stuffs and the most costly, and Taj al-Muluk presented them with great store of money to Aziz, and farewelled him, saying, O my brother and my true friend, take these loads and accept them from me by way of gift and token of affection, and go in peace to thine own country. Aziz accepted the presents, and kissing the ground between the hands of the prince and his father, bade them adieu. Moreover, Taj al-Muluk mounted and accompanied him three miles on his homeward way as a proof of amity, after which Aziz conjured him to turn back, saying, By Allah, O my master, were it not for my mother, I never would part from thee. But good my lord, leave me not without news of thee. Replied Taj al-Muluk, So be it. Then the prince returned to the city, and Aziz journeyed on till he came to his native town, and he entered it and ceased not faring till he went in to his mother and found that she had built him a monument in the midst of the house and used to visit it continually. When he entered, he saw her with hair dishevelled and dispread over the tomb, weeping and repeating these lines. Indeed, I am strong to bear whatever befall, but weak to bear such partings dire mischance. What heart estrangement of the friend can bear? What strength withstand assault of severance? Then sobs burns from her breast, and she recited also these couplets. What's this? I pass by tombs and fondly greet my friends' last homes, but send they no reply, for saith each friend, reply how can I make, when pledged to clay and pond to stones I lie? Earth has consumed my charms, and I forget thy love, for kith and kin poor banished I. While she was thus, behold, Aziz came in to her, and when she saw him, she fell down, fainting for very joy. He sprinkled water on her face, till she revived, and rising, took him in her arms, and strained him to her breast, whilst he in like manner embraced her. Then he greeted her, and she greeted him, and she asked the reason of his long absence, whereupon he told her all that had befallen him from first to last, and informed her how Taj al-Muluk had given him an hundred loads of monies and stuffs. At this she rejoiced, and Aziz abode with his mother in his native town, weeping for what mishaps had befallen to him with the daughter of Dilala, the weary one, even her who had castrated him. Such was the case with Aziz, but as regards Taj al-Muluk, he went in unto his beloved, Princess Dunya, and abated her maidenhead. Then King Shariman proceeded to equip his daughter for her journey with her husband and father-in-law, and bade bring them provant and presents and rarities. So they loaded their beasts and set forth, whilst King Shariman escorted them, by way of farewell, three days' journey on their way, till King Shah Suleyaman conjured him to return. So he took leave of them and turned back, and Taj al-Muluk and his wife and father fared forwards night and day with their troops, till they drew near their capital. As soon as the news of their coming spread abroad, the folk decorated for them the city. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 5 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3 Recording by Filippo Joaquin
Section 6 Volume 3 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Translated by Richard Burton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Filippo Joaquin The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Volume 3 Section 6 When it was the one hundred and thirty-seventh night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Shah Sulaiman drew near his capital, the folk decorated the city for him and for his son. So they entered in state, and the king, sitting on his throne, with his son by his side, gave alms and largesse, and loosed all who were in his jails. Then he held a second bridle for his son, and the sound of the singing women and players upon instruments was never silent for a whole month. And the tired woman stinted not to adorn the Lady Dunya and display her in various dresses. And she tired not of the displaying, nor did the women weary of gazing on her. Then Taj al-Muluk, after having foregathered a while with his father and mother, took up his sojourn with his wife, and they abode in all joyance of life and in fairest fortune, till there came to them the destroyer of all delights. Now when Wazir Dandan had ended the tale of Taj al-Muluk and the Lady Dunya, Zaw al-Makan said to him, Of a truth it is the like of thee who lighten the mourner's heart, and who deserve to be the born companion of kings, and to guide their policy in the right way. All this befell, and they were still besigning Constantinople, where they lay four whole years, till they yearned after their native land, and the troops murmured, being weary of vigil and besieging and the endurance of fray and foray by night and by day. Then King Zawal Makan summoned Rustam and Bahram and Tarkash, and when they were in presence bespoke them thus, Know that we have lain here all these years, and we have not won to our wish, nay, we have but gained increase of care and concern. For indeed we came, thinking to make our men boat for King Omar bin al-Numan, and in so doing my brother Sharkan was slain. So is our sorrow grown to sorrow twain, and our affliction to afflictions twain. All these came of the old woman Zat al-Dawahi, for it was she who slew the sultan in his kingdom, and carried off his wife, the Queen Sophia. Nor did this suffice her, but she must put another cheat on us, and cut the throat of my brother Sharkan, and indeed I have bound myself and sworn by the solemnest oaths that there is no help but I take blood wit from her. What say ye? Ponder my address and answer me. Then they bowed their heads and answered, it is for the wazir Dandan to opine. So the minister came forward and said, No, O king of the age, it booteth us not to tarry here, and tis my counsel that we strike camp and return to our own country, there to abide for a certain time, and after that we should return for a razzia upon the worshippers of idols. Replied the king, this reed is right, for indeed this folk is weary for a sight of their families, and I am another who is also troubled with yearning after my son Kanmakan and my brother's daughter Kuzia Fakan. For she is in Damascus, and I know not how is her case. When the troops heard this report, they rejoiced and blessed the wazir Dandan, then the king bade the crier call the retreat after three days. They fell to preparing for the march, and on the fourth day they beat the big drums and unfurled the banners, and the army set forth, 
the Wazir Dandan in the van, and the King riding in the mid battle, with the Grand Chamberlain by his side. And all journeyed without ceasing, night and day, till they reached Baghdad city. The folk rejoiced in their return, and care and fear ceased from them whilst they stay at homes, met the absentees, and each emir betook him to his own house. As for Zaw al Makan, he marched up to the palace and went in to his son, Kamakan, who had now reached the age of seven, and who used to go down to the weapon plain and ride. As soon as the king was rested of his journey, he entered the hammam with his son, and returning, seated himself on his sofa of state, whilst the wazir Dandan took up his station before him, and the emirs and lords of the realm presented themselves and stood in attendance upon him. Then Zaw al Makan called for his comrade, the fireman, who had befriended him in his wanderings. And when he came into presence, the king rose to do him honor, and seated him by his side. Now he had acquainted the wazir with all the kindness and good turns which the stalker had done him, and he found that the wicked had waxed fat and burly with rest and good fare, so that his neck was like an elephant's throat, and his face like a dolphin's belly. Moreover, he was grown dull of wit, for that he had never stirred from his palace. So at first he knew not the king by his aspect. But Zaw al Makan came up to him smiling in his face, and greeted him after the friendliest fashion, saying, How soon hast thou forgotten me? With this the fireman roused himself, and looking steadfastly at Zaw al Makan, made sure that he knew him, whereupon he sprang hastily to his feet and exclaimed, O my friend, who hath made thee sultan? Then Zaw al Makan laughed at him, and the wazir, coming up to him, expounded the whole story to him, and said, In good sooth he was thy brother and thy friend, and now he is king of the land, and needs must thou get great good of him. So I charge thee, if he say, Ask a boon of me. Ask not but for some great thing, for thou art very dear to him. Quoth the fireman, I fear lest, if I ask of him aught, he may not choose to give it, or may not be able to grant it. Quoth the wazir, Have no care, whatsoever thou askest, he will give thee. Rejoined the stalker, By Allah, I must at once ask of him a thing that is in my thought. Every night I dream of it, and implore mighty Allah to vouchsafe it to me. Said the wazir, Take heart, by Allah, if thou ask of him the government of Damascus in place of his brother, he would surely give it thee, and make thee governor. With this the stalker rose to his feet, and Zaw al Makan signed to him to sit. But he refused, saying, Allah forfend, the days are gone by of my sitting in thy presence. Answered the Sultan, Not so, they endure even now. Thou wast in very deed the cause that I am at present alive, and by Allah, whatever thing most desired thou requirest of me, I will give that same to thee. But ask thou first of Allah, and then of me. He said, O my lord, I fear, fear not, quoth the Sultan. He continued, I fear to ask aught, and that thou shouldst refuse it to me, and it is only. At this the king laughed, and replied, If thou require of me the half of my kingdom, I would share it with thee. So ask what thou wilt, and leave talking. Repeated the fireman, I fear, don't fear, quoth the king. He went on, I fear lest I ask a thing, and thou be not able to grant it. 
Upon this the Sultan waxed wroth and cried, Ask what thou wilt. Then said he, I ask, first of Allah and then of thee, that thou write me a patent of syndicate over all the firemen of the baths in the holy city, Jerusalem. The Sultan and all present laughed, and Zaw al Makan said, Ask something more than this. He replied, O my lord, said I not, I fear that thou wouldst not choose to give me what I should ask, or that thou be not able to grant it? Therewith the wazir signed him with his foot once and twice and thrice, and every time he began, I ask of thee, quoth the sultan, ask and be speedy. So he said, I ask thee to make me chief of the scavengers in the holy city of Jerusalem, or in Damascus town. Then all those who were present fell on their backs with laughter, and the wazir beat him. Whereupon he turned to the minister and said to him, What art thou that thou shouldst meet me? Tis no fault of mine, didst thou not thyself bid me ask some important thing? And he added, Let me go to my own land. With this the sultan knew that he was jesting, and took patience with him a while. Then turned to him and said, O my brother, ask of me some important thing, befitting our dignity. So the stalker said, O king of the age, I ask first of Allah and then of thee, that thou make me viceroy of Damascus in the place of thy brother. And the king replied, Allah granteth thee this. Thereupon the fireman kissed ground before him, and he bade set him a chair in his rank, and vested him with a viceroy's habit. Then he wrote him a patent, and sealed it with his own seal, and said to the wazir Dandan, None shall go with you but thou, and when thou makest the return journey, do thou bring with thee my brother's daughter, Kuzia Fakan. Hearkening and obedience, answered the minister, and taking the fireman, went down with him, and made ready for the march. Then the king appointed for the stalker servants and suit, and gave him a new litter and a princely equipage, and said to the emirs, Whoso loveth me, let him honor this man, and offer him a handsome present. So each and every of the emirs brought him his gift, according to his competence, and the king named him Zibl Khan, and conferred on him the honorable surname of Al-Mujahid. As soon as the gear was ready, he went up with the wazir Dandan to the king, that he might take leave of him, and ask his permission to depart. The king rose to him and embraced him, and charged him to do justice between his subjects, and bade him make ready for fight against the infidels after two years. Then they took leave of each other, and the king, the fighter for the faith, Haiz Zibl Khan, having been again exhorted by Zaw al Makan to deal fairly with his subjects, set out on his journey, after the emirs had brought him Mamelukes and eunuchs, even to five thousand in number, who rode after him. The Grand Chamberlain also took horse, as did Baram, the captain of the Delamites, and Rustam, captain of the Persians, and Tarkash, captain of the Arabs, who attended to do him service, and they ceased not riding with him three days' journey by way of honor. Then, taking their leave of him, they returned to Baghdad, and the Sultan Zibl Khan and the Wazir Dandan fared on with their suit and troops, till they drew near Damascus. Now news was come upon the wings of birds to the notables of Damascus, that King Zaw al Makan had made Sultan over Damascus a king named Zibl Khan and surnamed Al Mujahid. So when he reached the city, he found it dressed in his honor, 
and everyone in the place came out to gaze on him. The new sultan entered Damascus in a splendid progress, and went up to the citadel, where he sat down upon his chair of state, whilst the wazir Dandan stood in attendance on him, to acquaint him with the ranks of the emirs and their stations. Then the grandees came in to him, and kissed hands, and called down blessings on him. The new king, Zibl Khan, received them graciously, and bestowed on them dresses of honor and various presents and bounties, after which he opened the treasuries, and gave largesse to the troops, great and small. Then he governed and did justice, and proceeded to equip the lady Kuzia Fakan, daughter of King Sharkan, appointing her a litter of silken stuff. Moreover, he furnished the wazir Dandan equally well for the return journey, and offered him a gift of coin, but he refused, saying, Thou art near the time appointed by the king, and haply thou wilt have need of money, or after this he may send to seek of thee funds for the holy war, or what not. Now when the wazir was ready to march, Sultan al-Mujahid mounted to bid the minister farewell, and brought Kuzia Fakan to him, and made her enter the litter, and sent with her ten damsels to do her service. Thereupon they set forward, whilst king, fighter for the faith, returned to his government, that he might order affairs, and get ready his munitions of war, awaiting such time, as King Zawa Makan should send a requisition to him. Such was the case with Sultan Zibl Khan. But as regards the wazir Dandan, he ceased not faring forward and finishing off the stages, in company with Kuzia Fakan, till they came to Ruba, after a month's travel, and thence pushed on, till they drew near Baghdad. Then he sent to announce his arrival to King Zawa Makan, who, when he heard this, took horse and rode out to meet him. The wazir Dandan would have dismounted, but the king conjured him not to do so, and urged his steed till he came up to his side. Then he questioned him of Zibl Khan, Haiz al-Mujahid, whereto the wazir replied that he was well, and that he had brought with him Kuzia Fakan, the daughter of his brother. At this the king rejoiced, and said to Dandan, Down with thee, and rest thee from the fatigue of the journey for three days, after which come to me again, replied the wazir with joy and gratitude, and betook himself to his own house, whilst the king rode up to his palace, and went in to his brother's daughter. Kuzia Fakan, a girl of eight years old. When he saw her, he rejoiced in her and sorrowed for her sire. Then he bade make for her clothes and gave her splendid jewelry and ornaments, and ordered she be lodged with his son Kanmakan in one place. So they both grew up the brightest of the people of their time and the bravest. But Kuzia Fakan became a maiden of good sense and understanding and knowledge of the issues of events, whilst Kamakan approved him a generous youth and free-handed, taking no care in the issue of aught. And so they continued till each of them attained the age of twelve. Now Kuzia Fakan used to ride a horseback and fare forth with her cousin into the open plain and push forward and range at large with him in the war. And they both learned to smite with swords and spike with spears. But when they had reached the age of twelve, King Zawa Makan, having completed his preparations and provisions and munitions for holy war, summoned the wazir Dandan and said to him, Know that I have set mind on a thing which I will discover to thee, and I want thine opinion thereon. So do thou with speed return me a reply. Asked the wazir, What is that, O king of the age? And the other answered, I am resolved to make my son Kanmakan sultan, 
and rejoice in him in my lifetime, and do battle before him till death overtake me. What reckest thou of this? The wazir kissed the ground before the king and replied, No, O king, and sultan mine, lord of the age and the time, that which is in thy mind is indeed good, save that it is now no tide to carry it out, for two reasons. The first, that thy son Kanmakan is yet of tender age, and the second, that it often befalleth him who maketh his son king in his lifetime to live but a little while thereafterward. And this is my reply. Rejoined the king, No, O wazir, that we will make the grain chamberlain guardian over him, for he is now one of the family, and he married my sister, so that he is to me as a brother. Quoth the wazir, Do what seemeth good to thee, we have only to obey thine orders. Then the king sent for the grand chamberlain, whom they brought into the presence, together with the lords of the realm, and he said to them, Ye know that this my son, Khan Makan, is the first cavalier of the age, and that he hath no peer in striking with the sword and longing with the lance. And now I appoint him to be sultan over you, and I make the grand chamberlain, his uncle, guardian over him. Replied the chamberlain, I am but a tree which thy bounty hath planted. And Zawa Makan said, O chamberlain, Verily this my son Khan Makan and my niece Kuzia Fakan are brother's children. So I hereby marry her to him, and I call those present to witness thereof. Then he made over to his son such treasures as no tongue can describe. And going in to his sister Nuzhat al-Zaman, told her what he had done, whereat she was a glad woman and said, Verily the twain are my children. Allah preserve thee to them, and keep thy life for them many a year. Replied he, O my sister, I have accomplished in this world all my heart desired, and I have no fear for my son. Yet it were well thou have an eye on him, and an eye on his mother. As he charged the chamberlain and Nuzhat al-Zaman, with the care of his son and niece and wife, and this he continued to do nights and days till he fell sick, and deemed surely that he was about to drink the cup of death. So he took to his bed, while his chamberlain busied himself with ordering the folk and realm. At the end of the year the king summoned his son Kanmakan and the wazir Dandan, and said, O my son, after my death, this wazir is thy sire. For know that I am about to leave this house of life transitory, for the house of eternity. And indeed, I have fulfilled my will of this world. Yet there remaineth in my heart one regret, which may Allah dispel through and by thy hands. Asked his son, What regret is that, O my father? Answered Zaw al Makan, O my son, the sole regret of me is that I die without having avenged thy grandfather, Omar bin al Nu'uman, and thine uncle, Sharkan, on an old woman whom they call Zat al Dawahi. But if Allah grant thee aid, sleep not till thou take thy wreck on her, and so wipe out of shame we have suffered at the infidel's hands and beware of the old hag's wile, and do what the wazir Dandan shall advise thee, because he from all time hath been the pillar of our realm. And his son assented to what he said. Then the king's eyes ran over with tears, and his sickness redoubled on him. Whereupon his brother-in-law, the chamberlain, took charge over the country, and being a capable man, he judged and bade and forbade for the whole of that year, while Zaw al Makan was occupied with his malady. And his sickness was sore upon him 
for four years, during which the chief chamberlain sat in his stead, and gave full satisfaction to the commons and the nobles, and all the country blessed his rule. Such was the case with Zawa Makan and the chamberlain. But as regards the king's son, he busied himself only with riding and longing with lance and shooting with shaft. And thus also did the daughter of his uncle, Kuzia Fakan, for he and she were wont to fare forth at the first of the day and return at nightfall, when she would go in to her mother and he would go in to his mother, whom he ever found sitting in tears by the head of his father's couch. Then he would tend his father all night long till daybreak, when he would go forth again with his cousin according to their wont. Now Zaw al Makan's pains and sufferings were lonesome upon him, and he wept and began versifying with these couplets. Gone is my strength, told is my tale of days, and look ye, I am left as thou dost see, in honour's day most honoured want to be, and win the race from all my company. Would heaven before my death I might behold, my son is seat of empire sit for me, and rush upon his foes to take his wreck with sway of swords and lance lunged gallantly. In these words and the next I am undone, except the Lord vouchsafe me clemency. When he had ended repeating these verses, he laid his head on his pillow and closed his eyes and slept. Then saw he in his sleep one who said to him, Rejoice, for thy son shall fill the land with justice sway and he shall rule them, and him shall the lieges obey. Then he awoke from his dream, gladdened by the good tidings he had seen, and after a few days death smote him, and because of his dying great grief fell on the people of Baghdad, and simple and gentle mourned for him. But time passed over him, as though he had never been, and Kanmakan's estate was changed. For the people of Baghdad set him aside and put him and his family in a place apart. Now when his mother saw this, she fell into the sorriest of plights and said, There is no help but that I go to the Grand Chamberlain, and I must hope for the aidance of the subtle, the all-wise. Then she rose from her place and betook herself to the house of the Chamberlain, who was now become Sultan and she found him sitting upon his carpet. So she went in to his wife, Nuzhat al-Zaman, and wept with sore weeping, and said unto her, Verily, the dead hath no friend. May Allah never bring you to what, as long as your age, the years endure, and may you cease not to rule justly over rich and poor. Thine ears have heard, and thine eyes have seen all that was ours of kinship and honour and dignity and wealth and fair fortune of life and condition. And now time hath turned upon us, and fate and the world have betrayed us and wrought in hostile way with us. Wherefore I come to thee, craving thy favours, I from whom favours were craved. For when a man dieth, Women and maidens are brought to despisal. And she repeated these couplets. Suffice thee death, such marvels can enhance, And severed lives make lasting severance. Men's days are marvels, and their stations are But water pits of misery and mischance. Not rings my heart, save loss of noble friends, Girt round my rings of heart, harsh circumstance. When Nusat al Zaman heard these words, she remembered her brother Zaw al Makan and his son Kan Makan, and making her draw near to her and showing her honour, she said, Verily, 
at this moment, by Allah, I am grown rich, and thou art poor. Now, by the Lord, we did not cease to seek thee out, but we feared to wound thy heart, lest thou shouldst fancy our gifts to thee, an alms gift. Withal, whatso will we now enjoy is from thee and thy husband, so our house is thy house, and our place thy place, and thine is all our wealth, and what goods we have belong to thee. Then she robed her in sumptuous robes, and set apart for her a place in the palace, a join in her own. And they abode therein, she and her son, in all delight of life. And Uzat al-Zaman clothed him also in king's raiment, and gave to them both a special handmaids for their service. After a little she related to her husband, the sad case of the widow of her brother, Zaw al Makan, whereat his eyes filled with tears, and he said, Wouldest thou see the word after thee? Look thou upon the word after other than thyself. Then entreat her honorably, and enrich her poverty. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section six of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume Three. Recording by Filippo Joachim. Section seven, Volume Three of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Filippo Joaquin. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3, Section 7. When it was the 138th night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Nushat al-Zaman related to her husband the sad case of the widow of her brother, Zaw al-Makan, the chamberlain said, Entreat her honorably, and enrich her poverty. Thus far concerning Nushat al-Zaman, and her consort, and the relict of Zaw al-Makan. But as regards Khan Makan, and his cousin, Kuzia Fakan, they grew up and flourished, till they waxed like unto two fruit-laden boughs, or two shining moons, and they reached the age of fifteen, and she was indeed the fairest of maids, who are modestly veiled, loosely faced, with smooth cheeks graced, and slender waist on heavy hips based. And her shape was the shaft's thin line, and her lips were sweeter than old wine, and the nectar of her mouth, as it were the fountain, Salsabil, even as saith the poet in these two couplets, describing one like her. As though tisane of wine on her lips honey dew, dropped from the ripened grapes, her mouth in cluster grew. And when her frame thou doublest, and low bends her vine, praise her creator's might no creature ever knew. Of a truth Allah had united in her every charm, her shape would shame the branch of waving tree, and the rose before her cheeks craved the lenity, and the honeydew of her lips of wine made jeer, however old and clear, and she gladdened heart and beholder with joyous cheer, even as saith of her the poet. Goodly of gifts is she, and charm those perfect eyes, with lashes shaming coal, and all the fair one cold. And from those eyne the glances pierce the lover's heart, like sword in mir al muminina alis hold. And the relator continueth, as for Khan Makan, he became unique in loveliness and excelling in perfection no less. None could even him in qualities, as in seemliness, 
and in the sheen of valor between his eyes was espied, testifying for him while against him it never testified. The hardest hearts inclined to his side. His eyelids bore lashes, black as by coal, and he was of surpassing worth in body and soul. And when the down of lips and cheeks began to sprout bars, and poets sang for him far and near, appear not my excuse till hair had clothed his cheek, and gloom overcrept that side face, side to stagger, a fawn when eyes would batten on his charms. Each glance deals thrusts like point of Kanjar dagger. And saith another, His lover's soul have drawn upon his cheek, An ant that perfected its rosy light. I marvel at such martyrs lies apent, Who yet with greeny robes of heaven are dight. Now it chanced one holiday, that Kuzia Fakan fared forth to make festival with certain kindred of the court, and she went surrounded by her handmaids, and indeed beauty encompassed her. The roses of her cheeks dealt envy to their mole. From out her smiling lips Levi flashed white, gleaming like the chamomile, and Kanmakan began to turn about her and devour her with his sight for she was the moon of resplendent light. Then he took heart, and giving his tongue a start, began to improvise. When shall the disappointed heart be healed of severance, and lips of union smile at ceasing of our hard mischance? Would heaven I knew shall come some night, and with it surely bring meeting with friend who like myself endureth sufferance. When Kuzia Fakan heard these couplets, she showed vexation and disapproval, and putting on a haughty and angry air, said to him, Dost thou name me in thy verse to shame me amongst folk? By Allah, if thou turn not from this talk, I will assuredly complain of thee to the grain chamberlain. Sultan of Khorasan and Baghdad, and Lord of Justice and Equity, that disgrace and punishment may befall thee. Kanmakan made no reply for anger, but he returned to Baghdad. And Kuzia Fakan also returned to her palace, and complained of her cousin to her mother, who said to her, O oh, my daughter, haply he meant thee no harm, and is he aught but an orphan? Withal, he said not of reproach to thee, so beware thou tell none of this, lest perchance it come to the sultan's ears, and he cut short his life, and blot out his name, and make it even as yesterday, whose memory hath passed away. However, Kanmakan's love for Kuzia Fakan spread abroad in Baghdad, so that the women talked of it. Moreover, his breast became straitened, and his patience waned, and he knew not what to do. Yet he could not hide his condition from the world. Then longed he to give vent to the pangs he endured, by reason of the love of separation. But he feared her rebuke and her wrath, so he began improvising. Now is my dread to incur reproaches which disturb her temper and her mind obscure. Patient I'll bear them. Even a generous youth his case to cure, beareth the burn of brand his case to cure. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the one hundred and thirty-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the Grand Chamberlain became Sultan, they named him King Sasan, and after he had assumed the throne, he governed the people in righteous way. Now, as he was giving audience one day, Kanmakan's verses came to his knowledge. 
Thereupon he repented him of the past, and going in to his wife Nuzhat al-Zaman, said to her, Verily, to joy halfa grass and fire is the greatest of risks, and man may not be trusted with woman, so long as eye glanceth and eyelid quivereth. Now thy brother's son, Kanmakan, is come to man's estate, and it beloveth us to forbid him access to the room where anklets trickle. And it is yet more needful to forbid thy daughter the company of man, for the like of her should be kept in a harem. Replied she, Thou sayest sooth, O wise king. Next day came Kanmakan according to his wont, and going in to his aunt saluted her. She returned his salutation, and said to him, O my son, I have somewhat to say to thee, which I would fain leave unsaid, yet I must tell it thee, despite my inclination. Quoth he, Speak, and quoth she, Know then that thy sire the chamberlain, the father of Kuzia Fakan, hath heard of the verses thou madest anent here and hath ordered that she be kept in the harem, and out of thy reach. If therefore, O my son, thou want anything from us, I will send it to thee from behind the door, and thou shalt not look upon Kuzia Fakan, nor shalt thou return hither from this day forth. When he heard this, he arose and withdrew without speaking a single word and betaking himself to his mother, related what his aunt has said. She observed, This all cometh of thine over-talking. Thou knowest that the news of thy passion for Kuzia Fakan is noised abroad, and the tattle hath spread everywhere, how thou eatest their food, and thereafter thou courtest their daughter. Rejoined he, and who should have her but I? She is the daughter of my father's brother, and I have the best of rights to her. Retorted his mother, These are idle words. Be silent, lest haply thy talk come to the king Sasan's ears, and it prove the cause of thy losing her, and the reason of thy ruin and increase of thine affliction. They have not sent us any supper to-night, and we shall die and hungered. And were we in any land but this, we were already dead of famine, or of shame for begging our bread. When Kanmakan heard these words from his mother, his regrets redoubled, his eyes ran over with tears, and he complained and began improvising. Minish this blame I ever bear from you. My heart loves her to whom all love is due. Ask not from me of patience jot or little. Divorce of patience by God's house. I rue what blamers preach of patience I unheed. Here am I, love path firmly to pursue. Indeed they bar me access to my love. Here am I by God's truth no ill I sue. Good sooth my bones, when as they hear thy name. Quail as birds quailed, when Nisus o'er them flew. Ah, say to them, who blame my love, that I will love, that face fair cousin, till I die. And when he had ended his verses, he said to his mother, I have no longer a place in my aunt's house, nor among these people, but I will go forth from the palace, and abide in the corners of the city. So he and his mother left the court, and having sought an abode in the neighborhood of the poorer sort, there settled. But she used to go from time to time to King Sasan's palace, and thence take daily bread for herself and her son. As this went on, Kuzia Fakan took her aside one day, and said to her, Alas, O my nanti, how is it with thy son? Replied she, 
O oh, my daughter, sooth to say, he is tearful-eyed and heavy-hearted, being fallen into the net of thy love. And she repeated to her the couplets he had made, whereupon Kuzia Fakan wept and said, By Allah, I rebuked him not for his words, nor for ill-will to him, but because I feared for him the malice of foes. Indeed, my passion for him is double that he feeleth for me. My tongue may not describe my yearning for him, and were it not for the extravagant willfulness of his words and the wanderings of his wit, my father had not cut off from him favors that besit, nor had decreed unto him exclusion and prohibition as fit. However, Men's days bring naught but change, and patience in all case is most becoming. Peradventure he who ordained our severance will vouchsafe us reunion. And she began versifying in these two couplets. O son of mine uncle, same sorrow I bear, and suffer the like of thy cark and thy care. Yet hide I from men that I suffer for pine, hide it too, and such secret to man never bear. When his mother heard this from her, she thanked her and blessed her. Then she left her and acquainted his son with what she had said, whereupon his desire for her increased, and he took heart, being eased of his despair and the turmoil of his love and care. And he said, by Allah, I desire none but her. And he began improvising. Leave this blame, I will list to no flout of my foe. I divulged my secret, was told to me keep. He is lost to my sight, for whose union I yearn. And I watch all the while, he can slumber and sleep. So the days and nights went by, while Skanmakan lay tossing upon coals of fire, till he reached the age of seventeen, and his beauty had waxed perfect, and his wits were at their brightest. One night, as he lay awake, he communed with himself and said, Why should I keep silence till I waste away and see not my lover? Fault have I none save poverty, so by Allah, I am resolved to remove me from this region and wander over the wild of the world. For my position in this city is a torture, and I have no friend nor lover therein to comfort me. Wherefore, I am determined to distract myself by absence from my native land, till I die and take my rest after this shame and tribulation and he began to improvise and recite these couplets. Albeit my vitals quiver neath this ban, before the foe myself I'll never man, so pardon me, my vitals are a writ, whose superscription are my tears that tran. Hey ho, my cousin seemeth hoary way, came down to hurt by reason of Rizwan, Scrape not the dreadful sword lung of her look, Who dares the glancing of those eyes to scan, Over Allah's widespread world I roam and roam, And from such exile win what bread I can, Yes, over broad earth I'll roam and save my soul, All but her absence bearing like a man. With gladsome heart I'll haunt the field of fight, and meet the bravest brave in battle van. So Kammakan fared forth from the palace barefoot, and he walked in a short-sleeved gown, wearing on his head a skull-cap of felt, seven years old, and carrying a scone three days stale, and in the deep gloom of night betook himself to the portal of Al-Arish of Baghdad. Here he waited for the gate being opened, and when it was opened, he was the first to pass through it, 
and he went out at random, and wandered about the wastes, night and day. When the dark hours came, his mother sought him, but found him not, whereupon the word waxed straight upon her for all that it was great and wide, and she took no delight in aught of weal it supplied. She looked for him a first day, and a second day, and a third day, till ten days were past, but no news of him reached her. Then her breast became contracted, and she shrieked and shrilled, saying, O oh my son, O oh my darling, thou hast revived my regrets. Suffice not what I endured, but thou must depart from my home. After thee I care not for food, nor joy in sleep, and naught but tears and mourning are left me. O oh, my son, from what land shall I call thee, and what town hath given thee refuge? Then her sobs burst out, and she began repeating these couplets. Well learnt we, since you left, our grief and sorrow to sustain, while boughs of severance shot their shafts in many a railing rain. They left me, after girding on their cells of Corduane, to fight the very pangs of death while spanned their sandy plain. Mysterious through the nightly gloom there came the moan of dove, a ring dove, and replied I, Cease thy plaint, how darst complain? If by my life her heart, like mine, were full of pain and pine, she had not taxed her neck with ring nor soul with ruddy stain. Fled is mine own familiar friend, bequeathing me a store of parting pang and absence ache to suffer evermore. Then she abstained from food and drink and gave herself up to excessive tear-shedding and lamentation. Her grief became public property far and wide, and all the people of the town and countryside wept with her and cried, Where is thine eye, O Zaw al -Makan? And they bewailed the rigors of time, saying, Would heaven we knew what hath befallen Kanmakan, that he fled his native town, and chased himself from the place where his father used to fill all in hungry case and do justice and grace. And his mother redoubled her weeping and wailing till the news of Kanmakan's departure came to King Sasan. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 7 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Volume 3 Recording by Filippo Joachim Section 8, Volume 3 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Translated by Richard Burton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Filippo Joachim the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3, Section 8 When it was the one hundred and fortieth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that came to King Sasan the tidings of the departure of Kanmakan, through the chief emirs, who said to him, Verily he is the son of our sovereign and the seed of King Omar bin al Nu'uman and it hath reached us that he hath exiled himself from the land. When King Sasan heard these words, he was wroth with them and ordered one of them to be hanged by way of silencing him, whereat the fear of him fell upon the hearts of all the other grandees, and they dared not speak one word. Then he called to mind all the kindness that Zawa Makan had done him, and how he had charged him with the care of his son. Wherefore he grieved for Kanmakan, and said, 
needs must I have searched made for him in all countries. So he summoned Tarkash and bade him choose an hundred horse and wend with them in quest of the prince. Accordingly he went out and was absent ten days, after which he returned and said, I can learn no tidings of him and have hit on no trace of him, nor can any tell me aught of him. Upon this King Sasan repented him of that which he had done by the prince, whilst his mother abode in unrest continual, nor would patience come at her call, and thus passed over her twenty days in heaviness all. This is how it fared with these. But as regards Kanmakan, when he left Baghdad, he went forth perplexed about his case, and knowing not whither he should go. So he fared on alone through the desert for three days, and saw neither footman nor horseman. Withal his sleep fled and his wakefulness redoubled, for he pined after his people and his homestead. He ate of the herbs of the earth and drank of its flowing waters and siested under its trees at hours of noontide heat, till he turned from that road to another way and following it other three days came on the fourth to a land of green leaves, dyed with the hues of plants and trees and with sloping valley sides made to please, abounding with the fruits of the earth. It had drunken of the cups of the cloud, to the sound of thunders rolling loud, and the song of the turtle dove gently sought, till its hills sloped were brightly verdant, and its fields were sweetly fragrant. Then Kanmakan recalled his father's city, Baghdad, and for excess of emotion he broke out into verse. I roam, and roam in hope I to return, yet of returning see not how or when. I went for love of one I could not win, nor way of escaping ills that pressed could ken. When he ended his recital, he wept, but presently he wiped away his tears and ate of the fruits of the earth enough for his present need. Then he made the wuzu ablution and prayed the ordained prayers which he had neglected all this time, and he sat resting in that place through the live-long day. When night came he slept and ceased not sleeping till midnight. When he awoke and heard a human voice declaiming these couplets, What's life to me unless I see the pearly sheen Of teeth I love and sight that glorious mine? Pray for our bishops who in coven train, Vine to bow before that heavenly queen, And death is lighter than the loved one's wrath, Whose phantom haunts me, seen in every scene. O joy of cup companions, when they meet, and loved and lovers over each other lean. Even more in time of spring, the lord of flowers, when fragrant is the word with bloom and green, drainer of vine juice, up with thee, for now earth is a heaven where sweet waters flow. When Kanmakan heard these this teach, his sorrows surged up, his tears ran down his cheeks like freshets and flames of fire darted into his heart. So he rose to see who it was that spake these words, but saw none for the thickness of the gloom, whereupon passion increased on him, and he was frightened, and restlessness possessed him. He descended from his place to the soul of the valley, and walked along the banks of the stream, till he heard the same voice, sighing heavy sighs and reciting these couplets though tis thy wont to hide thy love perforce yet weep on day of parting and divorce twixt me and my dear love were plighted vows 
pledge of reunion, fonder intercourse, with joy inspires my heart and deals it rest. Zephyr, whose coolness doth desire enforce, O Sada, thinks of me that anklet wearer, or parting broke she thought without remorse, and say, Shall night foregather us and we of suffered hardships tell in soft discourse? Quoth she, Thou art daft for us and fay, quoth I, saying thee how many a friend has turned to course. If taste mine eyes sweep sleep while she's away, Allah will loss of her thine eyes a curse. O wounds in vital mine, for cure they lack, Union and dewy lips, sweet theriac. When Kanmakan heard this verse, again spoken by the same voice, yet saw no one, he knew that the speaker was a lover like unto himself, debarred from union with her who loved him, and he said to himself, Twere fitting that this man should lay his head to my head and become my comrade in this my strangerhood. Then he hailed the speaker and cried out to him, saying, O thou who farest in sombre night, draw near to me and tell me thy tale haply thou shalt find me one who will succour thee in thy sufferings. And when the owner of the voice heard these words, he cried out, O thou that respondest to my complaint, and wouldest hear my story, who art thou amongst the knights? Art thou human or genie? Answer me speedily, ere thy death draw near, for I have wandered in this desert some twenty days, and have seen no one, nor heard any voice but thy voice. At these words, Kanmakan said to himself, This one's case is like my case, for I, even I, have wandered twenty days, nor during my wayfare have I seen man or heard voice. And he added, I will make him no answer till day arise. So he was silent, and the voice again called out to him, saying, O thou that callest, if thou be of the jinn, fare in peace, and if thou be man, stay a while, till the day breaks dark, and the night flee with the dark. The speaker abode in his place, and Kanmakan did likewise, and the twain in reciting verses never failed, and wept tears that railed till the light of day began loom, and the night departed with its gloom. Then Kanmakan looked at the other, and found him to be of the Badawi Arabs, a youth in the flower of his age, clad in worn clothes, and bearing in baldric a rusty sword which he kept sheathed, and the signs of love longing were apparent on him. He went up to him and accosted him and saluted him, and the Badawi returned the salute and greeted him with courteous wishes for his long life, but somewhat despised him, seeing his tender years and his condition, which was that of a pauper. So he said to him, O youth, of what tribe art thou, and to whom art thou kin among the Arabs? And what is thy history that thou goest by night after the fashion of knights? Indeed thou spakest to me in the dark words such as are spoken of none but doughty cavaliers and lion-like warriors. And now I hold thy life in hand, but I have compassion on thee by reason of thy green ears. So I will make thee my companion, and thou shalt go with me to do me service. When Kanmakan heard him speak these unseemly words, after showing him such skill in verse, he knew that he despised him and would presume with him. Therefore he answered him with soft and well-chosen speech, saying, O chief of the Arabs, 
leave my tenderness of age and tell me why thou wanderest by night in the desert reciting verses thou talkest i see of my serving thee who then art thou and what moved thee to talk this wise answered he hark ye boy i am saba son of rama bin humam my people are of the arabs of syria and i have a cousin nijma hais who to all that look on her brings delight and when my father died i was brought up in the house of his brother the father of najma but as soon as i grew up and my uncle's daughter became a woman they secluded her from me and me from her seeing that i was poor and without money in pouch then the chief of the arabs and the heads of the tribes rebuked her sire and he was abashed before them and consented to give me my cousin but upon condition that i should bring him as her dower fifty head of horses and fifty dromedaries which travel ten days without a halt and fifty camels laden with wheat and a like number laden with barley together with ten black slaves and ten handmaids thus the weight he set upon me was beyond my power to bear for he exacted more than the marriage settlement as by law established so here am i traveling from syria to iraq and i have passed twenty days without seeing other than myself yet i mean to go to baghdad that i may ascertain what merchant men of wealth and importance start thence then will i fare forth in their track and loot their goods and i will slay their escort and drive off their camels with their loads but what manner of man art thou replied kanmakan thy case is like unto my case save that my evil is more grievous than thine ill for my cousin is a king's daughter and the dowry of which thou hast spoken would not content her people nor would they be satisfied with the like of that from me quoth saba surely thou art a fool or thy wits for excess of passion are gathering wool how can thy cousin be a king's daughter thou hast no sign of royal rank on thee for thou art but a mendicant rejoined kanmakan o chief of the arabs let not this my case seem strange to thee for what happened happened and if thou desire proof of me i am kanmakan son of king zau al makan son of king omar bin al numan lord of baghdad and the realm khorasan and fortune banned me with her tyrant man for my father died and my sultanate was taken by king sasan so i fled forth from baghdad secretly lest i be seen of any man and have wandered twenty days without any but thyself to scan so now i have discovered to thee my case and my story is as thy story and my need as thy need when saba heard this he cried out o oh my joy i have attained my desire i will have no loot this day but thyself for since thou art of the seed of kings and hast come out in beggar's garb there is no help but thy people will seek thee and if they find thee in any one's power they will ransom thee with money's galore so show me thy back o my lad and walk before me answered kanmakan o brother of the arabs act not on this wise for my people will not buy me with silver nor with gold not even with a copper dirham and i am a poor man having with me neither much nor little so cease then to be upon this track and take me to thy comrade fare we forth for the land of iraq and wander over the world 
so haply we may win dower and marriage portion, and we may seek and enjoy our cousins' kisses and embraces when we come back. Hearing this, Saba waxed angry. His arrogance and fury redoubled, and he said, Woe to thee! Dost thou bandy words with me, O vilest of dogs that be? Turn thee thy back, or I will come down on thee with clack. Kanmakan smiled and answered, Why should I turn my back for thee? Is there no justice in thee? Dost thou not fear to bring blame upon the Arab man by driving a man like myself captive, in shame and disdain, before thou hast proved him on the plain, to know if he be a warrior or of cowardly strain? Upon this Saba laughed and replied, By Allah, a wonder, thou art a boy in years told, but in talk thou art old. These words should come from none but a champion doughty and bold. What wantest thou of justice? Quoth Kanmakan, If thou wilt have me thy captive, to wend with thee and serve thee, throw down thine arms and put off thine outer gear and come on and wrestle with me and whichever of us throw his opponent shall have his will of him and make him his boy then saba laughed and said i think this waste of breath denoteth the nearness of thy death then he arose and threw down his weapon and tucking up his skirt drew near unto kanmakan who also drew near, and they gripped each other. But the Badawi found that the other had the better of him, and weighed him down as the quintal down weighs the diner. And he looked at his legs firmly planted on the ground, and saw that they were as two minarets, strongly based, or two tent poles in earth encased, or two mountains which may not be displaced, so he acknowledged himself to be a failure, and repented of having come to wrestle with him, saying to himself, Would I had slain him with my weapon. Then Kanmakan took hold of him, and mastering him, shook him till the Badawi thought his bowels would burst in his belly, and he broke out, Hold thy hand, O oh boy. He heeded not his words but shook him again, and lifting him from the ground, made with him towards the stream, that he might throw him therein. Whereupon the Badawi roared out, saying, O thou valiant man, what wilt thou do with me? Quoth he, I mean to throw thee into this stream, it will bear thee to the Tigris, the Tigris will bring thee to the river Issa, and the Issa will carry thee to the Euphrates, and the Euphrates will land thee in thine own country. So thy tribe shall see thee, and know thy manly cheer, and how thy passion be sincere. Then Saba cried aloud, and said, O champion of the desert lair, do not with me what did the wicked dare, but let me go, by the life of thy cousin, the jewel of the fair. Hearing this, Kanmakan set him on the ground. But when he found himself at liberty, he ran to his sword and targe, and taking them up, stood plotting in himself treachery and sudden assault on his adversary. The prince kenned his intent in his eye, and said to him, I con what is in thy heart. Now thou hast hold of thy sword and thy targe. Thou hast neither length of hand, nor trick of wrestling, but thou thinkest that, were thou on thy mare, and couldst wheel about the plain, and ply me with thy skin, I had long ago been slain. But I will give thee thy requite, so there may be left in thy heart no despite, nor give me the targe and fall on me with thy winger. 
either thou shalt kill me or I shall kill thee. Here it is, answered Sabah, and throwing him the targe, bared his brand and rushed at him sword in hand. Kanmakan hent the buckler in his right and began to fend himself with it while Saba struck at him, saying at each stroke, This is the finishing blow. But he fell harmless enough, for Kanmakam took all of his buckler, and it was waste work, though he did not reply, lacking the wherewithal to strike, and Saba ceased not to smite at him with the saber, till his arm was weary. When his opponent saw this, he rushed upon him, and hugging him in his arm, shook him and threw him to the ground. Then he turned him over on his face and pinioned his elbows behind him with the baldric of his sword, and began to drag him by the feet and to make for the river. Thereupon cried Saba, What wilt thou do with me? O youth, and cavalier of the age, and brave of the plain, where battle rage, answered he, Did I not tell thee that it was my intent to send thee by the river to thy kin and to thy tribe, that thy heart be not troubled for them, nor their hearts be troubled for thee, unless thou miss thy cousin's bride feast? At this Saba shrieked aloud, and wept, and screaming said, Do not thus, O champion of the times brave, let me go and make me one of thy slaves. And he wept, and wailed, and began reciting these verses. I am estranged fro my folk, and estrangements long. Shall I die amid strangers? Ah, would that I can. I die nor my kinsmen shall know where I am slain, die in exile, nor see the dear face of my friend. Thereupon Kanmakan had compassion on him, and said, Make with me a covenant true, and swear me an oath to be a comrade as due, and to bear me company wheresoever I may go. Tis well, replied Saba, and swore accordingly. Then Kanmakan loosed him, and he rose, and would have kissed the prince's hand, but he forbade him that. Then the Badawi opened his scrip, and taking out three barley scones, laid them before Kanmakan, and they both sat down on the bank of the stream to eat. When they had done eating together, they made the lesser ablution, and prayed. After which, they sat talking of what had befallen each of them, from his people and from the shifts of time. Presently said Kamakan, Whither dost thou now intend? Replied Sabah, I purpose to repair to Baghdad, thy native town, and abide there until Allah vouchsafe me the marriage portion. Rejoined the other, Up then, and to the road, I tarry here. So the Badawi farewelled him and took the way for Baghdad, whilst Kanmakan remained behind, saying to himself, O oh my soul, with what face shall I return pauper, poor? Now, by Allah, I will not go back empty handed, and if the Almighty please, I will assuredly work my deliverance. Then he went to the stream and made the wusu washing, and when prostrating, he laid his brow in the dust, and prayed to the Lord, saying, O Allah, Thou who sendest down the dew, and feedest the worm that homes in the stone, I beseech Thee vouchsafe me my livelihood of Thine omnipotence, and the grace of Thy benevolence. Then he pronounced the, the salutation which closes prayer. Yet every road appeared close to him, and while he sat turning right and left, behold, he espied a horseman making towards him with bent back and reins slack. 
he sat upright and after a time reached the prince and the stranger was at the last grasp and made sure of death for he was grievously wounded when he came up the tears streamed down his cheeks like water from the mouth of skins and he said to kanmakan o chief of the arabs take me to thy friendship as long as i live for thou wilt not find my like and give me a little water though the drinking of water be harmful to one wounded especially whilst the blood is flowing and the life with it and if i live i will give thee what shall heal thy penury and thy poverty and if i die mayst thou be blessed for thy good intent now under that horseman was a stallion so noble a rabbit the tongue fails to describe him and as kanmakan looked at his legs like marble shafts he was seized with a longing and said to himself verily the one of this stallion is not to be found in our time then he helped the rider to alight and entreated him in friendly guise and gave him a little water to swallow after which he waited till he had taken rest and addressed him saying who hath dealt thus with thee quoth the rider i will tell thee the truth of the case i am a horse thief and i have busied myself with lifting and snatching horses all my life night and day and my name is Gassan, the plague of every stable and stallion i heard tell of this horse that he was in the land of Rome with King Afridun, where they had named him al Katul and surnamed him al Majnun. So I journeyed to Constantinople for his sake and watched my opportunity, and whilst I was thus waiting, there came out an old woman, one highly honored among the Greeks, and whose word with them is law by name Zat al-Dawahi, a past mistress in all manner of trickery. She had with her this steed and ten slaves, no more, to attend on her and the horse. And she was bound for Baghdad and Khorasan, there to seek King Sasan and to sue for peace and pardon from Ben. So I went out in their track, longing to get the horse, and ceased not to follow them, but was unable to come by the stallion, because of the strict guard kept by the slaves, till they reached this country, and I feared lest they enter the city of Baghdad. As I was casting about to steal the stallion, lo, a great cloud of dust arose on them and walled the horizon. Presently it opened and disclosed fifty horsemen gathered together to waylay merchants on the highway and their captain by name kardash was a lion in daring and dash a furious lion who layeth knights flat as carpets in battle crash and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say end of section 8 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3, Recording by Filippo Joachim Section 9, Volume 3 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Translated by Richard Burton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellie. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3, Section 9. When it was the one hundred and forty-first night, she said, It has reached me, O auspicious king, that the wounded rider spake thus to Kemekin. Then came out the same Kadesh, and fell on the old woman and her man, and bore down upon them, bashing them, 
nor was it long before they bound her and the ten slaves bore off their captives and the horse rejoicing when i saw this i said to myself my pains were in vain nor did i attain my gain however i waited to see how the affair would fare and when the old woman found herself in bonds she wept and said to the captain kadesh o oh, thou doughty champion and furious knight what wilt thou do with an old woman and slaves now that thou hast thy will of the horse and she beguiled him with soft words and she sware that she would send him horses and cattle till he released her and her slaves then he went his way he and his comrades and i followed them till they reached this country and i watched them till at last i found an opportunity of stealing the horse whereupon i mounted him and drawing a whip from my wallet struck him with it when the robbers heard this they came out on me and surrounded me on all sides and shot arrows and cast spears at me whilst i stuck fast on his back and he fended me with hoofs and forehand till at last he bolted out with me from amongst them like an earring shaft or shooting star but in the stress i got sundry grievous wounds and sore and since that time i have passed on his back three days without tasting food or sleeping aught so that my strength is down broad and the world is become to me as naught but thou hast dealt kindly with me and hast shown ruth on me and i see thee naked stark and sorrow hast set on thee its mark yet are signs of wealth and gentle breeding manifest on thee so tell me what and whence art thou and whither art thou pond answered the prince my name is kemmekin son of suolmekin son of king omar bin el newman when my father died and an orphan lot was my fate a base man seized the throne and became king over small and great then he told him all his past from first to last and the horse thief said to him for he pitied him by allah thou art one of high degree and exceeding nobility and thou shalt surely attain a state sublime and become the first cavalier of thy time if thou can lift me on horseback and mount thee behind me and bring me to my own land thou shalt have honour in this world and a reward on the day of band calling to band for i have no strength left to steady myself and if this be my last day the steed is thine alway for thou art worthier of him than any other quoth kemmekin by allah if i could carry thee on my shoulders or share my days with thee i would do this deed without this deed for i am of a breed that loveth to do good and to succour those in need and one kindly action in almighty allah's honour averteth seventy calamities from his doer so make ready to set out and put thy trust in the subtle the all-wise and he would have lifted him on to the horse and fared forward trusting in allah aider of those who seek aid but the horse thief said wait for me a while then he closed his eyes and opening his hands said i testify that there is no god but the god and i testify that mohammed is the apostle of god and he added o glorious one pardon me my mortal sin for none can pardon mortal sins save the immortal and he made ready for death and recited these couplets i have wronged mankind and have ranged like wind over the world and in the wine cups my life has passed i have swam torrent course to be of the horse and my guile's high places on plain have cast much i've tried to win and over much my sin and cut all of my winnings is most and last i had hoped of this deed to gain wish and need but vain was the end of this journey's vast i have stolen through life and my death in strife and was doomed by the lord who does all forecast and i have told these tolls to their fatal end for an orphan a pauper so kiss and friend and when he finished these verses he closed his eyes and opened his mouth then with a single death rattling he left this world thereupon came back and rose and dug a grave and laid him in the dust after which he went up to the steed and kissed him and wiped his face and joyed with exceeding joy saying none has the fellow of this stallion no not even king sassan but such was the case with kemmekin as regards king sassan presently news came to him that vesa dandan had thrown off his allegiance and with him half the army who swore that they would have no king but kemmekin and the minister had bound the troops by a solemn covenant and had gone with them to the islands of india and to berber island and to black island where he had levied armies from far and near like unto the swollen sea from fear and none could tell the hosts when from its rear and the minister was resolved to make for baghdad and take the kingdom in ward and slay every soul who dare retard having sworn not to return the sword of war to its cheese till he had made kenmekin king when these news came to sassan he was drowned in the sea of appeal knowing that the whole state would turn against him great and small and his trouble redoubled and his care became despair 
so he opened his treasuries and distributed his monies among his officers and he prayed for kamekin's return that he might draw his heart to him with fair usage and bounty and make him commander of those troops which ceased not being faithful to him so might he quench the sparks ere they became a flame now when the news of this reached kamekin by the merchants he returned in haste to baghdad on the back of a foresaid stallion and as king sassan sat perplexed upon his throne he heard of the coming of kamekin whereupon he dispatched all the troops and headmen of the city to meet him so all who were in baghdad fared forth and met the prince and escorted him to the palace and kissed the thresholds whilst the damsels and eunuchs went on to his mother and gave her the fair tidings of his return she came to him and kissed him between the eyes but he said to her o oh, mother mine let me go to my uncle king sassan who has overwhelmed me with weal and boon and while he so did all the palace people and headmen marvelled at the beauty of the stallion and said no king is like unto this man so came mac and went into the king sassan and saluted him as he rose to receive him and kissing his hands and feet offered him the horse as a present the king greeted him saying welcome and welcome to my son Kemekin. by allah the world has been straitened on me by reason of thine absence but praise be allah for thy safety and Kemekin called down blessings on him then the king looked at the stallion el katul highs and knew him for the very horse he had seen in such and such a year whilst beleaguering the cross worshippers of constantinople with kemekin's sire suel mekin that time they slew his uncle sherkin so he said to the prince if thy father could have come by this courser he would have bought it with a thousand blood horses but now let the honour return to the honourable we accept the steed and we give him back to thee as a gift for to him thou hast more right than any wit being knightliest of knightliest then king sassan bade bring forth for him dresses of honour and led horses and appointed to him the chief of lodging in the palace and showed him the utmost affection and honour because he feared the issue of the vassal dandan's doings at this kamekin rejoiced and shame and humiliation ceased from him then he went to his horse and going to his mother asked o oh, my mother how is it with the daughter of my uncle answered she by allah o oh, my son my concern for thine absence has distracted me from any other even from thy beloved especially as she was the cause of thy strangerhood and thy separation from me then he complained to her of his case saying o my mother go to her and speak with her haply she will vouchsafe me her sight to see and dispel from me this despondency replied his mother idle desires a base man's necks so put away from thee this thought that can only vex for i will not vent to her nor go into her with such message now when he heard his mother's words he told her what said the horse thief concerning said al dawahi how the old woman was then in the land purposing to make back that and added it was she who slew my uncle and my grandfather and needs must i avenge them by man boat that our reproach be wiped out then he left her and repaired to an old woman a wicked whorish paniculous bedlam by name of sedana and complained to her of his case and of what he suffered for love of his cousin kusir fekin and begged her to go unto her and win her favour for him i hear and i obey answered the old hag and leaving him betook herself to kusir fekin's palace that she might intercede with her in his behalf then she returned to him and said of the truth kusir fekin salutes thee and promises to visit thee this night about midnight and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say End of section 9 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3, recording by Ellie, September 2009. Section 10, Volume 3 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3, Section 10 When it was the one hundred and forty-second night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the old woman came to Kanmakan and said, Of a truth the daughter of thine uncle saluteth thee, and she will visit thee this night about midnight, he rejoiced and sat down to await the fulfilment of his cousin's promise. 
but before the hour of night she came to him wrapped in a veil of black silk and she went in to him and aroused him from sleep saying how canst thou pretend to love me when thou art sleeping heart free and in complete content so he awoke and said by allah o desire of my heart i slept not but in the hope that thine image might visit my dreams then she chid him with soft words and began versifying in these couplets hadst thou been leaf in love's loyalty ne'er hadst suffered sleep to seal those eyne o thou who claimest lover loyalty treading the lover's path of pain and pine by allah o my cousin never yet did eyes of lover sleep such sleep in dine now when he heard his cousin's words he was abashed before her and rose and excused himself then they embraced and complained to each other of the anguish of separation and they ceased not thus till dawn broke and day dispersed itself over the horizon when she rose preparing to depart upon this kanmakan wept and sighed and began improvising these couplets o thou who deignest come at sorest sink whose lips those teeth like necklaced pearls enshrine i kissed him thousand times and clipped his waist and spent the night with cheek to cheek close line till to depart us twain came dawning day like sword edge drawn from sheath in radiant line and when he ended his poetry kuzia fakan took leave of him and returned to her palace now certain of her damsels became aware of her secret and one of these slave girls disclosed it to king sasan who went in to kuzia fakan and drawing his sabre upon her would have slain her but her mother nujat zaman entered and said to him by allah do her no harm for if thou hurt her the report will be noised among the folk and thou shalt become a reproach amongst the kings of the age know thou that kanmakan is no son of adultery but a man of honour and nobility who would not do aught that could shame him and she was reared with him so be not hasty for verily the report is spread abroad among all the palace people and all the folk of baghdad how the wazir dandan hath levied armies from all countries and is on his way hither to make kanmakan king quoth sasan by allah needs must i cast him into such calamity that neither earth shall support him nor sky shall shadow him i did but speak him fair and show him favour because of my lieges and my lords lest they incline to him but right soon shalt thou see what shall betide then he left her and went out to order the affairs of the realm such then was the case with king sasan but as regards kanmakan on the next day he came in to his mother and said o my mother i am resolved to ride forth a raiding and a looting and i will cut the road of caravans and lift horses and flocks negroes and white slaves and as soon as i have collected great store and my case is bettered galore i will demand my cousin kuzia fakan in marriage of my uncle sasan replied she o my son of a truth the goods of men are not ready to hand like a scape camel for on this side of them are sword strokes and lance lungings and men that eat the wild beast and lay countries waste and chase lynxes and hunt lions quoth he heaven forfend that i turn back from my resolve till i have won to my will then he dispatched the old woman to kuzia fakan to tell her that he was about to set out in quest of a marriage settlement befitting her saying to the beldam thou needs must pray her to send me an answer i hear and i obey replied the old woman and going forth presently returned with kuzia fakan's reply which was she will come to thee at midnight so he abode awake till one half of the night was past when restlessness got hold of him and before he was aware she came in to him saying my life be thy ransom from wakefulness and he sprang up to receive her exclaiming o desire of my heart my life be thy redemption from all ills and evils then he acquainted her with his intent and she wept 
but he said weep not o daughter of my uncle for i beseech him who decreed our separation to vouchsafe us reunion and fair understanding then kanmakan having fixed a day for departure went in to his mother and took leave of her after which came he down from his palace and threw the baldric of his sword over his shoulder and donned turbaned and face veil and mounting his horse al katul and looking like the moon at its full, he threaded the streets of Baghdad till he reached the city gate. And behold, here he found Sabah bin Rama coming out of town, and his comrade, seeing him, ran to his stirrup and saluted him. He returned his salutation, and Sabah asked him, O my brother, how camest thou by this good steed and this sword and clothes, whilst I, up to present time, have gotten nothing but my sword and target? Answered Kanmakan, The hunter returneth not but with quarry after the measure of his intention. A little after thy departure, fortune came to me. So now say, wilt thou go with me, and work thine intent in my company, and journey with me in this desert? replied Sabah, by the lord of the Kaaba, from this time forth i will call thee naught but my lord then he ran on before the horse with his sword hanging from his neck and his budget between his shoulder blades and kanmakan rode a little behind him and they plunged into the desert for a space of four days eating of the gazelles and drinking water of the springs on the fifth day they drew near a high hill, at whose foot was a spring encampment, and a deep running stream, and the knolls and hollows were filled with camels and cattle and sheep and horses, and little children played about the pens and folds. When Kanmakan saw this, he rejoiced at the sight, and his breast was filled with delight, so he addressed himself to fight, that he might take the camels and the cattle, and said to Sabah, Come, fall with us upon this loot, whose owners have left it unguarded here, and do we battle for it with near and far, so haply may fall to our lot of good some share. Replied Sabah, O oh my lord, verily they to whom these herds belong be many in number, and among them are doughty horsemen and fighting footmen, and if we venture lives in this daring do, we shall fall into danger great, and neither of us will return safe from this bait. But we shall both be cut off by fate, and leave our cousins desolate. Then Kanmakan laughed, and knew that he was a coward, so he left him and rode down the rise, intent on rapine, with loud cries, and chanting these couplets. O oh, a valiant race are the sons of Nu'uman, Braves whose blades shred heads of the foeman clan, A tribe who, when tried in the tussle of war, Taketh prowess, stand in the battle van, In their tents, safe close, Gabalunzi's ein, Nor his poverty's ugly features scan, And I for their aidance sue of him, Who is king of kings, and made soul of man. Then he rushed upon the she-camels, like a he-camel in rut, and drove all before him, sheep and cattle, horses and dromedaries. Therewith the slaves ran at him with their blades so bright and their lances so long, and at their head rode a Turkish horseman, who was indeed a stout champion, doughty in fray and in battle chance, and skilled to wield the nut-brown lance and the blade with bright glance. He drove at Kanmakan, saying, Woe to thee! Knewest thou to whom these herds belong? Thou hadst not done this deed. Know that they are the goods of the band Grecian, the champions of the ocean, and the troop Circassian. And this troop containeth none but valiant whites, numbering an hundred knights, who have cast off the allegiance of every sultan. But there hath been stolen from them a noble stallion, and they have vowed not to return hence without him. Now when Kanmakan heard these words, he cried out, saying, O oh, villain, this I bestride is the steed whereof ye speak, and after which ye seek, and ye would do battle with me for his sake. So come out against me, all of you at once, and do you dourest for the nonce. 
Then he shouted between the ears of Al Katul, who ran at them like a ghul, whereupon Kanmakan let drive at the Turk, and ran him through the body, and threw him from his horse, and let out his life. After which he turned upon a second, and a third, and a fourth, and also of life bereft them. When the slaves saw this, they were afraid of him, and he cried out and said to them, Ho, oh, sons of whores, drive out the cattle and the stud, or I will dye my spear in your blood. So they untethered the beasts, and began to drive them out, and Sabah came down to Kanmakan with loud voicing and hugely rejoicing, when, lo, there arose a cloud of dust, and grew till it walled the view, and there appeared under of it riders an hundred, like lions and hungered. Upon this Sabah took flight, and fled to the hill's topmost height, leaving the assailable sight, and enjoyed sight of the fight, saying, I am no warrior, but in sport and jest I delight. Then the hundred cavaliers made towards Kanmakan, and surrounded him on all sides, and one of them accosted him, saying, Whither goest thou with this loot? Quoth he, I have made it my prize, and am carrying it away, and I forbid you from it, or come on to the combat, for know ye that he who is before you is a terrible lion, and an honourable champion, and a sword that cutteth wherever it turneth. When the horseman heard these words, he looked at Kanmakan, and saw that he was a knight, like a main-clad lion in might, whilst his face was as the full moon rising on its fourteenth night, and velour shone from between his eyes. Now that horseman was the captain of the hundred horse, and his name was Kahdash. And when he saw in Kanmakan the perfection of Kavalaris, with surpassing gifts of comeliness, his beauty reminded him of a beautiful mistress of his, whose name was Fatin. Now she was one of the fairest of women in face, for Allah had given her charms and grace, and noble qualities of all kind, such as tongue faileth to explain, and which ravish the hearts of men. Moreover, the cavaliers of the tribe feared her prowess, and all the champions of that land stood in awe of her high spirit and she had sworn that she would not marry, nor let any possess her, except he should conquer her in combat, Kahdash being one of her suitors. And she said to her father, None shall approach me, save he be able to deal me overthrow in the field, and stead of war-thrust and blow. Now when this news reached Kahdash, he scorned to fight with a girl, fearing reproach, and one of his intimates said to him, Thou art complete in all conditions of beauty and goodliness, so if thou contend with her, even though she be stronger than thou, thou must needs overcome her, for when she seeth thy beauty and grace, she will be discomfited before thee, and yield thee the victory. For verily women have a need of men, even as thou heedest full plain. Nevertheless Kardash refused, and would not contend with her, and he ceased not to abstain from her thus, till he met from Kanmakan that which hath been set down. Now he took the prince for his beloved Fatin, and was afraid. Albeit indeed she loved him for what she had heard of his beauty and valour. So he went up to him and said, Woe to thee, O Fatin! Thou comest here to show me thy prowess, but now alight from thy steed, that I may talk with thee, for I have lifted these cattle, and have foiled my friends, and waylaid many a brave and man of knightly race, all for the sake of thy beauty of form and face, which are without peer. So marry me now, that king's daughters may serve thee, and thou shalt become queen of these countries. When Kanmakan heard these words, the fires of wrath flamed up in him, and he cried out, Woe to thee, O Persian dog! Leave Fatin and thy trust and mistrust, and come to cut and thrust, for eftsoon thou shalt lie in the dust. And so saying, he began to wheel about him, and assail him, and feel the way to prevail. But when Kardash observed him closely, he knew him for a doughty knight, and a stalwart in fight, and the error of his thought became manifest to him when as he saw the green down on his cheeks dispread like myrtles springing from the heart of a rose bright red 
and he feared his onslaught, and quoth he to those with him, Woe to you! Let one of you charge down upon him, and show him the keen sword and the quivering spear, for know that when many do battle with one man, it is a foul shame, even though he be a Kemperly white, and an invincible knight. Upon this there ran at Kanmakan a horseman like a lion in fight, mounted on a black horse with hooves snow-white, and a star on his forehead, the bigness of a dirham, astounding wit and sight, as he were Abjar, which was Antar's destrier, even as saith of him the poet, The courser chargest on battling foe, mixing heaven on high with the earth down low, as thou the morning had blazed his brow, and he rends her vitals as quid pro quo. He rushed upon Kanmakan, and they wheeled about a while, giving blows and taking blows, such as confound the sprite and dim the sight. But Kanmakan was the first to smite the foe a swashing blow, that rove through turbaned and iron skull-cap, and reached his head, and he fell from his steed with the fall of a camel when he rolleth over. Then a second came out to him, and offered battle, and in like guise a third, a fourth, and a fifth, and he did with them all as he had done with the first. Thereupon the rest at once rushed upon him, for indeed they were roused by rage, and wild with wrath, but it was not long before he had pierced them all with the point of his spear. When Kardash saw these feats of arms, he feared death, for he knew that the youth was stoutest of heart and concluded that he was unique among knights and braves. And he said to Kanmakan, I waive my claim to thy blood, and I pardon thee the blood of my comrades. So take what thou wilt of the cattle, and wend thy ways. For thy firmness in fight moveth my ruth, and life is better for thee than death. Replied Kanmakan, Thou lackest not of the generosity of the noble, but leave this talk, and run for thy life and reck not of blame, nor think to get back the booty, but take the straight path for thine own safety. Thereupon Kardash waxed exceeding wrath, and rage moved him to the cause of his death. So he said to Kanmakan, Woe to thee, and thou knew who I be, thou wouldst not wield these words in the open field. I am the lion to bash, known as Kardash, he who spoileth great kings, and waylayeth all travellings, and seizeth the merchant's preciousest things. And the steed under thee is that I am seeking, and I call upon thee to tell me how thou camest by him, and hast him in thy keeping. Replied Kanmakan, Know thou that this steed was being carried to my uncle, King Sasan, under the escort of an ancient dame, high in rank, attended by ten slaves, when thou fellest upon her, and tookest the horse from her. And I have a debt of blood against this old woman, for the sake of my grandfather, King Omar bin al-Nu'man, and my uncle, King Sharkan. Woe to thee, quoth Kardash! Who is thy father, O thou that hast no lawful mother? Quoth he, Know that I am Kanmakan, bin Zaw al-Makan, son of Omar, bin an numan But when Kardash heard this address, he said, Thy perfection cannot be denied, nor yet the union in thee of knightly virtue and seemly head. And he added, Fare in peace, for thy father showed us favour. Rejoined Kanmakan, by Allah, I will not deign to honour thee, O wretch I disdain, so far as to overcome thee in battle plain. Upon this the Badawi waxed wroth, and they drove at each other, shouting aloud, whilst their horses pricked their ears and raised their tails. And they ceased not clashing together with such a crash that it seemed to each as if the firmament were split in sunder and they continued to strive like two rams which butt, smiting and exchanging with their spears, thrust and cut. Presently Kardash foined at Kanmakan, but he evaded it, and so pierced him through the breast that the spearhead issued from his back. Then he collected the horses and the plunder, and he cried out to the slaves, saying, Up and be driving as hard as ye may. Hearing this, down came Sabah, and accosting Kanmakan, said to him, 
Right well hast thou died, O knight of the age. Verily I prayed Allah for thee, and the Lord heard my prayer. Then he cut off Kardash's head, and Kanmakan laughed and said, Woe to thee, O Sabah! I thought thee a rider fain of fight. Quoth the Badawi, Forget not thy slave in the division of the spoil, so haply therewith I may marry my cousin Najma. Answered Kanmakan, Thou shalt assuredly share in it, but now keep watch over the booty and the slaves. Then he set out for his home, and he ceased not journeying night and day, till he drew near Baghdad city, and all the troops heard of Kanmakan, and saw what was his of loot and cattle and the horse-thief's head on the point of Sabah's spear. Also, for he was a noted highwayman, the merchants knew Kardash's head, and rejoiced, saying, Allah hath rid mankind of him. And they marvelled at his being slain, and blessed his slayer. Thereupon all the people of Baghdad came to Kanmakan, seeking to know what adventures had befallen him. And he told them what had passed, whereupon all men were taken with awe of him, and the knights and champions feared him. Then he drove his spoil under the palace walls, and planting the spear-heel, on whose point was Kardash's head, over against the royal gate, gave largesse to the people of Baghdad, distributing horses and camels, so that all loved him, and their hearts inclined to him. Presently he took Sabah, and lodged him in a spacious dwelling, and gave him a share of the loot, after which he went in to his mother, and told her all that had befallen him in his last journey. Meanwhile the news of him reached the king, who rose from his levee, and shutting himself up with his chief officers, said to them, Know ye that I desire to reveal to you my secret, and acquaint you with the hidden facts of my case? and further know that Kanmakan will be the cause of our being uprooted from this kingdom, our birthplace, for he hath slain Kardash, albeit he had with him the tribes of the Kurds and the Turks, and our affair with him will end in our destruction, seeing that the most part of our troops are his kinsmen, and ye weet what the wazir Dandan hath done, how he disowneth me, after all I have shown him of favours and after being faithful he hath turned traitor. Indeed it hath reached me that he hath levied an army in the provinces, and hath planned to make Kanmakan Sultan, for that the Sultanate was his father's and his grandfather's, and assuredly he will slay me without mercy. Now when the lords of the realm heard from him these words, they replied, O oh, king, verily this man is unequal to this, and did we not know him to have been reared by thee, not one of us would approve of him. And know thou that we are at thy commandment. If thou desire his death, we will do him die, and if thou wilt remove him, we will remove him. Now when King Sasan heard this, he said, Verily to slay him were wise, but needs must ye swear an oath to it. So all swear to slay Kanmakan without giving him a chance, to the end that, when the wazir Dandan should come and hear of his death, his force might be weakened, and he fail of his design. When they had made this compact and covenant with Trim, the king honoured them with the highest honours, and presently retired to his own apartments. But the officers deserted him, and the troops refused their service, and would neither mount nor dismount until they should espy what might befall, for they saw that most of the army was with the wazir Dandan. Presently the news of these things came to Kuzia Fakan, and caused her much concern, so that she sent for the old woman, who was wont to carry messages between her and her cousin, and when she came, bade her go to him and warn him of the plot. Whereto he replied, Bear my salutation to the daughter of my uncle, and say to her, Verily the earth is of Allah, to whom belong might and majesty, and he giveth it as heritage to whomsoever of his servants he willeth. How excellent is the saying of the sayer, Allah holds kingship, whoso seeks without him victory, shall be cast out with soul condemned to hell of low degree. Had I or any other man a finger-breadth of land, the rule were changed, and men a twain of partner-gods would see.
Then the old woman returned to Kuzia Fakan and told her his reply, and acquainted her that he abode in the city. Meanwhile King Sasan awaited his faring forth from Baghdad, that he might send after him some who would slay him, till it befell one morning that Kanmakan went out to course and chase, accompanied by Sabah, who would not leave him night or day. He caught ten gazelles, and among them one that had tender black eyes, and turned right and left. So he let her go, and Sabah said to him, Why didst thou free this gazelle? Kanmakan laughed, and set the others free also, saying, It is only humane to release gazelles that have young, and this one turned not from side to side, save to look for her fawns. So I let her go, and released the others in her honour. Quoth Sabah, Do thou release me, that I may go to my people. At this Kanmakan laughed, and smote him with the spear-butt on the breast, and he fell to the ground, squirming like a snake. Whilst they were thus doing, behold, they saw a dust-cloud spiring high, and heard the tramp of horses, and presently there appeared under it a plump of knights and braves. Now the cause of their coming was this. Some of his followers had acquainted King Sasan with Kanmakan's going out to the chase. So he sent for an emir of the Dalamites called Jamit, and twenty of his horsemen, and gave them money, and bade them slay Kanmakan. So when they drew near the prince, they charged upon him, and he met them in mid-charge, and killed them all, to the last man. And behold, King Sasan took horse, and riding out to meet his people, found them all slain, whereat he wondered and turned back, when, lo, the people of the city laid hands upon him, and bound him straightly. As for Kanmakan, after that adventure, he left the place behind him, and rode onward with Sabah the Badawi. And while he went, lo, he saw a youth sitting at the door of a house on his road, and saluted him. The youth returned his greeting, and going into the house, brought out two platters, one full of soured milk, and the other of brewis swimming in clarified butter. And he set the platter before Kanmakan, saying, Favour us by eating of our victual. But he refused, and quoth the young man to him, what aileth thee, O man, that thou wilt not eat? Quoth Kanmakan, I have a vow upon me. The youth asked, What is the cause of thy vow? And Kanmakan answered, Know that King Sasan seized my kingdom like a tyrant and an enemy, although it was my father's and my grandfather's before me. Yet he became master of it by force after my father's death, and took no count of me by reason of my tender years. So I have bound myself by a vow to eat no man's victual, till I have eased my heart of my foe. Rejoined the youth, Rejoice, for Allah hath fulfilled thy vow. Know that he hath been prisoned in a certain place, and methinks he will soon die. Asked Kanmakan, In what house is he confined? Under yon high dome, answered the other. The prince looked, and saw the folk entering, and buffeting Sasan, who was suffering the agonies of the dying. So he arose, and went up to the pavilion, and noted what was therein, after which he returned to his place, and sitting down to the proffered victual, ate what sufficed him, and put the rest in his wallet. Then he took seat in his own place, and ceased not sitting till it was dark night, and the youth, whose guest he was, slept when he rose and repaired to the pavilion wherein Sasan was confined. Now about it were dogs guarding it, and one of them sprang at him, so he took out of his budget a bit of meat and threw it to him. He ceased not casting flesh to the dogs till he came to the pavilion, and making his way to where King Sasan was, laid his hand upon his head, whereupon he said in a loud voice, Who art thou? He replied, I am Kanmakan, whom thou stravest to kill, but Allah made thee fall into thine evil device. Did it not suffice thee to take my kingdom and the kingdom of my father, but thou must purpose to slay me? And Sasan swore a false oath that he had not plotted his death, and that the brute was untrue. So Kanmakan forgave him, and said to him, Follow me. Quoth he, I cannot walk a single step for weakness. Quoth Kanmakan, 
if the case be thus we will get us two horses and ride forth i and thou and seek the open so he did as he said and he took horse with sasan and rode till daybreak when they prayed the dawn prayer and fared on and ceased not faring till they came to a garden where they sat down and talked then kanmakan rose to sasan and said is aught left to set thy heart against me no by allah replied sasan so they agreed to return to baghdad and sabah the badawi said i will go before you to give folk the fair tidings of your coming then he rode on in advance acquainting women and men with the good news so all the people came out to meet kanmakan with tabrets and pipes and kuzia fakan also came out like the full moon shining in all her splendour of light through the thick darkness of the night so kanmakan met her and soul yearned to soul and body longed for body there was no talk among the people of the time but of kanmakan for the knights bore witness of him that he was the most valiant of the folk of the age and said it is not right that other than kanmakan should be our sultan but the throne of his grandfather shall revert to him as it began meanwhile sasan went in to his wife nujat az zaman who said to him i hear that the folk talk of nothing but kanmakan and attribute to him such qualities as tongue never can he replied hearing of a man is not like seeing a man i have seen him but have noted in him none of the attributes of perfection not all that is heard is said but folk ape one another in extolling and cherishing him and allah maketh his praises to run on the lips of men so that there incline to him the hearts of the people of baghdad and of the wazir dandan that perfidious and treacherous man who hath levied troops from all the lands and taketh to himself the right of naming a king of the country and who chooseth that it shall be under the hand of an orphan ruler whose worth is naught asked nujat az zaman what then is it that thou purposest to do and the king answered i mean to kill him that the wazir may be balked of his intent and return to his allegiance seeing nothing for it but my service quoth she in good sooth perfidy with strangers is a foul thing and how much more with kith and kin the righteous deed to do would be to marry him to thy daughter kuzia fakan and give heed to what was said of old time and fate some person stablish o'er thy head and thou being worthier her choice upbraid yet do him honour due to his estate he'll bring thee weal though far or near thou vade nor speak thy thought of him else shalt thou be of those who self-degrade from honour's grade many harims are lovelier than the bride but time and fortune lent the bride their aid when sasan heard these her words and comprehended what her verse intended he rose from her in anger and said were it not that thy death would bring on me dishonour and disgrace i would take off thy head with my blade and make an end of thy breath quoth she why art thou wroth with me i did but jest with thee then she rose to him and bussed his head and hands saying right is thy foresight and i and thou will cast about for some means to kill him forthright when he heard this he was glad and said make haste and contrive some deceit to relieve me of my grieving for in my sooth the door of devices straightened upon me replied she at once i will devise for thee to do away his life how so asked he and she answered by means of our female slave the so-called bakun now this bakun was past mistress in all kinds of knavery and was one of the most pestilent of old women in whose religion to abstain from wickedness was not lawful she had brought up kuzia fakan and kanmakan who had her in so great affection that he used to sleep at her feet so when king sasan heard his wife name her he said right is this wrecking and sent for the old woman told her what had passed and bade her cast about to kill kanmakan promising her all good replied she thy bidding shall be obeyed 
but i would have thee o my lord give me a dagger which hath been tempered in water of death that i may dispatch him the speedilier for thee quoth sasan and welcome to thee and gave her a hanger that would devance man's destiny now this slave-woman had heard stories and verses and had learnt by rote great store of strange sayings and anecdotes so she took the dagger and went out of the room considering how she could compass his doom then she repaired to kanmakan who was sitting and awaiting news of tryst with the daughter of his uncle kuzia fakan so that night his thought was taken up with her and the fires of love for her raged in his heart and while he was thus behold the slave-woman bakun went in to him and said union time is at hand and the days of disunion are over and gone now when he heard this he asked how is it with kuzia fakan and bakun answered know that her time is wholly taken up with love of thee at this he rose and doffing his outer clothes put them on her and promised her all good then said she know that i mean to pass this night with thee that i may tell thee what talk i have heard and console thee with stories of many passion distraughts whom love hath made sick nay quoth he rather tell me a tale that will gladden my heart and gar my cares depart with joy and good will answered she then she took seat by his side and that poniard under her dress and began to say know thou that the pleasantest thing my ears ever heard was the tale of the hashish eater a certain man loved fair women and spent his substance on them till he became so poor that nothing remained to him the world was straitened upon him and he used to go about the market streets begging his daily bread once upon a time as he went along behold a bit of iron nail pierced his finger and drew blood so he sat down and wiping away the blood bound up his finger then he arose crying out and fared forwards till he came to a hammam and entering took off his clothes and when he looked about him he found it clean and empty so he sat him down by the fountain basin and ceased not pouring water on his head till he was tired and shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day and ceased to say her permitted say End of section 10 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3「Eleven, Volume 3 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3, Section 11. When it was the one hundred and forty-third night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the man sat down by the fountain basin, and ceased not pouring water on his head, till he was tired. Then he went out to the room in which was the cistern of cold water, and seeing no one there, he found a quiet corner, and taking out a piece of hashish, swallowed it. Presently the fumes mounted to his brain, and he rolled over on to the marble floor. Then the hashish made him fancy that a great lord was shampooing him, and that two slaves stood at his head, one bearing a bowl, and the other washing gear, and all the requisites of the hammam. When he saw this, he said in himself, Meseemeth these here be mistaken in me, or else they are of the company of us hashish-eaters. Then he stretched out his legs, and he imagined that the bath-man said to him, O oh, my master, the time of thy going up to the palace draweth near, and it is to-day thy turn of service. At this he laughed, and said to himself, As Allah willeth, O oh Hashish! Then he sat and said nothing, whilst the bath-man arose, and took him by the hand, and girt his middle with a waist-cloth of black silk, after which the two slaves followed him with the bowls and gear, and they ceased not escorting him, till they brought him into a cabinet, wherein they set incense and perfumes a-burning. 
he found the place full of various kinds of fruits and sweet-scented flowers and they sliced him a watermelon and seated him on a stool of ebony whilst the bathman stood to wash him and the slaves poured water on him after which they rubbed him down well and said o oh, our lord sir wazir health to thee for ever then they went out and shut the door on him, and in the vanity of fantasy he arose, and removed the waistcloth from his middle, and laughed till he well nigh fainted. He gave not over laughing for some time, and at last quoth he to himself, What aileth them to address me as if I were a minister, and style me master and sir? Haply they are now blundering, but after an hour they will know me, and say, This fellow is a beggar and take their fill of cuffing me on the neck presently feeling hot he opened the door whereupon it seemed to him that a little white slave and an eunuch came in to him carrying a parcel then the slave opened it and brought out three kerchiefs of silk one of which he threw over his head a second over his shoulders and a third he tied round his waist moreover the eunuch gave him a pair of bath clogs and he put them on after which in came white slaves and eunuchs, and supported him, and he, laughing the while, to the outer hall, which he found hung and spread with magnificent furniture, such as beseemeth none but kings. And the pages hastened up to him, and seated him on the divan. Then they fell to kneading him, till sleep overcame him, and he dreamt that he had a girl in his arms. So he kissed her, and set her between his thighs, then, sitting to her as a man sitteth to a woman, he took yard in hand, and drew her towards him, and weighed down upon her, when, lo, he heard one saying to him, Awake, thou ne'er-do-well! The noon hour is come, and thou art still asleep. He opened his eyes, and found himself lying on the merge of the cold-water tank, amongst a crowd of people all laughing at him, for his prickle was at point, and the napkin had slipped from his middle. So he knew that all this was but a confusion of dreams, and an illusion of hashish. And he was vexed, and said to him who had aroused him, Would thou hadst waited till I had put it in! Then said the folk, Art thou not ashamed, O hashish-eater, to be sleeping stark naked with stiff standing tool? And they cuffed him till his neck was red. Now he was starving, yet forsooth had he savoured the flavour of pleasure in his dream. When Kanmakan heard the bondwoman's tale, he laughed till he fell backward and said to Bakun, O oh, my nurse, this is indeed a rare story and a delectable. I never heard the like of this anecdote. Say me, hast more? Yes, replied she, and she ceased not to tell him merry adventures and laughable absurdities till sleep overcame him. Then she sat by his head till the most part of the night was past, when she said to herself, it is time to profit by the occasion. So she sprang to her feet, and unsheathed the hanger, and rushing up to Kanmakan, was about to cut his throat, when, behold, his mother came in upon the twain. As soon as Bakun saw her, she rose in respect, and advanced to meet her, and fear got hold of her, and she fell a-trembling, as if she had the ague. When his mother looked at her, she marvelled to see her thus, and aroused her son, who awoke and found her sitting at his head. Now the cause of her coming was that Kuzia Fakan overheard the conversation and the concert to kill Kanmakan, and she said to his mother, O wife of my uncle, go to thy son, ere that wicked whore Bakun murder him. And she told her what had passed from first to last. So she fared forth at once, and she thought of naught, and stayed not for aught, till she went in to her son at the very moment when Bakun was about to slay him in his sleep. When he awoke, he said to his mother, O oh, my mother, indeed thou comest at a good time, for nurse Bakun hath been with me this night. Then he turned to Bakun, and asked her, By my life, knowest thou any story better than those thou hast told me? She answered, and where is what I have told thee compared with what I will tell thee? But however better it be, it must be told at another time. Then she rose to depart, hardly believing in her escape, albeit he said, Go in peace, for she perceived by her cunning that his mother knew what had occurred. So she went her way, 
whereupon his mother said to him, O my son, blessed be this night, for that Almighty Allah hath delivered thee from this accursed woman. And how so? inquired he, and she told him the story from beginning to end. Quoth he, O my mother, of a truth the live man findeth no slayer, and though slain he shall not die. But now it were wiser that we depart from amongst these enemies, and let Allah work what he will. So, when day dawned, he left the city, and joined the wazir Dandan, and after his departure certain things befell between King Sasan and Nujat az zaman which compelled her also to quit the city and join herself to them. And presently they were met by all the high officers of King Sasan, who inclined to their party. Then they sat in council together, devising what they should do, and at last all agreed upon a razia into the land of Rum, there to take their revenge for the death of King Omar bin An-Nu'man and his son Sharkan. So they set out with this intent, and after sundry adventures, which it were tedious to tell, as will appear from what follows, they fell into the hands of Rumzan, king of the Greeks. Next morning King Rumzan caused Kanmakan and the wazir Dandan and their company to be brought before him, and when they came he seated them at his side, and bade spread the tables of food. So they ate and drank, and took heart of grace, after having made sure of death, when they were summoned to the king's presence, and they had said to one another, He hath not sent for us but to slay us. And when they were comforted, the king said, In truth I have had a dream, which I related to the monks, and they said, None can expound it to thee, save the wazir Dandan quoth the minister. Weal it was thou didst see in thy dream, O king of the age. Quoth the king, O wazir, I dreamt that I was in a pit which seemed a black well where multitudes were tormenting me, and I would have risen, but when springing up I fell on my feet and could not get out of that same pit. Then I turned and saw therein a girdle of gold, and I stretched out my hand to take it, for when I raised it from the ground, I saw it was two girdles. So I girt my middle with them both, and behold, the girdles became one girdle. And this, O Wazir, is my dream, and what I saw when my sleep was deepest. Said Dandan, O our lord the Sultan, know that this thy dream denoteth thou hast a brother, or a brother's son, or an uncle's son, or other near kinsman of thy flesh and blood, whom thou knowest not, with all he is of the noblest of you all. Now when the king heard these words, he looked at Kanmakan, and Nujat az zaman and Kuzia Fakan, and the wazir Dandan, and the rest of the captives, and said to himself, If I smite these people's necks, their troops will lose heart for the destruction of their chiefs, and I shall be able to return speedily to my realm, lest the kingship pass out of my hands. So, having determined upon this, he called to the sworder, and bade him strike off Kanmakan's head upon the spot, and forthright, when, lo, up came Rumzan's nurse, and said to him, O oh, auspicious king, what purposest thou? quoth he, I purpose slaughtering these prisoners who are in my power, and after that I will throw their heads upon their men, then will I fall upon them. I and all my army in one body, and kill all we can kill, and rout the rest. So will this be the decisive action of the war, and I shall return speedily to my kingdom, ere aught of accident befall among my subjects. When the nurse heard these words, she came up to him, and said in the Frankish tongue, How canst thou prevail upon thyself to slay thine own brother's son, and thy sister, and thy sister's daughter? When he heard this language, he was wroth with exceeding wrath, and said to her, O oh, accursed woman, didst thou not tell me that my mother was murdered, and that my father died by poison? Didst thou not give me a jewel, and say to me, Of a truth this jewel was thy father's? Why didst thou not tell me the truth? Replied she, All that I told thee is true, but my case and thy case are wonderful and my history and thy history are marvellous. My name is Marjana, and thy mother's name was Abriza, 
and she was gifted with such beauty and loveliness and velour that proverbs were made of her and her prowess was renowned among men of war and thy father was king omar bin at numan lord of baghdad and khorasan without doubt or double dealings or denial he sent his son sharkan on a razia in company with this very wazir dandan and they did all that men can but sharkan thy brother who had preceded the force separated himself from the troops and fell in with thy mother queen abriza in her palace and we happened to have sought a place apart in order to wrestle she and i and her other damsels he came upon us by chance while we were in such case and wrestled with thy mother who overcame him by the power of her splendid beauty and by her prowess then she entertained him five days in her palace till the news of this came to her father by the old woman shawahi surnamed zatta dawahi whereupon she embraced al-islam at the hands of sharkan and he took her and carried her by stealth to baghdad and with her myself and Rihanab and twenty other damsels all of us having like her followed the true faith when we came into the presence of thy father the king omar bin at numan and he saw thy mother queen abriza he fell in love with her and going in unto her one night had connection with her and she conceived by him and became with child of thee now thy mother had three jewels which she presented to thy father and he gave one of them to his daughter nujat al zaman another to thy brother zau al makan and the third to thy brother sharkan this last thy mother took from sharkan and kept it for thee but as the time of her delivery drew near she yearned after her own people and disclosed to me her secret so i went to a black slave called al ghazban and privily telling him our case bribed him to go with us accordingly the negro took us and fled the city with us thy mother being near her time but as we approached a desert place on the borders of our own country the pangs of labour came upon thy mother then the slave proved himself a lustful villain and approaching her sought of her a shameful thing whereupon she cried out at him with a loud cry and was sore affrighted at him in the excess of her fright she gave birth to thee at once and at that moment there arose in the direction of our country a dust cloud which towered and flew till it walled the view thereupon the slave feared for his life so he smote queen abriza with his sword and slew her in his fury then mounting his horse he went his way soon after his going the dust lifted and discovered thy grandfather king hardub lord of grecia land who seeing thy mother and his daughter lying slain on the plain was sorely troubled with a distress that redoubled and questioned me of the manner of her death and the cause of her secretly quitting her father's realm so i told him all that had passed first and last and this is the cause of the feud between the people of the land of the greeks and the people of the city of baghdad then we bore off thy murdered mother and buried her and I took thee, and reared thee, and hung about thy neck the jewel which was with Queen Abriza. But when, being grown up, thou camest to man's estate, I dared not acquaint thee with the truth of the matter, lest such information stir up a war of blood revenge between you. Moreover, thy grandfather had enjoined me to secrecy, and I could not gainsay the commandment of thy mother's father, Hardub, king of the Greeks. This, then, is the cause of my concealment, and the reason why I forbore to inform thee that thy father was King Omar bin at Nu'man. But when thou camest to the throne, I told thee what thou knowest, and I durst not reveal to thee the rest till this moment, O King of the Age. So now I have discovered to thee my secret and my proof, and I have acquainted thee with all I know, and thou reckest best what is in thy mind. Now all the captives had heard the slave-woman Marjana, nurse to King Rumzan, speaking as she spake, when Nujat az zaman without stay or delay, cried out, saying, This King Rumzan is my brother by my father, King Omar bin at Nu'man, and his mother was Queen Abriza, daughter of King Hardub, 
lord of the Greeks, and I know this slave woman, Marjana, right well. With this, trouble and perplexity got hold upon Rumzan, and he caused Nujat az Zaman to be brought up to him forthright. When he looked upon her, blood yearned to blood, and he questioned her of his history. She told him the tale, and her story tallied with that of Marjana, his nurse. Whereupon the king was assured that he was, indeed and without a doubt, of the people of Iraq, and that King Omar bin an Man was his father. So, without losing time, he caused his sister to be unpinioned, and Nujat az Zaman came up to him and kissed his hands, whilst her eyes ran over with tears. The king wept also to see her weeping, and brotherly love possessed him, and his heart yearned to his brother's son, Sultan Kanmakan. So he sprang to his feet, and taking the sword from the sworder's hands, whereat the captives made sure of death, he caused them to be set close to him, and he cut their bonds with the blades, and said to his nurse, Marjana, Explain the matter to this company, even as thou hast explained it to me. Replied she, O king, know that this shaykh is the wazir Dandan, and he is the best of witnesses to my story, seeing that he knoweth the facts of the case. Then she turned to the captives, and repeated the whole story to them, on the spot and forthright, and in presence of the kings of the Greeks, and the kings of the Franks. Whereupon Queen Nujat az Zaman, and the Wazir Dandan, and all who were prisoners with them, confirmed her words. When Marjana, the bondwoman, had finished, chancing to look at Sultan Kanmakan, she saw on his neck the third jewel fellow to the two which were with Queen Abriza, and recognising it she cried so loud a cry that the palace re-echoed it, and said to the king, O oh, my son, know that now my certainty is still more assured, for this jewel that is about the neck of yonder captive is the fellow to that I hung to thy neck, and these being the two, this captive is indeed thy brother's son, Kanmakan. Then the slave woman, Marjana, turned to Kanmakan and said to him, Let me see that jewel, O king of the age. So he took it from his neck and handed it to her. Then she asked Nujat az Zaman of the third jewel, and she gave it to her. And when the two were in her hand, she delivered them to King Rumzan, and the truth and proof were made manifest to him, and he was assured that he was indeed Sultan Kanmakan's uncle and that his father was King Omar bin an Nu'man. So he arose at once, and on the spot, and going up to the wazir Dandan, threw his arms round his neck. Then he embraced King Kanmakan, and the twain cried a loud cry for excess of joy. The glad news was blazed abroad without delay, and they beat the tabrets and cymbals, whilst the shawm sounded, and the people held high festival. The armies of Iraq and Syria heard the clamour of rejoicing among the Greeks, so they mounted to the last man, and King Zibl Khan also took horse, saying to himself, Would I knew what can be the cause of this clamour and rejoicing in the army of the Franks and the Greeks. Then the army of Iraq dight itself for fight, and advanced into the plain and place of Cut and Foyne. Presently King Rumzan turned him round and saw the army deployed, and in preparing for battle employed, so he asked the cause thereof, and was told the state of the case. Thereupon he bade his niece and brother's daughter, Kuzia Fakan, return at once and forthright to the troops of Syria and Iraq, and acquaint them with the plight that had betided, and how it was come to light that King Rumzan was uncle to Sultan Kanmakan. She set out, putting away from her sorrows and troubles, and, coming to King Zibl Khan, saluted him, and told him all that had passed of the good accord, and how King Rumzan had proved to be her uncle, and uncle of Kanmakan. And when she went in to him, she found him tearful-eyed, in fear for the captive emirs and princes. But when he heard what had passed, from first to last, the Muslim's sadness was abated, and they joyed with the more gladness. 
Then King Zibl Khan and all his officers and his retinue took horse and followed Princess Guzia Farkan till they reached the pavilion of King Rumzan, and when entering they found him sitting with his nephew, Sultan Kanmakan. Now he had taken counsel with the Wazir Dandan concerning King Zibl Khan, and had agreed to commit to his charge the city of Damascus of Sham, and leave him king over it, as he before had been, while they themselves entered Iraq. Accordingly they confirmed him in the viceroyalty of Damascus of Syria, and bade him set out at once for his government. So he fared forth with his troops, and they rode with him a part of the way to bid him farewell. Then they returned to their own places, whereupon the two armies foregathered, and gave orders for the march upon Iraq. But the kings said one to other, Our hearts will never be at rest, nor our wrath cease to rage, till we have taken our reek of the old woman Shawahi, surnamed Zatta Dawahi, and wiped away our shame and blot upon our honour. Thereupon King Rumzan and his nephew set out, surrounded by their nobles and grandees. And indeed Kanmakan rejoiced in his uncle, King Rumzan, and called down blessings on Nurse Marjana, who had made them known to each other. They fared on, and ceased not faring, till they drew near their home Baghdad, and when the chief chamberlain, Sasan, heard of their approach, he came out to meet them, and kissed the hand of King Rumzan, who bestowed on him a dress of honour. Then the king of Rum sat down on the throne, and seated by his side his nephew, Sultan Kanmakan, who said to him, O my uncle, this kingdom befitteth none but thee. Replied Rumzan, Allah be my refuge, and the Lord forbid that I should supplant thee in thy kingdom. Upon this the wazir Dandan counselled them to share the throne between the two, ruling each one day in turn and with this they were well satisfied. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 11 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3「Section twelve, volume three of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, volume three, section twelve. When it was the one hundred and forty-fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the two kings agreed each to rule one day in turn. Then made they feasts, and offered sacrifices of clean beasts, and held high festival. And they abode thus a while, whilst Sultan Kanmakan spent his nights with his cousin Kuzia Fakan. And after that period, as the two kings sat rejoicing in their condition, and in the happy ending of their troubles, behold, they saw a cloud of dust arise, and tower till it walled the world from their eyes, and out of it came a merchant shrieking and crying aloud for succour, and saying, O kings of the age, how cometh it that I woned safely in the land of the infidels, and I am plundered in your realm? though it be the biding-place of justice and peace. Then King Rumzan went up to him and questioned him of his case, and he replied, I am a merchant, and like other merchants I have been long absent from my native land, travelling in far countries for some twenty years, and I have a patent of exemption from the city of Damascus, which the viceroy, King Shar Khan, who hath found mercy, wrote me for the cause that I had made him gift of a slave-girl. Now, as I was drawing near my home, having with me an hundred loads of rarities of Hind, when I brought them near Baghdad, which be the seat of your sovereignty, and the place of your peace and your justice, 
out there came upon me wild arabs and kurds in band gathered together from every land and they slew my many and they robbed my money and this is what they have done me then the trader wept in presence of king rumzan saying that he was an old man and infirm and he bemoaned himself till the king felt for him and had compassion on him and likewise did king kanmakan and they swore that they would sally forth upon the thieves so they set out amid an hundred horse each reckoned worth thousands of men and the merchant went before them to guide them in the right way and they ceased not faring on all that day and the livelong night till dawn-break when they came to a valley abounding in rills and shady with trees here they found the foray dispersed about the valley having divided that merchant's bales among them but there was yet some of the goods left so the hundred horsemen fell upon them and surrounded them on all sides and king rumzan shouted his war-cry and thus also did his nephew kanmakan and ere long they made prize of them all to the number of near three hundred horsemen banded together of the refuse of rascality they took what they could find of the merchant's goods and binding them tightly brought them to baghdad where king rumzan and his nephew king kanmakan sat down together on one throne and passing the prisoners in review before them questioned them of their case and their chiefs they said we have no chiefs but these three men and it was they who gathered us together from all corners and countries the kings said to them point out to us your headman and when this was done they bade lay hands on the leaders and set their comrades free after taking from them all the goods in their possession and restoring them to the merchant who examined his stuffs and monies and found that a fourth of his stock was missing the kings engaged to make good the whole of his loss whereupon the trader pulled out two letters one in the handwriting of sharkan and the other in that of nujat az zaman for this was the very merchant who had bought nujat az zaman of the badawi when she was a virgin and had forwarded her to her brother sharkan and that happened between them which happened hereupon king kanmakan examined the letters and recognized the handwriting of his uncle sharkan and having heard the history of his aunt nujat az zaman he went into her with the second letter written by her to the merchant who had lost through her his monies kanmakan also told her what had befallen the trader from first to last she knew her own handwriting and recognizing the merchant dispatched to him guest gifts and commended him to her brother and nephew who ordered him largesse of money and black slaves and pages to wait on him besides which nujat az zaman sent him an hundred thousand dirhams in cash and fifty loads of merchandise and presented to him other rich presents then she sent for him and when he came she went up to him and saluted him and told him that she was the daughter of king omar bin an nu'man and that her brother was king rumzan and that king kanmakan was her nephew thereupon the merchant rejoiced with great joy and congratulated her on her safety and on her reunion with her brother and kissed her hands thanking her for her bounty and said to her by allah a good deed is not lost upon thee then she withdrew to her own apartment and the trader sojourned with them three days after which he took leave of them and set out on his return march to the land of syria thereupon the two kings sent for the three robber chiefs who were of the highwaymen and questioned them of their case when one of them came forward and said know ye that i am a badawi who am wont to lie in wait by the way to snatch small children and virgin girls and sell them to merchants and this i did for many a year until these latter days when satan incited me to join yon two gallows birds in gathering together all the riff-raff of the arabs and other peoples that we might plunder merchandise and waylay merchants said the kings tell us the rarest of the adventures that have befallen thee in kidnapping children and maidens replied he o kings of the age 
the strangest thing that happened to me was that one day two and twenty years ago i snatched a girl who belonged to the holy city she was gifted with beauty and comeliness despite that she was but a servant and was clad in threadbare clothes with a piece of camlet cloth on her head so i entrapped her by guile as she came out of the caravanserai and at that very hour mounting her on a camel made off with her thinking to carry her to my own people in the desert and there set her to pasture the camels and gather their droppings in the valley but she wept with so sore weeping that after coming down upon her with blows i took her and carried her to damascus city where a merchant saw her with me and being astounded at her beauty and marvelling at her accomplishments wished to buy her of me and kept on bidding me more and more for her till at last i sold her to him for an hundred thousand dirhams after selling her i heard her display prodigious eloquence and it reached me that the merchant clothed her in handsome gear and presented her to the viceroy of damascus who gave him three times the price which he had paid to me and this price by my life was but little for such a damsel this o kings of the age is the strangest thing that ever befell me when the two kings heard her story they wondered thereat but when nuzhat az zaman heard what the badawi related the light became darkness before her face and she cried out and said to her brother rumzan sure and sans doubt this is the very badawi who kidnapped me in the holy city jerusalem then she told them all that she had endured from him in her strangerhood of hardship blows hunger humiliation contempt adding and now it is lawful for me to slay him so saying she seized a sword and made at him to smite him and behold he cried out and said o kings of the age suffer her not to slay me till i have told you the rare adventures that have betided me and her nephew kanmakan said to her o my aunt let him tell us his tale and after that do with him as thou wilt so she held her hand and the king said to him now let us hear thy history quoth he o kings of the age if i tell you a rare tale will ye pardon me yes answered they then the badawi robber chief began the tale of hamad the badawi and he said know ye that a short while ago i was sore wakeful one night and thought the morn would never dawn so as soon as it was break of day i rose without stay or delay and slinging over my shoulder my sword mounted horse and set my lance in rest then i rode out to sport and hunt and as i went along a company of men accosted me and asked me whither i was bound i told them and they said we will keep thee company so we all fared on together and whilst we were faring lo and behold up started an ostrich and we gave her chase but she escaped our pursuit and spreading wings ceased not to fly before us and we following by sight till she lost us in a desert wherein there was neither grass nor water nor heard we aught therein save hiss of snake and wail of jinn and howl of rull and when we reached that place the ostrich disappeared nor could we tell whether she had flown up into the sky or into the ground had gone down then we turned our horses heads and thought to return but found that to retrace our steps at that time of burning heat would be toilsome and dangerous for the sultry air was grievous to us so that we thirsted with sore thirst and our steeds stood still we made sure of death but while we were in this case we suddenly espied from afar a spacious mead where gazelles were frisking therein was a tent pitched and by the tent side a horse tethered and a spear was planted with head glittering in the sun upon this our hearts revived after we had despaired and we turned our horses heads towards that tent making for the meadow and the water which irrigated it and all my comrades fared for it and i at their head and we ceased not faring till we reached the mead then we alighted at the spring and watered our beasts but i was seized with a fever of foolish curiosity and went up to the door of that tent 
wherein I saw a young man, without hair on his cheeks, who fellowed the new moon, and on his right hand was a slender wasted maid, as she were a willow wand. No sooner did I set my eyes on her than love got hold of my heart, and I saluted the youth, who returned my greeting. Then said I, O oh, my brother, tell me who thou art, and what to thee is this damsel sitting by thy side? Thereupon the youth bent his head groundwards a while, then raised it, and replied, Tell me first who thou art, and what are these horsemen with thee? Answered I, I am Hamad, son of Al-Fazari, the renowned knight, who is reckoned among the Arabs as five hundred horse. We went forth from our place this morning to sport and chase, and were overcome by thirst. So I came to the door of this tent, thinking haply to get of thee a draught of water. When he heard these my words, he turned to the fair maiden, and said, Bring this man water, and what food there is ready. So she arose, trailing her skirts, whilst the golden bangles tinkled on her ankles, and her feet stumbled in her long locks, and she disappeared for a little while. Presently she returned, bearing in her right hand a silver vessel full of cold water, and in her left hand a bowl brimming with milk and dates, together with some flesh of wild cattle. But I could take of her nor meat nor drink for the excess of my passion and I applied to her these two couplets, saying, It was as though the sable dye upon her palms were raven perching on a swathe of freshest snow. Thou seest sun and moon conjoined in her face, while sun fear-dimmed and moon fright-pallid show. After I had eaten and drunk, I said to the youth, Know thou, O chief of the Arabs, that I have told thee in all truth who and what I am, and now I would fain have thee do the like by me, and tell me the truth of thy case. Replied the young man, As for this damsel, she is my sister. Quoth I, It is my desire that thou give me her to wife of thy free will, else I will slay thee and take her by force. Upon this he bowed his heads groundwards a while. Then he raised his eyes to me, and answered, Thou sayest sooth in avouching thyself a renowned knight, and famed in fight, and verily thou art the lion of the desert. But if ye all attack me treacherously, and slay me in your wrath, and take my sister by force, it will be a stain upon your honour. An you be, as ye aver, cavaliers who are counted among the champions, and wreck not the shock of foray and fray, Give me a little time to don my armour, and sling on my sword, and set lance in rest, and mount war-steed. Then will we go forth into the field of fight, I and you, and if I conquer you, I will kill you to the last man. But if you overcome me, and slay me, this damsel, my sister, is yours. Hearing such words, I replied, This is only just, and we oppose it not. Then I turned back my horse's head for my love for the damsel waxed hotter and hotter, and returned to my companions, to whom I set forth her beauty and loveliness, as also the comeliness of the young man who was with her, together with his velour and strength of soul, and how he had avouched himself a match for a thousand horse. Moreover, I described to my company the tent and all the riches and rarities therein, and said to them, Know ye that this youth would not have cut himself off from society, and have taken up his abode alone in this place, were he not a man of great prowess? So I propose that whoso slayeth the younker shall take his sister. And they said, This contenteth us. Then my company armed themselves, and mounting, rode to the tent, where we found that the young man had donned his gear, and backed his steed. But his sister ran up to him her veil being drenched with tears, and took hold of his stirrup, and cried out, saying, Alas! and, Woe! worth the day! in her fear for her brother, and recited these couplets. To Allah will I make my moan of travail and of woe. Maybe Illa of Arsh will smite their faces with affright. Fain would they slay thee, brother mine, with purpose fell and fell. All be no cause of vengeance was, nor fault for went the fight. 
yet for a rider art thou known to those who back the steed and twixt the east and west of knights thou art the prowess knight thy sister's honour thou shalt guard though little might be hers for that her brother and for thee she sueth allah's might then let not enemy possess my soul nor thrall my frame and work on me their will and treat thy sister with despite i'll ne'er abide by allah's truth in any land or home where thou art not though dight it be with joyance and delight for love and yearning after thee myself i fain will slay and in the gloomy darksome tomb spread bed upon the clay but when her brother heard her verse he wept with sore weeping and turned his horse's head towards his sister and made this answer to her poetry stand by and see the daring do which i to-day will show when meet we and i deal them blows that rend and cleave and split in though rush out to seek about the lion of the war the stoutest hearted brave of all and eke the best in wit to him i'll deal without delay a sa'alabian blow and die my cane spears joint in blood by wound of foe bespit if all i beat not off from thee or sister may this frame be slain and cast my corpse to birds for so it would befit yes for thy dearest sake i'll strike my blows with might and main and when we're gone shall this event in many a book be writ and when he had ended his verse he said o oh, my sister give ear to what i shall enjoin on thee whereto she replied hearkening and obedience quoth he if i fall let none possess thy person and thereupon she buffeted her face and said allah forbid o my brother that i should see thee laid low and yield myself to the foe with this the youth put out his hand to her and withdrew her veil from her face whereupon it shone forth as the sun shineth out from the white clouds then he kissed her between the eyes and bade her farewell after which he turned to us and said holla knights come ye as guests or crave ye cuts and thrusts if ye come to us as your hosts rejoice ye in the guest right and if ye covet the shining moon come ye out against me night by night into this plain and place of fight thereupon rushed out to him a doughty rider and the young man said to him tell me thy name and thy father's name for I am under an oath not to slay any whose name tallies with mine, and whose father's name is that of my father. And if this be the case with thee, I will give thee up the maid. Quoth the horseman, My name is Bilal. And the young man answered him, saying, Thou liest when speaking of benefits, while thou comest to front with thine evilest will, and of prowess that prow to my words give ear i'm he who makes champions in battlefield reel with keen blade like the horn of the cuspid moon so where thrust thee shall drill through the duress hill then they charged down each at each and the youth thrust his adversary in the breast so that the lance head issued from his back with tints another came out and the youth cried ho oh, thou hound who art rotten with foulness in grain what high meed is there easy for warrior to gain tis none save the lion of strain purest pure who uncareth for life in the battle plain nor was it long before the youth left him drowned in his blood and cried out who will come forth to me so a third horseman rushed out upon the youth and began saying to thee come I forth with my heart aflame, And summon my friends and my comrades by name. When thou slewest the chief of the Arabs this day, This day thou remainest the pledge of my claim. Now when the youth heard this, he answered him in these words, Thou liest, O foulest of Satans that are, And with easings calumnious thou comest to war. This day thou shalt fall by a death-dealing point, where the lances lunge and the scimitars jar then he so foined him in the breast that the spear-point issued from his back and he cried out saying oh will none come out 
so a fourth fared forwards and the youth asked him his name and he answered my name is hilal the new moon and the youth began repeating thou hast failed who would sink me in ruin sea thou who camest in malice with perfidy i whose verses hast heard from the mouth of me will ravish thy soul though unknown to thee then they drave at each other and delivered two cuts but the youth's stroke devanced that of the rider his adversary and slew him and thus he went on to kill all who sallied out against him now when i saw my comrade slain i said to myself if i go down to fight with him i shall not be able to prevail against him and if i flee i shall become a byword of shame among the arabs but the youth gave me no time to think for he ran at me and dragged me from my saddle and hurled me to the ground i fainted at the fall and he raised his sword designing to cut off my head but i clung to his skirts and he lifted me in his hand as though i were a sparrow when the maiden saw this she rejoiced in her brother's prowess and coming up to him kissed him between the eyes then he delivered me to her saying take him and look to him and entreat him hospitably for he is come under our rule so she took hold of the collar of my hauberk and led me away by it as one would lead a dog then she did off her brother's coat of mail and clad him in a robe and set for him a stool of ivory on which he sat down and she said to him allah whiten thy honour and prevent from thee the shifts of fortune and he answered her with these couplets my sister said as saw she how i stood in fight when sun-rays lit my knightly hood allah sane thee for a brave of braves to whom in vale bow lions howso would quoth i go ask the champions of my case when feared the lords of war my warrior mood my name is famed for fortune and for force and soared my spirit to such altitude ho oh, thou hamad a lion hast upstirred shall show thee speedy death like viper brood now when i heard his verse i was perplexed as to my case and considering my condition and how i was become a captive i was lowered in my own esteem then i looked at the damsel his sister and seeing her beauty i said to myself "'Tis she who caused all this trouble. "'And I fell a-marvelling at her loveliness, "'till the tears streamed from my eyes, "'and I recited these couplets. "'Dear friend, I'll leave thy loud reproach and blame. "'Such blame but irks me, yet may not alarm. "'I'm clean distraught for one whom saw I not, "'without her winning me by winsome charm. "'Yestreen her brother crossed me in her love, a brave stout-hearted and right long of arm then the maiden set food before her brother and he bade me eat with him whereat i rejoiced and felt assured that i should not be slain and when he had ended eating she brought him a flagon of pure wine and he applied him to it till the fumes of the drink mounted to his head and his face flushed red then he turned to me and said woe to thee o hamad dost thou know me or not replied i by thy life i am rich in naught save ignorance quoth he o oh, hamad i am abad bin tamim bin Sa'laba, and indeed allah giveth thee thy liberty and leadeth thee to a happy bride and spareth thee confusion then he drank to my long life and gave me a cup of wine and i drank it off and presently he filled me a second and a third and a fourth and i drained them all while he made merry with me and swore me never to betray him so i swear to him one thousand five hundred oaths that i would never deal perfidiously with him at any time but that i would be a friend and a helper to him thereupon he bade his sister bring me ten suits of silk so she brought them and laid them on my person and this dress i have on my body is one of them moreover he made bring one of the best of his she dromedaries carrying stuffs and provant he bade her also bring a sorrel horse and when they were brought he gave the whole of them to me i abode with them three days eating and drinking and what he gave me of gifts is with me to this present at the end of the three days he said to me o hamad o my brother 
I would sleep a while and take my rest, and verily I trust my life to thee. But if thou see horsemen making hither, fear not, for know that they are of the Banu Sa'laba, seeking to wage war on me. Then he laid his sword under his head pillow and slept. And when he was drowned in slumber, Iblis tempted me to slay him. So I arose in haste, and drawing the sword from under his head, dealt him a blow that made his head fall from his body. But his sister knew what I had done, and rushing out from within the tent, threw herself on his corpse, rending her raiment, and repeating these couplets. To kith and kin bear thou sad tidings of our plight, from doom, though wise decreed, shall none of men take flight. Lo, art thou laid, O brother, strewn upon the stones, With face that mirrors moon, when shining brightest bright. Good sooth, it is a day accursed, thy slaughter day, Shivering thy spear that won the day in many a fight. Now thou be slain, no rider shall delight in steed, nor man-child shall the breeding woman bring to light. This morn Hamad uprose, and foully murdered thee, falsing his oath and troth with foulest perjury. When she had ended her verse, she said to me, O oh, thou of accursed forefathers, wherefore didst thou play my brother false, and slay him, when he purposed returning thee to thy native land with provisions? and it was his intent also to marry thee to me at the first of the month. Then she drew a sword she had with her, and planting the hilt in the earth, with the point set to her breast, she bent over it, and threw herself thereon, till the blade issued from her back, and she fell to the ground, dead. I mourned for her, and wept, and repented, when repentance availed me naught. Then I rose in haste, and went to the tent, and taking whatever was light of load, and weighty of worth, went my way. But in my haste and horror I took no heed of my dead comrades, nor did I bury the maiden and the youth. And this my tale is still more wondrous than the story of the serving girl I kidnapped from the holy city Jerusalem. But when Nujat az zaman heard these words from the Badawi, the light was changed in her eyes to night and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 12 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3section 13 volume 3 of the book of a thousand nights and a night translated by richard burton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for further information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the book of a thousand nights and a night volume 3 section 13 when it was the one hundred and forty-fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Nujat az zaman heard these words from the Badawi, the light was changed in her eyes to night, and she rose, and drawing the sword, smote Hamad the Arab between the shoulder-blades, so that the point issued from the apple of his throat. And when all present asked her, why hast thou made haste to slay him? She answered, Praised be Allah, who hath granted me in my life-tide to avenge myself with mine own hand. And she bade the slaves drag the body out by the feet, and cast it to the dogs. Thereupon they turned to the two prisoners who remained of the three, and one of them was a black slave, so they said to him, What is thy name, fellow? Tell us the truth of thy case. He replied, as for me, my name is Al-Razban, and acquainted them what had passed between himself and Queen Abriza, daughter of King Hardub, Lord of Greece, and how he had slain her and fled. Hardly had the negro made an end of his story, when King Rumzan struck off his head with a scimitar, saying, Praise to Allah who gave me life! I have avenged my mother with my own hand. 
Then he repeated to them what his nurse, Marjana, had told him of this same slave, whose name was Al-Ghazban. After which they turned to the third prisoner. Now this was the very camel-driver, whom the people of the holy city Jerusalem hired to carry Zaw al-Makan, and lodge him in the hospital at Damascus of Syria. But he threw him down on the ashes midden, and went his way. And they said to him, Acquaint us with thy case, and tell the truth. So he related to them all that had happened to him with Sultan Zaw al-Makan, how he had been carried from the holy city at the time when he was sick, till they made Damascus, and he had been thrown into the hospital. How also the Jerusalem folk had paid the camelier money to transport the stranger to Damascus, and he had taken it, and fled after casting his charge upon the midden, by the side of the ash-heap of the hammam. But when he ended his words, Sultan Kanmakam took his sword forthright, and cut off his head, saying, Praised be Allah, who hath given me life, that I might requite this traitor what he did with my father, for I have heard this very story from King Zaw al-Makan himself. Then the king said each to other, it remaineth only for us to wreak our revenge upon the old woman Shawahi, yclept Zat Adawahi, because she is the prime cause of all these calamities, and cast us into adversity on this wise. Who will deliver her into our hands, that we may avenge ourselves upon her, and wipe out our dishonour? And King Rumzan said, Needs must we bring her hither. So, without stay or delay, he wrote a letter to his grandmother, the aforesaid ancient woman, giving her to know therein that he had subdued the kingdoms of Damascus and Mosul and Iraq, and had broken up the host of the Muslims, and captured their princes, adding, I desire thee of all urgency to come to me, bringing with thee Queen Sophia, daughter of King Afridun, and whom thou wilt of the Nazarene chiefs but no armies, for the country is quiet and wholly under our hands. And when she read the letter, and recognised the handwriting of King Rumzan, she rejoiced with great joy, and forthright equipping herself and Queen Sophia, set out with their attendants, and journeyed, without stopping, till they drew near Baghdad. Then she foresent a messenger to acquaint the king of her arrival, whereupon quoth Rumzan, we should do well to don the habit of the Franks, and fare forth to meet the old woman, to the intent that we may be assured against her craft and perfidy. Whereto Kanmakan replied, Hearing is consenting. So they clad themselves in Frankish clothes, and, when Kuzia Fakan saw them, she exclaimed, By the truth of the Lord of Worship, did I not know you, I should take you to be indeed Franks. Then they sallied forth with a thousand horse, King Rumzan riding on before them to meet the old woman. As soon as his eyes fell on hers, he dismounted and walked towards her, and she, recognising him, dismounted also and embraced him. But he pressed her ribs with his hands, till he well nigh broke them. Quoth she, What is this, O my son? But before she had done speaking, up came Kanmakan and Dandan, and the horsemen with them cried out at the women and slaves, and took them all prisoners. Then the two kings returned to Baghdad with their captives, and Rumzan bade them decorate the city, which they did for three days, at the end of which they brought out the old woman Shawahi, hight Zatta Dawahi, with a peaked red turban of palm leaves on her head, diademed with ass's dung, and proceeded by a herald proclaiming aloud, This is the reward of those who presume to lay hands on kings and the sons of kings. Then they crucified her on one of the gates of Baghdad, and when her companions saw what befell her, all embraced in a body the faith of al-Islam. As for Kanmakan and his uncle Rumzan, and his aunt Nujat zaman and the wazir Dandan, they marvelled at the wonderful events that had betided them, and bade the scribes chronicle them in books that those who came after might read. 
Then they all abode for the remainder of their days in the enjoyment of every solace and comfort of life, till there overtook them the destroyer of all delights and the sunderer of all societies. And this is the whole that hath come down to us of the dealings of fortune with King Omar bin at Nu'uman, and his sons Sharkan, and Zaw al Makan, and his son son Kan Makan, and his daughter Nujat al Zaman, and her daughter Kuzia Fakan. Thereupon quoth Shahryar to Shahrazad, I desire that thou tell somewhat about birds. And hearing this, Dunyazad said to her sister, I have never seen the Sultan light at heart all this while till the present night, and his pleasure giveth me hope that the issue for thee with him may be a happy issue. Then drowsiness overcame the Sultan, so he slept, and Shahrazad perceived the approach of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the one hundred and forty-sixth night, Shahrazad began to relate in these words the tale of The Birds and Beasts and the Carpenter. Quoth she, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that in times of yore, and in ages long gone before, a peacock abode with his wife on the seashore. Now the place was infested with lions and all manner wild beasts, with all it abounded in trees and streams. So cock and hen were wont to roost by night upon one of the trees, being in fear of the beasts, and went forth by day questing food. And they ceased not thus to do, till their fear increased on them, and they searched for some place wherein to dwell, other than their old dwelling-place and in the course of their search, behold, they happened on an island abounding in streams and trees. So they alighted there, and ate of its fruits, and drank of its waters. But whilst they were thus engaged, lo, up came to them a duck in a state of extreme terror, and stayed not faring forwards, till she reached the tree whereon were perched the two peafowl, when she seemed reassured in mind. The peacock doubted not, but that she had some rare story, so he asked her of her case, and the cause of her concern, whereto she answered, I am sick for sorrow, and my horror of the son of Adam, so beware, and again I say beware, of the sons of Adam, rejoined the peacock, fear not, now that thou hast won our protection, cried the duck, Alhamdulillah, Glory to God, who hath done away my cark and care, by means of you being near. For indeed I come of friendship fain with you twain. And when she had ended her speech, the peacock's wife came down to her and said, Well come, and welcome, and fair cheer. No harm shall hurt thee. How can son of Adam come to us, and we in this isle which lieth the middlemost of the sea? From the land he cannot reach us, neither can he come against us from the water. So be of good cheer, and tell us what hath betided thee from the child of Adam. Answered the duck, Know then, O thou peahen, that of a truth I have dwelt all my life in this island safely and peacefully, nor have I seen any disquieting thing, till one night, as I was asleep, I sighted in my dream the semblance of a son of Adam, who talked with me, and I with him. Then I heard a voice say to me, O thou duck, beware of the son of Adam, and be not imposed on by his words, nor by that he may suggest to thee, for he aboundeth in wiles and guiles. So beware with all wariness of his perfidy, for again I say, he is crafty and right cunning, even as singeth of him the poet. He'll offer sweetmeats with his edged tongue, and fox thee with the foxy guile of fox. And know thou that the son of Adam circumventeth the fishes, and draweth them forth of the seas, and he shooteth the birds with a pellet of clay, and trappeth the elephant with his craft. None is safe from his mischief, and neither bird nor beast escapeth him. And on this wise have I told thee what I have heard concerning the son of Adam. So I awoke, fearful and trembling, and from that hour to this my heart hath not known gladness, for dread of the son of Adam, 
lest he surprise me unawares by his wile or trap me in his snares. By the time the end of the day overtook me, my strength was grown weak, and my spunk failed me. So, desiring to eat and drink, I went forth walking, troubled in spirit, and with a heart ill at ease. Now when I reached yonder mountain, I saw a tawny lion-whelp at the door of a cave, and sighting me he joyed in me with great joy, for my colour pleased him, and my gracious shape. So he cried out to me, saying, draw nigh unto me. I went up to him, and he asked me, What is thy name, and what is thy nature? Answered I, My name is Duck, and I am of the bird kind. And I added, But thou, why tarriest thou in this place till this time? Answered the whelp, My father the lion hath for many a day warned me against the son of Adam, and it came to pass this night that I saw in my sleep the semblance of a son of Adam. And he went on to tell me the like of that I have told you. When I heard these words I said to him, O oh, lion, I take asylum with thee, that thou mayest kill the son of Adam, and be steadfast in resolve to his slaughter. Verily I fear him for myself with extreme fear, and to my fright a fright is added, for that thou also dreadest the son of Adam, albeit thou art sultan of savage beasts. Then I ceased not, O my sister, to bid the young lion beware of the son of Adam, and urge him to slay him, till he rose of a sudden, and at once from his stead, and went out, and he fared on, and I after him, and I noted him lashing flanks with tail. We advanced in the same order till we came to a place where the roads forked, and saw a cloud of dust arise, which presently clearing away, discovered below it a runaway naked ass, now galloping and running at speed, and now rolling in the dust. When the lion saw the ass, he cried out to him, and he came up to him in all humility. Then said the lion, Hark ye, crack-brain brute! What is thy kind, and what be the cause of thy coming hither? He replied, O son of the Sultan, I am by kind an ass, Asinus Caballus, and the cause of my coming to this place is that I am fleeing from the son of Adam. Asked the lion whelp, Dost thou fear then that he will kill thee? Answered the ass, Not so, O son of the Sultan but I dread lest he put a cheat on me, and mount upon me, for he hath a thing called pack-saddle, which he setteth on my back, also a thing called girths, which he bindeth about my belly, and a thing called crupper, which he putteth under my tail, and a thing called bit, which he placeth in my mouth, and he fashioneth me a goad, and goadeth me with it, and maketh me run more than my strength. If I stumble, he curseth me, and if I bray, he revileth me. And at last, when I grow old, and can no longer run, he putteth on me a panel of wood, and delivereth me to the water-carriers, who load my back with water from the river, in skins and other vessels, such as jars. And I cease not to wone in misery and abasement, and fatigue, till I die, when they cast me on the rubbish-heaps to the dogs. So what grief can surpass this grief, and what calamities can be greater than these calamities? Now when I heard, O Pehen, the ass's words, my skin shuddered, and became as goose-flesh at the son of Adam. And I said to the lion, Well, O my lord, the ass of a verity hath excuse, and his words add terror to my terror. Then quoth the young lion to the ass, Whither goest thou? quoth he, before sunrise I spied the son of Adam afar off, and fled from him, and now I am minded to flee forth, and run without ceasing for the greatness of my fear of him, so haply I may find me a place of shelter from the perfidious son of Adam. Whilst the ass was thus discoursing with the lion whelp, seeking the while to take leave of us and go away, behold, appeared to us another cloud of dust, whereat the ass brayed, and cried out, and looked hard, and let fly a loud fart. 
after a while the dust lifted and discovered a black steed finely dight with a blaze on the forehead like a dirham round and bright handsomely marked about the hoof with white and with firm strong legs pleasing to sight and he neighed with a fright this horse ceased not running till he stood before the whelp the son of the lion who when he saw him marvelled and made much of him and said what is thy kind o majestic wild beast and wherefore fleest thou into this desert wide and vast he replied o lord of wild beasts i am a steed of the horse kind and the cause of my running is that i am fleeing from the son of adam the lion whelp wondered at the horse's speech and cried to him speak not such words for it is shame to thee seeing that thou art tall and stout and how cometh it that thou fearest the son of adam thou with thy bulk of body and thy swiftness of running when i for all my littleness of stature am resolved to encounter the son of adam and rushing on him eat his flesh that i may allay the affright of this poor duck and make her dwell in peace in her own place but now thou hast come here and thou hast wrung my heart with thy talk and turned me back from what i had resolved to do seeing that for all thy bulk the son of adam hath mastered thee and hath feared neither thy height nor thy breadth albeit wert thou to kick him with one hoof thou wouldst kill him nor could he prevail against thee but thou wouldst make him drink the cup of death the horse laughed when he heard the whelp's words and replied far far is it from my power to overcome him o prince let not my length and my breadth nor yet my bulk delude thee with respect to the son of adam for that he of the excess of his guile and his wiles fashioneth me a thing called hobble and applieth to my four legs a pair of ropes made of palm fibres bound with felt and gibbeteth me by the head to a high peg so that i being tied up remain standing and can neither sit nor lie down and when he is minded to ride me he bindeth on his feet a thing of iron called stirrup and layeth on my back another thing called saddle which he fasteneth by two girths passed under my armpits then he setteth in my mouth a thing of iron he calleth bit to which he tieth a thing of leather called rein and when he sitteth in the saddle of my back he taketh the rein in his hand and guideth me with it goading my flanks the while with the shovel stirrups till he maketh them bleed so do not ask o son of our sultan the hardships i endure from the son of adam and when i grow old and lean and can no longer run swiftly he selleth me to the miller who maketh me turn in the mill and i cease not from turning night and day till i grow decrepit then he in turn vendeth me to the knacker who cutteth my throat and flayeth off my hide and plucketh out my tail which he selleth to the sieve maker and he melteth down my fat for tallow candles when the young lion heard the horse's words his rage and vexation redoubled and he said when didst thou leave the son of adam replied the horse at midday and he is upon my track whilst the whelp was thus conversing with the horse lo there rose a cloud of dust and presently opening out discovered beneath it a furious camel gurgling and pawing the earth with his feet and never ceasing so to do till he came up with us now when the lion whelp saw how big and buxom he was he took him to be the son of adam and was about to spring upon him when i said to him o oh, prince of a truth this is not the son of adam this be a camel and he seemeth to be fleeing from the son of adam as i was thus conversing on my sister with the lion whelp the camel came up and saluted him whereupon he returned the greeting and said what bringeth thee hither replied he i came here fleeing from the son of adam quoth the whelp and thou with thy huge frame and length and breadth how cometh it that thou fearest the son of adam seeing that with one kick of thy foot thou wouldst kill him quoth the camel o son of the sultan 
know that the son of Adam hath subtleties and wiles which none can withstand, nor can any prevail against him, save only death. For he putteth into my nostrils a twine of goat's hair, he calleth nose-ring, and over my head a thing he calleth halter. Then he delivereth me to the least of his little children, and the youngling draweth me along by the nose-ring, my size and strength notwithstanding. Then they load me with the heaviest of burdens, and go long journeys with me, and put me to hard labour through the hours of the night and the day. When I grow old and stricken in years, and disabled from working, my master keepeth me not with him, but selleth me to the knacker, who cutteth my throat, and vendeth my hide to the tanners, and my flesh to the cooks. So do not ask the hardships I suffer from the son of Adam. When didst thou leave the son of Adam? asked the young lion, and he answered, At sundown, and I suppose that coming to my place after my departure, and not finding me there, he is now in search of me. Wherefore let me go, O son of the Sultan, that I may flee into the wolds and the wilds. Said the whelp, Wait a while, O camel, till thou see how I will tear him, and give thee to eat of his flesh, whilst I crunch his bones and drink his blood. Replied the camel, O king's son, I fear for thee from the child of Adam, for he is wily and guileful. And he began repeating these verses. When the tyrant enters the lieges' land, Nought remains for the lieges but quick remove. Now, whilst the camel was speaking with the lion whelp, behold, there rose a cloud of dust, which, after a time, opened and showed an old man, scanty of stature and lean of limb, and he bore on his shoulder a basket of carpenter's tools, and on his head a branch of a tree and eight planks. He led little children by the hand, and came on at a trotting pace never stopping till he drew near the whelp. When I saw him, O oh my sister, I fell down for excess of fear. But the young lion rose and walked forward to meet the carpenter, and when he came up to him, the man smiled in his face and said to him, with a glib tongue and in courtly terms, O oh, king who defendeth from harm, and lord of the long arm, Allah prosper thine evening and thine endeavouring and increase thy valiancy, and strengthen thee. Protect me from that which hath distressed me, and with its mischief hath oppressed me, for I have found no helper save only thyself. And the carpenter stood in his presence, weeping and wailing and complaining. When the whelp heard his sighing and his crying, he said, I will succour thee from that thou fearest. Who hath done thee wrong, and what art thou, O wild beast, whose like in my life I never saw, nor ever espied one goodlier of form, or more eloquent of tongue than thou? What is thy case? replied the man, O lord of wild beasts, as to myself I am a carpenter, but as to hath wronged me, verily he is a son of Adam, and by break of dawn after this coming night he will be with thee in this place. When the lion whelp heard these words of the carpenter, the light was changed to night before his sight, and he snorted and roared with ire, and his eyes cast forth sparks of fire. Then he cried out, saying, By Allah, I will assuredly watch through this coming night till dawn, nor will I return to my father till I have won my will. Then he returned to the carpenter and asked, of a truth I see thou art short of step, and I would not hurt thy feelings, for that I am generous of heart. Yet do I deem thee unable to keep pace with the wild beasts. Tell me then, whither thou goest? Answered the carpenter, Know that I am on my way to thy father's wazir, the lynx, for when he heard that the son of Adam had set foot in this country, he feared greatly for himself, and sent one of the wild beasts on a message for me, to make him a house wherein he should dwell, that it might shelter him and fend off his enemy from him, so not one of the sons of Adam should come at him. Accordingly I took up these planks, and set forth to find him. Now when the young lion heard these words, he envied the lynx, and said to the carpenter, 
by my life there is no help for it but thou make me a house with these planks ere thou make one for sir lynx when thou hast done my work go to him and make him whatso he wisheth the carpenter replied o lord of wild beasts i cannot make thee aught till i have made the lynx what he desireth then will i return to thy service and build thee a house as a fort to ward thee from thy foe exclaimed the lion whelp by allah i will not let thee leave this place till thou build me a house of planks so saying he made for the carpenter and sprang upon him thinking to jest with him and cuffed him with his paw knocking the basket off his shoulder and threw him down in a fainting fit whereupon the young lion laughed at him and said woe to thee o carpenter of a truth thou art feeble and hast no force so it is excusable in thee to fear the son of Adam. Now when the carpenter fell on his back, he waxed exceeding wroth, but he dissembled his wrath for fear of the whelp, and sat up and smiled in his face, saying, Well, I will make for thee the house. With this he took the planks he had brought, and nailed together the house, which he made in the form of a chest, after the measure of the young lion and he left the door open, for he had cut in the box a large aperture, to which he made a stout cover, and bored many holes therein. Then he took out some newly wrought nails and a hammer, and said to the young lion, Enter the house through this opening, that I may fit it to thy measure. Thereat the whelp rejoiced, and went up to the opening, but saw that it was straight, and the carpenter said to him, Enter and crouch down on thy legs and arms. So the whelp did thus, and entered the chest, but his tail remained outside. Then he would have drawn back and come out, but the carpenter said to him, Wait patiently a while, till I see if there be room for thy tail with thee. The young lion did as he was bid, when the carpenter twisted up his tail, and stuffing it into the chest, whipped the lid on to the opening, and nailed it down. Whereat the whelp cried out, and said, O oh, carpenter, what is this narrow house thou hast made me? Let me out, sirrah. But the carpenter answered, Far be it, far be it from thy thought. Repentance for past avails naught, and indeed of this place thou shalt not come out. He then laughed and resumed, Verily thou art fallen into the trap, and from thy duress there is no escape, O vilest of wild beasts. Rejoined the whelp, O oh, my brother, what manner of words are these thou addressest to me? The carpenter replied, No, O oh dog of the desert, that thou hast fallen into that which thou fearedst. Fate hath upset thee, nor shall caution set thee up. When the whelp heard these words, O oh my sister, he knew that this was indeed the very son of Adam, against whom he had been warned by his sire in waking state and by the mysterious voice in sleeping while. And I also was certified that this was indeed he, without doubt, wherefore great fear of him for myself seized me, and I withdrew a little apart from him, and waited to see what he would do with the young lion. Then I saw, O oh my sister, the son of Adam, dig a pit in that place hard by the chest which held the whelp, and throwing the box into the hole, heap dry wood upon it, and burn the young lion with fire. At this sight, O sister mine, my fear of the son of Adam redoubled, and in my affright I have been these two days fleeing from him. But when the peahen heard from the duck this story, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say, End of section 13 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3. Section 14, Volume 3 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3, Section 14. When it was the one hundred and forty-seventh night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the peahen heard from the duck this story, she wondered with exceeding wonder, and said to her, O my sister, here thou art safe from the son of Adam, for we are in one of the islands of the sea, whither there is no way for the son of Adam. So do thou take up thine abode with us, till Allah make easy thy case, and our case. Quoth the duck, I fear lest some calamity come upon me by night, for no runaway can rid him of fate by flight. Rejoined the peahen, Abide with us, and be like unto us, and ceased not to persuade her till she yielded, saying, O oh, my sister, thou knowest how weak is my resistance, but verily had I not seen thee here, I had not remained. Said the peahen, that which is on our foreheads we must indeed fulfil, and when our doomed day draweth near, who shall deliver us? But not a soul departeth, except it have accomplished its predestined livelihood and term. Now the while they talked thus, a cloud of dust appeared and approached them, at sight of which the duck shrieked aloud and ran down into the sea, crying out, Beware, beware! though flight there is not from fate and lot. After a while the dust opened out, and discovered under it an antelope, whereat the duck and the peahen were reassured, and the peacock's wife said to her companion, This thou seest, and wouldst have me beware of, is an antelope, and here he is making for us. He will do us no hurt, for the antelope feedeth upon the herbs of the earth, and even as thou art of the bird kind, so is he of the beast kind. Be therefore of good cheer, and cease care-taking, for care-taking wasteth the body. Hardly had the peahen done speaking, when the antelope came up to them, thinking to shelter him under the shade of the tree, and sighting the peahen and the duck, saluted them, and said, I came to this island to-day, and I have seen none richer in herbage, nor pleasanter for habitation. Then he besought them for company and amity, and when they saw his friendly behaviour to them, they welcomed him and gladly accepted his offer. So they struck up a sincere friendship, and swear thereto, and they slept in one place, and they ate and drank together nor did they cease dwelling in safety, eating and drinking their fill, till one day there came thither a ship which had strayed from her course in the sea. She cast anchor near them, and the crew came forth and dispersed about the island. They soon caught sight of the three friends, antelope, peahen, and duck, and made for them, whereupon the peahen flew up into the tree, and thence winged her way through the air and the antelope fled into the desert, but the duck abode paralysed by fear. So they chased her till they caught her, and she cried out and said, Caution availed me naught against fate and lot, and they bore her off to the ship. Now when the peahen saw what had betided the duck, she removed from the island, saying, I see that misfortunes lie in ambush for all, but for yonder ship, Parting had not befallen between me and this duck, because she was one of the truest of friends. Then she flew off and rejoined the antelope, who saluted her, and gave her joy of her safety, and asked for the duck, to which she replied, The enemy hath taken her, and I loathe the sojourn of this island after her. Then she wept for the loss of the duck, and began repeating, the day of parting cut my heart in twain, in twain may Allah cut the parting day. And she spake also this couplet, I pray some day that we reunion gain, so I may tell him parting's ugly way. The antelope sorrowed with great sorrow, but dissuaded the peahen from her resolve to remove from the island. So they abode there together with him, eating and drinking, in peace and safety, except that they ceased not to mourn for the loss of the duck. And the antelope said to the peahen, O oh, my sister, thou seest how the folk who came forth of the ship were the cause of our severance from the duck, and of her destruction, 
so do thou beware of them and guard thyself from them and from the wile of the son of adam and his guile but the peahen replied i am assured that naught caused her death save her neglecting to say subhan allah glory to god indeed i often said to her exclaim thou praised be allah and verily i fear for thee because thou neglectest to laud the almighty for all things created by allah glorify him on this wise and whoso neglecteth the formula of praise him destruction waylays when the antelope heard the peahen's words he exclaimed allah make fair thy face and betook himself to repeating the formula of praise and ceased not therefrom a single hour and it is said that his form of adoration was as follows praise be to the requiter of every good and evil thing the lord of majesty and of kings the king and a tale is also told on this wise of the hermits a certain hermit worshipped on a certain mountain whither resorted a pair of pigeons and the worshipper was wont to make two parts of his daily bread and shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the one hundred and forty-eighth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that the worshipper was wont to make two parts of his daily bread eating one half himself and giving the other to the pigeon pair he also prayed for them both that they might be blessed with issue so they increased and multiplied greatly now they resorted only to that mountain where the hermit was and the reason of their foregathering with the holy man was their assiduity in repeating praised be allah for it is recounted that the pigeon said in praise praised be the creator of all creatures the distributor of daily bread the builder of the heavens and dispreader of the earths and that couple ceased not to dwell together in the happiest of life they and their brood till the holy man died when the company of the pigeons was broken up and they dispersed among the towns and villages and mountains now it is told that on a certain other mountain there dwelt a shepherd a man of piety and good sense and chastity and he had flocks of sheep which he tended and he made his living by their milk and wool the mountain which gave him a home abounded in trees and pasturage and also in wild beasts but these had no power over his flocks so he ceased not to dwell upon that highland in full security taking no thought to the things of the world by reason of his beatitude and his assiduity in prayer and devotion till allah ordained that he should fall sick with exceeding sickness thereupon he betook himself to a cavern in the mountain and his sheep used to go out in the morning to the pasturage and take refuge at night in the cave but allah almighty being minded to try him and prove his patience and his obedience sent him one of his angels who came in to him in the semblance of a fair woman and sat down before him when the shepherd saw that woman seated before him his flesh shuddered at her with horripilation and he said to her o oh, thou woman what was it invited thee to this my retreat i have no need of thee nor is there aught betwixt me and thee which calleth for thy coming in to me quoth she o oh man dost thou not behold my beauty and loveliness and the fragrance of my breath and knowest thou not the need women have of men and men of women so who shall forbid thee from me when i have chosen to be near thee and desire to enjoy thy company indeed i come to thee willingly and do not withhold myself from thee and near us there is none whom we need fear and i wish to abide with thee as long as thou sojournest in this mountain and be thy companion and true friend i offer myself to thee for thou needest the service of woman and if thou have carnal connection with me and know me thy sickness shall be turned from thee and health return to thee and thou wilt repent thee of the past for having forsworn the company of women during the days that are now no more in very sooth i give thee good advice so incline to my counsel and approach me 
quoth the shepherd go out from me o woman deceitful and perfidious i will not incline to thee nor approach thee i want not thy company nor wish for union with thee he who coveteth the coming life renounceth thee for thou seducest mankind those of past time and those of present time allah the most high lieth in wait for his servants and woe unto him who is cursed with thy company answered she o oh, thou that errest from truth and wanderest from the way of reason turn thy face to me and look upon my charms and take thy full of my nearness as did the wise who have gone before thee indeed they were richer than thou in experience and sharper of wit withal they rejected not as thou rejectest the enjoyment of women nay they took their pleasure of them and their company even as thou renouncest them and it did them no hurt in things temporal or things spiritual wherefore do thou recede from thy resolve and thou shalt praise the issue of thy case rejoined the shepherd all thou sayest i deny and abhor and all thou offerest i reject for thou art cunning and perfidious and there is no honesty in thee nor is there honour how much of foulness hidest thou under thy beauty and how many a pious man hast thou seduced from his duty and made his end penitence and perdition avaunt from me o thou who devotest thyself to corrupt others thereupon he threw his goat's hair cloak over his head that he might not see her face and betook himself to calling upon the name of his lord and when the angel saw the excellence of his submission to the divine will he went out from him and ascended to heaven now hard by the hermit's hill was a village wherein dwelt a pious man who knew not the other's station till one night he heard in a dream a voice saying to him in such a place near to thee is a devout man go thou to him and be at his command so when morning dawned he set out to wend thither and what time the heat was grievous upon him he came to a tree which grew beside a spring of running water so he sat down to rest in the shadow of that tree and behold he saw beasts and birds coming to that fount to drink and when they caught sight of the devotee sitting there they took fright and fled from before his face then said he there is no majesty and there is no might save in allah i rest not here but to hurt of these beasts and fowls so he arose blaming himself and saying verily my tarrying here this day hath wronged these animals and what excuse have i towards my creator and the creator of these birds and beasts for that i was the cause of their flight from their drink and their daily food and their place of pasturage alas for my shame before my lord on the day when he shall avenge the hornless sheep on the sheep with horns and he wept and began repeating these couplets now an by allah unto man were fully known why he is made in careless sleep he ne'er would wone first death then cometh wake and dreadful day of doom reproof with threats sore terror frightful malice on bid we or else forbid we all of us are like the cave companions when at length their sleep was done then he again wept for that he had driven the birds and beasts from the spring by sitting down under the tree and he fared on till he came to the shepherd's dwelling and going in saluted him the shepherd returned his salutation and embraced him weeping and saying what hath brought thee to this place where no man hath ever yet come to me quoth the other devotee i saw in my sleep one who described to me this thy stead and bade me repair to thee and salute thee so i came in obedience to the commandment the shepherd welcomed him rejoicing in his company and the twain abode upon that mountain worshipping allah with the best of worship and they ceased not serving their lord in the cavern and living upon the flesh and milk of their sheep having clean put away from them riches and children and what not till the certain the inevitable became their lot and this is the end of their story
Then said King Shahryar, O oh, Shahrazad, thou wouldst cause me to renounce my kingdom, and thou makest me repent of having slain so many women and maidens. Hast thou any bird stories? Yes, replied she, and began to tell the tale of the waterfowl and the tortoise. It is related by truthful men, O king, that a certain bird flew high up firmament woods, and presently lit on a rock in the midst of water which was running. And as he sat there, behold, the current carried to him the carcass of a man, and lodged it against the rock, for being swollen it floated. The bird, which was a waterfowl, drew near, and examining it, found that it was the dead body of a son of Adam and saw in it sign of spear and stroke of sword. So he said to himself, I presume that this man who hath been slain was some evil doer, and that a company banded themselves together against him, and put him to death, and were at peace from him and his evil doing. And as he continued marvelling at this, suddenly the vultures and kites came down upon the carcass from all sides, and got round it which, when the waterfowl saw, he feared with sore affright, and said, I cannot abide here any longer. So he flew away in quest of a place where he might wone, till that carcass should come to an end, and the birds of prey leave it. And he stayed not in his flight, till he found a river with a tree in its midst. So he alighted on the tree, troubled and distraught, and sore grieved for departing from his birthplace, and said to himself, Verily sorrows cease not to follow me. I was at my ease when I saw that carcass, and rejoiced therein with much joy, saying, This is a gift of daily bread which Allah hath dealt to me. But my joy became a noy, and my gladness turned to sadness, for the ravenous birds, which are like lions, seized upon it, and tear it to pieces, and came between me and my prize. So how can I hope to be secure from misfortune in this world, or put any trust therein? Indeed the proverb saith, The world is the dwelling of him who hath no dwelling. He who hath no wits is cozened by it, and entrusteth it with his wealth, and his child, and his family, and his folk. And whoso is cozened, ceaseth not to rely upon it, pacing proudly upon earth, until he is laid under earth, and the dust is cast over his corpse by him who of all men was dearest to him and nearest. But naught is better for generous youth than patience under its cares and miseries. I have left my native place, and it is abhorrent to me to quit my brethren and friends and loved ones. Now, whilst he was thus musing, lo, a male tortoise descended into the river, and approaching the waterfowl, saluted him, saying, O oh my lord, what hath exiled thee, and driven thee so far from thy place? Replied the waterfowl, The descent of enemies thereon, for the wise brooketh not the neighbourhood of his foe. And how well saith the poet, Whenas on any land the oppressor doth alight, there's nothing left for those that dwell therein but flight. Quoth the tortoise, If the matter be as thou sayest, and the case as thou describest, I will not leave thee, nor cease to stand before thee, that I may do thy need, and fulfil thy service. For it is said that there is no sorer desolation than that of him who is an exile, cut off from friends and home. And it is also said, that no calamity equaleth that of severance from the good. But the best solace for men of understanding is to seek companionship in strangerhood, and be patient under sorrows and adversity. Wherefore I hope that thou wilt approve of my company, for I will be to thee a servant and a helper. Now when the waterfowl heard the tortoise's words, he answered, Verily, thou art right in what thou sayest, for, by my life, I have found grief and pain in separation, that while I have been parted from my place, and sundered from my brethren and friends, seeing that in severance is an admonition to him who will be admonished, and matter of thought for him who will take thought. 
if the generous youth find not a companion to console him weal is for ever cut off from him and ill is eternally established with him and there is nothing for the sage but to solace himself in every event with brethren and be constant in patience and endurance indeed these two are praiseworthy qualities and both uphold one under calamities and vicissitudes of the world and ward off startling sorrows and harrowing cares come what will rejoined the tortoise beware of sorrow for it will spoil thy life and waste thy manliness and the two gave not over conversing till the bird said never shall i cease fearing the shifts of time and vicissitudes of events when the tortoise heard this he came up to him and kissing him between the eyes said to him never may the company of the birds cease to be blessed in thee and through thee and find wisdom in thy good counsel how shalt thou be burdened with care and harm and he went on to comfort the waterfowl and soothe his terrors till he became reassured then he flew to the place where the carcass was and found on arriving there the birds of prey gone and they had left nothing of the body but bones whereupon he returned to the tortoise and acquainted him with the fact that the foe had disappeared from his place saying know that of a truth i long for return homewards to enjoy the society of my friends for the sage cannot endure separation from his native place so they both went thither and found naught to affright them whereupon the waterfowl began repeating and haply when as straight descends on lot of generous youth right sore with allah only lies his issue from annoy he straightened but full oft when rings and meshes straightest clip he scapes his straight and joyance finds albe i see no joy so the twain abode in that island and while the waterfowl was enjoying a life of peace and gladness suddenly fate led thither a hungry falcon which drove its talons into the bird's belly and killed him nor did caution avail him when his term of life was ended. Now the cause of his death was that he neglected to use the formula of praise, and it is said that his form of adoration was as follows, Praised be our Lord in that he ordereth and ordaineth, and praised be our Lord in that he enricheth and impoverisheth. Such was the waterfowl's end, and the tale of the ravenous birds and when it was finished quoth the sultan o oh, shahrazad verily thou overwhelmest me with admonitions and salutary instances hast thou any stories of beasts yes answered she and began to tell the tale of the wolf and the fox know o king that a fox and a wolf once cohabited in the same den harbouring therein together by day resorting thither by night but the wolf was cruel and oppressive to the fox they abode thus a while till it so befell that the fox exhorted the wolf to use gentle dealing and leave off his ill deeds saying if thou persist in thine arrogance belike allah will give the son of adam power over thee for he is past master in guile and wile and by his artifice he bringeth down the birds from the firmament, and he haleth the mighty fish forth of the flood-waters, and he cutteth the mountain, and transporteth it from place to place. All this is of his craft and wiliness. Wherefore do thou betake thyself to equity and fair dealing, and leave frowardness and tyranny, and thou shalt fare all the better for it. But the wolf would not accept his counsel, and answered him roughly, saying, What right hast thou to speak of matters of weight and importance? And he dealt the fox a cuff that laid him senseless. But when he revived, he smiled in the wolf's face, and excusing himself for his unseemly speech, repeated these two couplets. If any sin I sinned, or I did aught in love of you, which hateful mischief wrought, my sin I saw repent and pardon sue, so give the sinner gift of pardon sought. The wolf accepted his excuse and held his hand from further ill treatment, saying, Speak not of whatso concerneth thee not, 
lest thou hear what will please thee not answered the fox to hear is to obey and shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day and ceased to say her permitted say end of section 14 of the book of a thousand nights and a night volume 3《Section 15, Volume 3 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Moreau. — The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3, Section 15. — When it was the one hundred and forty-ninth night, she said, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that quoth the wolf to the fox, Speak not of what so concerneth thee not, lest thou hear what will please thee not, answered the fox. To hear is to obey. I will abstain henceforth from what pleaseth thee not. For the sage saith, Have a care that thou speak not of that whereof thou art not asked. Leave that which concerneth thee not for that which concerneth thee, and by no means lavish good counsel on the wrongness for they will repay it to thee with wrong. And reflecting on the words of the wolf, he smiled in his face, but in his heart he meditated treachery against him, and privily said, There is no help but that I compass the destruction of this wolf. So he bore with his injurious usage, saying to himself, Verily, insolence and evil-speaking are causes of perdition, and cast into confusion, and it is said, The insolent is shent, and the ignorant doth repent and whoso feareth to him safety is sent. Moderation marketh the noble, and gentle manners are gains of the grandest. It behoveth me to dissemble with this tyrant, and needs must he be cast down. Then quoth he to the wolf, Verily, the Lord pardoneth his erring servant, and relenteth toward him, if he confess his offences. And I am a weak slave, and have offended in presuming to counsel thee. If thou knewest the pain that befell me by thy buffet, Thou wouldst ken that even the elephant could not stand against it, nor endure it. But I complain not of this blow's hurt, because of the joy and gladness that hath betided me through it. For though it was to me exceeding sore, yet was its issue of the happiest. And with sooth saith the sage, The blow of the teacher is at first right hurtful, but the end of it is sweeter than strained honey. Quoth the wolf, I pardon thee thine offence, and I cancel thy fault. But beware of my force, and avow thyself my thrall, for thou hast learned my severity unto him who showeth his hostility. Thereupon the fox prostrated himself before the wolf, saying, Allah lengthen thy life, and mayest thou never cease to overthrow thy foes. And he stinted not to fear the wolf, and to wheedle him and dissemble with him. Now it came to pass that one day the fox went to a vineyard and saw a breach in its walls, but he mistrusted it and said to himself, Verily, for this breach there must be some cause, and the old saw saith, Whoso seeth a cleft in the earth, and shunneth it not, and is not wary in approaching it, the same is self-deluded, and exposeth himself to danger and destruction. Indeed, it is well known that some folk make the figure of a fox in their vineyards. Nay, they even set before the semblance grapes in plates, that foxes may see it, and come to it, and fall into perdition. In very sooth I regard this breach as a snare, and the proverb saith, Caution is one half of cleverness. Now prudence requireth that I examine this breach, and see if there be aught therein which may lead to perdition, and coveting shall not make me cast myself into destruction. So he went up to the hole and walked round it right warily, and lo, it was a deep pit which the owner of the vineyard had dug to trap therein the wild beasts which laid waste to his vines. Then he said to himself, Thou hast gained, for thou hast refrained. And he looked and saw that the hole was lightly covered with dust and matting. So he drew back from it, saying, Praised be Allah that I was wary of it. I hope that my enemy the wolf, who maketh my life miserable, will fall into it. So will the vineyard be left to me, and I shall enjoy it alone and dwell therein at peace. Thus saying, he shook his head and laughed a loud laugh, and began versifying. Would heaven I saw at this hour the wolf fallen down in this well. He who anguished my heart for so long, and guard me drain isle and fell. 
Heaven grant after this I may live free of wolf for long fortunate spell, when I've rid grapes and vineyard of him, and in bunch spoiling happily dwell. His verse being finished, he returned in haste to the wolf and said to him, Allah hath made plain for thee the way into the vineyard without toil and moil. This is of thine auspicious fortune. So good luck to thee, and mayest thou enjoy the plentiful plunder and the profuse provant which Allah hath opened up to thee without trouble. Asked the wolf, What proof hast thou of what thou assertest? And the fox answered, I went up to the vineyard and found that the owner was dead, having been torn to pieces by wolves. So I entered the orchard and saw the fruit shining upon the trees. The wolf doubted not the fox's report, and his gluttony got hold of him. So he arose and repaired to the cleft, for that greed blinded him, whilst the fox falling behind him lay as one dead, quoting to the case the following couplet. For Layla's favor dost thou greed? But bear in mind, greed is a yoke of harmful weight on neck of man. And when the wolf had reached the breach, the fox said, Enter the vineyard, thou art spared the trouble of climbing a ladder, for the garden wall is broken down, and with a lie it resteth to fulfill the benefit. So the wolf went on walking and thought to enter the vineyard, but when he came to the middle of the pit covering he fell through, whereupon the fox shook for joy and gladness. His care and concern left him, and he sang out for delight and improvised these couplets. Fortune had mercy on the soul of me, and for my torments now shows clemency, granting whatever gift my heart desired and far removing what I feared to see. I will, good sooth, excuse her all her sins. She sinned in days gone by, and much sinned she. Yea, her injustice she hath shown in this. She whitened locks that were so black of blee, but now for this same wolf escape there's none. Of death and doom he hath full certainty. Then all the vineyard comes beneath my rule. I'll brook no partner who's so fond a fool. Then the fox looked into the cleft, and seeing the wolf weeping in repentance and sorrow for himself wept with him. Whereupon the wolf raised his head to him and asked, Is it of pity for me thou weepest, O father of the fortlet? Answered the fox, no, by him who cast thee into this pit, I weep for the length of thy past life, and for regret that thou didst not fall into the pit before this day. For hadst thou done so before I forgathered with thee, I had rested and enjoyed repose. But thou wast spared till the fulfilment of thine allotted term, and thy destined time. Then the wolf said to him, as one jesting, O oh, evildoer, go to my mother and tell her what hath befallen me. Haply she may devise some device for my release." Of a truth thou hast been brought to destruction by the excess of thy greed and thine exceeding gluttony, since thou art fallen into a pit whence thou wilt never escape. Knowest thou not the common proverb, O thou witless wolf? Whoso taketh no thought as to how things end, him shall fate never befriend, nor shall he safe from perils wend. O Reynard, quoth the wolf, thou wast wont to show me fondness, and covet my friendliness, and fear the greatness of my strength. Hate me not rancorously because of that I did with thee, for he who hath power and forgiveth, his reward Allah giveth, even as saith the poet, So kindness seed in the unfittest stead, twill not be wasted whereso thou shalt sow, for kindness I'll be buried long, yet none shall reap the crop save sower who guard it grow. Rejoined the fox, O witlessest of beasts of prey, and stupidest of the wild brute which the worlds overstray, Hast thou forgotten thine arrogance and insolence and tyranny, and thy disregarding the due of good fellowship, and thy refusing to be advised by what the poet saith? Wrong not thy neighbor, e'en if thou have power, the wronger alway vengeance harvest reaps. Thine eyes shall sleep, while bides the wronged on wake, accursing thee, and Allah's eye ne'er sleeps. O Abu al Hussein, replied the wolf, twit me not with my past sins. For forgiveness is expected of the generous, and doing kind deeds is the truest of treasures. How well saith the poet, Haste to do kindness, while thou hast much power, for at all seasons thou hast not such power. And he ceased not to humble himself before the fox, and say, Haply thou canst do somewhat to deliver me from destruction, replied the fox, O oh, thou wolf, thou witless, deluded, deceitful trickster! Hope not for deliverance, 
for this is but the just reward of thy foul dealing and its due retaliation. Then he laughed with chops wide open and repeated these two couplets. No longer beguile me, thou'lt fail of thy will. What can't be thou seekest? Thou hast sown, so reap ill. Quoth the wolf, O gentlest of ravenous beasts, I fain hold thee too faithful to leave me in this pit. Then he wept and complained, and with tears streaming from his eyes recited these two couplets. O thou whose favours have been out of compt, whose gifts are more than may be numbered, never mischance befell me, yet from time, but that I found thy hand right fain to aid. O thou ninny foe, quoth the fox, how art thou reduced to humiliation and prostration and abjection and submission, after insolence and pride and tyranny and arrogance? Verily, I kept company with thee only for fear of thy fury, and I cajoled thee without one hope of fair treatment from thee. But now trembling has come upon thee, and vengeance hath overtaken thee. And he repeated these two couplets. O thou who seekest innocence to guile, thou art caught in trap of thine intentions vile. Now drain the draught of shamefullest mischance, and be with other wolves cut off, thou scryle. Replied the wolf, O thou clement one, speak not with the tongue of enemies, nor look with their eyes, but fulfill the covenant of fellowship with me, ere the time of applying remedy cease to be. Rise and make ready to get me a rope, and tie one end of it to a tree, then let the other down to me, that I may lay hold of it, so haply I shall from this strait win free, and I will give thee all my hand possesseth of wealth and fee. Quoth the fox, Thou persistest in conversation concerning what will not procure thy liberation. Hope not for this, for thou shalt never, never get of me wherewithal to set thee at liberty. But call to mind thy past misdeeds, and the craft and perfidy thou didst imagine against me and bethink thee how near thou art to being stoned to death. For know that thy soul is about the world to quit, and cease in it, and depart from it. So shalt thou to destruction high, and ill is the abiding place thou shalt abide. Rejoined the wolf, O father of the fortlet, hasten to return to amity, and persist not in this rancorous enmity. Know that whoso from ruin saveth a soul is as if he had quickened it, and made it whole. And whoso saveth a soul alive is as if he had saved all mankind. Follow not forwardness, for the wise forbid it, and it were most manifest forwardness to leave me in this pit, draining the agony of death and dight to look upon mine own doom, when as it lieth in thy power to deliver me from my store. So do thy best to release me and deal with me benevolently. Answered the fox, O oh, thou base and barbarous wretch i compare thee because of the fairness of thy professions and expressions and the foulness of thy intentions and thy inventions to the falcon and the partridge asked the wolf how so and the fox began to tell the tale of the falcon and the partridge once upon a time i entered a vineyard to eat of its grapes and while so doing behold i saw a falcon stoop upon a partridge and seize him but the partridge escaped from the caesar and entering his nest, hid himself there. The falcon followed apace, and called out to him, saying, O oh, imbecile, I saw thee and hungered in the world, and took pity on thee. So I picked up for thee some grain, and took hold of thee, that thou mightest eat. But thou fleddest from me, and I wot not the cause of thy flight, except it were to put upon me a slight. Come out, then, and take the grain I have brought thee to eat, and much good may it do thee and with thy health agree. When the partridge heard these words, he believed and came out to him, whereupon the falcon struck his talons into him and seized him. Cried the partridge, Is this that which thou toldest me thou hadst brought me from the world, and whereof thou badest me eat, saying much good may it do thee, and with thy health agree? Thou hast lied to me, and may Allah cause what thou eatest of my flesh to be a killing poison in thy maw. So when the falcon had eaten the partridge, his feathers fell off, and his strength failed, and he died on the spot. Know then, O wolf, pursued the fox, that he who diggeth for his brother a pit, himself soon falleth into it, and thou first deceivest me in mode unfit, quoth the wolf. 
spare me this discourse nor saws and tales in force and remind me not of my former ill course for sufficeth me the sorry plight i endure perforce seeing that i am fallen into a place in which even my foe would pity me much more a true friend rather find some trick to deliver me and be thou thereby my saviour if this cause thee trouble remember that a true friend will undertake the sorest travail for his true friend's sake and will risk his life to deliver him from evil and indeed it hath been said a real friend is better than a real brother so if thou stir thyself to save me and i be saved i will for sure gather thee such store as shall be a provision for thee against want however sore and truly i will teach thee rare tricks whereby to open what so bounteous vineyards thou please and strip the fruit-laden trees rejoined the fox laughing how excellent is what the learned say of him who aboundeth in ignorance like unto thee asked the wolf what do the wise men say and the fox answered they have observed that the gross of body are gross of mind far from intelligence and nigh unto ignorance as for thy saying o thou stupid cunning idiot that a true friend should undertake sore travail for his true friend's sake it is sooth as thou sayest but tell me of thine ignorance and poverty of intelligence how can i be a true friend to thee considering thy treachery dost thou count me thy true friend nay i am thy foe who joyeth in thy woe and couldst thou trow it this word were sorer to thee than slaughter by shot of shaft as for thy promise to provide me a store against want however sore and teach me tricks to plunder what so bounteous vineyards i please and spoil fruit-laden trees how cometh it o guileful traitor that thou knowest not a while to save thyself from destruction how far art thou from profiting thyself and how far am i from accepting thy counsel if thou have any tricks make shift for thyself to save thee from the risk wherefrom i pray allah to make thine escape far distant so look o fool if there be any trick with thee and therewith save thyself from death ere thou lavish instruction upon thy neighbours but thou art like a certain man attacked by a disease who went to another diseased man with the same disease and said to him shall i heal thee of thy disease replied the sick man why dost thou not begin by healing thyself so he left him and went his way and thou o ignorant wolf art like this so stay where thou art and under what hath befallen thee be of good heart when the wolf heard what the fox said he knew that from him he had no hope of favour so he wept for himself saying verily i have been heedless of my weal but if allah delivered me from this ill i will assuredly repent of my arrogance toward those who are weaker than i and will wear woollens and go upon the mountains celebrating praises of the almighty allah and fearing his punishment and i will withdraw from the company of other wild beasts and for sure will feed the poor fighters for the faith then he wept and wailed till the heart of the fox softened when he heard his humble words and his professions of penitence for his past insolence and arrogance so he took pity upon him and sprang up joyfully and going to the brink of the breach squatted down on his hind quarters and let his tail hang in the hole whereupon the wolf arose and putting out his paw pulled the fox's tail so that he fell down in the pit with him then said the wolf o fox of little mercy why didst thou exult in my misery thou that wast my companion and under my dominion now thou art fallen into the pit with me and retribution hath soon overtaken thee verily the sages have said if one of you reproach his brother with sucking the dugs of a bitch he also shall suck her and how well quoth the poet when fortune weighs heavy on some of us and makes camel kneel by some other one say to those who rejoice in our ills awake the rejoicer shall suffer as we have done and death in company is the best of things wherefore i will certainly and assuredly hasten to slay thee ere thou see me slain said the fox to himself aha i am fallen into the snare with this tyrant and my case calleth for the use of craft and cunning for indeed it is said that a woman fashioneth her jewellery for the day of display and quoth the proverb i have not kept thee o my tear save for the time when distress draweth near and unless i make haste to circumvent this prepotent beast i am lost without recourse and how well saith the poet make thy game by guile for thou art born at a time when suns are lions and forests lain 
and turn on the leet of thy knavery, that the mill of subsistence may grind thy grain, and pluck the fruits, or, if out of reach, why cram thy maw with the grass on plain? Then said the fox to the wolf, Hasten not to slay me, for that is not the way to pay me, and thou wouldst repent it. O oh, thou valiant wild beast, lord of force and exceeding prowess! And thou accord delay, and consider what I shall say. Thou wilt ken what purpose I proposed. But if thou hasten to kill me, it will profit thee not, and we shall both die in this very place. Answered the wolf, O oh, thou wily trickster, what gareth thee hope to work my deliverance in thine own? that thou prayest me to grant thee delay. Speak, and propound to me thy purpose, replied the fox. As for the purpose I proposed, it was one which deserveth that thou girdon me handsomely for it. For when I heard thy promises and thy confessions of thy past misdeeds, and regrets for not having earlier repented and done good, and when I heard thee vowing, shouldst thou escape from this strait, to leave harming thy fellows and others, Forswear the eating of grapes and of all manner of fruits, devote thyself to humility, cut thy claws and break thy dog teeth, don woolens and offer thyself as an offering to Almighty Allah, then indeed I had pity upon thee. For true words are the best words, and although before I had been anxious for thy destruction, when as I heard thy repenting and thy vows of amending should Allah thou shafe to save thee, I felt bound to free thee from this thy present plight. So I let down my tail that thou mightest grasp it and be saved. Yet wouldest thou not quit thy wanted violence and habit of brutality, nor soughtest thou to save thyself by fair means, but thou gavest me a tug which I thought would sever body from soul, so that thou and I are fallen into the same place of distress and death. And now there is but one thing can save us, and if thou accept it of me, we shall both escape, and after it behoveth me to fulfill the vows thou hast made, and I will be thy veritable friend. Asked the wolf, What is it thou proposest for mine acceptance? Answered the fox, It is that thou stand up at full height till I come nigh on level with the surface of the earth. Then will I give a spring and reach the ground, and when out of the pit, I will bring thee what thou mayst lay hold of, and thus shalt thou make thine escape. Rejoined the wolf, I have no faith in thy word, for sages have said, Whoso practiseth trust in the place of hate erreth, and whoso trusteth in the untrustworthy is a dupe. He who retrieth him who hath been tried shall reap repentance, and his days shall go waste. And he who cannot distinguish between case and case, giving each its due, and assigneth all the weight to one side, his luck shall be little, and his miseries shall be many. How well saith the poet, Let thy thought be ill, and none else but ill. For suspicion is best of the worldling skill. Naught casteth a man into parlous place, but good opinion and worse good will. And the saying of another, Be sure all are villains and so bide safe, who lives wide awake on few ills shall light. Meet the foe with smiles and a smooth fair brow, and in heart raise a host for the battle dight. And that of yet another, He thou trusted most is thy worst unfriend. Wear all, and take heed with whom thou wend. Fair opinion of fortune is feeble sign, So believe her ill, and her ills perpend. Quoth the fox, Verily, mistrust and ill opinion of others Are not to be commended in every case. Nay, trust and confidence are the characteristics Of a noble nature, and the issue thereof Is freedom from stress of fear. Now it behoveth thee, O thou wolf, To devise some device for thy deliverance From this thou art in and our escape will be better to us both than our death. So quit thy distrust and rancor, for if thou trust in me, one of two things will happen. Either I shall bring thee something whereof to lay hold and escape from this case, or I shall abandon thee to thy doom. But this thing may not be, for I am not safe from falling into some such strait as this thou art in, which indeed would be fitting punishment of perfidy. Of a truth, the adage saith, Faith is fair, and faithlessness is foul. So it behoveth thee to trust in me, for I am not ignorant of the haps and mishaps of the world, and delay not to contrive some device for our deliverance, as the case is too close to allow further talk, replied the wolf. For all my want of confidence in thy fidelity, verily I knew what was in thy mind, and that thou wast moved to deliver me, when as thou heardest my repentance, 
and I said to myself, If what he asserteth be true, he will have repaired the ill he did, and if false, it resteth with the Lord to requite him. So look ye, I have accepted thy proposal, and if thou betray me, may thy traitorous deed be the cause of thy destruction. Then the wolf stood bolt upright in the pit, and taking the fox upon his shoulders, raised him to the level of the ground, whereupon Reynard gave a spring from his back and lighted on the surface of the earth. When he found himself safely out of the cleft, he fell down senseless, and the wolf said to him, O oh, my friend, neglect not my case, and delay not to deliver me. The fox laughed with a loud ha-ha, and replied, O oh, dupe, not threw me into thy hand save my laughing at thee and making mock of thee. For in good sooth, when I heard thee profess repentance, mirth and gladness seized me, and I fricked about and made merry and danced, so that my tail hung low into the pit, and thou caughtest hold of it, and draggest me down with thee. And the end was that the law Almighty delivered me from thy power. Then why should I be other than a helper in thy destruction, seeing that thou art of Satan's host? I dreamt yesterday that I danced at thy wedding, and I told my dream to an interpreter, who said to me, Verily thou shalt fall into imminent deadly danger, and thou shalt escape therefrom. So now I know that my falling into thy hand and my escape are the fulfillment of my dream, and thou, O imbecile, knowest me for thy foe. So how couldst thou, of thine ignorance and unintelligence, nurse desire of deliverance at my hands, after all thou hast heard of harsh words from me? And wherefore should I attempt thy salvation when, as the sages have said, in the death of the wicked is rest for mankind, and a purge for the earth. But were it not that I fear to bear more affliction by keeping faith with thee than the sufferings which follow perfidy, I had done mine endeavor to save thee. When the wolf heard this, he bit his forehand for repentance. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 15 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3《Section 16, Volume 3, of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kamna. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3, Section 16. When it was the one hundred and fiftieth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the wolf heard the fox's words, he bit his forehand for repentance. Then he gave the fox fair words, but this availed not, and he was at his wit's end for what to do. So he said to him in soft, low accents, Verily, you tribe of foxes, are the most pleasant, in point of tongue, and the subtlest in jest. And this is but a joke of thine, but all times are not good for funning and jesting. The fox replied, O ignoramus, in good sooth jesting hath a limit, with the jester must not overpass, and deem not that Allah will again give thee possession of me after having once delivered me from thy hand. Quoth the wolf, It behoveth thee to compass my release by reason of our brotherhood and good fellowship, and if thou release me, I will assuredly make fair thy recompense. Quoth the fox, Wise men say, Take not to brother the wicked fool, for he will disgrace thee in lieu of disgracing thee. Nor take to brother the liar for, if thou do good, he will conceal it, and if thou do ill, he will reveal it. And again the sages have said, There is help for everything but death. All may be warded off except fate. As for the reward, thou declarest to be my due from thee. I compare thee herein within the serpent which fled from the charmer. A man saw her, affrighted and said to her, What aileth thee, O thou serpent? Replied she, I am fleeing from the snake Shama, for he seeketh to trap me, and 
if thou wilt save me and hide me with thee i will make fair thy reward and do thee all manner of kindness so he took her incited thereto by lust for the recompense and eager to find favour with heaven and set her in his breast pocket now when the charmer had passed and he had wended his way and the serpent had no longer any cause to fear he said to her where is the reward thou didst promise me behold i have saved thee from that thou fearedest and soughtest to fly replied she tell me in what limb or in what place shall i strike thee with my fangs for thou knowest we exceed not that recompense so saying she gave him a bite whereof he died and i liken thee o dullard to the serpent's inner dealings with her man hast thou not heard what the poet saith trust not to man when thou hast raised his plane and wrath nor that to a cool thou misween smooth fields a viper to the touch and glides with grace yet hides she deadliest venin quoth the wolf o thou glib of gab and fair of face ignore not my case and men's fear of me and well thou weetest how i assault the strongly walled pace and uproot the vines from base wherefore do as i bid thee and stand before me even as the thrall standeth before his lord quoth the fox o stupid dullard who seekest a vain thing i marvel at thy folly and thy front of brass and that thou biddest me serve thee and stand up before thee as i were a slave bought with thy silver but soon shalt thou see what is in store for thee in the way of cracking thy stones with stones and knocking out thy titorous dog teeth so saying the fox climbed the hill overlooking the vineyard and standing there shouted to the vintagers nor did he give over shouting till he woke them and they seeing him all came up to him in haste he stood his ground till they drew near him and close to the pit wherein was the wolf then he turned and fled so the folk looked into the cleft and spying the wolf set to pelting him with heavy stones and they stinted not smiting him with stones and sticks and stabbing him with spears till they killed him and went away thereupon the fox returned to the cleft and said standing over the spot where his foe had been slain saw the wolf dead so he wagged his head for very joyance and began to recite these couplets faith the wolf soul snatched up from wordly stead far be from bliss his soul that perished abu sirhan how sore thou soughtest my death thou burned this day in fire of sorrow dread thou art fallen into pit where all who fall are blown by death blast down among the dead thence forward the aforesaid fox abode alone in the vineyard unto the hour of his death secure and fearing no hurt and such are the adventures of the wolf and the fox but men also tell a tale of the mouse and the ichinum a mouse and an ichinum once dealt in the house of a peasant who was very poor and one of his friends sickened the doctor prescribed him husked sesame so the hind sought of one of his comrades sesame to be husked by way of healing the sick man and when a measure thereof was given to him he carried it home to his wife and bade her dress it so she steeped it and husked it and spread it out to dry now when the ichinum saw the grain she went up to it and fell to cra- carrying it away to her hole and she toiled all day till she had borne off the most of it presently in came the peasant's wife and seeing much of the spray- grain gone stood a while wondering after which she sat down to watch and find out who might be the intruder and make him account for her loss after a while out crept the ichinum to carry off the grain as was her wont but spying the woman seated there knew that she was on the watch for her and said in her mind verily this affair is like to end blamably and so i fear me this woman is on the lookout for me and fortune is no friend to those 
to who can who attend not to the issue and end so there is no help for it but that i do a fair deed whereby i may manifest my innocence and wash out all the ill doings i have done so saying she began to tackle the to take the sesame out of a hole and carry it forth and lay it back upon the rest the woman stood by and seeing the ichinum do thus said to herself verily this is not the cause of our loss for she bring it back from the hole for him who stole it and returned it to its place and of a truth she had done us a kindness in storing us a sesame and the reward of those who does us good is that we do them the like good it is clear that it is she who stole the grain but i will not cease my watching till he fall into my hands and i find out who is the thief the ichinum guessed what was in her mind so she went to the mouse and said to her o my sister there is good in one who observeth not the claims of neighbourship and who showeth no constancy in friendship the mouse replied even so o my friend and i delight in thee and in thy neighbourhood but what be the motive of this speech quoth it the ichinum the house master hath brought some home some sesame and hath eaten his fill of it he and his family and hath left much every living being hath eaten of it and if thou take of it in thy return thou art worthier thereof than any other this pleased the mouse and she squeaked for joy and danced and frisked her ears and tail and greed for the grain deluded her so she rose at once and issuing forth of her home saw the sesame husked and dry shining with whiteness and the woman sitting at watch and ward the mouse taking no thought to the issue of the affair for the woman had armed herself with a cudgel and unable to contain herself ran up to the sesame and began turning it over and eating of it whereupon the woman smote her with that club and cleft her head so the cause of the, her destruction were her greed and headlessness of consequences then said the sultan o shahrazad by allah this be a goodly parable say me hast thou any story bearing on the beauty of true friendship and the observance of its duty in time of distress and rescuing from destruction answered she yes it hath reached me that they tell the tale of the cat and the crow once upon a time a crow and a cat lived in brotherhood and one day as they were together under a tree behold they spied a leopard making towards them and they were not aware of his approach till he was close upon them the crow at once flew up to the tree top but the cat abode confounded and said to the crow o my friend hast thou no device to save me even as all hope is in thee replied the crow of very truth it behoveth brethren in case of need to cast about for a device when peril overtaketh them and how well said the poet poet a friend in need is he who ever true for they well doing would do him would himself undo one who when fortune gars a sporting rue victimeth self reunion to renew now hard by that tree were shepherds with their dogs so the crow flew towards them and smote the face of the earth with its wings cawing and crying out furthermore he went up to one of the dogs and flapped his wings in his face and flew up a little way whilst the dog ran after him thinking to catch him presently one of the shepherds raised his head and saw the bird flying near the ground and lightning lighting alternately so he followed them and the crow ceased not flying just high enough to save himself and to throw out the dogs and yet tempting them to follow for the purpose of tearing him to pieces but as soon as they came near him he would fly up a little and so at last he brought them to the tree under which was the leopard and when the dogs saw him they rushed upon him and he turned and fled now the leopard thought to eat the cat who saved the cat who was saved by the craft of his friend by the crow this story o king showeth that the friendship of brothers of purity delivereth and saveth from difficulties and from falling into mortal dangers and they also tell a tale of the fox and the crow a fox one dwelt once dwelt 
in the cave of a certain mountain and as often as a cub was born to him and grew stout he would eat the young one for he had died of hunger had he instead of doing left the cub alive and bred it by his side and preserved and cherished his issue yet this was very grievous to him now on the chest of the same mountain a crow had made his nest and the fox said to himself i have a mind to set up a friendship with this crow and make a comrade of him that he may help me to my daily bread for he can do in such matters what i cannot so he drew near the crow's home and when he came within the sound of speech he saluted him and said o my neighbour verily a true believer had two claims upon his true be- believing neighbour the right of neighbourliness and the right of al-islam our common common faith and know o my friend that thou art my neighbour and thou hast a claim upon me which is prohibited to observe the more that i have long been thy neighbour also there be implanted in my breast a store of love to thee which biddeth me speak thee fair and obliged me to solicit thy brothership what sayest thou in reply answered the crow verily the truest speech is the best speech and happily thou speakest with thy tongue that which is not in thy heart so i fear lest thy brotherhood be only of the tongue outward and thy enmity be in the heart inward for that thou art the eater and i the eaten and faring apart faring apart were apter to us than friendship and fellowship what then maketh this thee seek that which thou hast may not gain and desire what may not be done seeing that i be the bird kind and thou be of the beast kind verily this thy proffered brotherhood may not be made neither were it seemly to make it rejoined the fox of a truth who knoweth the abiding place of excellent things make it better choice in what he chooseth but their form so perchance he may advantage his brethren and indeed i should love to wound near thee and i have sued for thine intimacy to the end that we may help each other to our several objects and success shall surely wait upon our amity i have a many tales of the goodliness of true friendship which i will relate to thee if thou wish the relating answered the crow thou hast my leave to let me hear thy communication so tell thy tale and relate it to me that i may hearken it hearken to it and where be it and judge of thine with intent thereby rejoined the fox here then o my friend what which is told of a flea and a mouse and which beareth out what i have said to thee asked the crow how so and the fox answered they tell this tale of the flea and the mouse once upon a time a mouse dwelt in the house of a merchant who owned much merchandise and great stories of monies one night a flea a flea took shelter in my in the merchant's carpet bed and finding his body soft and being thirsty drank of his blood the merchant ha- was awakened by the smart of his bite of the bite and sitting up called to his slave girls and serving men so they hastened to him and tucking up their sleeves fell to searching for the flea but as soon as the bloodsucker was aware of the search he turned to flee and coming on to the ma- on the mouse's home entered home entered it when the mouse saw him she said to him what bringeth thee into me thou who art not of my nature nor of my kind and who canst not be assured and of safety from violence or not of being expelled with roughness roughness and ill usage answer the sea answer the flea of a truth i took refuge in thy dwelling to save me from slaughter and i have come to thee seeking thy protection and on now is coveting thy house nor shall any mischief betide thee from me to make thee leave thy home nay i hope right soon to repay thy favours to me with all good and then shalt thou see and praise the issue of my words and when the mouse heard the speech of the flea and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say End of section 16 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3. Recording by Kamna.
Section 17, Volume 3 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night. Translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Moreau. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3, Section 17. When it was the one hundred and fifty-first night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the mouse heard the words of the flea, she said, If the case be as thou dost relate and describe, then be at thine ease here, for naught shall befall thee save the reign of peace and safety, nor shall aught betide thee but what shall joy thee, and shall not annoy thee, nor shall it annoy me. I will lavish on thee my affections without stint, and do not thou regret having lost the merchant's blood, nor lament for thy subsistence from him. But be content with what sustenance thou canst obtain, for indeed that is safer for thee. And I have heard, O flea, that one of the gnomic poets saith as follows in these couplets. I have fared content in my solitude with whate'er befell, and led life of ease on a water-draught and a bite of bread, coarse salt and a gown of tattered frieze. Allah might, and he be pleased, give me easiest life, but with what so pleaseth himself I please. Now when the flea heard these words of the mouse, he rejoined, I hearken to thy charge, and I submit myself to obey thee, nor have I power to gainsay thee till life be fulfilled in this righteous intention, replied the mouse. Pure intention sufficeth to sincere affection. So the tie of love arose and was knitted between them twain, and after this the flea used to visit the merchant's bed by night and not exceed his diet, and house himself by day in the hole of the mouse. Now it came to pass one night that the merchant brought home great store of dinars and began to turn them over. When the mouse heard the chink of the coin, she put her head out of her hole and fell to gazing at it, till the merchant laid it under his pillow and went to sleep. When she said to the flea, Seest thou not the proper occasion and the great good fortune? Hast thou any device to bring us to our desire of yonder dinars? Quoth the flea, Verily, it is not good that one strives for aught, unless he be able to win his will, because if he lack ability thereto, he falleth into what he should avoid, and he attaineth not his wish by reason of his weakness. Albeit he use all power and cunning, like the sparrow which picketh up grain and falleth into the net, and is caught by the fowler. Thou hast no strength to take the dinars and to transport them out of this house, nor have I force sufficient to do this. I the contrary, I could not carry a single ducat of them. So what hast thou to do with them? Quoth the mouse, I have made me for my house these seventy openings, whence I may go out at my desire and I have set apart a place strong and safe for things of price, and if thou can contrive to get the merchant out of the house, I do not doubt of success, and so be that fate aid me. Answered the flea, I will engage to get him out of the house for thee. And going to the merchant's bed, bit him a fearful bite, such as he had never before felt, then fled to a place of safety where he had no fear of the man. So the merchant awoke and sought for the flea, but finding him not, lay down again on his other side. Then the flea bit him a second time, more painfully than before. So he lost patience, and leaving his bed, went out to lay down on the bench before his door, and slept there, and woke not till the morning. Meanwhile the mouse came out, and fell to carrying the dinars into her hole, till she left not a single one. And when day dawned, the merchant began to suspect the folk, and fancy all manner of fancies. And, continued the fox, Know thou, O wise and experienced crow with the clear-seeing eyes, that I tell thee this only to the intent that thou mayest reap the recompense of thy kindness to me, even as the mouse reaped the reward of her kindness to the flea. For see how he repaid her and requited her with the goodliest of requitals. Said the crow, It lies with the benefactor to show benevolence or not to show it, nor is it incumbent on us to entreat kindly one who seeketh a connection that entaileth separation from kith and kin. If I show thee favor, who art my foe by kind, I am the cause of cutting myself off from the world, and thou, O fox, art full of wiles and guiles. Now those whose characteristics are craft and cunning must not be trusted upon oath, and whoso is not to be trusted upon oath 
in him there is no good faith. The tidings lately reached me of thy treacherous dealing with one of thy comrades, which was a wolf, and how thou didst deceive him until thou leddest him into destruction by thy perfidy and stratagems. And this thou didst after he was of thine own kind, and thou hadst long consorted with him, yet didst thou not spare him. And if thou couldst deal thus with thy fellow, which was of thine own kind, how can I have trust in the truth, and what would be thy dealing with thy foe of other kind than thy kind? Nor can I compare thee and me, but with the saker and the birds. How so? asked the fox, answered the crow. They relate this tale of the saker and the birds. There once was a saker who was a cruel tyrant, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the one hundred and fifty-second night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the crow pursued. They relate that there was once a saker who was a cruel tyrant in the days of his youth, so that the raveners of the air and the scavengers of the earth feared him, none being safe from his mischief. And many were the haps and mishaps of his tyranny and his violence, for this saker was ever in the habit of oppressing and injuring all the other birds. As the years passed over him he grew feeble and his force failed him, so that he was often famished, but his cunning waxed stronger with the waning of his strength, and he redoubled in his endeavor and determined to be present at the general assembly of the birds, that he might eat of their orts and leavings. So in this manner he fed by fraud instead of feeding by fierceness and force. And thou, O fox, art like this. If thy might fail thee, thy slight faileth thee not. And I doubt not that thy seeking my society is a fraud to get thy food. But I am none of those who fall to thee and put fist into thy fist. For that Allah hath vouchsafed force to my wings, and caution to my mind, and sharp sight to my eyes. And I know that whoso apeth a stronger than he, wearieth himself, and haply cometh to ruin. Wherefore I fear for thee, lest... If thou apest a stronger than thyself, there befall thee what befell the sparrow. Asked the fox, What befell the sparrow? Allah upon thee, tell me his tale. And the crow began to relate the story of The Sparrow and the Eagle. I have heard that a sparrow was once flitting over a sheepfold, when he looked at it carefully, and behold, he saw a great eagle swoop down upon a newly weaned lamb and carry it off in his claws and fly away. Thereupon the sparrow clapped his wings and said, I will do even as this one did. And he waxed proud in his own conceit and mimicked a greater than he. So he flew down forthright and lighted on the back of a fat ram with a thick fleece, which was become matted by his lying in his dung and stale till it was like woolen felt. As soon as the sparrow pounced upon the sheep's back, he flapped his wings to fly away, but his feet became tangled in the wool, and however hard he tried, he could not set himself free. While all this was doing, the shepherd was looking on, having seen what happened first with the eagle, and afterward with the sparrow. So he came up to the wee birdie in a rage, and seized him. Then he plucked out his wing feathers, and tying his feet with a twine, carried him to his children, and threw him to them. What is this? asked one of them, and he answered, This is he that aped a greater than himself, and came to grief. Now thou, O fox, art like this, and I would have thee beware of aping a greater than thou lest thou perish. This is all I have to say to thee, so fare from me in peace. When the fox despaired of the crow's friendship, he turned away, groaning for sorrow and gnashing teeth upon teeth in his disappointment. And the crow, hearing the sound of weeping and seeing his grief and profound melancholy, said to him, O fox, what dole and doler make thee gnash thy canines? Answered the fox, I gnash my canines because I find thee a greater rascal than myself. And so saying, he made off to his house, and ceased not to fare until he reached his home. Quoth the Sultan, O Shahrazad, how excellent are these thy stories, and how delightsome! Hast thou more of such edifying tales? Answered she, They tell this legend concerning the hedgehog and the wood pigeons. A hedgehog once took up his abode by the side of a date palm, whereupon roosted a wood pigeon and his wife, that had built their nest there and lived a life of ease and enjoyment. So he said to himself, This pigeon pear eateth of the fruit of the date tree, and I have no means of getting at it, but needs must I find some fashion of tricking them. 
Upon this he dug a hole at the foot of the palm tree, and took up his lodgings there, he and his wife. Moreover, he built an oratory beside the hole, and went into retreat there, and made a show of devotion and edification and renunciation of the world. The male pigeon saw him praying and worshipping, and his heart was softened toward him for his excess of devoutness. So he said to him, How many years hast thou been thus? replied the hedgehog. During the last thirty years. What is thy food? That which falleth from the palm tree. And what is thy clothing? Prickles. And I profit by their roughness. And why hast thou chosen this for place rather than another? I chose it and preferred it to all others, that I might guide the erring into the right way, and teach the ignorant. I had fancied thy case, quoth the wood-pigeon, other than this, but now I yearn for that which is with thee, quoth the hedgehog. I fear lest thy deed contradict thy word, and thou be even as the husbandman who, when the seed season came, neglected to sow, saying, Verily I dread lest the days bring me not to my desire, and by making haste to sow I shall only waste my substance. When the harvest time came and he saw the folk earing their crops, he repented him of what he had lost by his tardiness, and he died of chagrin and vexation. Asked the wood-pigeon, What then shall I do that I may be freed from the bonds of the world and cut myself loose from all things save the service of my lord? Answered the hedgehog, Betake thee to preparing for the next world, and content thyself with a pittance of provision. Quoth the pigeon, How can I do this, I that am a bird, and unable to go beyond the date-tree whereon is my daily bread? And even could I do so, I know of no other place wherein I may wone. Quoth the hedgehog, Thou canst shake down of the fruit of the date-tree what shall suffice thee and thy wife for a year's provant. Then do you take up your abode in a nest under the trunk that ye may prayerfully seek to be guided in the right way, and then turn thou to what thou hast shaken down, and transport it all to thy home, and store it up against what time the dates fail. And when the fruits are spent, and the delay is longsome upon you, address thyself to total abstinence. exclaimed the pigeon, O oh, Allah requite thee with good for the righteous intention wherewith thou hast reminded me of the world to come, and hast directed me into the right way. Then he and his wife worked hard at knocking down the dates, till nothing was left on the palm-tree, whilst the hedgehog, finding whereof to eat, rejoiced and filled his den with the fruit, storing it up for his subsistence, and saying in his mind, When the pigeon and his wife have need of their provision, they will seek it of me and covet what I have, relying upon thy devoutness and abstinence. And, from what they have heard of my counsels and admonitions, they will draw near unto me. Then I will make them my prey and eat them, after which I shall have the place and all that drops from the date-tree to suffice me. Presently, having shaken down the fruits, the pigeon and his wife descended from the tree-top, and finding that the hedgehog had removed all the dates to his own place, said to him, O hedgehog, thou pious preacher and of good counsel, we can find no sign of the dates, and know not on what else we shall feed, replied the hedgehog. Probably the winds have carried them away, but the turning from the provisions to the provider is of the essence of salvation, and he who the mouth corners cleft, the mouth without victual hath never left. And he gave not over improving the occasion to them on this wise, and making a show of piety, and cozening them with fine words and false, until they put faith in him and accepted him, and entered his den, and had no suspicion of his deceit. Thereupon he sprang to the door, and gnashed his teeth, and the wood-pigeon, seeing his perfidy manifested, said to him, What hath to-night to do with yesternight? Knowest thou not that there is a helper for the oppressed? Beware of craft and treachery, lest that mishap befall thee which befell the sharpers who plotted against the merchant. What was that? asked the hedgehog. Answered the pigeon, I have heard tell this tale of— THE MERCHANT AND THE TWO SHARPERS In a city called Sinda there once was a very wealthy merchant, who made ready his camel-loads and equipped himself with goods, and set out with his outfit for such a city, purposing to sell it there. Now he was followed by two sharpers, who had made up into bales what merchandise they could get, and giving out to the merchant that they also were merchants, wended with him by the way. So halting at the first halting-place, they agreed to play him false and take all he had, 
but at the same time each inwardly plotted foul play to the other, saying in his mind, If I can cheat my comrade, times will go well with me, and I shall have all these goods for myself. So after planning this perfidy, one of them took food, and putting therein poison, brought it to his fellow. And the other did the same, and they both ate of the poisoned mess, and they both died. Now they had been sitting with the merchant, so when they left him and were long absent from him, he sought for tidings of them, and found the twain lying dead, whereby he knew that they were sharpers who had plotted to play him foul, but their foul play had recoiled upon themselves. So the merchant was preserved, and took what they had. Then quoth the sultan, O oh, Shahrazad, verily thou hast aroused me to all whereof I was negligent. So continue to edify me with these fables. Quoth she, It hath reached me, O king, that men tell this tale of the thief and his monkey. A certain man had a monkey, and that man was a thief who never entered any of the street markets of the city wherein he dwelt, but he made off with great profit. Now it came to pass one day that he saw a man offering for sale worn clothes, and he went calling them in the market. But none bid for them, and all to whom he showed them refused to buy of him. Presently the thief who had the monkey saw the man with the ragged clothes set them in a wrapper and sit down to rest for weariness. So he made the ape sport before him to catch his eye, and whilst he was busy gazing at it stole the parcel from him. Then he took the ape and made off to a lonely place, where he opened the wrapper, and taking out the old clothes, folded them in a piece of costly stuff. This he carried to another bazaar, and exposed for sale together with what was therein, making it a condition that it should not be opened, and tempting the folk with the lowness of the price he set on it. A certain man saw the wrapper, and its beauty pleased him, so he bought the parcel on these terms and carried it home, doubting not that he had done well. When his wife saw it, she asked, What is this? And he answered, It is costly stuff which I have bought at the lowest price, meaning to sell it again and take the profit. Rejoined she, O oh, dupe, would this stuff be sold under its value unless it had been stolen? Dost thou not know that whoso buyeth aught without examining it falleth into error and becometh like unto the weaver? Quoth he, And what is the story of the weaver? And quoth she, I have heard this tale of the foolish weaver. There once was in a certain village a weaver who worked hard but could not earn his living save by overwork. Now it chanced that one of the Richards of the neighborhood made a marriage feast and invited the folk thereto. The weaver also was present, and found the guests who wore rich gear served with delicate viands and made much of by the housemaster for what he saw of their fine clothes. So he said in his mind, if I change this my craft for another craft easier to compass, and better considered, and more highly paid, I shall amass a great store of money, and I shall buy splendid attire, so I may rise in rank, and be exalted in men's eyes, and become even with these. Presently he beheld one of the mountebanks who was present at the feast, climbing up to the top of a high and towering wall, and throwing himself down to the ground, and alighting on his feet. Whereupon the weaver said to himself, Needs must I do as this one hath done, for surely I shall not fail of it. So he arose and swarmed upon the wall, and casting himself down, broke his neck against the ground, and died forthright. Now I tell thee this, that thou sayest, Get thy living by what thou knowest, and thoroughly understandest, lest peradventure greed enter into thee, and thou lust after what is not of thy condition. Quote the woman's husband, not every wise man is saved by his wisdom, nor is every fool lost by his folly. I have seen it happen to a skilful charmer, well versed in the ways of serpents, to be struck by the fangs of a snake and killed, and others to prevail over serpents who had no skill in them and no knowledge of their ways. And he went, contrary to his wife, and persisted in buying stolen goods below their value till he fell under suspicion and perished therefore, even as perished the sparrow in the tale of the Sparrow and the Peacock There was, once upon a time, a sparrow that used every day to visit a certain king of the birds, and ceased not to wait upon him in the mornings, and not to leave him till the evenings, being the first to go in and the last to go out. One day a company of birds chanced to assemble on a high mountain, and one of them said to another, Verily we are waxed many, and many are the differences between us, 
and there is no help for it but we have a king to look into our affairs so shall we all be at one and our differences will disappear thereupon up came that sparrow and counselled them to choose for king the peacock that is the prince he used to visit so they chose the peacock for their king and he become their sovereign bestowed largesse upon them and made the sparrow his secretary and prime minister now the sparrow was wont by times to quit his assiduous service in the presence of the king and look into matters in general so one day he absented himself at the usual time whereat the peacock was sore troubled and while things stood thus he returned and the peacock said to him what hath delayed thee and thou the nearest to me of all my servants and the dearest of all my dependents replied the sparrow i have seen a thing which is doubtful to me and whereat i am affrighted asked the peacock what was it thou sawest and the sparrow answered i saw a man set up a net hard by my nest peg down its pegs strew grain in its midst and withdraw far off and i sat watching what he would do when behold fate and fortune drave thither a crane and his wife which fell into the midst of the net and began to cry out whereupon the fowler rose up and took them this troubled me and such is the reason for my absence from thee o king of the age but never again will i abide in that nest for fear of the net rejoined the peacock depart not thy dwelling for against fate and lot forethought will avail thee not and the sparrow obeyed his bidding and said i will forthwith arm myself with patience and forbear to depart in obedience to the king so he ceased not taking care of himself and carrying food to his sovereign who would eat what sufficed him and after feeding drink his water and dismiss the sparrow now one day as he was looking into matters lo and behold he saw two sparrows fighting on the ground and said in his mind how can i who am the king's wazir look on and see sparrows fighting in my neighbourhood by allah i must make peace between them so he flew down to reconcile them but the fowler cast a net over the whole number and the sparrow happened to be in their very midst then the fowler arose and took him and gave him to his comrade saying take care of him i never saw fatter or finer but the sparrow said to himself i have fallen into that which i feared and none but the peacock inspired me with false confidence it availed me not to beware of the stroke of fate and fortune since even he who taketh precaution may never flee from destiny and how well said the poet in this poetry whatso is not to be shall ne'er become no wise and that to be must come to pass yea it shall come to pass at time ordained and the ignoramus eyes shall cry alas whereupon quoth the king o shahrazad recount me other of these tales and quoth she i will do so during the coming night if life be granted to me by the king whom allah bring to honour and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say End of section 17 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3section 18 volume 3 the book of a thousand nights and a night translated by richard burton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the book of a thousand nights and a night volume 3 section 18 when it was the 153rd night she said I will relate the tale of Ali bin Bakar and of Shams al-Nahar. It hath reached me, O August King, that in the days of yore, and in times and ages long long before, during the caliphate of Harun al-Rashid, there was a merchant who named his son Abu al-Asan, Ali bin Tahir. And the same was of great goods and grace, while his son was fair of form and face, and held in favor by all folk. He used to enter the royal palace without asking leave, for all the caliph's concubines and slave girls loved him. And he was wont to be companion with al Rashid in his cups, and recite verses to him, and tell him curious tales and witty. Withal he sold and bought in the merchant's bazaar, and there he used to sit in his shop a young youth named Ali bin Bakar, of the sons of the Persian kings, who was formous of form, and symmetrical of shape, and perfect of figure with cheeks as red as roses and joined eyebrows, sweet as speech, laughing-lipped, 
and delighting in mirth and gaiety. Now it chanced one day, as the two sat talking and laughing, behold, there came up ten damsels like moons, every one of them complete in beauty and loveliness, in elegance and grace. And amongst them was a young lady riding on a she-mule, with a saddle of brocade and stirrups of gold. She wore an outer veil of fine stuff, and her waist was girt with a girdle of gold-embroidered silk, and she was even as saith the poet, silky her skin, and silk that zone and waist, sweet voice, words not o'er many, nor too few. Two eyes quoth all a bee, and they became, and work like wine on hearts they make to rue. O love I feel, grow greater every night, O solace, doom day bring our interview. And when the courage reached Abu al Hassan's shop, she alighted from her mule, and sitting down on the front board, saluted him, and he returned her salam. When Ali bin Bakar saw her, she ravished his understanding, and he rose to go away. But she said to him, Sit in thy place. We came to thee, and thou goest away. This is not fair. Replied he, O my lady, by Allah, I flee from what I see, for the tongue of the case saith, She is a sun which towereth high a sky, so ease thy heart with cure and patience lent. Thou to where sky height shall fail to fly, nor she from sky height can make descent. When she heard this, she smiled and asked Abu al-Hasan, What is the name of this young man? Who answered, He is a stranger, and she inquired, What countryman is he? Whereto the merchant replied, He is a descendant of the Persian kings. His name is Ali, son of Bakar, and the stranger deserveth honor. Rejoined she, When my damsel comes to thee, come thou at once to us, and bring him with thee, that we may entertain him in our abode, lest he blame us and say, there is no hospitality in the people of Baghdad, for niggardliness is the worst fault a man can have. Thou hearest what I say to thee, and if thou disobey me, thou wilt incur my displeasure, and I will never again visit thee or salute thee. Quoth Abu al Hasan, On my head and my eyes, Allah preserve me from thy displeasure, fair lady. Then she rose and went her way. Such was her case. But as regards Ali bin Bakar, he remained in such a state of bewilderment. Now after an hour the damsel came to Abu al Hasan and said to him, Of a truth my lady Shams al Nahar, the favorite of the commander of the faithful, Harun al Rashid, biddeth thee to her, thee and thy friend, my lord Ali bin Bakar. So he rose and taking Ali with him, followed the girl to the cow's palace, where she carried them into a chamber and made them sit down. They talked together a while, when behold, trays of food were set before them, and they ate and washed their hands. Then she brought them wine, and they drank deep and merry, after which she bade them rise and carried them into another chamber, vaulted upon four columns, furnished after the goodliest fashion with various kinds of furniture, and adorned with the decorations as it were one of the pavilions of paradise. They were amazed at the rarities they saw, and as they were enjoying like a review of these marvels, suddenly came up ten slave girls, like moons, swaying and swimming in beauty's pride dazzling the sight and confounding the sprite, and they ranged themselves in two ranks as if they were of the black-eyed brides of paradise. And after a while in came ten other damsels, bearing in their hands lutes and divers instruments of mirth and music. And these, having saluted the two guests, sat down and fell to tuning their lute strings. Then they rose and standing before them, played and sang and recited verses. And indeed, each one of them was a seduction to the servants of the Lord. Whilst they were thus busied, and there entered ten other damsels like unto them, high-bosomed maids, and of equal age, with black eyes and cheeks like the rose, joined eyebrows and looks languorous, a very fascination to every faithful white, and to all who looked upon them a delight, clad in various kinds of colored silks, with ornaments that amazed the band's intelligence. They took up their station at the door, and there succeeded them yet ten other damsels, even fairer than they, clad in glorious way, so as no tongue can say. And they also stationed themselves by the doorway. Then came in a band of twenty damsels, and among them the lady, Shams al Nahar height, as she were the moon among the stars, swaying from side to side, with luring gait and in beauty's pride. And she was veiled to the middle with the luxuriance of her locks, and clad in a robe of azure blue, and a mantilla of silk, embroidered with gold and gems of price. 
and her waist was girt with a zone set with various kinds of precious stones she ceased not to advance with her graceful and kettish swaying till she came to the couch that stood at the upper end of the chamber and seated herself thereon but when ali bin bakr saw her he versified with these verses source of mine evils truly she alones of long love longing and my groans and moans near her i find my soul in melting mood for love of her and wasting of my moans and finishing his poetry he said to abu al hasan hadst thou dealt more kindly with me thou hadst forewarned me of these things ere i came hither that i might have made up my mind in taking patience to support what hath befallen me and he wept and groaned and complained replied abu al hasan o my brother i meant thee naught but good but i feared to tell thee this lest lest such transport should betide thee as might hinder thee from foregathering with her and be a stumbling block between thee and her but be of good cheer and keep thine eyes cool and clear for she to thee inclineth and to favour thee designeth asked ali bin bakar what is this young lady's name answered abu al hasan she is hight sams al nahar one of the favorites of the commander of the faithful harun al rashid and this is the palace of the caliphate then shams al nahar sat gazing upon the charms of ali bin bakar and he upon hers till both were engrossed with love for each other presently she commanded the damsels one and all to be seated each in her rank and place and all sat on a couch before one of the windows and she bade them sing whereupon one of them took up the lute and began caroling give thou my message twice bring clear reply in trice to thee o prince of beauty with complaint i rise my lord his heart blood dear and life's most precious prize give me one kiss and gift or loan if thou devise and if thou craves for more take all that satisfies thou don't be sickness dress thee with health sweet i bless her singing charmed ali bin bakar and he said to her sing me more of the like of these verses so she struck the strings and began to chaunt these lines by stress of parting o beloved one thou mats the eyelids torment race to run o gladness of my sight and dear desire goal of my wishes my religion pity the youth whose eyes are drowned in tears of lover gone distraught and clean undone when she had finished her verses shams al nahar said to another damsel let us hear something from thee so she played a lively measure and began with these couplets his looks have made me drunken not his wine his grace of gate disgraced sleep to these eyne dazed me no cup but cop with curly crop his gifts overcame me not the gifts of vine his winding locks my patience clue unwound his robe beauties robbed all wits of mine when shams al nahar heard this recital from the damsel she sighed heavily and the song pleased her then she bade another damsel sing so she took the lute and began chanting face that with soul and having lamping vies give tides fair fountain which begins to rise whose curly side beard writeth writ of love and each curl concealeth mysteries cried beauty when i met this youth i knew tis allah's loom such gorgeous robe supplies when she had finished her song ali bin bakr said to the slave maiden nearest him sing us somewhat thou o damsel so she took up the lute and began singing our trysting time is all too short for this long coyish coquetry how long this nay nay and wait wait this is not old nobility and now that time deigns lend delight profits of the opportunity when she ended and ali bin bakar followed up her song with glowing tears as shams al nahar saw him weeping and groaning and complaining she burned with love longing and desire and passion and transport consumed her so she rose from the sofa and came to the door of the outlobe where ali met her and they embraced with the arms round the neck and fell down fainting in the doorway whereupon the damsels came to them and carrying them into the outlobe sprinkled rose water upon them both when they had recovered they found not abu al hasan who had hidden himself by the side of a couch and the young lady said where is abu al hasan so he showed himself to her from beside the couch and she saluted him saying I pray Allah to give me the means of requiting thee, O the countess of men. Then she turned to Ali bin Bakr and said to him, O my lord, passion hath not reached this extreme pass with thee without my feeling the like, but we have nothing to do save to bear patiently what calamity hath befallen us. Replied he, 
By Allah, O my lady, union with thee may not contend me, nor leave me the love of thee which hath mastered my heart, but with the leaving of my life. So saying, he wept, and the tears ran down his cheeks like threaded pearls. And when Shams al Nahar saw him weep, she wept for his weeping. But Abu al Nasan exclaimed, By Allah, I wonder at your case, and am confounded at your condition. Of a truth, your affair is amazing, and your chance dazing. What, this weeping while ye are together? Then how will it be what time ye are parted and far separated? And he continued, Indeed, this is no tide for weeping and wailing, but a season for meeting and merrymaking. Rejoice, therefore, and take your pleasure and shed no more tears. Then Shams al-Nahar signed to a slave girl, who arose and presently returned with handmaids bearing a table, whose dishes of silver were full of various rich viands. They set the table before the pair, and Shams al-Nahar began to eat, and to place tidbits in the mouth of Ali bin Bakar, and they ceased not doing till they were satisfied. When the table was removed, and they washed their hands. Then the waiting woman fetched censers with all manner of incense, aloe wood and amber grease, and mixed scents, and sprinkling flasks full of rose water were also brought, and they were fumigated and perfumed. After this, the slaves set on vessels of graven gold containing all kinds of sherbets, besides fruits fresh and dried, that I can desire and I can delight in. And lastly, one brought a flagon of carnelian full of old wine. Then Shams al Nahar chose ten handmaids to attend on them, and ten singing women, and dismissing the rest to their apartments, bade some of those who remained strike the lute. They did as he bade, and one of them began to sing. My soul to him who smiled back my salute, in breast reviving hopes that were no more. The hand of love my secret brought to light, and censor's tongue what lies my ribs below. My teardrops ever pressed twixt me and him, as though my teardrops showing love would flow. When she had finished her singing, Shams al Nahar rose, and filling a goblet, drank it off, then crowned it again, and handed it to Ali bin Bakar. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 18 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3. Translated by Richard Burton. Section 19, Volume 3 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night. Translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3, Section 19. When it was the one hundred and fifty-fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Shams al-Nahar filled a goblet and handed it to Al bin Bakar, after which she bade another damsel sing, and she began singing these couplets. My tears thus flowing rival with my wine, pouring the like of what fills cup to bring. By Allah, what I not, and run these eyne, we wine or else it is of tears I drink. And when she ended her recitation, Al bin Bakar drained his cup and returned it to Shams al Nahar. She filled it again and gave it to Abu al Hasan, who tossed it off. Then she took the lute, saying, None shall sing over my cup save myself. So she screwed up the strings and intoned these verses. The tears run down his cheeks in double row, and in his breast high flameth lover low. He weeps when near a fearing to be far, and whether far or near his teardrops flow. And the words of another, Our life to thee, O cup boy beauty dight, from parted hair to calves, from black to white. Sol beameth from thy hands and from thy lips, Pleiades and full moon through thy colours night. Good sooth the cups which made our heads fly round, Are those thine eyes pass round to daze the sight. No wonder lovers hail thee as full moon, Waning to them for self ere waxing bright. Art thou a deity to kill and quicken, Bidding this fair forbidding other white? Allah from model of thy form made beauty, And the sea first scented with thy sprite. Thou art not of this order of humanity, But angel lent by heaven to man.
when ali bin bakkar and abu al hasan and those present heard shams al nahar's song they were like to fly for joy and sported and laughed but while they were thus enjoying themselves lo up came a damsel trembling for fear and said o oh, my lady the commander of the faithful's eunuchs are at the door afif and masrur and marjan and others whom what i not when they heard this they were like to die with fright but shams al nahar laughed and said have no fear then quoth she to the damsel keep answering them whilst we remove hence and she caused the doors of the alcove to be closed upon ali and abu al hasan and let down the curtains over the entrance they being still within after which she shut the door of the saloon and went out by the privy wicket into the flower garden where she seated herself on a couch she had there and made one of the damsels knead her feet then she dismissed the rest of her women to their rooms and bade the portress admit those who were at the door whereupon masrur entered he and his company of twenty with drawn swords and when they saluted her she asked wherefore come ye whereto they answered the commander of the faithful saluteth thee indeed he is desolated for want of thy sight he letteth thee know that this be to him a day of joy and great gladness and he wisheth to seal this day and complete his pleasure with thy company at this very hour so say wilt go to him or shall he come to thee upon this she rose and kissing the earth replied i hear and i obey the commandment of the prince of true believers then she summoned the women guards of her household and other slave damsels who lost no time in attending upon her and made a show of obeying the caliph's orders and albeit everything about the place was in readiness she said to the eunuchs go to the commander of the faithful and tell him that i wait him after a little space that i may make ready for him a place with carpets and other matters so they returned in haste to the caliph whilst shams al nahar doffing her outer gear repaired to her lover al bin bakkar and drew him to her bosom and bade him farewell whereat he wept sore and said o oh, my lady this leave-taking will cause the ruin of my very self and the loss of my very soul but i pray allah grant me patience to support the passion wherewith he hath afflicted me replied she by allah none shall suffer perdition save i for thou wilt fare forth to the bazaar and consort with those that shall divert thee and thy life will be sound and thy love hidden for sure but i shall fall into trouble and tristesse nor find any to console me more by token that i have given the caliph a tryst wherein haply great peril shall betide me by reason of my love for thee and my longing for thee and my grief at being parted from thee for with what tongue shall i sing and with what heart shall i present myself before the caliph and with what speech shall i company the commander of the faithful in his cups and with what eyes shall i look upon a place where thou art absent and with what taste shall i drink wine of which thou drinkest not quoth abu al hasan be not troubled but take patience and be not remiss in entertaining the commander of the faithful this night neither show him any neglect but be of a good heart now at this juncture behold up came a damsel who said to shams al nahar o oh, my lady the caliph's pages are come so she hastily rose to her feet and said to the maid take abu al hasan and his friend and carry them to the upper balcony giving upon the garden and there leave them till darkness come on when do thou contrive to carry them forth accordingly the girl led them up to the balcony and locking the door upon them both went her away as they sat looking on the garden lo the caliph appeared escorted by near a hundred eunuchs with drawn swords in hand and girt about with a score of damsels as they were moons all clad in the richest of raiment 
and on each one's head was a crown set with jewels and rubies, while each carried a lighted flambeau. The caliph walked in their midst, they encompassing him about on all sides, and Masrur and Afif and Wasif went before him, and he bore himself with a graceful gait. So Shams al-Nahar and her maidens rose to receive him, and, meeting him at the garden door, kissed ground between his hands, nor did they cease to go before him till they brought him to the couch whereon he sat down, whilst all the waiting women who were in the garden and the eunuchs stood before him, and there came fair handmaids and concubines, holding in hand lighted candles and perfumes and incense and instruments of mirth and music. Then the sovereign bade the singer sit down, each in her place, and Shams al-Nahar came up and, seating herself on a stool by the side of the caliph's couch, began to converse with him, all this happening whilst Abu al-Hasan and Ali bin Bakkar looked on and listened unseen of the king. Presently the caliph fell to jesting and toying with Shams al-Nahar, and both were in the highest spirits, glad and gay, when he bade them throw open the garden pavilion. So they opened the doors and windows and lighted the tapers, till the place shone in the season of darkness even as the day. Then the eunuchs removed thither the wine service, and, quoth Abu al-Hasan, I saw drinking vessels and rarities whose like mine eyes never beheld, vases of gold and silver and all manner of noble metals and precious stones, such as no power of description can describe till indeed it seemed to me I was dreaming, for excess of amazement at what I saw. But as for Ali bin Bakkar, from the moment Shams al-Nahar left him, he lay strown on the ground for stress of love and desire. And when he revived he fell to gazing upon these things, that had not their like, and saying to Abu al-Hasan, O oh, my brother, I fear lest the caliph see us, or come to know of our case but the most of my fear is for thee for myself of a truth i know that i am about to be lost past recourse and the cause of my destruction is not but love and longing and excess of desire and distraction and disunion from my beloved after union with her but i beseech allah to deliver us from this perilous predicament and they ceased not to look out of the balcony on the caliph who was taking his pleasure till the banquet was spread before him when he turned to one of the damsels and said to her o garam let us hear some of thine enchanting songs so she took the lute and tuning it began singing the longing of a bedouin maid whose folks are far away who yearns after the willow of the hedges and the bay whose tears when she on travellers lights might for their water serve and eke her passion with its heat their bivouac fire purvey is not more fierce nor ardent than my longing for my love who deems that i commit a crime in loving him alway now when shams al nahar heard these verses she slipped off the stool whereon she sat and fell to the earth fainting and became insensible to the world around her upon which the damsels came and lifted her up and when ali bin bakkar saw this from the balcony he also slipped down senseless and abu al hasan said verily fate hath divided love desire equally upon you twain as he spoke lo in came the damsel who had led them up to the balcony and said to them o abu al hasan arise thou and thy friend and come down for of a truth the world has back straight upon us and i fear lest our case be discovered or the caliph become aware of you unless you descend at once we are dead ones quoth he and how shall this youth descend with me seeing that he hath no strength to rise thereupon the damsel began sprinkling rose-water on ali bin bakkar till he came to his senses when abu al hasan lifted him up and the damsel made him lean upon her so they went down from the balcony and walked on a while till the damsel opened a little iron door 
and made the two friends pass through it and they came upon a bench by the tigris bank thereupon the slave girl clapped her hands and there came up a man with a little boat to whom said she take up these two young men and land them on the opposite side so both entered the boat and as the man rowed off with them and they left the garden behind them ali bin bakkar looked back towards the caliph's palace and the pavilion and the grounds and bade them farewell with these two couplets i offered this weak hand as last farewell while to a heart burning fire that hand is guided o oh, let not this end union let not this be last provision for long road provided thereupon the damsel said to the boatman make haste with them both so he plied his oars deftly the slave girl being still with them and shahrazad perceived the dawning day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the one hundred and fifty-fifth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that the boatman rowed them towards the other bank till they reached it and landed whereupon she took leave of them saying it were my wish not to abandon you but i can go no farther than this then she turned back whilst ali bin bakkar lay prostrate on the ground before abu al hasan and by no manner of means could he rise till his friends said to him indeed this place is not sure and i fear lest we lose our lives in this very spot by reason of the lewd fellows who infest it and highwaymen and men of lawlessness upon this ali bin bakkar arose and walked a little but could not continue walking now abu al hasan had friends in that quarter so he made search for one of them in whom he trusted and who was of his intimates and knocked at the door the man came out quickly and seeing them bade them welcome and brought them into his house where he seated them and talked with them and asked them whence they came quoth abu al hasan we came out but now being obliged thereto by a person with whom i had dealings and who hath in his hands dirhams of mine and it reached me that he designed to flee into foreign parts with my monies so i fared forth to-night in quest of him taking with me for company this youth ali bin bakkar but when we came hoping to see the debtor he hid from us and we could get no sight of him accordingly we turned back empty-handed without a doit but it was irksome to us to return home at this hour of the night so weeting not whither to go we came to thee well knowing thy kindness and wanted courtesy ye are welcome and well come answered the host and studied to do them honour so the twain abode with him the rest of their night and as soon as the daylight dawned they left him and made their way back without aught of delay to the city when they came to the house of abu al hasan he conjured his comrade to enter so they went in and lying down on the bed slept a while as soon as they awoke abu al hasan bade his servants spread the house with rich carpets saying in his mind needs must i divert this youth and distract him from thinking of his affliction for i know his case better than another then he called for water for ali bin bakkar who when it was brought rose up from his bed and making his ablutions prayed the obligatory prayers which he had omitted for the past day and night after which he sat down and began to solace himself by talking with his friend when abu al hasan saw this he turned to him and said o oh, my lord it were fitter for thy case that thou abide with me this night so thy breast may be broadened and the distress of love-longing that is upon thee be dispelled and thou make merry with us so haply the fire of thy heart may thus be quenched ali replied o oh, my brother do what seemeth good to thee for i may not on any wise escape from what calamity hath befallen me so act as thou wilt accordingly abu al hasan arose and bade his servants summon some of the choicest of his friends and sent for singers and musicians who came and meanwhile he made ready meat and drink for them 
so they sat eating and drinking and making merry through the rest of the day till nightfall then they lit the candles and the cups of friendship and good fellowship went round amongst them and the time passed pleasantly with them presently a singing woman took the lute and began singing i've been shot by fortune and shaft of eye down struck me and parted from fondest friend time has proved him foe and my patient failed yet i ever expected it thus would end when ali bin bakkar heard her words he fell to the earth in a swoon and ceased not lying in his fainting fit till daybreak and abu al hasan despaired of him but with the dawning he came to himself and sought to go home nor could his friend hinder him for fear of the issue of his affair so he made his servants bring a she-mule and mounting ali thereon carried him to his lodgings he and one of his men when he was safe at home abu al hasan thanked allah for his deliverance from that sore peril and sat a while with him comforting him but ali could not contain himself for the violence of his love and longing so abu al hasan rose to take leave of him and returned to his own place and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the one hundred and fifty-sixth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that when abu al hasan rose to take leave of him ali son of bakkar exclaimed o oh, my brother leave me not without news i hear and obey replied the other and forthwith went away and repairing to his shop opened it and sat there all day expecting news of shams al nahar but none came he passed the night in his own house, and, when dawned the day, he walked to Ali bin Bakkar's lodging, and went in and found him thrown on his bed, with his friends about him, and physicians around him, prescribing something or other, and the doctors feeling his pulse. When he saw Abu al-Hasan enter, he smiled, and the visitor, after saluting him, inquired how he did, and sat with him till the folk withdrew, when he said to him, what plight is this quoth ali bin bakkar it was bruited abroad that i was ill and my comrades heard the report and i have no strength to rise and walk so as to give him the lie who noised abroad my sickness but continue lying strown here as thou seest so my friends came to visit me say however o oh, my brother hast thou seen the slave girl or heard any news of her he replied i have not seen her since the day we parted from her on tigris bank and he presently added o oh, my brother beware thou of scandal and leave this weeping rejoined ali o oh, my brother indeed i have no control over myself and he sighed and began reciting she gives a woman's hand a force that fails the hand of me and with red dye on wrist she gars my patience fail and flee and for her hand she fears so sore what shafts her eyes discharge she is fain to clothe and guard her hand with mail ring panoply the leech in ignorance felt my pulse the while to him i cried sick is my heart so quit my hand which hath no malady quoth she to that fair nightly vision favoured me and fled by allah picture him nor add nor bait in least degree replied the dream i leave him though he die of thirst i cry stand off from water pit and say why this persistency rain tear pearls her narcissus eyes and rose on cheek belit she made my sherbet and the lote with bits of hail she bit and when his recital was ended he said o oh, abu al hasan i am smitten with an affliction from which i deemed myself in perfect surety and there is no greater ease for me than death replied he be patient haply allah will heal thee 
then he went out from him and repairing to his shop opened it nor had he sat long when suddenly up came the handmaid who saluted him he returned her salam and looking at her saw that her heart was palpitating and that she was in sore trouble and showed signs of great affliction so he said to her thou art welcome and well come how is it with shams al nahar she answered i will presently tell thee but first let me know how doth ali bin bakar so he told her all that had passed and how his case stood whereat she grieved and sighed and lamented and marvelled at his condition then said she my lady's case is still stranger than this for when you went away and fared homewards i turned back my heart beating hard on your account and hardly crediting your escape on entering i found her lying prostrate in the pavilion speaking not nor answering any whilst the commander of the faithful sat by her not knowing what ailed her and finding none who could make known to him aught of her ailment she ceased not from her swoon till midnight when she recovered and the prince of the faithful said to her what harm hath happened to thee o shams al nahar and what hath befallen thee this night now when she heard the caliph's words she kissed his feet and said allah make me thy ransom o prince of true believers verily a sourness of stomach lighted a fire in my body so that i lost my senses for excess of pain and i know no more of my condition asked the caliph what hast thou eaten to-day and she answered i broke my fast on something i had never tasted before then she feigned to be recovered and calling for a something of wine drank it and begged the sovereign to resume his diversion so he sat down again on his couch in the pavilion and the sitting was resumed but when she saw me she asked me how you fared i told her what i had done with you both and repeated to her the verses which ali bin bakkar had composed at parting tide whereat she wept secretly but presently held her peace after a while the commander of the faithful ordered a damsel to sing and she began reciting life has no sweet for me since forth ye fared would heaven i wot how fair ye who forsake where only fit my tears were tears of blood since you are weeping for mine absence sake but when my lady heard this verse, she fell back on the sofa in a swoon. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 19 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3 Reading by Lars Rolander Section 20, Volume 3 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3, Section 20. When it was the one hundred and fifty-seventh night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the slave-girl continued to Abu al-Hasan. But when my lady heard this verse, she fell back on the sofa in a swoon, and seized her hand and sprinkled rose-water on her face, till she revived when I said to her, O oh, my lady, expose not thyself, and all thy palace containeth by the life of thy beloved be thou patient she replied can aught before me worse than death which indeed i seek for by allah my ease is therein whilst we were thus talking another damsel sang these words of the poet quoth they may be that patient lend thee ease quoth i since fared he where is patience place Convenant he made twixt me and him to cut the cords of patience at our last embrace. 
and as soon as she had finished her verse shams al nahar swooned away once more which when the caliph saw he came to her in haste and commanded the wine to be removed and each damsel to return to her chamber he abode with her the rest of the night and when dawned the day he sent for chirurgeons and leeches and bade them medicine her knowing not that her sickness arose from love and longing i tarried with her till i deemed her in a way of recovery and this is what kept me from thee i have now left her with a number of her body women who were greatly concerned for her when she bade me go to you too and bring her news of ali bin bakkar and return to her with the tidings when abul hasan heard her story he marvelled and said by allah i have acquainted thee with his whole case so now return to thy mistress and salute her for me and diligently exhort her to have patience and say to her keep thy secret and tell her that i know all her case which is indeed hard and one which calleth for nice conduct she thanked him and taking leave of him returned to her mistress so far concerning her but as regards abu al hasan he ceased not to abide in his shop till the end of the day when he arose and shut it and locked it and betaking himself to ali bin bakkar's house knocked at the door one of the servants came out and admitted him and when ali saw him he smiled and congratulated himself on his coming saying o abu al hasan thou hast desolated me by thine absence this day for indeed my soul is pledged to thee during the rest of my time answered the other leave this talk were thy healing at the price of my hand i would cut it off ere thou couldst ask me and could i ransom thee with my life i had already laid it down for thee now this very day shams al nahar's handmaid hath been with me and told me that what hindered her coming ere this was the caliph's sojourn with her mistress and she acquainted me with everything which had betided her and he went on to repeat to him all that the girl had told him of shams al nahar at which ali bin bakkar lamented sore and wept and said to him allah upon thee o my brother help me in this affliction and teach me what course i shall take moreover i beg thee of thy grace to abide with me this night that i may have the solace of thy society abu al hasan agreed to this request replying that he would readily night there so they talked together till eventide darkened when ali bin bakkar groaned aloud and lamented and wept copious tears reciting these couplets thine image in these ein a lip thy name my heart thy home how couldst thou disappear how sore i grieve for life which comes to end nor see i boon of union far or near and these the words of another she split my cask of courage with eye swords that sorely smite she pierced my patience ring mail with her shape like cane spear light patched by the musky mole on cheek was to our sight displayed comfort set round with ambergris light dawning through the night her soul was sorrowed, and she bit carnelian stone with pearls, whose unions in a sugar tank ever to lurk unite. Restless she sighed and smote with palm the snows that clothe her breast, and left a mark thereon. I looked and never beheld such sight. Pens fashioned of her coral nails with amber grief for ink five lines on crystal page of breast did cruelly indite o swordsman armed with trusty steel i bid you all beware when she on you bends deadly glance which fascinates the sprite and guard thyself o thou of spear whenas she draweth near to tilt with slender quivering shape like the nut-brown spear and when ali bin bakkar ended his verse he cried out with a great cry and fell down in a fit abu al hasan thought that his soul had fled his body and he ceased not from his swoon till daybreak 
when he came to himself and talked with his friend, who continued to sit with him till the forenoon. Then he left him and repaired to his shop, and hardly had he opened it, when, lo, the damsel came and stood by his side. As soon as he saw her, she made him a sign of salutation, which he returned, and she delivered to him the greeting message of her mistress, and asked, How doth Ali bin Bakkar? answered he, O handmaid of good, ask me not of his case, nor what he suffereth for excess of love-longing. He sleepeth not by night, neither resteth he by day. Wakefulness wasteth him, and care hath conquered him, and his condition is a consternation to his friend. Quoth she, My lady saluteth thee and him, and she hath written him a letter, for indeed she is in worse case than he and she entrusted the same to me, saying, Do not return save with the answer, and do thou obey my bidding. Here now is the letter, so say, Wilt thou wend with me to him, that we may get his reply? I hear and obey, answered Abu al-Hasan, and locking his shop and taking with him the girl, he went by a way different from that whereby he came to Ali bin Bakkar's house, where he left her standing at the door, and walked in. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the one hundred and fifty-eighth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Abu al-Hasan went with the girl to the house of Ali, son of Bakkar, where he left her standing at the door, and walked in to his great joy. And Abu al-Hasan said to him, the reason of my coming is that such an one hath sent his handmaid to thee with a letter containing his greeting to thee and mentioning therein that the cause of his not coming to thee was a matter that hath betided him the girl standeth even now at the door shall she have leave to enter and he signed to him that it was shams al nahar's slave girl ali understood his signal and answered bring her in and when he saw her he shook for joy and signed to her how doth thy lord allah grant him health and healing he is well answered she and pulling out the letter gave it to him he took it and kissing it opened and read it after which he handed it to abul hasan who found these verses written therein this messenger shall give my news to thee patience what while my sight thou canst not see a lover leaves in love's insanity, whose eyne abide on wake incessantly. I suffer patience pangs in woes that none of men can medicine such my destiny. Keep cool thine eyes, never shall my heart forget, nor without dream of thee one day shall be. Look what befell thy wasted frame, and thence argue what I'm doomed for love to dree and afterwards without fingers i have written to thee and without tongue i have spoken to thee to resume my case i have an eye wherefrom sleeplessness departeth not and a heart when sorrowful thought stirreth not it is with me as though health i had never known nor in sadness ever ceased to wone nor spent an hour in pleasant place but it is as if i were made up of pine and of the pain of passion and chagrin sickness unceasingly troubleth and my yearning ever redoubled desire still growth and longing in my heart still gloweth i pray allah to hasten our union and dispel of my mind the confusion and i would fain thou favour me with some words of thine that I may cheer my heart in pain and repine. Moreover, I would have thee put on patience leaf until Allah vouchsafe relief, and his peace be with thee. When Ali bin Bakkar had read this letter, he said in weak accents and feeble voice, With what hand shall I write, and with what tongue shall I make moan and lament? Indeed she addeth sickness to my sickness, and draweth death upon my death. Then he sat up, and taking in hand ink-case and paper, wrote the following reply. 
in the name of allah the compassionating the compassionate thy letter hath reached me o my lady and hath given ease to a sprite worn out with passion and love-longing and hath brought healing to a wounded heart cankered with languishment and sickness for indeed i am become even as saith the poet straitened bosom reveres dispread slumberless eyelids body wearied patience cut short disunion longsomest reason deranged and heart whose leaf is fled and know that complaining is unavailing but it eath is him whom love longing disordereth and separation destroyeth and with repeating union i keep myself comforted and how fine is the saying of the poet who said did not in love plight joys and sorrows meet how would the message of the writ be sweet when he had made an end of his letter he handed it to abul hasan saying read it and give it to the damsel so he took it and read it and its words stirred his soul and its meaning wounded his vitals then he committed it to the girl and when she took it ali bin bakkar said to her salute thy lady for me and acquaint her with my love and longing and how passion is blended with my flesh and my bones and say to her that in very deed i need a woman who shall snatch me from the sea of destruction and save me from this dilemma for of a truth fortune oppresses me with her visitudes and is there any helper to free me from her turpitudes and he wept and the damsel wept for his weeping then she took leave of him and went forth and abul hasan went out with her and farewelled her so she ganged her gait and he returned to his shop which he opened and sat down there as was his wont. and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the one hundred and fifty ninth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that abu al hasan farewelled the slave girl and returned to his shop which he opened and sat down there according to his custom but as he tarried he found his heart oppressed and his breast straitened and he was perplexed about his case so he ceased not from melancholy the rest of that day and night and on the morrow he betook himself to ali bin bakkar with whom he sat till the folk withdrew when he asked him how he did ali began to complain of desire and to descant upon the longing and distraction which possessed him and repeated these words of the poet men have plained of pining before my time live and dead by parting been terrified but such feelings as those which my ribs immure i have never heard of nor ever espied and these of another poet i have borne for thy love what never bore for his fair case the daft one height of old yet i chase not the wildings of wold and wild like case for madness is manifold thereupon quoth abu al hasan never did i see or hear of one like unto thee in thy love when thou sufferest all this transport and sickness and trouble being enamoured of one who returneth thy passion how would it be with thee if she whom thou lovest were contrary and contumelious and thy case were discovered through her perfidy and ali the son of bakkar says abu al hasan was pleased with my words and he relied upon them and he thanked me for what i had said and done i had a friend continued abul hasan to whom i discovered my affair and that of ali and who knew that we were intimates but none other than he was acquainted with what was betwixt us he was wont to come to me and inquire how ali did and after a little he began to ask me about the damsel but i fenced him off saying she invited him to her and there was between him and her as much as can possibly take place and this is the end of their affair but i have devised me a plan and an idea which i would submit to thee 
asked his friend and what is that answered abu al hasan i am a person well known to have much dealing among men and women and i fear o my brother lest the affair of these twain come to light and this lead to my death and the seizure of my goods and the rending of my repute and that of my family wherefore i have resolved to get together my monies and make ready forthright and repair to the city of bassorah and there abide till i see what cometh of their case that none may know of me for love hath lorded over both and correspondence passeth between them at this present their go-between and confidant is a slave-girl who hath till now kept their counsel but i fear lest haply anxiety get the better of her and she discover their secret to some one and the matter being bruited abroad might bring me to great grief and prove the cause of my ruin for i have no excuse to offer my accusers rejoined his friend thou hast acquainted me with a parlous affair from the like of which the wise and understanding will shrink with fear allah avert from thee the evil thou dreadest with such dread and save thee from the consequences thou apprehendest assuredly thy wrecking is aright so abu al hasan returned to his place and began ordering his affairs and preparing for his travel nor had three days passed ere he made an end of his business and fared forth bassorah wards his friend came to visit him three days after but finding him not asked of him from the neighbours who answered he set out for bassorah three days ago for he had dealings with its merchants and he is gone thither to collect monies from his debtors but he will soon return the young man was confounded at the news and knew not whither to wend and he said in his mind would i had not parted from abu al hasan then he bethought him of some plan whereby he should gain access to ali bin bakkar so he went to his lodging and said to one of his servants ask leave for me of thy lord that i may go in and salute him the servant entered and told his master and presently returning invited the man to walk in so he entered and found ali bin bakkar thrown back on the pillow and saluted him ali returned his greeting and bade him welcome whereupon the young man began to excuse himself for having held aloof from him all that while and added o oh, my lord between abu al hasan and myself there was close friendship so that i used to trust him with my secrets and could not severe myself from him an hour now it so chanced that i was absent three days space on certain business with a company of my friends and when i came back and went to him i found his shop locked up so i asked the neighbours about him and they replied he is gone to bassorah now i know he had no surer friend than thou so by allah tell me what thou knowest of him when ali bin bakkar heard this his colour changed and he was troubled and answered i never heard till this day of his departure and if the case be as thou sayest weariness is come upon me and he began repeating for joys that are no more i want to weep while friends and lovers stood by me unscattered this day when disunited me and them fortune i weep lost loves and friendship shattered then he hung his head groundwards in thought a while and presently raising it and looking to one of his servants said go to abu al hasan's house and acquire anent him whether he be at home or journeying abroad if they say he is abroad ask whither he be gone the servant went out and returning after a while said to his master when i asked for abu al hasan his people told me that he was gone on a journey to bassorah but i saw a damsel standing at the door who knowing me by sight though i knew her not said to me art thou not servant to ali bin bakkar even so answered i and she rejoined i bear a message for him from one who is the dearest of all folk to him so she came with me and she is now standing at the door quoth ali bin bakkar bring her in the servant went out to her and brought her in 
and the man who was with Ali looked at her and found her pretty. Then she advanced to the son of Bakr and saluted him. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 20 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3 Read by Lars Rolander Section 21, Volume 3 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3, Section 21. When it was the one hundred and sixtieth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the slave girl came into Ali bin Bakkar, she advanced to him and saluted him and spake with him secretly, and from time to time during the dialogue he exclaimed with an oath and swore that he had not talked and tattled of it. Then she took leave of him and went away. Now Abu al Hasan's friend was a jeweller and when she was gone he found a place for speech and said to ali bin bakkar doubtless and assuredly the caliph's household have some demand upon thee or thou hast dealings therewith who told thee of this asked ali and the jeweller answered i know it by yonder damsel who is shams al nahar's slave girl for she came to me a while since with a note wherein was written that she wanted a necklace of jewels and I sent her a costly collar. But when Ali bin Bakkar heard this, he was greatly troubled, so that the jeweller feared to see him give up the ghost. Yet after a while he recovered himself and said, O oh, my brother, I conjure thee by Allah to tell me truly how thou knowest her. Replied he, Do not press this question upon me. And Ali rejoined, indeed i will not turn from thee till thou tell me the whole truth quoth the jeweller i will tell thee all on condition that thou distrust me not and that my words cause thee no restraint nor will i conceal aught from thee by way of secret but will discover to thee the truth of the affair provided that thou acquaint me with the true state of thy case and the cause of thy sickness then he told him all that had passed from first to last between abu al hasan and himself adding i acted thus only out of friendship for thee and of my desire to serve thee and assured him that he would keep his secret and venture life and good in his service so ali in turn told him his story and added by allah o my brother not moved me to keep my case secret from thee and from others but my fear lest folk should lift the veils of protection from certain persons rejoined the jeweller and i decide not to foregather with thee but of the great affection i bear thee and my seal for thee in every case and my compassion for the anguish thy heart endureth from severance Haply I may be a comforter to thee in the room of my friend, Abu al-Hasan, during the length of his absence. So be thou of good cheer, and keep thine eyes cool and clear. Thereupon Alice thanked him, and repeated these couplets. And say I, patient I can bear his faring. My tears and sighings give my say the lie. How can I hide these tears that course adown, this plain my cheek, for friend to feign to fly? Then he was silent a while, and presently said to the jeweller, Knowst thou what secret the girl whispered to me? Answered he, Not I by Allah, O my lord. Quoth Ali, she fancied that I directed Abu al-Hasan to go to Bassorah, and that I had devised this device to put a stop to our correspondence and consorting. I swore to her that this was on no wise so, but she would not credit me, and went away to her mistress, persisting in her injurious suspicions, 
for she inclined to Abul Hassan and gave ear to his word. Answered the young jeweller, O oh, my brother, I understood as much from the girl's manner, but I will win for thee thy wish. In Salah, rejoined Ali bin Bakkar, who can be with me in this, and how wilt thou do with her, when she shies and flies like a wildling of the wold? Cried the jeweller, By Allah, needs must I do my utmost to help thee, and contrive to scrape acquaintance with her, without exposure of mischief? Then he asked leave to depart, and Ali bin Bakkar said, O oh, my brother, mind thou keep my counsel and he looked at him and wept the jeweller bade him good-bye and fared forth and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the one hundred and sixty-first night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that the jeweller bade him good-bye and fared forth not knowing what he should do to win for him his wishes and he ceased not walking while over musing the matter till he spied a letter lying in the road he took it up and looked at its direction and superscription then read it and behold it ran from the least worthy of lovers to the most worthy of beloveds so he opened it and found these words written therein a messenger from thee came bringing union hope but that he erred somehow with me the thought prevailed so i rejoiced not rather grew my grief still more weeting my messenger of wits and wit had failed but afterwards know o oh my lord that i ken not the reason why our correspondence between thee and me hath been broken off but if the cruelty arise from thy part i will requite it with fidelity and if thy love have departed i will remain constant to my love of the parted for i am with thee even as says the poet be proud i'll crouch bully i'll bear despise i'll pray go i will come speak i will hear bid i'll obey as he was reading lo up came the slave-girl looking right and left and seeing the paper in the jeweller's hand said to him oh my master this letter is one i let fall he made her no answer but walked on and she walked behind him till he came to his house when he entered and she after him saying oh my master give me back this letter for it fell from me thereon he turned to her and said o handmaid of good fear not neither grieve for verily allah the protector loveth those who protect but tell me in truthful way thy case, as I am one who keepeth counsel. I conjure thee by an oath not to hide from me aught of thy lady's affairs, for haply Allah shall help me to further her wishes, and make easy by my hand that which is hard. When the slave-girl heard these words, she said, O oh my lord, indeed a secret is not lost whereof thou art the secretist nor shall any affair come to naught for which thou strivest know that my heart inclineth to thee and would interest thee with my tidings but do thou give me the letter then she told him the whole story adding allah is witness to whatso i say quoth he thou hast spoken truly for i am acquainted with the root of the matter then he told her his tale of ali bin bakkar and how he had learnt his state of mind, and related to her all that had passed from first to last, whereat she rejoiced, and they two agreed that she should take the letter and carry it to Ali, and returned and acquaint the jeweller with all that happened. So he gave her the letter, and she took it and sealed it up as it was before, saying, My mistress, Shams al-Nahar, gave it to me sealed and when he hath read it and given me its reply i will bring it to thee then she took leave and repaired to ali bin bakkar whom she found waiting and gave him the letter he read it and writing a paper by way of reply gave it to her and she carried it to the jeweller who tore asunder the seal and read it and found written therein these two couplets the messenger who kept our commerce hid 
hath failed and showeth wrath without disguise choose one more leal from your many friends who truth approving disapproves of lies to proceed verily i have not entered upon perfidy nor have i abandoned fidelity i have not used cruelty neither have i out of lealty no covenant hath been broken by me nor hath love tie been severed by me i have not parted from penitence nor have i found aught but misery and ruin after severance i know nothing of that thou avouchest nor do i love aught but that which thou lovest by him who knoweth the secret of hidden things none discover i have no desire save union with my lover and my one business is my passion to conceal albeit with sore sickness i ail this is the exposition of my case and now all hail when the jeweller read this letter and learnt its contents he wept with sore weeping and the slave girl said to him leave not this place till i return to thee for he suspecteth me of such and such things in which he is excusable so it is my desire to bring about a meeting between thee and my mistress shams al nahar whosoever i may trick you to it for the present i left her prostrate awaiting my return with a reply then she went away and the jeweller passed the night with a troubled mind and when day dawned he prayed his dawn prayer and sat expecting the girl's coming and behold she came in to him rejoicing with much joy and he asked her what news o damsel she answered after leaving thee i went to my mistress and gave her the letter written by ali bin bakkar and when she read it and understood it she was troubled and confounded but i said to her o oh, my lady have no fear of your affair being frustrated by abu al hassan's disappearance for i have found one to take his place better than he and more of worth and a good man to keep secrets then i told her what was between thyself and abu al hassan and how thou camest by his confidence and that of ali bin bakkar and how that note was dropped and thou camest by it and i also showed her how we arranged matters betwixt me and thee the jeweller marvelled with much wonder when she resumed and now my mistress would hear what so thou sayest that she may be assured by thy speech of the covenant between thee and him so get thee ready to go with me to her forthwith when the jeweller heard the slave girl's words he saw that the proposed affair was grave and a great peril to brave not likely to be undertaken or suddenly entered upon and he said to her o oh, my sister verily i am of the ordinary and not like unto abul hassan for he being of high rank and of well-known repute was wont to frequent the caliph's household because of their need of his merchandise as for me he used to talk with me and i trembled before him the while so if thy mistress would speak with me our meeting must be in some place other than the caliph's palace and far from the abode of the commander of the faithful for my common sense will not let me consent to what thou proposest on this wise he refused to go with her and she went on to say that she would be surety for his safety adding take heart and fear no harm and pressed him to courage till he consented to accompany her with all his legs bent and shivered and his hands quivered and he exclaimed allah forbid that i should go with thee indeed i have no strength to do this thing replied she hearten thy heart if it be hard for thee to go to the caliph's palace and thou canst not muster up courage to accompany me i will make her come to thee so budge not from thy place till i return to thee with her then the slave girl went away and was absent for a while but a short while after which she returned to the jeweller and said to him take thou care that there be with thee none save thyself neither man-slave nor girl-slave quoth he i have but a negress who is in years and who waiteth on me so she arose and locked the door between his negress and the jeweller and sent his man-servants out of the place 
after which she fared forth and presently returned followed by a lady who entering the house filled it with the sweet scent of her perfumes when the jeweller saw her he sprang up and set her a couch and a cushion and she sat down while he seated himself before her she abode a while without speaking till she had rested herself when she unveiled her face and it seemed to the jeweller's fancy as if the sun had risen in his home then she asked her slave girl is this the man of whom thou spakest to me yes answered she whereupon the lady turned to the jeweller and said to him how is it with thee replied he right well i pray allah for thy preservation and that of the commander of the faithful quoth she thou hast moved us to come to thee and possess thee with what we hold secret then she questioned him of his household and family and he disclosed to her all his circumstance and his condition and said to her i have a house other than this and i have set it apart for gathering together my friends and brethren and there is none there save the old negress of whom i spoke to thy handmaid she asked him on what wise he came first to know how the affair began and the matter of abu al hasan and the cause of his wayfaring accordingly he told her all he knew and how he advised the journey thereupon she bewailed the loss of abu al hasan and said to the jeweller no o such a one that men's souls are active in their lusts and that men are still men and that deeds are not done without words nor is end ever reached without endeavour rest is won only by work and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the one hundred and sixty-second night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Shams al Nahar thus addressed the jeweller, Rest is gained only by work, and success is gendered only by help of the generous. Now I have acquainted thee with our affair, and it is in thy hand to expose us or to shield us i say no more because thy generosity requireth not thou knowest that this my handmaid keepeth my counsel and therefore occupieth high place in my favour and i have selected her to transact my affairs of importance so let none be worthier in thy sight than she and acquaint her with thine affair and be of good cheer for on her account thou art safe from all fear and there is no place shut upon thee but she shall open it to thee she shall bring thee my messages to ali bin bakkar and thou shalt be our intermediary so saying she rose scarcely able to rise and fared forth the jeweller faring before her to the door of her house after which he returned and sat down again in his place having seen of her beauty and heard of her speech what dazzled him and dazed his wit and having witnessed of her grace and courtesy what bewitched his sprite he sat musing on her perfections till his mind was waxed tranquil when he called for food and ate enough to keep soul and body together then he changed his clothes and went out and repairing to the house of the youth ali bin bakkar knocked at the door the servants hastened to admit him and walked before him till they had brought him to their master whom he found strown upon his bed now when he saw the jeweller he said to him thou hast tarried long from me and that hath heaped care upon my care then he dismissed his servants and bade the doors be shut after which he said to the jeweller by allah o my brother i have not closed my eyes since the day i saw thee last for the slave-girl came to me yesterday with a seed letter from her mistress shams al nahar and went on to tell him all that had passed with her adding by the lord i am indeed perplexed concerning mine affair and my patience faileth me for abu al hasan was a comforter who cheered me because he knew the slave-girl when the jeweller heard his words he laughed and ali said why dost thou laugh at my words thou on whose coming i congratulated myself and to whom i looked for provision against the shifts of fortune then he sighed and wept and repeated these couplets 
full many laugh at tears they see me shed who had shed tears and bore they what i bore none feeleth pity for the afflicted woe say one as anxious and in woe galore my passion yearning sighing thought repine are for me cornered in my heart's deep core he made a home there which he never quits yet rare our meetings not as heretofore no friend to establish in his place i see no intimate but only he and he now when the jeweller heard these lines and understood their significance he wept also and told him all that had passed betwixt himself and the slave girl and her mistress since he left him and ali bin bakkar gave ear to his speech and at every word he heard his colour shifted from white to red and his body grew now stronger and then weaker till the tale came to an end when he wept and said o oh, my brother i am a lost man in any case would mine end were nigh that i might be at rest from all this but i beg thee of thy favour to be my helper and comforter in all my affairs till allah fulfil what so be his will and i will not gainsay thee with a single word quoth the jeweller nothing will quench thy fire save union with her whom thou lovest and the meeting must be in other than this perilous place better it were in a house of mine where the girl and her mistress met me which place she chose for herself to the intent that ye twain may there meet and complain each to other of what you have suffered from the pangs of love quoth ali bin bakkar o oh, good sir do as thou wilt and with allah be thy reward and what thou deemst is right do it forthright but be not long in doing it lest i perish of this anguish so i abode with him said the jeweller that night conversing with him till the morning morrowed and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say end of section twenty one of the book of a thousand nights and a night volume three read by lars rolander Section twenty two, volume three of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, volume three, section twenty two. When it was the one hundred and sixty third night, she said, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the jeweller continued. So I abode with him that night, conversing with him till the morning morrowed, when I prayed the dawn prayers, and going out from him returned to my house. Hardly had I settled down when the damsel came up and saluted me, and I returned her salutation, and told her what had passed between myself and Ali bin Bakkar, and she said, Know that the caliph hath left us, and there is no one in our place and it is safer for us and better. Replied I, Sooth thou sayest, yet it is not like my other house which is both fitter and surer for us. And the slave girl rejoined, Be it as thou seest fit, I am now going to my lady, and will tell her what thou sayest, and acquaint her with all thou hast mentioned. So she went away, and sought her mistress, and laid the project before her, and presently returned, and said to me, it is to be as thou sayest, so make us ready the place, and expect us. Then she took out of her breast pocket a purse of dinars, and gave this message. My lady saluteth thee, and saith to thee, Take this, and provide therewith what the case requireth. But I swore that I would accept naught of it. So she took the purse, and returning to her mistress, told her, He would not receive the money, but gave it back to me. No matter, answered Shams al-Nahar. As soon as the slave girl was gone, continued the jeweller, I arose and betook myself to the other house, and transported thither all that was needful, by way of vessels and furniture and rich carpets, and I did not forget china vases and cups of glass and gold and silver, 
and I made ready meat and drink required for the occasion. When the damsel came and saw what I had done, it pleased her, and she bade me fetch Ali bin Bakkar. But I said, None shall bring him save thou. Accordingly, she went to him and brought him back perfectly dressed and looking his best. I met him and greeted him, and then seated him upon a divan befitting his condition, and set before him sweet-scented flowers in vases of china and vari-coloured glass. Then I set on a tray of many-tinted meats, such as broaden the breast with their sight, and sat talking with him and diverting him, whilst the slave-girl went away and was absent till after sundown prayers, when she returned with Shams al-Nahar, attended by two maids and none else. Now as soon as she saw Ali bin Bakkar and he saw her, he rose and embraced her, and she on her side embraced him, and both fell in a fit to the ground. They lay for a whole hour insensible. Then, coming to themselves, they began mutually to complain of the pains of separation. Thereupon they drew near to each other and sat talking charmingly, softly, tenderly. After which they somewhat perfumed themselves and fell to thanking me for what I had done for them. Quoth I, Have ye a mind for food? Yes, quoth they. So I set before them a small matter of food, and they ate till they were satisfied, and then washed their hands. After which I led them to another sitting-room, and brought them wine. So they drank and drank deep, and inclined to each other, and presently Shams al-Nahar said to me, O oh, my master, complete thy kindness by bringing us a lute or other instrument of mirth and music, that the measure of our joy may be fully filled. I replied, On my head and eyes, and rising, brought her a lute which she took and tuned. Then, laying it in her lap, she touched it with a masterly touch, at once exciting to sadness and changing sorrow to gladness. After which she sang these two couplets. My sleeplessness would show I love to bide on wake, and would my leanness prove that sickness is my make, and tear floods course adown the cheeks they only scald. What I knew union shall disunion overtake. Then she went on to sing the choicest and most affecting poesy to many and various modes, till our senses were bewitched, and the very room danced with excess of delight and surprise at her sweet singing, and neither thought nor reason was left in us. When we had sat a while and the cup had gone round amongst us, the damsel took the lute and sang to a lively measure these couplets. My love a meeting promised me and kept it faithfully. One night as many I shall count in number and degree. O night of joyance, fate vouchsafe till faithful lovers tway, uncaring for the railer loon and all his company. My lover lay the night with me and clipped me with his right, while I with left embraced him a faint for ecstasy and hugged him to my breast, and sucked the sweet wine of his lips, full savouring the honey draught the honey man sold to me. Whilst we were thus bedrowned in the sea of gladness, continued the jeweller, behold, there came in to us a little maid trembling, and said, O oh, my lady, look how you may go away, for the folk have found you out and have surrounded the house, and we know not the cause of this. When I heard her words I arose startled, and lo, in rushed a slave-girl who cried, Calamity hath come upon you. At the same moment the door was burst open, and there rushed in upon us ten men masked in kerchiefs, with hangers in their hands and swords by their sides, and as many more behind them. When I saw this, the world was straightened on me for all its wideness, and I looked to the door but saw no issue, so I sprang from the terrace into the house of one of my neighbours, and there hid myself. Thence I found that folk had entered my lodgings and were making a mighty hubbub, and I concluded that the caliph had got wind of us, and had sent his chief of the watch to seize us and bring us before him. So I abode confounded, and ceased not remaining in my place without any possibility of quitting it till midnight. And presently the house-master arose, for he had heard me moving, and he feared with exceeding great fear of me. So he came forth from his room with drawn brand in hand, and made at me, saying, who is this in my house? Quoth I, I am thy neighbour, the jeweller. And he knew me, and retired. Then he fetched a light, and coming up to me said, O my brother, indeed that which hath befallen thee this night is no light matter to me. I replied, O my brother, tell me who was in my house, and entered it breaking in my door, for I fled to thee not knowing what was to do. He answered, Of a truth, 
the robbers who attacked our neighbors yesterday and slew such a one and took his goods saw thee on the same day bringing furniture into this house so they broke in upon thee and stole thy goods and slew thy guests then we arose pursued the jeweller i and he and repaired to my house which we found empty without a stick remaining in it so i was confounded at the case and said to myself as for the gear, I care not about its loss, albeit I borrowed part of the stuff from my friends, and doth come to grief. Yet is there no harm in that, for they know my excuse in the plunder of my property and the pillage of my place. But as for Ali bin Bakar and the caliph's favorite concubine, I fear lest their case get bruited abroad, and this cause the loss of my life. So I turned to my neighbor and said to him, Thou art my brother and my neighbor, and wilt cover my nakedness. What then dost thou advise me to do? The man answered, What I counsel thee to do is to keep quiet and wait, for they who entered thy house and took thy goods have murdered the best men of a party from the palace of the caliphate, and have killed not a few of the watchmen. The government officers and guards are now in quest of them on every road, and haply they will hit upon them, whereby thy wish will come about without effort of thine. The jeweller, hearing these words, returned to his other house, that wherein he dwelt, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the one hundred and sixty-fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the jeweller heard these words, he returned to his other house, wherein he dwelt, and said to himself, Indeed, this that hath befallen me is what Abu al-Hasan feared, and from which he fled to Bassorah and now I have fallen into it. Presently the pillage of his pleasure-house was noised abroad among the folk, and they came to him from all sides and places, some exulting in his misfortune, and others excusing him and condoling with his sorrow, whilst he bewailed himself to them, and for grief neither ate meat nor drank drink. And as he sat repenting him of what he had done, behold, one of his servants came in to him and said, there is a person at the door who asketh for thee, and I know him not. The jeweller went forth to him and saluted him who was a stranger, and the man whispered to him, I have somewhat to say between our two selves. Thereupon he brought him in and asked him, What hast thou to tell me? Quoth the man, Come with me to thine other house. And the jeweller inquired, Dost thou then know my other house? Replied the other, I know all about thee and I know that also, whereby Allah will dispel thy dolors. So I said to myself, continued the jeweller, I will go with him whither he will, and went out and walked on till we came to my second house, and when the man saw it, he said to me, It is without door or doorkeeper, and we cannot possibly sit in it, so come thou with me to another place. Then the man continued passing from stead to stead, and I with him, till night overtook us. Yet I put no question to him of the matter in hand, and we ceased not to walk on, till we reached the open country. He kept saying, Follow me, and quickened his pace to a trot, whilst I trotted after him, heartening my heart to go on, until we reached the river, where he took boat with me, and the boatman rowed us over to the other bank. Then he landed from the boat, and I landed after him, and he took my hand and led me to a street which I had never entered in all my days, nor do I know in what quarter it was. Presently the man stopped at the door of a house, and opening it, entered and made me enter with him, after which he locked the door with an iron padlock, and led me along the vestibule, till he brought me in the presence of ten men who were as though they were one and the same man, they being brothers. We saluted them, continued the jeweller, and they returned our greeting and bade us be seated, so we sat down. Now I was like to die for excess of weariness, but they brought me rose-water and sprinkled it on my face after which they gave me a sherbet to drink, and set before me food, whereof some of them ate with me. Quoth I to myself, Were there aught harmful in the food, they would not eat with me. So I ate, and when we had washed our hands, each of us returned to his place. Then they asked me, Dost thou know us? And I answered, No, nor in my life have I ever seen you. Nay, I know not even him who brought me hither. Said they, Tell us thy tidings, and lie not at all. Replied I, Know then that my case is wondrous and my affair marvellous, but wot ye anything about me? They rejoined, Yes, it was we took thy goods yesternight, and carried off thy friend and her who was singing to him. Quoth I, Allah let down his veil over you, 
Where be my friend and she who was singing to him? They pointed with their hands to one side and replied, Yonder, but by Allah, O our brother, the secret of their case is known to none save to thee, for from the time we brought the twain hither, up to this day we have not looked upon them nor questioned them of their condition, seeing them to be persons of rank and dignity. Now this and this only it was that hindered our killing them. So tell us the truth of their case, and thou shalt be assured of thy safety and of theirs. When I heard this, continued the jeweller, I almost died of fright and horror, and I said to them, Know ye, O my brethren, that if generosity were lost, it would not be found save with you, and had I a secret which I feared to reveal, none but your breasts would conceal it. And I went on, exaggerating their praises in this fashion, till I saw that frankness and readiness to speak out would profit me more than concealing facts. So I told them all that had betided me to the very end of the tale. When they heard it, they said, And is this young man Ali Bakar's son, and this lady Shams al-Nahar? I replied, Yes. Now this was grievous to them, and they rose and made their excuses to the two, and then they said to me, Of what we took from thy house part is spent, but here is what is left of it. So speaking, they gave me back most of my goods, and they engaged to return them to their places in my house, and to restore me the rest as soon as they could. My heart was set at ease till they split into two parties, one with me and the other against me, and we fared forth from that house, and such was my case. But as regards Ali bin Bakar and Shams al-Nahar, they were well nigh dying for excess of fear, when I went up to them, and saluting them, asked, What happened to the damsel and the two maids, and where be they gone? And they answered only, We know nothing of them. Then we walked on, and stinted not till we came to the river-bank where the bark lay, and we all boarded it, for it was the same which had brought me over on the day before. The boatmen rowed us to the other side, but hardly had we landed and taken seat on the bank to rest, when a troop of horse swooped down on us like eagles and surrounded us on all sides and places, whereupon the robbers with us sprang up in haste like vultures, and the boat put back for them and took them in, and the boatmen pushed off into midstream, leaving us on the river-bank, unable to move or to stand still. Then the chief horseman said to us, Whence be ye? And we were perplexed for an answer, but I said, continued the jeweller. Those ye saw with us are rogues, we know them not. As for us, we are singers, and they intended taking us to sing for them, nor could we get free of them, save by subtlety and soft words. So on this occasion they let us go, their works being such as you have seen. But they looked at Shams al-Nahar and Ali bin Bakar, and said to me, Thou hast not spoken sooth, but if thy tale be true, tell us who ye are, and whence ye are, and what be your place, and in what quarter you dwell. I knew not what to answer them, but Shams al-Nahar sprang up, and approaching the captain of the horsemen, spoke with him privily, whereupon he dismounted from his steed, and setting her on horseback, took the bridle, and began to lead his beast. And two of his men did the like with the youth, Ali bin Bakar, and it was the same with myself. The commandant of the troop ceased not faring on with us, till they reached a certain part of the river-bank, when he sang out in some barbarous jargon, and there came to us a number of men with two boats. Then the captain embarked us in one of them, and he with us, whilst the rest of his men put off in the other, and rode on with us till we arrived at the palace of the caliphate, where Shams al-Nahar landed. And all the while we endured the agonies of death for excess of fear, and they ceased not faring till they came to a place whence there was a way to our quarter. Here we landed and walked on, escorted by some of the horsemen, till we came to Ali bin Bakar's house, and when we entered it, our escort took leave of us and went their way. We abode there, unable to stir from the place, and not knowing the difference between morning and evening, and in such case we continued till the dawn of the next day. But when it was again nightfall, I came to myself, and saw Ali bin Bakar and the women and men of his household weeping over him, for he was stretched out without sense or motion. Some of them came to me, and thoroughly arousing me, said, Tell us what hath befallen our son, and say how came he in this plight. Replied I, O folk, hearken to me. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 22 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3
Section 23, Volume 3 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3, Section 23. When it was the one hundred and sixty-fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the jeweller answered them, O folk, hearken to my words, and give me no trouble and annoyance, but be patient, and he will come to tell you his tale for himself. And I was hard upon them, and made them afraid of a scandal between me and them. But as we were thus, behold, Ali bin Bakkar moved on his carpet-bed, whereat his friends rejoiced, and the stranger folk withdrew from him but his people forbade me to go away. Then they sprinkled rose-water on his face, and he presently revived and sensed the air. Whereupon they questioned him of his case, and he essayed to answer them, but his tongue could not speak forthright, and he signed to them to let me go home. So they let me go, and I went forth hardly crediting my escape, and returned to my own house supported by two men. When my people saw me thus, they rose up and set to shrieking and slapping their faces, but I signed to them with my hand to be silent, and they were silent. Then the two men went their way, and I threw myself down on my bed, where I lay the rest of the night, and awoke not till the forenoon, when I found my people gathered round me, and saying, What calamity befell thee, and what evil with its mischief did fell thee? Quoth I, Bring me somewhat to drink. So they brought me drink, and I drank of it what I would, and said to them, What happened, happened. Thereupon they went away, and I made my excuses to my friends, and asked if any of the goods that had been stolen from my other house had been returned. They answered, Yes, some of them have come back, by token that a man entered and threw them down within the doorway, and we saw him not. So I comforted myself, and abode in my place two days, unable to rise and leave it. And presently I took courage and went to the bath, for I was worn out with fatigue, and troubled in mind for Ali bin Bakkar and Shams al-Nahar, because I had no news of them all this time, and could neither get to Ali's house, nor, out of fear for my life, take my rest in my own. And I repented to Almighty Allah of what I had done, and praised him for my safety. Presently my fancy suggested to me to go to such and such a place, and see the folk and solace myself. So I went on foot to the cloth market, and sat a while with a friend of mine there. When I rose to go, I saw a woman standing over against me. So I looked at her, and, lo, it was Shams al-Nahar's slave girl. When I saw her, the world grew dark in my eyes, and I hurried on. She followed me, but I was seized with a fright, and fled from her. And whenever I looked at her, a trembling came upon me whilst she pursued me, saying, Stop, that I may tell thee somewhat. But I heeded her not, and never ceased walking till I reached a mosque, and she entered after me. I prayed a two-bow prayer, after which I turned to her, and sighing, said, What cost thou want? She asked me how I did, and I told her all that had befallen myself and Ali bin Bakkar, and besought her for news of herself. She answered, Know that when I saw the robbers break open thy door and rush in, I was in sore terror for I doubted not that they were the caliph's officers, and would seize me and my mistress, and we should perish forthwith. So we fled over the roofs, I and the maids, and casting ourselves down from a high place, came upon some people with whom we took refuge. And they received us and brought us to the palace of the caliphate, where we arrived in the sorriest of plights. We concealed our case and abode on coals of fire till nightfall, when I opened the river gate, and calling the boatman who had carried us the night before, said to him, I know not what has become of my mistress, so take me in the boat that we may go seek her on the river. Haply I shall chance on some news of her. Accordingly he took me into the boat, and went about with me, and ceased not wending till midnight, when I spied a bark making towards the water-gate, with one man rowing and another standing up, and a woman lying prostrate between them twain. And they rowed on till they reached the shore when the woman landed, and I looked at her, and behold, it was Shams al-Nahar. Thereupon I got out and joined her, dazed for joy to see her after having lost all hopes of finding her alive. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the one hundred and sixty-sixth night, 
she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the slave girl went on telling the jeweller. I was dazed for joy to see her, after having lost all hopes of finding her alive. When I came up to her, she bade me give the man who had brought her thither a thousand gold pieces, and we carried her in, I and the two maids, and laid her on her bed, where she passed that night in a sorely troubled state. And when morning dawned, I forbade the women and eunuchs to go into her, or even to draw near her for the whole of that day. But on the next she revived, and somewhat recovered, and I found her as if she had come out of her grave. I sprinkled rose-water upon her face, and changed her clothes, and washed her hands and feet. Nor did I cease to coax her till I brought her to eat a little and drink some wine, though she had no mind to any such matter. As soon as she had breathed the fresh air and strength began to return to her, I took to upbraiding her, saying, O oh, my lady, consider and have pity on thyself. Thou seest what hath betided us. Surely enough and more than enough of evil hath befallen thee, for indeed thou hast been nigh upon death. She said, By Allah, O good damsel, in sooth death were easier to me than what hath betided me, for it seemed as though I should be slain and no power could save me. When the robbers took us from the jeweller's house, they asked me, Who mayest thou be? And hearing my answer, I am a singing girl, they believed me. Then they turned to Ali bin Bakar and made inquiries about him, And who art thou, and what is thy condition? Whereto he replied, I am of the common kind. So they took us and carried us along, without our resisting, to their abode, and we hurried on with them for excess of fear. But when they had us set down with them in the house, they looked hard at me, and seeing the clothes I wore, and my necklaces and jewellery, believed not my account of myself, and said to me, Of a truth, these necklaces belong to no singing girl, so be soothfast, and tell us the truth of thy case. I returned them no answer whatever, saying in my mind, Now will they slay me for the sake of my apparel and ornaments. And I spoke not a word. Then the villains turned to Ali bin Bakar, asking, and thou, who art thou, and whence art thou? For thy semblance seemeth not as that of the common kind. But he was silent, and we ceased not to keep our counsel, and to weep, till Allah softened the rogues' hearts to pity, and they said to us, Who is the owner of the house wherein we were? We answered, Such a one, the jeweller. Whereupon, quoth one of them, I know him right well, and I wot the other house where he liveth, and I will engage to bring him to you this very hour. Then they agreed to set me in a place by myself, and Ali bin Bakar in a place by himself, and said to us, Be at rest, ye twain, and fear not, lest your secret be divulged. Ye are safe from us. Meanwhile their comrade went away and returned with the jeweller, who made known to them our case, and we joined company with him. After which a man of the band fetched a bark, wherein they embarked us all three, and rowing us over the river, landed us with scant ceremony on the opposite bank, and went their ways. Thereupon up came a horse patrol, and asked us who we were. So I spoke with the captain of the watch, and said to him, I am Shams al-Nahar, the caliph's favorite. I had drunken strong wine, and went out to visit certain of my acquaintance of the wives of the wazirs, when yonder rogues came upon me, and laid hold of me, and brought me to this place. But when they saw you, they fled as fast as they could. I met these men with them. So do thou escort me and them to a place of safety, and I will requite thee as I am well able to do. When the captain of the watch heard my speech, he knew me, and alighting, mounted me on his horse, and in like manner did two of his men with Ali bin Bakar. So I spoke to her, continued the handmaid, and blamed her doings, and bade her beware, and said to her, O oh, my lady, have some care for thy life. But she was angered at my words, and cried out at me. Accordingly, I left her, and came forth in quest of thee, but found thee not, and dared not to go to the house of Ali bin Bakar. So stood watching for thee, that I might ask thee of him, and what how it goes with him. And I pray thee of thy favour to take of me some money, for thou hast doubtless borrowed from thy friends part of the gear, and as it is lost, it behoveth thee to make it good with the folk. I replied, To hear is to obey, go on. And I walked with her till we drew near my house, when she said to me, Wait here till I come back to thee. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the one hundred and sixty-seventh night, she said, 
It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that after the slave-girl had addressed the jeweller, wait here till I come back to thee. She went away, and presently returned with money, which she put, continued the jeweller, into my hand, saying, O my master, in what place shall we meet? Quoth I, I will start and go to my house at once, and suffer hard things for thy sake, and contrive how thou mayest win access to him, for such access is difficult at this present. Said she, Let me know some spot where I shall come to thee, and I answered, In my other house I will go thither forthright, and have the doors mended and the place made safe again, and henceforth we will meet there. Then she took leave of me and went her way, whilst I carried the money home, and counting it, found it five thousand dinars. So I gave my people some of it, and to all who had lent me aught I made good their loss, after which I arose and took my servants, and repaired to my other house, whence the things had been stolen. And I brought builders and carpenters and masons, who restored it to its former state. Moreover, I placed my negress slave there, and forgot the mishaps which had befallen me. Then I fared forth and repaired to Ali bin Bakar's house, and when I reached it, his slave-servants accosted me, saying, Our Lord calleth for thee night and day, and hath promised to free whichever of us bringeth thee to him. So they have been wandering about in quest of thee everywhere, but knew not in what part to find thee. Our master is by way of recovering strength, but at times he reviveth, and at times he relapseth, and whenever he reviveth he nameth thee, and saith, Needs must ye bring him to me, though but for the twinkling of an eye. And then he sinketh back into his torpor. Accordingly, continued the jeweller, I accompanied the slave and went in to Ali bin Bakar, and finding him unable to speak, sat down at his head. Whereupon he opened his eyes, and seeing me, wept and said, Welcome and well come. I raised him, and making him sit up, strained him to my bosom, and he said, Know, O my brother, that from the hour I took to my bed I have not sat up till now. Praise to Allah that I see thee again. And I ceased not to prop him, and support him, until I made him stand on his feet and walk a few steps, after which I changed his clothes and he drank some wine, but all this he did for my satisfaction. Then, seeing him somewhat restored, I told him what had befallen me with the slave-girl, none else hearing me, and said to him, Take heart, and be of good courage, I know what thou sufferest. He smiled, and I added, Verily, nothing shall betide thee save what shall rejoice thee and medicine thee. Thereupon he called for food, which being brought he signed to his pages, and they withdrew. Then quoth he to me, O my brother, hast thou seen what hath befallen me? And he made excuses to me, and asked how I had fared all that while. I told him everything that had befallen me, from beginning to end, whereat he wondered, and calling his servants, said, Bring me such and such things. They brought in fine carpets and hangings, and besides that vessels of gold and silver, more than I had lost, and he gave them all to me. So I sent them to my house and abode with him that night. When the day began to yellow, he said to me, Know thou that as to all things there is an end, so the end of love is either death or accomplishment of desire. I am nearer unto death, would I had died ere this befell. And had not Allah favoured us, we had been found out and put to shame. And now I know not what shall deliver me from this my strait, and were it not that I fear Allah, I would hasten my own death. For know, O my brother, that I am like bird in cage, and that my life is of a surety perished, choked by the distresses which have befallen me. Yet hath it a period established firm, and an appointed term." And he wept and groaned, and began repeating, Enough of tears hath shed the lover white, When grief outcast all patience from his sprite. He hid the secrets which united us, But now his eye parts what he did unite. When he had finished his verses, the jeweller said to him, O oh, my lord, I now intend returning to my house. He answered, There be no harm in that. Go and come back to me with news as fast as possible, For thou seest my case. So I took leave of him, continued the jeweller, and went home, and hardly had I sat down, when up came the damsel, choked with long weeping. I asked, What is the matter? And she answered, O oh, my lord, know then that what we feared hath befallen us, for when I left thee yesterday and returned to my lady, I found her in a fury with one of the two maids who were with us the other night, and she ordered her to be beaten. The girl was frightened and ran away, but as she was leaving the house, 
one of the door-porters and guards of the gate met her and took her up, and would have sent her back to her mistress. However, she let fall some hints which were a disclosure to him, so he cajoled her and led her on to talk, and she tattled about our case, and let him know of all our doings. This affair came to the ears of the caliph, who bade remove my mistress, Shams al-Nahar, and all her gear to the palace of the caliphate, and set over her a guard of twenty eunuchs. Since then, to the present hour, he hath not visited her, nor hath given her to know the reason of his action. But I suspect this to be the cause. Wherefore I am in fear for my life, and am sorely troubled, O my lord, knowing not what I shall do, nor with what contrivance I shall order my affair and hers, for she hath none by her more trusted or more trustworthy than myself. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 23 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3Section 24, Volume 3, of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3, Section 24. When it was the 168th night, she said, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the slave-girl thus addressed the jeweller. And in very sooth my lady hath none by her more trusted or more trustworthy in matter of secrecy than myself. So go thou, O my master, and speed thee without delay to Ali bin Bakar, and acquaint him with this, that he may be on his guard and ward, and if the affair be discovered, we will cast about for some means whereby to save our lives." On this, continued the jeweller, I was seized with sore trouble, and the world grew dark in my sight, for the slave-girl's words. And when she was about to wend, I said to her, What reckest thou, and what is to be done? Quoth she, My counsel is that thou hasten to Ali bin Bakar, if thou be indeed his friend, and desire to save him. Thine be it to carry him this news at once, without aught of stay and delay, or regard for far and near and mine be it to sniff about for further news. Then she took her leave of me and went away. So I rose and followed her track, and betaking myself to Ali bin Bakar, found him flattering himself with impossible expectations. When he saw me returning to him so soon, he said, I see thou hast come back to me forthwith, and only too soon. I answered, patience, and cut short this foolish connection, and shake off the preoccupation wherein thou art, for there hath befallen that which may bring about the loss of thy life and good. Now when he heard this, he was troubled and strongly moved, and said to me, O oh, my brother, tell me what hath happened. Replied I, O oh, my lord, know that such and such things have happened, and thou art lost without recourse, if thou abide in this thy house till the end of the day. At this he was confounded, and his soul well-nigh departed his body. But he recovered himself, and said to me, What shall I do, O my brother, and what counsel hast thou to offer? Answered I, My advice is that thou take what thou canst of thy property, and whom of thy slaves thou trustest, and flee with us to a land other than this, ere this very day come to an end. And he said, I hear, and I obey. So he rose, confused and dazed like one in epilepsy, now walking, and now falling, and took what came under his hand. Then he made an excuse to his household, and gave them his last injunctions, after which he loaded three camels, and mounted his beast, and I did likewise. We went forth privily in disguise, and fared on, and ceased not our wayfare the rest of that day and all its night, till nigh upon morning, when we unloaded, and hobbling our camels, lay down to sleep, but we were worn with fatigue, and we neglected to keep watch, so that there fell upon us robbers, who stripped us of all we had, and slew our slaves, when these would have beaten them off, leaving us naked and in the sorriest of plights, after they had taken our money, and lifted our beasts, and disappeared. As soon as they were gone we arose, and walked on till morning dawned, when we came to a village which we entered, and finding a mosque, took refuge therein, for we were naked. So we sat in a corner all that day, and we passed the next night without meat or drink, 
and at daybreak we prayed our dawn prayer and sat down again. Presently, behold, a man entered, and saluting us, prayed a two-bow prayer, after which he turned to us and said, O folk, are ye strangers? We replied, Yes, the bandits waylaid us and stripped us naked, and we came to this town, but know none here with whom we may shelter. Quoth he, What say ye? Will ye come home with me? And, pursued the jeweller, I said to Ali bin Bakkar, Up, and let us go with him, and we shall escape two evils. The first our fear lest some one who knoweth us enter this mosque and recognize us, so that we come to disgrace, and the second that we are strangers and have no place wherein to lodge. And he answered helplessly, As thou wilt. Then the man said to us again, O oh, ye poor folk, give ear unto me, and come with me to my place. And I replied, Hearkening and obedience. Whereupon he pulled off a part of his own clothes, and covered us therewith, and made his excuses to us, and spoke kindly to us. Then we arose, and accompanied him to his house, and he knocked at the door, whereupon a little slave-boy came out and opened to us. The host entered, and we followed him. When he called for a bundle of clothes and muslins for turbans, and gave us each a suit and a piece, so we dressed and turbaned ourselves, and sat us down. Presently in came a damsel with a tray of food, and set it before us, saying, Eat. We ate some small matter, and she took away the tray, after which we abode with our host till nightfall, when Ali bin Bakkar sighed and said to me, Know, O my brother, that I am a dying man past hope of life, and I would charge thee with a charge. It is that when thou seest me dead, thou go to my parent, and tell her of my decease and bid her come hither, that she may be here to receive the visits of condolence, and be present at the washing of my corpse. And do thou exhort her to bear my loss with patience. Then he fell down in a fainting fit, and when he recovered he heard a damsel singing afar off, and making verses as she sang. Thereupon he addressed himself to give ear to her, and hearken to her voice, and now he was insensible, absent from the world, and now he came to himself and anon he wept for grief and mourning at the love which had befallen him. Presently he heard the damsel who was singing repeat these couplets. Parting ran up to part from lover twain, free converse, perfect concord, friendship fain. The nights with shifting drifted us apart, would heaven I wot if we shall meet again. How bitter after meeting tis to part, may lovers ne'er endure so bitter pain. Death grip, death choke, lasts for an hour and ends, but parting tortures I in heart remain. Could we but trace where parting's house is placed, we would make parting eke of parting taste. When Ali, son of Bakar, heard the damsel's song, he sobbed one sob, and his soul quitted his body. As soon as I saw that he was dead, continued the jeweller, I committed his corpse to the care of the housemaster, and said to him, Know thou that I am going to Baghdad to tell his mother and kinsfolk that they may come hither and conduct his burial. So I betook myself to Baghdad, and going to my house changed my clothes, after which I repaired to Ali bin Bakkar's lodging. Now when his servants saw me, they came to me and questioned me of him, and I bade them ask permission for me to go in to his mother. She gave me leave, so I entered, and saluting her said, Verily, Allah ordereth the lives of all creatures by his commandment, and when he decreeth aught, there is no escaping its fulfillment, nor can any soul depart but by leave of Allah, according to the writ which affirmeth the appointed term. She guessed by these words that her son was dead, and wept with sore weeping. Then she said to me, Allah upon thee, tell me, is my son dead? I could not answer her for tears and excessive grief and when she saw me thus she was choked with weeping, and fell to the ground in a fit. As soon as she came to herself she said to me, Tell me how it was with my son. I replied, May Allah abundantly compensate thee for his loss. And I told her all that had befallen him from beginning to end. She then asked, Did he give thee any charge? And I answered, Yes, and told her what he had said, adding, Hasten to perform his funeral. When she heard these words, she swooned away again, and when she recovered she addressed herself to do as I charged her. Then I returned to my house, and as I went along musing sadly upon the fair gifts of his youth, behold, a woman caught hold of my hand, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say.
When it was the one hundred and sixty-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the jeweller thus continued. A woman caught hold of my hand, and I looked at her, and lo, it was the slave-girl who used to come from Shams al-Nahar, and she seemed broken by grief. When we knew each other, we both wept, and ceased not weeping till we reached my house. And I said to her, Knowest thou the news of the youth, Ali bin Bakar? She replied, No, by Allah. So I told her the manner of his death and all that had passed, whilst we both wept. After which, quoth I to her, How is it with thy mistress? Quoth she, The commander of the faithful would not hear a single word against her, but, for the great love he bore her, saw all her actions in a favorable light, and said to her, O Shams al-Nahar, thou art dear to me, and I will bear with thee, and bring the noses of thy foes to the grindstone. Then he bade them furnish her an apartment decorated with gold and a handsome sleeping chamber, and she abode with him in all ease of life and high favor. Now it came to pass that one day, as he sat at wine according to his custom, with his favorite concubines in presence, he bade them be seated in their several ranks, and made Shams al-Nahar sit by his side. But her patience had failed, and her disorder had redoubled upon her. Then he bade one of the damsels sing, so she took a lute, and tuning it, struck the chords, and began to sing these verses. One craved my love, and I gave all he craved of me. And tears on cheek betray how twas I came to yield. Teardrops, meseemeth, are familiar with our case. Revealing what I hide, hiding what I revealed. How can I hope in secret to conceal my love, Which stress of passion ever showeth unconcealed? Death, since I lost my lover, is grown sweet to me. Would I knew what their joys, when I shall quit the field. Now when Shams on the Har heard these verses sung by the slave-girl, She could not keep her seat, but fell down in a fainting fit, Whereupon the caliph cast the cup from his hand, and drew her to him, crying out. And the damsels also cried out, and the prince of true believers turned her over and shook her, and lo and behold, she was dead. The caliph grieved over her death with sore grief, and bade break all the vessels and dulcimers, and other instruments of mirth and music which were in the room. Then carrying her body to his closet, he abode with her for the rest of the night. When the day broke, he laid her out, and commanded to wash her, and shroud her, and bury her. And he mourned for her with sore mourning, and questioned not of her case, nor of what caused her condition. And I beg thee in Allah's name, continued the damsel, to let me know the day of the coming of Ali bin Bakar's funeral procession, that I may be present at his burial. Quoth I, For myself, where thou wilt thou canst find me, but thou, where art thou to be found, and who can come at thee where thou art? She replied, On the day of Sham al-Nahar's death, the commander of the faithful freed all her women, myself among the rest, and I am one of those now abiding at the tomb in such a place. So I rose and accompanied her to the burial ground, and piously visited Sham al-Nahar's tomb. After which I went my way, and ceased not to await the coming of Ali bin Bakar's funeral. When it arrived, the people of Baghdad went forth to meet it, and I went forth with them. And I saw the damsel among the women, and she the loudest of them in lamentation, crying out and wailing with a voice that rent the vitals and made the heart ache. Never was seen in Baghdad a finer funeral than his, and we ceased not to follow in crowds till we reached the cemetery, and buried him to the mercy of Almighty Allah. Nor from that time to this have I ceased to visit the tombs of Ali son of Bakar and of Sham al-Nahar. This, then, is their story and Allah Almighty have mercy upon them. And yet is not their tale, continued Shahrazad, more wonderful than that of King Shahriman? The king asked her, and what was his tale? And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 24 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3《Section 25, Volume 3 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Filippo Joachim. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3, Section 25. 
when it was the one hundred and seventieth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, as regard the tale of Kamar al-Zaman, that there was in times of yore and in ages long gone before a king called Shariman, who was lord of many troops and guards and officers, and who reigned over certain islands, known as the Khalidan Islands, on the borders of the land of the Persians. But he was stricken in years, and his bones were wasted, without having been blessed with a son, albeit he had four wives, daughters of kings, and threescore concubines, with each of whom he was wont to lie one night in turn. This preyed upon his mind, and disquieted him, so that he complained thereof to one of his wazirs, saying, Verily, I fear lest my kingdom be lost when I die, for that I have no son to succeed me. The minister answered, O king, peradventure Allah shall yet bring something to pass, so rely upon the Almighty, and be instant in prayer. It is also my counsel that thou spread a banquet, and invite to it the poor and needy, and let them eat of thy food, and supplicate the Lord to vouchsafe thee a son, for perchance there may be among thy guests a righteous soul, whose prayers find acceptance, and thereby thou shalt win thy wish. So the king rose, made a lesser ablution, and prayed a two-bow prayer. Then he cried upon Allah with pure intentions, after which he called his chief wife to bed and lay with her forthright. By grace of God she conceived, and when her months were accomplished, she bore a male child, like the moon on the night of fullness. The king named him Kamar al-Zaman, and rejoiced in him with extreme joy and bade the city be dressed out in his honor. So they decorated the streets seven days, whilst the drums beat and the messenger bore the glad tidings abroad. Then wet and dry nurses were provided for the boy, and he was reared in splendor and delight, until he reached the age of fifteen. He grew up of surpassing beauty, and seemly hid, and symmetry, and his father loved him so dear that he could not brook to be parted from him day or night. One day he complained to a certain of his ministers and earned the excess of his love for his only child, saying, O thou the wazir, of a truth I fear for my son, Kamar al-Zaman, the shifts on accidents which befall man, and fain would I marry him in my lifetime, answered the wazir. O king, know thou that marriage is one of the most honorable of moral actions, and thou wouldst indeed do well and right to marry thy son in thy lifetime, ere thou make him sultan. On this quoth the king, Hither with my son Kamar al-Zaman, so he came and bowed his head to the ground in modesty before his sire. O Kamar al-Zaman, said King Shariman, of a truth I desire to marry thee and rejoice in thee during my lifetime. Replied he, O my father, know that I have no lust to marry, nor clothe my soul inclined to women, for that concerning their craft and perfidy I have read many books and heard much talk, even as saith the poet. Now, and of women ask ye, I reply, in their affairs I am versed a doctor rare. When man's head grizzles and his money dwindles, in their afflictions he hath not for share. And another said, Rebel against women, and so shalt thou serve Allah no more. The youth who gives women the rein must for fate all hope to soar. They'll balk him when seeking the strange device, Excelsior. 
thou waste he a thousand of years in the study of science and lore. And when he had ended his verses, he continued, O my father, wedlock is a thing whereto I will never consent. No, not though I drink the cup of death. When Sultan Shariman heard these words from his son, light became darkness in his sight, and he grieved thereat with great grief. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the one hundred and seventy-first night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when King Shariman heard these words from his son, the light became darkness in his sight, and he grieved over his son's lack of obedience to his directions in the matter of marriage. Yet, for the great love he bore him, he was unwilling to repeat his wishes, and was not wroth with him, but caressed him, and spake him fair, and showed him all manner of kindness, such as tendeth to induce affection. All this, and Kamar al-Zaman increased daily in beauty, and loveliness, and amorous grace, and the king bore with him for a whole year, till he became perfect in eloquence and elegant wit. All men were ravished with his charms, and every breeze that blew bore the tidings of his gracious favor. His fair sight was a seduction to the loving, and a garden of delight to the longing. For he was honey-sweet of speech, and the sheen of his face shamed the full moon. He was a model of symmetry, and blandishment, and engaging ways. His shape was as the willow wand, or the rattan cane, and his cheeks might take the place of rose or red anemone. He was, in fine, the pink of perfection, even as the poet has said of him. He came and cried they, Now be Allah blessed. Praise him that clad thou soul in so fair vest. He is king of beauty, where the beauteous be. All are his riots, all obey his hest, his lip dews sweeter than the virgin honey. His teeth are pearls in double row close press, all charms are congregate in him alone, and deals his loveliness to man on rest, beauty wrought to those cheeks for words to see. I testify there is none good but he. When the year came to an end, the king called his son to him and said, O my son, wilt thou not hearken to me? Whereupon Kamar al-Zaman fell down for respect and shame before his sire and replied, O my father, how should I not hearken to thee, seeing that Allah commandeth me to obey thee and not gain see thee? rejoined King Shariman, O my son, know that I desire to marry thee, and rejoice in thee whilst yet I live, and make thee king over my realm before my death. When the prince heard his sire pronounce these words, he bowed his head a while, then raised it and said, O my father, this is a thing which I will never do. No, not though I drink the cup of death. I know of a surety that the Almighty hath made obedience to thee a duty in religion. But Allah upon thee, press me not on this matter of marriage, nor fancy that I will ever marry my life long, for that I have read the books both of the ancients and the moderns, and I have come to know all the mischiefs and miseries which have befallen them through women in their endless artifices. And how excellent is the saying of the poet, He whom the randy moths and trap shall never see deliverance, though build he forts a thousandfold, whose mighty strength led plates and hands, therefore shall be of no avail, these fortresses have not a chance, women I, 
deal in treachery, to far and near over earth's expense, with fingers dipped in henna blood, and locks in braids that mad the glance, and eyelids painted over with coal, they gar us drink of dire mischance. And how excellently saith another, Women, for all the chastity they claim, are awful cast by kites wherever they list. This night their talk and secret charms are shine, that night another joyeth calf and wrist, like in whence after night thou first at dawn, and lodges other white thou hast not wist. Now when Shariman heard these his son's words, and learned the import of his verses and poetical quotations, he made no answer of his excessive love for him, but redoubled in graciousness and kindness to him. He at once broke up the audience, and as soon as the seance was over, he summoned his minister, and taking him apart, said to him, O thou the wazir, tell me how I shall deal with my son in the matter of marriage. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the one hundred and seventy-second night, she said, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the king summoned his minister, and taking him apart, said to him, O thou the wazir, tell me what I shall do with my son in the matter of marriage. Of a truth I took counsel with thee thereon, and thou didst counsel me to marry him, before making him king. I have spoken with him of wedlock time after time, and he still gainsaid me, so do thou, O wazir, forthright advise me what to do. Answered the minister, O king, wait another year, and if after that thou be minded to speak to him on the matter of marriage, speak not to him privily, but address him on a day of state, when all the emirs and wazirs are present, with the whole of the army standing before thee. And when all are in crowd, then send for thy son, Kamar al-Zaman, and summon him. And when he cometh, broach to him the matter of marriage before the wazirs and grandees and officers of state and captains, for he will surely be bashful and daunted by their presence and will not dare to oppose thy will. Now when King Shariman heard his wazir's words, he rejoiced with exceeding joy, seeing success in the project, and bestowed on him a splendid robe of honor. Then he took patience with his son another year, whilst, with every day that passed over him, Kamar al-Zaman increased in beauty and loveliness, and elegance and perfect grace, till he was nigh twenty years old. Indeed Allah had clad him in the cloak of comeliness and had crowned him with the crown of completion. His eye glance was more bewitching than Harut and Marut, and the play of his luring looks more misleading than Tagut, and his cheeks shone like the dawn rosy red, and his eyelashes stormed the keen-edged blade. The whiteness of his brow resembled the moon shining bright, and the blackness of his locks was as the murky night, and his waist was more slender than the gossamer, and his back parts than two sand heaps bulkier, making a babble of the heart with their softness. But his waist complained of the weight of his hips and loins, and his charms ravished all mankind, even as one of the poets saith in these couplets. By his eyelash tendril curled, by his slender waist I swear, by the dart his witchery feathers, fatal hurtling through the air, by the just roundness of his shape, by his glances bright and keen, 
by the swart limping of his locks and his fair forehead shining sheen by his eyebrows which deny that she who looks on them should sleep which now commanding now forbidding over me high dominion keep by the roses of his cheek his face as fresh as myrtle wreath his tulip lips and those pure pearls that hold the places of his teeth by his noble form which rises fatally turned in even swell to where upon his jutting chest two young promgrenades seem to dwell by his supple moving hips his taper waist the silky skin by all he robbed perfection of and holds enchained his form within by his tongue of steadfastness his nature true and excellent by the greatness of his rank his noble birth and high descent musk from my love her savour steals who musk exhales from every limb and all the airs ambergris breathes are but the zephyrs blow over him the sun methinks the broad bright sun as low before my love should quail as would my love himself transcend the paltry paring of his nail so king shariman having accepted the counsel of his wazir waited for another year and a great festival and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the one hundred and seventy-third night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that shariman having accepted the counsel of his wazir waited for another year and a great festival a day of state when the audience hall was filled with the emirs and wazirs and grandees of his reign and officers of state and captains of might and main thereupon he sent for his son kamar al-zaman who came and kissing the ground before him three times stood in presence of his sire with his hands behind his back the right grasping the left and said the king to him know o my son that i have not sent for thee on this occasion and summoned thee to appear before this assembly and all these officers of state here awaiting our orders save and accept that i may lay a commandment on thee wherein do thou not disobey me and my commandment is that thou marry for i am minded to wed thee to a king's daughter and rejoice in thee ere i die when the prince heard this much from his royal sire he bowed his head grand words a while then raising it towards his father and being moved thereto at that time by youthful folly and boyish ignorance replied but for myself i will never marry no not though i drink the cup of death as for thee thou art great in age and small of wit hast thou not twice ere this day and before this occasion questioned me of the matter of marriage and i refused my consent indeed thou dotest and are not wit to govern a flock of sheep so saying kamar al zaman unclasped his hands from behind his back and tucked up his sleeves above his elbows before his father being in a fit of fury moreover he added many words to his sire knowing not what he said in the trouble of his spirits the king was confounded and ashamed for that this befell in the presence of his grandees and soldier officers assembled on a high festival and a state occasion but presently the majesty of kingship took him and he cried out at his son and made it tremble then he called to the guards standing before him and said seize him so they came forward and laid hands on him and binding him brought him before his sire who bade them pinion his elbows behind his back and in this guise make him stand before the presence and the prince bowed down his head for fear and apprehension and his brow and face were beaded and sprangled with sweat 
and shame and confusion troubled him sorely. Thereupon his father abused him and reviled him and cried, Woe to thee, thou son of adultery and nursling of abomination! How dost thou answer me on this wise before my captains and soldiers? But hitherto none hath chastised thee. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the one hundred and seventy-fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that King Shariman cried out to his son, Kamar al-Zaman, How darst thou answer me on this wise before my captains and soldiers? But hitherto none hath chastised thee. Knowest thou not that this deed thou hast done were disgrace to him had it been done by the meanest of my subjects? And the king commanded his Mamelukes to lose his elbow bonds and imprison him in one of the bastions of the citadel. So they took the prince and thrust him into an old tower, wherein there was a dilapidated saloon and in its middle a ruined well after having first swept it and cleansed its floor flags and set therein a couch on which they laid a mattress a leathern rug and a cushion and then they brought a great lanthorn and a wax candle for that place was dark even by day and lastly the mamelukes led kamar al zaman thither and stationed an eunuch at the door and when all this was done the prince threw himself on the couch, sad-spirited and heavy-hearted, blaming himself and repenting on his injurious conduct to his father, whenas repentance availed him not, and saying, Allah, curse marriage and marriageable and married woman, the traitress is all. Would I had hearkened to my father and accepted a wife, had I so done it had been better for me than this jail. This is how it fared with him, but as regards King Shariman, he remained seated on his throne all throughout the day until sundown. Then he took the minister apart and said to him, Know thou, O Wazir, that thou and thou only wast the cause of all this that hath come to pass between me and my son, by the advice thou wast pleased to devise. And so what dost thou counsel me to do now? Answered he, O king, leave thy son in limbo for a space of fifteen days, then summon him to thy presence, and bid him wed, and assuredly he shall not gainsay thee again. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 25 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3 Recording by Filippo Joachim Section 26, Volume 3 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Translated by Richard Burton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ethan Rampton. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3, Section 26. When it was the one hundred and seventy-fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the wazir said to King Shariman, Leave thy son in limbo for the space of fifteen days. Then summon him to thy presence, and bid him wed, and assuredly he shall not gainsay thee again. The king accepted the wazir's opinion, and lay down to sleep that night troubled at heart concerning his son, for he loved him with dearest love, because he had no other child but this. And it was his wont every night not to sleep, save after placing his arm under his son's neck. So he passed that night in trouble and unease on the prince's account, tossing from side to side, as he were laid on coals of Artemisia wood, for he was overcome with doubts and fears, 
and sleep visited him not at all that livelong night. But his eyes ran over with tears, and he began repeating, While slanderers slumber, longsome is my night. Suffice thee a heart so sad in parting plight. I say, one night in care slow moments by, What no return for thee, fair morning light? And the saying of another, When saw I Pleiad stars his glance escape, And pole star draught of sleep upon him pour, And the beer daughters wend in morning dight, I knew that morning was for him no more. Such was the case with King Shariman. But as regards Kamar al-Zaman, when the night came upon him, the eunuch set the lanthorn before him, and lighting the wax candle, placed it in the candlestick, then brought him somewhat of food. The prince ate a little, and continually reproached himself for his unseemly treatment of his father, saying to himself, O my soul, knowest thou not that a son of Adam is the hostage of his tongue? and that a man's tongue is what casteth him into deadly perils. Then his eyes ran over with tears, and he bewailed that which he had done, from anguished vitals and aching heart, repenting him with exceeding repentance of the wrong wherewith he had wronged his father, and repeating, Fair youth shall die by stumbling of the tongue. Stumble of foot works not man's life such wrong. The slip of lip shall oft smite off the head, while slip of foot shall never harm one long. Now when he had made an end of eating, he asked for the wherewithal to wash his hands, and when the Mameluke had washed them clean of the remnants of food, he arose and made the wazoo ablution, and prayed the prayers of sundown and nightfall, conjoining them in one. After which he sat down. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the hundred and seventy-sixth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the prince Kamar al-Zaman had prayed, conjoining them in one the prayers of sundown and nightfall, he sat down on the well, and began reciting the Koran, and he repeated the Kao, and the house of Imran, and Y.S., the compassionate, blessed be the king, unity, and the two talismans, and he ended with blessing and supplication, and with saying, I seek refuge with Allah from Satan the stoned. Then he lay down upon his couch, which was covered with a mattress of satin from Al-Madin town, the same on both sides, and stuffed with the raw silk of Iraq. And under his head was a pillow filled with ostrich down, and when ready for sleep, he doffed his outer clothes and drew off his bag trousers, and lay down in a shirt of delicate stuff smooth as wax. And he donned a headkerchief of Azyomarazi cloth, and at such time and on this guise Kamar al-Zaman was like the full-orbed moon, when it riseth on its fourteenth night. Then, drawing over his head a coverlet of silk, he fell asleep with the lanthorn burning at his feet, and the wax candle over his head, and he ceased not sleeping through the first third of the night, not knowing what lurked for him in the womb of the future, and what the omniscient had decreed for him. Now, as fate and fortune would have it, both tower and saloon were old and had been many years deserted, and there was therein a Roman well inhabited by a genia of the seed of Iblis the accursed, by name Maimuna, daughter of al a renowned king of the Jan. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the one hundred and seventy-seventh night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the name of the genia in question was Maimuna, daughter of al a renowned king of the Jan. And as Kamar al-Zaman continued sleeping till the first third of the night, Maimuna came up out of the Roman well, and made for the firmament, thinking to listen by stealth to the converse of the angels. But when she reached the mouth of the well, she saw a light shining in the tower, contrary to custom. And having dwelt there many years without seeing the like, she said to herself, Never have I witnessed aught like this. And marveling much at the matter, determined that there must be some cause therefore, so she made for the light, and found the eunuch sleeping within the door, and inside she saw a couch spread, whereon was a human form with the wax candle burning at his head, and the lanthorn at his feet. And she wondered to see the light, and stole towards it little by little. Then she folded her wings, and stood by the bed, and drawing back the coverlid, discovered Kamar al-Zaman's face. She was motionless for a full hour in admiration and wonderment for the luster of his visage outshone that of the candle. His face beamed like a pearl with light, 
His eyelids were languorous like those of the gazelle. The pupils of his eyes were intensely black and brilliant. His cheeks were rosy red. His eyebrows were arched like bows, and his breath exhaled a scent of musk. Even a saith of him the poet, I kissed him. Darker grew those pupils which seduce my soul, and cheeks flushed rosier hue. O heart, if slanderers dare to deem there be his like in charms, say, bring him hither you. Now when Maimuna saw him, she pronounced the formula of praise, and said, Blessed be Allah, the best of creators, for she was of the true believing jinn, and she stood a while gazing on his face, exclaiming and envying the youth his beauty and loveliness. And she said in herself, By Allah, I will do no hurt to him, nor let any harm him. Nay, from all of evil will I ransom him, for this fair face deserveth not but that folk should gaze upon it, and for it praise the Lord. Yet how could his family find it in their hearts to leave him in such desert place, where, if one of our marids came upon him at this hour, he would assuredly slay him? Then the Ifrita Maimuna bent over him, and kissed him between the eyes, and presently drew back the sheet over his face which she covered up. And after this she spread her wings, and soaring into the air flew upwards. And after rising high from the circle of the saloon, she ceased not winging her way through air and ascending skywards, till she drew near the heaven of this world, the lowest of the heavens. And behold, she heard the noisy flapping of wings cleaving the welkin, and directing herself by the sound, she found when she drew near it that the noise came from an ifrit called Danash. So she swooped down upon him like a sparrow-hawk, and when he was aware of her, and knew her to be Maimuna, the daughter of the king of the jinn, he feared her, and his side-muscles quivered, and he implored her forbearance, saying, I conjure thee, by the most great and august name, and by the most noble talisman graven upon the seal-ring of Solomon, entreat me kindly, and harm me not. When she heard these words, her heart inclined to him, and she said, Verily thou conjurest me, O accursed, with a mighty conjuration. Nevertheless, I will not let thee go, till thou tell me whence thou comest at this hour. He replied, O princess, know that I come from the uttermost end of China land, and from among the islands, and I will tell thee of a wonderful thing I have seen this night. If thou kind my words true, let me wend my way, and write me a patent under thy hand, and with thy sign manual that I am thy freedman, so none of the jinn hosts, whether of the upper who fly, or of the lower who walk the earth, or of those who dive beneath the waters, do me let or hindrance. Rejoined Maimuna, And what is it that thou hast seen this night, O liar, O accursed? Tell me without leasing, and think not to escape from my hand with falses, for I swear to thee by the letters graven upon the bezel of the seal-ring of Solomon David's son, on both of whom be peace, Except thy speech be true, I will pluck out thy feathers with mine own hand, and strip off thy skin, and break thy bones. Quoth the Ifrid Danash, son of Shamhurish the flyer, I accept, O my lady, these conditions. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. She said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Danash spoke thus to Mamuna, I accept, O my lady, these conditions. Then he resumed, Know, O oh my mistress, that I come to-night from the islands of the inland sea, in the parts of China, which are the realms of King Gaiur, lord of the islands and the seas and the seven palaces. There I saw a daughter of his, than whom Allah hath made none fairer in her time. I cannot picture her to thee, for my tongue would fail to describe her with her due of praise, but I will name to thee a somewhat of her charms by way of approach. Now her hair is like the nights of disunion and separation, and her face like the days of union and delectation. And right well hath the poet said when picturing her, she dispread the locks from her head one night, showing fourfold nights into one night run, and she turned her visage towards the moon, and two moons showed at moment one. She hath a nose like the edge of the burnished blade, and cheeks like purple wine, or anemones blood red. Her lips as coral and carnelian shine, and the water of her mouth is sweeter than old wine. Its taste would quench hell's fiery pain. Her tongue is moved by wit of high degree and ready repartee. Her breast is a seduction to all that see it. Glory be to him who fashioned it and finished it. And joined thereto are two upper arms smooth and rounded. Even as saith of her the poet Al-Walahan, She hath wrists which did her bangles not contain. She would run from out her sleeves in silvern rain. She hath breasts like two globes of ivory, from whose brightness the moons borrow light, 
and a stomach with little waves, as it were a figured cloth of the finest Egyptian linen, made by the Copts, with creases like folded scrolls, ending in a waist slender past all power of imagination, based upon back parts like a hillock of blown sand, that force her to sit when she would feast stand, and awaken her when she fain would sleep, even as saith of her and describeth her the poet. She hath those hips conjoined by thread of waist, hips that o'er me and her too tyrannize my thoughts their days whene'er I think of them, and weigh her down whene'er she would uprise. And those back parts are upborne by thighs smooth and round, and by a calf like a column of pearl, and all this reposeth upon two feet, narrow, slender, and pointed like spear-blades, the handiwork of the protector and requiter. I wonder how of their littleness they can sustain what is above them, but I cut short my praises of her charms, fearing lest I be tedious. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the one hundred and seventy-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the Ifrit Danash bin Shamurish said to the Ifrita Maimuna, Of a truth I cut short my praises, fearing lest I be tedious. Now when Maimuna heard the description of that princess and her beauty and loveliness, she stood silent in astonishment. Whereupon Danash resumed, The father of this fair maiden is a mighty king, a fierce knight, immersed night and day in fray and fight, for whom death hath no fright and the escape of his foe no dread, for that he is a tyrant masterful and a conqueror irresistible, lord of troops and armies and continents and islands and cities and villages, and his name is King Gaiur, lord of the islands and of the seas and of the seven palaces. Now he loveth his daughter, the young maiden whom I have described to thee, with dearest love, and for affection of her, he hath heaped together the treasures of all the kings, and built her therewith seven palaces, each of a different fashion, the first of crystal, the second of marble, the third of china steel, the fourth of precious stones and gems of price, the fifth of porcelain, and many-hued onyxes and ring bezels, the sixth of silver, and the seventh of gold and he hath filled the seven palaces with all sorts of sumptuous furniture, rich silken carpets and hangings and vessels of gold and silver and all manner of gear that kings require, and hath bidden his daughter to abide in each by turns for a certain season of the year, for her name is the Princess Badur. Now when her beauty became known and her name and fame were bruited among the neighboring countries, all the kings sent to her father to demand her of him in marriage, and he consulted her on the matter. But she disliked the very word wedlock with a manner of abhorrence, and said, O oh, my father, I have no mind to marry, no, not at all, for I am a sovereign lady, and a queen's suzerain ruling over men, and I have no desire for a man who shall rule over me. And the more suit she refused, the more her suitor's eagerness increased, and all the royalties of the inner islands of China sent presents and rarities to her father, with letters asking her in marriage. So he pressed her again and again with advice on the matter of espousals, but she ever opposed to him refusals, till at last she turned upon him angrily and cried, O oh my father, if thou name matrimony to me once more, I will go into my chamber and take a sword, and fixing its hilt in the ground, will set its point to my waist, then will I press upon it, till it come forth from my back, and so slay myself. Now when the king heard these her words, the light became darkness in his sight, and his heart burned for her as with a flame of fire, because he feared lest she should kill herself and he was filled with perplexity concerning her affair, and the kings her suitors. So he said to her, If thou be determined not to marry, and there be no help for it, abstain from going and coming in and out. Then he placed her in a house, and shut her up in a chamber, appointing ten old women as duennas to guard her, and forbade her to go forth to the seven palaces. Moreover, he made it appear that he was incensed against her, and sent letters to all the kings, giving them to know that she had been stricken with madness by the jinns, and it is now a year since she hath thus been secluded. Then continued the Ifrit Danash, addressing the Ifrita Maimuna, And I, O my lady, go to her every night, and take my fill of feeding my sight on her face, and I kiss her between the eyes. Yet of my love to her I do her no hurt, neither mount her, for that her youth is fair and her grace surpassing. Every one who seeth her jealouseth himself for her. I conjure thee, therefore, O my lady, to go back with me and look on her beauty and loveliness, and stature, and perfection of proportion. And after, if thou wilt, chastise me or enslave me, and win to thy will, 
transport his line to bid and to forbid. So saying, the Ifrit Danash bowed his head towards the earth, and drooped his wings downward. But Maimuna laughed at his words, and spat in his face, and answered, What is this girl of whom thou pratest but a potsherd wherewith to wipe after making water? Far, far, by Allah, or cursed, I thought thou hadst some wondrous tale to tell me, or some marvellous news to give me. How would it be if thou were to sight my beloved? Verily this night I have seen a young man, whom if thou saw, though but in a dream, thou wouldst be palsied with admiration, and spittle would flow from thy mouth. Asked the Ifrit, And who and what is this youth? And she answered, No, o Dinash, that there hath befallen the young man the like of what thou tellest me befell thy mistress, for his father presseth him again and again to marry. But he refused, till at length his sire waxed wroth at being opposed, and imprisoned him in the tower where I dwell. And I came up to-night and saw him. Said Dinash, O my lady, shew me this youth, that I may see if he be indeed handsomer than my mistress, the princess Badur, or not, for I cannot believe that the like of her liveth in this our age. Rejoined Maimuna, Thou liest, O accursed, O most ill-omened of marids and vilest of satans! Sure I am that the like of my beloved is not in this world. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 26 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3《セクション27ボリューム3 of the book of a thousand nights and a night translated by Richard Burton This is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org reading by Lars Rolander The book of a thousand nights and a night volume 3 section 27 when it was the one hundred and eightieth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the Ifratah Maimuna spake thus to the Ifrit Danash, Sure am I that the like of my beloved is not in this world. Art thou mad to fellow thy beloved with my beloved? He said, Allah upon thee, O my lady, go back with me, and look upon my mistress, and after I will with thee, and look upon thy beloved. She answered, It must needs be so, O accursed, for thou art a knavish devil. But I will not go with thee, nor shalt thou come with me, save upon condition of a wager which is this. If the lover thou lovest, and of whom thou boastest so bravely, prove handsomer than mine, whom I mentioned, and whom I love, and of whom I boast, the bet shall be thine against me, but if my beloved prove the handsomer, the bet shall be mine against thee. Quoth Danash, the Ifrit, I accept this thy wager, and am satisfied thereat. So come with me to the islands. Quoth Maimuna, No, for the abode of my beloved is nearer than the abode of thine. Here it is under us, so come down with me to see my beloved, and after we will go look upon thy mistress. I hear and I obey, said Danash. So they descended to earth and alighted in the saloon, which the tower contained. Then Maimuna stationed Danash beside the bed, and, putting out her hand, drew back the silken coverlet from Kamar al-Zaman's face when it glittered and glistened and shimmered and shone like the rising sun. She gazed at him for a moment, then turning sharply round upon Danash, said, Look, O accursed, and be not the basest of madmen. I am a maid, yet my heart he hath waylaid. So Danash looked at the prince, and long continued gazing steadfastly on him then, shaking his head, said to Maimona, by Allah, O my lady, thou art excusable, but there is yet another thing to be considered, and this is that the estate female differeth from the male. By Allah's might this thy beloved is the likest of all created things to my mistress in beauty and loveliness and grace and perfection, and it is as though they were both cast alike in the mould of seemlyhead. Now, when Maimuna heard these words, 
the light became darkness in her sight and she dealt him with her wing so fierce a buffet on the head as well nigh made an end of him then quoth she to him i conjure thee by the light of his glorious countenance go at once o accursed and bring hither thy mistress whom thou lovest so fondly and foolishly and return in haste that we may lay the twain together and look on them both as they lie asleep side by side so shall it appear to us which be the goodlier and more beautiful of the two except thou obey me this very moment o accursed i will dart my sparks at thee with my fire and consume thee yea in pieces i will rend thee and into the deserts cast thee that to stay at home and wayfarer an example thou be quoth danash o my lady i will do thy behests for i know for sure that my mistress is the fairer and the sweeter so saying the ifrit flew away and maimunah flew with him to guard him they were absent a while and presently returned bearing the young lady who was clad in a shift of fine venetian silk with a double edging of gold and purfled with the most exquisite of embroidery having these couplets worked upon the ends of the sleeves three matters hinder her from visiting us in fear of hateful slandering envier and his hired spies the shining light of brow the trinket's tinkling voice and scent of essences that tell whenever she tries given that she hide her brow with edge of sleeve and leave at home her trinketry how shall her scent disguise and danash and maimuna stinted not bearing that young lady till they had carried her into the saloon and had laid her beside the youth kamar al zaman and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the one hundred and eighty-first night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that the ifrit danash and the ifrata maimuna stinted not bearing princess budur till they descended and laid her on the couch beside kamar al zaman then they uncovered both their faces and they were the likest of all folk each to other as they were twins or an only brother and sister and indeed they were a seduction to the pious even as saith of them the poet al mubin o heart be not thy love confined to one lest thou by doting or disdain be undone love all the fair and thou shalt find with them if this be lost to thee that shall be one and quoth another mine eyes beheld two lying on the ground both had i loved if on these ein they lay so danash and maimuna gazed on them a while and he said by allah o my lady it is good my mistress is assuredly the fairer she replied not so my beloved is the fairer woe to thee o danash art blind of eye and heart that lean from fat thou canst not depart wilt thou hide the truth dost thou not see his beauty and loveliness and fine stature and symmetry out on thee hear what i purpose to say in praise of my beloved and if thou be a lover true to her thou dost love do thou the like for her thou lovest then she kissed kamar al zaman again and again between the eyes and improvised this ode how is this why should the blamer abuse thee in his pride what shall console my heart for thee that art but slender bow a nature cold eye thou hast that witcheth far and wide from pure platonic love of it deliverance none i trow those glances fell as plundering turp to heart such havoc deal as never havoc scimitar made keenest at the curve on me thou layest load of love the heaviest while i feel so feeble groan that under weight of chemiset i swerve my love for thee as what is well is habit and my low is nature to all others false is all the love i tender now were my heart but like to shine 
i never would say no only my wasted form is like thy waist so gracious slender out on him who in beauty's robe for moon-like charms hath fame and who is claimed by mouth of men as marvel of his tribe of man what manner may he be ask they who flight and blame for whom thy heart is so distressed i only cry describe o stone and tempered heart of him learn of his yielding grace and bending form to show me grace and yielding to consent o my prince beautiful thou hast an overseer in place who irketh me and eke a groom whose wrong cloth near relent indeed he lieth who hath said that all of loveliness was pent in joseph in thy charms there's many and many a joe the genie dread me when i stand and face to face address but meeting thee my fluttering heart its shame and terror show i take aversion semblance and i turn from thee in fright but more aversion i assume more love from me dost claim that hair of jetty black that brow ever raying radiant light those eyne wherein white jostles black that darling dainty frame when danash heard the poesy which maimona spake in praise of her beloved he joyed with exceeding joy and marvelled with excessive wonderment and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the one hundred and eighty-second night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the ifrit danash heard the posy which maimuna spake in praise of her beloved he shook for exceeding joy and said thou hast celebrated thy beloved in song and thou hast indeed done well in praise of him whom thou lovest and there is no help for it but that i also in my turn do my best to enfame my mistress and recite somewhat in her honour then the ifrit went up to the lady budur and kissing her between the eyes looked at maimuna and at his beloved princess and recited the following verses albeit he had no skill in poesy love for my fair they chide in angry way unjust for ignorance yea unjustice they ah lavish favours on the love mad whom taste of thy wrath and parting woe shall slay in sooth for love i'm wet with railing tears that rail mine eyelids blood thou mightest say no marvel what i bear for love tis marvel that any know my me while thou'rt away unlawful were our union did i doubt thy love or heart inclined to other may and eat these words i feed eyes on their stead by the valley's side and i'm slain and my slaver aside hath tried grief wine have i drunken and down my cheeks danced tears to the song of the camel guide for union blessing i strive though sure in budur and swad all my bliss shall bide what i not which of three gave me most to plain so hear them numbered ere thou decide those warders her eyne that lancers her figure or ring-mailed locks which her forehead hide quoth she and i ask of her what so waits or abide in towns or in desert ride to me in thy heart i dwell look there quoth i where's my heart aware aware when maimuna heard these lines from the ifrit she said thou hast done well o danash but say thou which of the two is the handsomer and he answered my mistress budur is handsomer than thy beloved cried maimuna thou liest o accursed nay my beloved is more beautiful than thine but danash persisted mine is the fairer and they ceased not to wrangle and challenge each other's words till maimuna cried out at danash and would have laid violent hands on him but he humbled himself to her and softening his speech said 
let not the truth be a grief to thee and cease we this talk for all we say is to testify in favour of our lovers rather let each of us withdraw the claim and seek we one who shall judge fairly between us which of the two be fairer and by his sentence we will abide i agree to this answered she and smote the earth with her foot whereupon there came out of it an ifrit blind of an eye humpbacked and scurvy skinned with eye orbits slit up and down his face on his head were seven horns and four locks of hair fell to his heels his hands were pitchfork like and his legs mast like and he had nails as the claws of a lion and feet as the hoofs of the wild ass when that ifrit rose out of the earth and sighted maimona he kissed the ground before her and standing with his hands clasped behind him said what is thy will o my mistress o daughter of my king she replied o kaskash i would have thee judge between me and this accursed danash and she made known to him the matter from first to last whereupon the ifrit kaskash looked at the face of the youth and then at the face of the girl and saw them lying asleep embraced each with an arm under the other's neck alike in beauty and loveliness and equal in grace and goodliness the marid gazed long upon them marvelling at their seemly head and after carefully observing the twain he turned to maimona and danash and recited these couplets go visit her thou lovest and regard not the words detractors utter envious churls can never favour love or sure the merciful never made a thing more fair to look upon than two fond lovers in each other's arms speaking their passion in a mute embrace when heart has turned to heart the fools would part them strike idly on cold steel so when thou'st found one purely folly shine except her true heart and live for her alone o thou that blamest the love struck for their love give o'er thy talk how canst thou minister to a mind deceased then he turned again to maimona and danash and said to them by allah if you will have the truth i tell you fairly the twain be equal in beauty and loveliness and perfect grace and goodliness nor can i make any difference between them on account of their being man and woman but i have another thought which is that we wake each of them in turn without the knowledge of the other and whichever is the more enamoured shall be held inferior in seemlihead and comeliness quoth maimona right is this wrecking and quoth danash i consent to this then danash changed himself to the form of a flea and bit kamar al zaman whereupon he started from sleep in a fright and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the one hundred and eighty-third night she said it has reached me o auspicious king that danash changed himself to the form of a flea and bit kamar al zaman who started from sleep in a fright and rubbed the bitten part his neck and scratched it hard because of the smart then turning sideways he found lying by him something whose breath was sweeter than musk and whose skin was softer than cream hereat marvelled he with great marvel and he sat up and looked at what lay beside him when he saw it to be a young lady like a union pearl or a shining sun or a dome seen from afar on a well-built wall for she was five feet tall with a shape like the letter alif bosomed high and rosy cheek even as saith of her the poet four things which never conjoin unless it be to store my vitals and to shed my blood brow white as day and tresses black as night cheeks rosy red and lips which smiles over flood and also quoth another a moon she rises will of one she waves breathes ambergris and gazes a gazelle me seems that sorrow woes my heart and wins 
and when she wendeth hastes therein to dwell and when kamar al zaman saw the lady budur daughter of king gaior and her beauty and comeliness she was sleeping clad in a shift of venetian silk without her petticoat trousers and wore on her head a kerchief embroidered with gold and set with stones of price her ears were hung with twin earrings which shone like constellations and round her neck was a collar of union pearls of size unique past the competence of any king when he saw this his reason was confounded and natural heat began to stir in him allah awoke in him the desire of question and he said to himself whatso allah willeth that shall be and what he willeth not shall never be so saying he put out his hand and turning her over loosed the collar of her chemise then arose before his sight her bosom with its breasts like double globes of ivory whereat his inclination for her redoubled and he desired her with exceeding hot desire he would have awakened her but she would not awake for danash had made her sleep heavy so he shook her and moved her saying o oh, my beloved awake and look on me i am kamar al zaman but she awoke not neither moved her head whereupon he considered her case for a long hour and said to himself if i guess aright this is the damsel to whom my father would have married me and these three years past i have refused her but in salah god willing as soon as it is dawn i will say to him marry me to her that i may enjoy her and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say end of section twenty seven of the book of a thousand nights and a night volume three read by Lars rolander Section twenty eight, volume three of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night. Translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, volume three, section twenty eight. When it was the one hundred and eighty-fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Kamar al-Zaman said to himself, By Allah, when I see dawn, I will say to my sire, Marry me to her, that I may enjoy her. Nor will I let half the day pass ere I possess her, and take my fill of her beauty and loveliness. Then he bent over Budur to buss her whereat the genii maimuna trembled and was abashed and danash the ifrit was like to fly for joy but as kamar al zaman was about to kiss her upon the mouth he was ashamed before allah and turned away his head and averted his face saying to his heart have patience then he took thought a while and said i will be patient haply my father when he was wroth with me and sent me to this jail may have brought my young lady and made her lie by my side to try me with her and may have charged her not to be readily awakened when i would arouse her and may have said to her whatever thing kamar al zaman do to thee make me ware thereof or belike my sire standeth hidden in some stead whence being himself unseen he can see all i do with this young lady and to-morrow he will scold me and cry how cometh it that thou sayest i have no mind to marry and yet thou didst kiss and embrace yonder damsel so i will withhold myself lest i be ashamed before my sire and the right and proper thing to do is not to touch her at this present nor even to look upon her except to take from her somewhat which shall serve as a token to me and a memorial of her that some sign endure between me and her then kamar al zaman raised the young lady's hand and took from her little finger a seal ring worth an immense amount of money for that it be was a precious jewel 
and around it were graven these couplets count not that i your promises forgot despite the length of your delinquencies be generous o my lord to me inclining haply your mouth and cheeks these lips may kiss by allah never will i relinquish you all be you will transgress love's boundaries then kamar al zaman took the seal-ring from the little finger of queen budur and set it on his own then turning his back to her went to sleep when maimuna the genii saw this she was glad and said to danash and kashkash saw ye how my beloved kamar al zaman bore himself chastely towards this young lady verily this was of the perfection of his good gifts for observe you twain how he looked on her and noted her beauty and loveliness and yet embraced her not neither kissed her nor put his hand to her but turned his back and slept answered they even so thereupon maimuna changed herself into a flea and entering into the raiment of budur the loved of danash crept up her calf and came upon her thigh and reaching a place some four carats below her navel there bit her thereupon she opened her eyes and sitting up in bed saw a youth lying beside her and breathing heavily in his sleep the loveliest of almighty allah's creatures with eyes that put to shame the fairest houris of heaven and a mouth like solomon's seal whose water was sweeter to the taste and more efficacious than theriac and lips the colour of coral stone and cheeks like the blood-red anemone even as saith one describing him in these couplets my mind's withdrawn from Sinab and nawar by rosy cheeks that growth of myrtle bear i love a fawn a tunic vested boy and leave the love of bracelet wearing fair my mate in hall and closet is unlike her that i play with as at home we pair o thou who blamest my flight from hind and Sinab, the cause is clear as dawn uplighting air wouldst have me fair a slave the thrall of thrall cribbed pent confined behind the bar and wall now when prince budur saw him she was seized by a transport of passion and yearning and love-longing and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the one hundred and eighty-fifth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that when princess budur saw kamar al zaman she was forthwith seized with a transport of passion and yearning and love-longing and she said to herself alas my shame this is a strange youth and i know him not how cometh he to be lying by my side on one bed then she looked at him a second time and noting his beauty and loveliness said by allah he is indeed a comely youth and my heart is well nigh torn in sunder with longing for him but alas how am i shamed by him by the almighty had i known it was this youth who sought me in marriage of my father i had not rejected him but i had wived with him and enjoyed his loveliness then she gazed in his face and said o oh, my lord and light of mine eyes awake from sleep and take thy pleasure in my beauty and grace and she moved him with her hand but maimuna the genii let down sleep upon him as it were a curtain and pressed heavily on his head with her wings so that kamar al zaman awoke not then princess budur shook him with her hands and said my life on thee hearken to me awake and up from thy sleep and look on the narcissus and the tender down thereon and enjoy the sight of naked waist and navel and tussle me and tumble me from this moment till break of day allah upon thee o my lord sit up and prop thee against the pillow and slumber not still kamar al zaman made her no reply but breathed hard in his sleep continued she alas alas thou art insolent in thy beauty and comeliness and grace and loving looks 
but if thou art handsome so am i handsome what then is this thou dost have they taught thee to float me or hath my father the wretched old fellow made thee swear not to speak to me to-night but kamar al-zaman opened not his mouth neither awoke whereat her passion for him redoubled and allah inflamed her heart with love of him she stole one glance of eyes that cost her a thousand sighs her heart fluttered and her vitals throbbed and her hands and feet quivered and she said to kamar al-zaman talk to me o my lord speak to me o my friend answer me o my beloved and tell me thy name for indeed thou hast ravished my wit and during all this time he abode drowned in sleep and answered her not a word and princess budur sighed and said alas alas why art thou so proud and self-satisfied then she shook him and turning his hand over saw her seal ring on his little finger whereat she cried a loud cry and followed it with a sigh of passion and said alack alack by allah thou art my beloved and thou lovest me yet thou seemst to turn thee away from me out of coquetry for all o my darling thou camest to me whilst i was asleep and knew not what thou didst with me and tookest my seal ring and yet i will not pull it off thy finger so saying she opened the bosom of his shirt and bent over him and kissed him and put forth her hand to him seeking somewhat that she might take as a token but found nothing then she thrust her hand into his breast and because of the smoothness of his body it slipped down to his waist and thence to his navel and thence to his yard whereupon her heart ached and her vitals quivered and lust was sore upon her for that the desire of women is fiercer than the desire of men and she was ashamed of her own shamelessness then she plucked his seal ring from his finger and put it on her own instead of the ring he had taken and boosted his inner lips and hands nor did she leave any part of him unkissed after which she took him to her breast and embraced him and laying one of her hands under his neck and the other under his armpit nestled close to him and fell asleep by his side and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the one hundred and eighty-sixth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that when princess budur fell asleep by the side of kamar al-zaman after doing that which she did quoth maimuna to danash night thou o accursed how proudly and coquettishly my beloved bore himself and how hotly and passionately thy mistress showed herself to my dearling there can be no doubt that my beloved is handsomer than thine nevertheless i pardon thee then she wrote him a document of manumission and turned to kashkash and said go help danash to take up his mistress and aid him to carry her back to her own place for the night waneth apace and there is but little left of it i hear and i obey answered kashkash so the two ifrits went forward to princess budur and upraising her flew away with her then bearing her back to her own place they laid her on her bed whilst maimuna abode alone with kamar al-zaman gazing upon him as he slept till the night was all but spent when she went her way as soon as morning morrowed the prince awoke from sleep and turned right and left but found not the maiden by him and said in his mind what is this business it is as if my father would incline me to marriage with the damsel who was with me and have now taken her away by stealth to the intent that my desire for wedlock may redouble then he called out to the eunuch who slept at the door saying woe to thee o damned one arise at once so the eunuch rose bemused with sleep and brought him basin and ewer whereupon kamar al-zaman entered the water-closet and did his need 
then coming out made the wuzu ablution and prayed the dawn prayer after which he sat telling on his beads the ninety and nine names of almighty allah then he looked up and seeing the eunuch standing in service upon him said out on thee o sabab who was it came hither and took away the young lady from my side and i still sleeping asked the eunuch o oh, my lord what manner of young lady the young lady who lay with me last night replied kamar al Saman. the eunuch was startled at his words and said to him by allah there hath been with thee neither young lady nor other how should young lady have come in to thee when i was sleeping in the doorway and the door was locked by allah o my lord neither male nor female hath come in to thee exclaimed the prince thou liest o pestilent slave is it of thy competence also to hoodwink me and refuse to tell me what is become of the young lady who lay with me last night and declined to inform me who took her away replied the eunuch and he was affrighted at him by allah o my lord i have seen neither young lady nor young lord his words only angered kamar al saman the more and he said to him o accursed one my father has indeed taught thee deceit come hither so the eunuch came up to him and the prince took him by the collar and dashed him to the ground whereupon he let fly a loud fart and kamar al saman kneeling upon him kicked him and throttled him till he fainted away then he dragged him forth and tied him to the well rope and let him down like a bucket into the well and plunged him into the water and drew him up and lowered him down again now it was hard winter weather and kamar al saman ceased not to plunge the eunuch into the water and pull him up again and doze him and haul him whilst he screamed and called for help and the prince kept on saying by allah o damned one i will not draw thee up out of this well till thou tell me and fully acquaint me with the story of the young lady and who it was took her away whilst i slept and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the one hundred and eighty-seventh night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that kamar al saman said to the eunuch by allah i will not draw thee up out of this well until thou tell me the story of the young lady and who it was took her away whilst i slept answered the eunuch after he had seen death staring him in the face o oh, my lord let me go and i will relate to thee the truth and the whole tale so kamar al saman pulled him up out of the well all but dead for suffering what with cold and the pain of dipping and dosing drubbing and dread of drowning he shook like cane in hurricanes his teeth were clenched as by cramp and his clothes were drenched and his body befouled and torn by the rough sides of the well briefly he was in a sad pickle now when kamar al saman saw him in this sorry plight he was concerned for him but as soon as the eunuch found himself on the floor he said to him o oh my lord let me go and doff my clothes and wring them out and spread them in the sun to dry and don others after which i will return to thee forthwith and tell thee the truth of the matter answered the prince o oh, rascal slave hadst thou not seen death face to face never hadst thou confessed to fact nor told me a word but go now and do thy will and then come back to me at once and tell me the truth thereupon the eunuch went out hardly crediting his escape and ceased not running stumbling and rising in his haste till he came in to king shariman whom he found sitting at talk with his vassir of kamar al saman's case the king was saying to the minister i slept not last night for anxiety concerning my son kamar al saman and indeed i fear lest some harm befall him in that old tower what good was there in imprisoning him answered the wazir have no care for him by allah no harm will befall him none at all leave him in prison for a month till his temper yield and his spirit be broken 
and he returned to his senses as the two spoke behold up rushed the eunuch in the aforesaid plight making to the king who was troubled at sight of him and he cried o our lord the sultan verily thy son's wits are fled and he hath gone mad he hath dealt with me thus and thus so that i am come as thou seest me and he kept saying a young lady lay with me this night and stole away secretly whilst i slept where is she and he insisteth on my letting him know where she is and on my telling him who took her away but i have seen neither girl nor boy the door was locked all through the night for i slept before it with the key under my head and i opened to him in the morning with my own hand when king shahriman heard this he cried out saying alas my son and he was enraged with sore rage against the wazir who had been the cause of all this case and said to him go up bring me news of my son and see what hath befallen his mind so the wazir rose and stumbling over his long skirts in his fear of the king's wrath hastened with the slave to the tower now the sun had risen and when the minister came in to kamar al zaman he found him sitting on the couch reciting the koran so he saluted him and seated himself by his side and said to him o oh, my lord this wretched eunuch brought us tidings which troubled and alarmed us and which incensed the king asked kamar al zaman and what hath he told you of me to trouble my father in good sooth he hath troubled none but me answered the wazir he came to us in fulsome state and told us of thee a thing which heaven forfend and the slave added a lie which it befitteth not to repeat allah preserve thy youth and sound sense and tongue of eloquence and forbid to come from thee aught of offence quoth the prince o wazir and what thing did this pestilent slave say of me the minister replied he told us that thy wits had taken leave of thee and thou wouldst have it that a young lady lay with thee last night and thou wast instant with him to tell thee whither she went and thou didst torture him to that end but when kamar al zaman heard these words he was enraged with sore rage and he said to the wazir tis manifest to me in very deed that you people taught the eunuch to do as he did and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section twenty-eight of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume Three. Read by Lars Rolander. Section twenty-nine, Volume Three, of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ethan Rampton. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3, Section 29. When it was the one hundred and eighty-eighth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king that when Kamar al-Zaman heard the words of the wazir, he was enraged with sore rage, and said to him, "'Tis manifest to me in very deed that you people taught the eunuch to do as he did, and forbade him to tell me what became of the young lady who lay with me last night. But thou, O wazir, art cleverer than the eunuch, so do thou tell me, without stay or delay, whither went the young lady who slept on my bosom last night? For it was you who sent her, and bade her steep in my embrace, and we lay together till dawn." But when I awoke I found her not. So where is she now? Said the wazir, O my lord Kamar al-Zaman, Allah's name encompass thee about. By the Almighty we sent none to thee last night, but thou layest alone, with the door locked on thee, and the eunuch sleeping behind it. Nor did there come to thee young lady or any other. Regain thy reason, O my lord, and establish thy senses, and occupy not thy mind with vanities. Rejoined Kamar al-Zaman, who was incensed at his words, O wazir, the young lady in question is my beloved, the fair one with the black eyes and rosy cheeks, whom I held in my arms all last night. 
So the minister wondered at his words, and asked him, Didst thou see this damsel last night with thine own eyes, on wake or in sleep? Answered Kamar al-Zaman, O ill-omened old man, dost thou fancy I saw her with my ears? Indeed, I saw her with my very eyes, and awake, and I touched her with my hand, and I watched by her full half the night, feeding my vision on her beauty and loveliness and grace and tempting looks. But you had schooled her, and charged her to speak no word to me. So she feigned sleep, and I lay by her side till dawn, when I awoke and found her gone. Rejoined the wazir, O my lord Kamar al-Zaman, haply thou sawest this in thy sleep. It must have been a delusion of dreams, or a deception caused by eating various kinds of food, or a suggestion of the accursed devils. Cried the prince, O pestilent old man, wilt thou too make a mock of me, and tell me this was haply a delusion of dreams, when that eunuch confessed to the young lady, saying, At once I will return to thee, and tell thee all about her. With these words he sprang up and rushed at the wazir, and gripped hold of his beard, which was long, and after gripping it he twisted his hand in it, and hailing him off the couch, threw him on the floor. It seemed to the minister as though his soul departed his body for the violent plucking at his beard. And Kamar al-Zaman ceased not kicking the wazir, and basting his breast and ribs, and cuffing him with open hand on the nape of his neck, till he had well nigh beaten him to death. Then said the old man in his mind, just as the eunuch slave saved his life from this lunatic youth by telling him a lie, Thus it is even fitter that I do likewise, else he will destroy me. So now for my lie to save myself, he being mad beyond a doubt. Then he turned to Kamar al-Zaman, and said, O oh, my lord, pardon me, for indeed thy father charged me to conceal from thee this affair of the young lady, but now I am weak and weary, and wounded with funding. For I am an old man, and lack strength and bottom to endure blows. Have, therefore, a little patience with me, and I will tell thee all, and acquaint thee with the story of the young woman. When the prince heard this, he left off drubbing him, and said, Wherefore couldst thou not tell me the tale until after shame and blows? Rise now, unlucky old man that thou art, and tell me her story. Quoth the wazir, Say, dost thou ask of the young lady with the fair face and perfect form? Quoth Kamar al-Zaman, Even so. Tell me, O wazir, who it was that led her to me and laid her by my side, and who was it that took her away from me by night? And let me know forthright whither she is gone, that I myself may go to her at once. If my father did this deed to me that he might try me by means of that beautiful girl, with a view to our marriage, I consent to wed her and free myself of this trouble, for he did all these dealings with me only because I refused wedlock. But now I consent, and I say again, I consent to matrimony. So tell this to my father, O wazir, and advise him to marry me to that young lady, for I will have none other, and my heart loveth none save her alone. Now rise up at once, and haste thee to my father, and counsel him to hurry on our wedding, and bring me his answer within this very hour. Rejoined the wazir, "'Tis well, and went forth from him, hardly believing himself out of his hands. Then he set off from the tower, walking and tripping up as he went, for excess of fright and agitation and he ceased not hurrying till he came in to King Shariman, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the one hundred and eighty-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the wazir fared forth from the tower, and ceased not running till he came in to King Shariman, who said to him as he sighted him, O thou wazir, what man hath brought thee to grief, and whose mischief hath treated thee in way unlief? How happeneth it that I see thee dumbfounded, and come to me thus astounded? Replied the wazir, O king, I bring thee good news. And what is it? quoth Shariman, and quoth the wazir, Know that thy son Kamar al-Zaman's wits are clean gone, and that he hath become stark mad. Now when the king heard these words of the minister, light became darkness in his sight, and he said, O wazir, make clear to me the nature of his madness. Answered the wazir, O my lord, I hear and I obey. Then he told him that such and such had passed, and acquainted him with all that his son had done. Whereupon the king said to him, Hear, O wazir, the good tidings which I give thee in return for this thy fair news of my son's insanity, and it shall be the cutting off of thy head, and the forfeiture of my favour, O most ill omened of wazirs, and foulest of emirs. For I feel that thou hast caused my son's disorder by the wicked advice, and the sinister counsel thou hast given me first and last. By Allah! If aught of mischief or madness have befallen my son, I will most assuredly nail thee upon the palace dome, and make thee drain the bitterest draught of death. 
Then he sprang up, and taking the wazir with him, fared straight for the tower, and entered it. And when Kamar al-Zaman saw the two, he rose to his father in haste from the couch whereon he sat, and kissing his hands, drew back and hung down his head, and stood before him with his arms behind him, and thus remained for a full hour. Then he raised his head towards his sire, the tears gushed from his eyes and streamed down his cheeks, and he began repeating, Forgive the sin neath which my limbs are trembling, for the slave seeks for mercy from his master. I have done a fault which calls for free confession. Where shall it call for mercy and forgiveness? When the king heard this, he arose and embraced his son, and kissing him between the eyes, made him sit by his side on the couch. Then he turned to the wazir, and looking on him with eyes of wrath, said, O dog of wazirs, how didst thou say of my son such and such things, and make my heart quake for him? Then he turned to the prince and said, O my son, what is today called? He answered, O my father, this day is the Sabbath, and tomorrow is first day. Then comes second day, third, fourth, fifth, and lastly Friday. Exclaimed the king, O my son, O Kamar al-Zaman, praised be Allah for the preservation of thy reason. What is the present month called in our Arabic? zul answered Kamar al-Zaman, and it is followed by zul -Hijjah. Then cometh Muharram, then Safar, then Rabi'ah the first and Rabi'ah the second, the two Jamadas, Rajab, Shahaban, Ramazan, and Shuwal. At this the king rejoiced exceedingly, and spat in the wazir's face, saying, O wicked old man, how canst thou say that my son is mad, and now none is mad but thou? Whereupon the minister shook his head, and would have spoken, but bethought himself to wait a while, and see what might next befall. Then the king said to his child, O my son, what words be these thou saidest to the eunuch and the wazir, declaring, I was sleeping with a fair damsel this night. What damsel is this of whom thou speakest? Then Kamar al-Zaman laughed at his father's words, and replied, O my father, know that I can bear no more jesting, so add me not another mock or even a single word on the matter, for my temper hath waxed short by that you have done with me. And know, O my father, with assured knowledge, that I consent to marry, but on condition that thou give me to wife her who lay by my side this night. For I am certain it was thou sentest her to me, and madest me in love with her, and then dispatchedst a message to her before the dawn, and took her away from beside me. Rejoined the king, The name of Allah encompass thee about, O my son, and be thy wit preserved from witlessness. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the one hundred and ninetieth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that quoth King Shahriman to his son Kamar al-Zaman, The name of Allah encompass thee about, O my son, and be thy wit preserved from witlessness. What thing be this young lady whom thou fanciest I sent to thee last night, and then again that I sent to withdraw her from thee before dawn? By the Lord, O my son, I know nothing of this affair, and Allah upon thee, tell me if it be a delusion of dreaming, or a deception caused by indisposition. For verily thou layest down to sleep last night with thy mind occupied and ent marriage, and troubled with the talk of it. Allah damn marriage in the hour when I spake of it, and curse him who counselled it. And without doubt or diffidence I can say that being moved in mind by the mention of wedlock, thou dreamedst that a handsome young lady embraced thee, and did fancy thou sawest her when awake. But all this, O my son, is but an imbroglio of dreams. Replied Kamar al-Zaman, Leave this talk, and swear to me by Allah, the All-Creator, the Omniscient, the humbler of the tyrant Caesars, and the destroyer of the Chosroes, that thou knowest naught of the young lady, nor of her woning place Quoth the king, by the might of Allah Almighty, the God of Moses and Abraham, I know not of all this, and never even heard of it. It is assuredly a delusion of dreams thou hast seen in sleep. Then the prince replied to his sire, I will give thee a self-evident proof that it happened to me when on wake. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the one hundred and ninety-first night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Kamar al-Zaman said to his sire, I will give thee a self-evident proof that this happened to me when on wake. Now let me ask thee, did it ever befall any man to dream that he was battling a sore battle, and after to awake from sleep and find in his hand a sword blade besmeared with blood? Answered the king, No, by Allah, O my son, this hath never been. Rejoined Kamar al-Zaman, I will tell thee what happened to me, and it was this. Meseemed I awoke from sleep in the middle of the past night, 
and found a girl lying by my side, whose form was like mine, and whose favour was as mine. I embraced her and turned her about with my hand, and took her seal-ring, which I put on my finger, and she pulled off my ring and put it on hers. Then I went to sleep by her side, but refrained for her from shame of thee, deeming that thou hast sent her to me, intending to tempt me with her, and incline me to marriage, and suspecting thee to be hidden somewhere whence thou couldst see what I did with her. And I was ashamed even to kiss her on the mouth for thy account, thinking over this temptation to wedlock. And when I awoke at point of day, I found no trace of her, nor could I come at any news of her, and there befell me what thou knowest of with the eunuch and with the wazir. How, then, can this case have been a dream and a delusion, when the ring is a reality? Save for her ring on my finger I should indeed have deemed it a dream. But here is the ring on my little finger. Look at it, O king, and see what is its worth. So saying, he handed the ring to his father, who examined it and turned it over, then looked to his son and said, Verily, there is in this ring some mighty mystery and some strange secret. What befell thee last night with the girl is indeed a hard nut to crack, and I know not how intruded upon us this intruder. None is the cause of all this posture, save the wazir. But Allah upon thee, O my son, take patience, so haply the Lord may turn to gladness this thy grief, and to thy sadness bring complete relief. As quoth one of the poets, Haply shall fortune draw her rein, and bring fair chance, for she is changeful, jealous, vain. Still I may woo my want and wishes win, and see on heels of care unfair the fane. And now, O my son, I am certified at this hour that thou art not mad, but thy case is a strange one which none can clear up for thee save the Almighty. Cried the prince, By Allah, O my father, deal kindly with me and seek out this young lady, and hasten her coming to me, else I shall die of woe, and of my death shall no one know. Then he betrayed the ardour of his passion, and turned towards his father, and repeated these two couplets. If your promise of personal call prove untrue, deign in vision to grant me an interview. Quoth they, how can phantom appear to the sight of a youth whose sight is fordone, perdu? Then, after ending his poetry, Kamar al-Zaman again turned to his father, with submission and despondency, and shedding tears in flood, began repeating these lines. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the one hundred and ninety-second night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Kamar al-Zaman had repeated to his father these verses, he wept and complained and groaned from a wounded heart, and added these lines, Beware that eye glance which hath magic might, wherever turn those orbs it bars our flight, nor be deceived by low sweet voice that breeds a fever festering in the heart and sprite. So soft that silky skin were rose to touch it, she'd cry and tear-drops rain for pain and fright. Did Zephyr e'en in sleep pass o'er her land, scented he chose to dwell in scented sight. Her necklets vie with twinkling of her belt, her wrists strike either wristlet dumb with spite. When upon her bangles bust those rings in ear, upon the lover's eye and high mysteries light. I'm blamed for love of her, nor pardon claim. Eyes are not profiting which lack foresight. Heaven strip thee, blame of mine, unjust art thou. Before this fawn must every eye low bow. After which he said, By Allah, O my father, I cannot endure to be parted from her even for an hour. The king smote hand upon hand and exclaimed, There is no majesty and there is no might save in Allah, the glorious, the great. No cunning contrivance can profit us in this affair. Then he took his son by the hand, and carried him to the palace, where Kamar al-Zaman lay down on a bed of languor, and the king sat at his head, weeping and mourning over him, and leaving him not, night or day, till at last the wazir came in to him and said, O king of the age and the time, how long wilt thou remain shut up with thy son, and hide thyself from thy troops? Haply the order of thy realm may be deranged, by reason of thine absence from thy grandees and officers of state. It behoveth a man of understanding, if he have various wounds in his body, to apply him first to medicine the most dangerous. So it is my counsel to thee that thou remove thy son from this place to the pavilion which is in the palace overlooking the sea, and shut thyself up with him there, setting apart in every week two days, Thursday and Monday, for state receptions and progresses and reviews. On these days let shine emirs and wazirs and chamberlains and viceroys, and high officials and grandees of the realm, and the rest of the levies and the lieges have access to thee, and submit their affairs to thee. 
and do thou their needs, and judge among them, and give and take with them, and bid and forbid. And the rest of the week thou shalt pass with thy son, Kamar al-Zaman, and cease not thus doing till Allah shall vouchsafe relief to you twain. Think not, O king, that thou art safe from the shifts of time, and the strokes of change which come like a traveller in the night. For the wise man is ever on his guard, and how well saith the poet, Thou deemest well of time when days went well, and fearest not what ills might bring thee fate. The nights so fair and restful cozen thee, for peaceful nights bring woes of heavy weight. On children of mankind whom time befriends, beware of time's deceits or soon or late. When the sultan heard his wazir's words, he saw that they were right, and deemed his counsel wise. And it had effect upon him, for he feared lest the order of the state be deranged. So he rose at once, and bade transport his son from his sick-room to the pavilion in the palace overlooking the sea. Now this palace was girt round by the waters, and was approached by a causeway twenty cubits wide. It had windows on all sides commanding an ocean view. Its floor was paved with party-coloured marbles, and its ceiling was painted in the richest pigments, and figured with gold and lapis lazuli. They furnished it for Kamar al-Zaman with splendid upholstery, embroidered rugs and carpets of the richest silk, and they clothed the walls with choice brocades, and hung curtains bespangled with gems of price. In the midst they set him a couch of juniper wood, inlaid with pearls and jewels, and Kamar al-Zaman sat down thereon, but the excess of his concern and passion for the young lady had wasted his charms and emaciated his body. He could neither eat, nor drink, nor sleep and he was like a man who had been sick twenty years of sore sickness. His father seated himself at his head, grieving for him with the deepest grief, and every Monday and Thursday he gave his wazirs and emirs and chamberlains and viceroys and lords of the realm and levies and the rest of his lieges leave to come up to him in that pavilion. So they entered and did their several service and duties, and abode with him till the end of the day, when they went their ways, and the king returned to his son in the pavilion, whom he left not night nor day and he ceased not doing on this wise for many days and nights. Such was the case with Kamar al-Zaman, son of King Shariman. But as regards Princess Budur, daughter of King Gayur, lord of the isles and the seven palaces, when the two jinns bore her up and laid her on her bed, she slept till daybreak, when she awoke and sitting upright looked right and left, but saw not the youth who had lain in her bosom. At this her vitals fluttered, her reason fled, and she shrieked a loud shriek which awoke all her slave-girls and nurses and duennas. They flocked into her, and the chief of them came forward and asked, What aileth thee, O my lady? Answered the princess, O wretched old woman, where is my beloved, the handsome youth who lay last night in my bosom? Tell me whither he is gone. Now when the duenna heard this, the light starkened in her sight, and she feared from her mischief with sore affright, and said to her, O my lady Bedur, what unseemly words are these? cried the princess. Woe to thee, pestilent crone that thou art! I ask thee again, where is my beloved, the goodly youth with the shining face and the slender form, the jetty eyes and the joined eyebrows, who lay with me last night from supper-tide until near daybreak? She rejoined, By Allah, O my lady, I have seen no young man, nor any other. I conjure thee, carry not this unseemly jest too far, lest we all lose our lives, for perhaps the joke may come to thy father's ears, and who shall then deliver us from his hand? And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 29 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3《All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Moreau The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3, Section 30 When it was the one hundred and ninety-third night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the duenna bespake the Lady Boudour in these words, Allah upon thee, O my lady! Carry not this unseemly jest too far, for perhaps it may come to thy father's ears, and who shall then deliver us from his hand? The princess rejoined, In very sooth a youth lay with me last night, one of the fairest faced of men, exclaimed the duenna. Heaven preserve thy reason indeed! No one lay with thee last night. 
Thereupon the princess looked at her hand, and finding Kamar al-Zaman's seal-ring on her finger instead of her own, said to her, Woe to thee, thou accursed, thou traitress! Wilt thou lie to me and tell me that none lay with me last night, and swear to me a falsehood in the name of the Lord? replied the duenna, By Allah, I do not lie to thee, nor have I sworn falsely. Then the princess was incensed by her words, and drawing a sword she had by her, she smote the old woman with it and slew her. Whereupon the eunuch and the waiting women and the concubines cried out at her, and ran to her father, and without stay or delay acquainted him with her case. So the king went to her and asked her, O oh, my daughter, what aileth thee? And she answered, O oh, my father, where is the youth who lay with me last night? Then her reason fled from her head, and she cast her eyes right and left, and rent her raiment even to the skirt. When her sire saw this, he bade the women lay hands on her. So they seized her and manacled her, then putting a chain of iron about her neck made her fast to one of the palace windows, and there left her. Thus far concerning Princess Budur, but as regards her father, King Gayur, the world was straightened upon him when he saw what had befallen his daughter, for that he loved her and her case was not a little grievous to him. So he summoned on it the doctors and astrologers and men skilled in talisman writing, and said to them, Whoso healeth my daughter of what ill she hath, I will marry him to her and give him half of my kingdom. But whoso cometh to her and cureth her not, I will strike off his head and hang it over her palace gate. Accordingly, all who went into her but failed to heal her, he beheaded and hung their heads over the palace gates, till he had beheaded on her account forty doctors and crucified forty astrologers. Wherefore the general held the loop from her, all the physicians having failed to medicine her malady, and her case was a puzzle to the men of science and the adepts in cabalistic characters. And as her longing and passion redoubled, and love and distraction were sore upon her, she poured forth tears and repeated these couplets. My fondness, O oh my moon, for thee my foeman is, and to thy comradeship the nights my thought compel. In gloom I bide with fire that flames below my ribs, whose low I make comparison with heat of hell. I'm plagued with the sorest stress of pine and ecstasy, nor clearest noontide can that horrid pain dispel. Then she sighed and repeated these also. Salams from me to friends and every stead, indeed to all dear friends do I incline. Salams, but not salams that bid adieu, salams that growth of good for you design. I love you dear indeed, nor less your land but bide I far from every need of mine. And when the Lady Budur ceased repeating her poetry, she wept till her eyes waxed sore and her cheeks changed form and hue, and in this condition she continued three years. Now she had a foster brother by name Marzawan, who was traveling in far lands and absent from her the whole of this time. He loved her with an exceeding love, passing the love of brothers. So when he came back he went into his mother and asked for his sister, the Princess Budur. She answered him, O oh, my son, thy sister hath been smitten with madness and hath passed these three years with a chain of iron about her neck, and all the physicians and men of science have failed of healing her. When Marzawan heard these words, he said, I must needs go into her, peradventure I may discover what she hath and be able to medicine her. And his mother replied, Needs must thou visit her, but wait till to-morrow, that I may contrive something to suit thy case. Then she went afoot to the palace of the Lady Budur, and accosting the eunuch in charge of the gates, made him a present, and said to him, I have a daughter who was brought up with thy mistress, and since then I married her. And when that befell the princess which befell her, she became troubled and sore concerned. And I desire of thy favor that my daughter may go in to her for an hour and look on her and then return when she came, so shall none know of it. Quoth the eunuch, This may not be except by night, after the king hath visited his child and gone away. Then come thou and thy daughter. So she kissed the eunuch's hand, and returning home, waited till the morrow at nightfall. And when it was time, she arose and sought her son Marzawan, and attired him in women's apparel. Then taking his hand in hers, led him toward the palace, and ceased not walking with him till she came upon the eunuch after the sultan had ended his visit to the princess. Now when the eunuch saw her, he rose to her and said, Enter, but do not prolong thy stay. 
So they went in, and when Marzawan beheld the Lady Budur in the aforesaid plight, he saluted her, after his mother had doffed his woman's garb. Then he took out of their satchel books he had brought with him, and lighting a wax candle, he began to recite certain conjurations. Thereupon the princess looked at him, and recognizing him, said, O oh, my brother, thou hast been absent on thy travels, and thy news have been cut off from us. He replied, True, but Allah hath brought me back safe and sound, and I am now minded to set out again, nor hath aught delayed me but the news I hear of thee. Wherefore my heart burned for thee, and I came to thee, so haply I may free thee of thy malady. She rejoined, O oh, my brother, thinkest thou it is madness aileth me? Yes, answered he, and she said, not so, by Allah, tis even as saith the poet. Quoth they, thou ravest on him thou lovest. Quoth I, the sweets of love are only for the insane. Love never maketh time his friend befriend. Only the gin struck white such boon can gain. Well, yes, I'm mad. Bring him who maddened me, and if he cure my madness, blame restrain. Then she let Marzawan know that she was love daft, and he said, Tell me concerning thy tale and what befell thee. Haply there may be in my hand something which shall be a means of deliverance for thee. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the one hundred and ninety-fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Marzawan thus addressed Princess Budur. Tell me concerning thy tale and what befell thee. Haply Allah may inspire me with a means of deliverance for thee. Quoth she, O my brother, hear my story which is this. One night I awoke from sleep in the last third of the night, and sitting up saw by my side the handsomest of youths that be, and tongue faileth to describe him, for he was as a willow wand, or an Indian rattan cane. So methought it was my father who had done on this wise in order to thereby try me, for that he had consulted me concerning wedlock when the king sought me of him to wife, and I had refused. It was this, though, withheld me from arousing him, for I feared that, if I did aught of embraced him, he would peradventure inform my father of my doings. But in the morning I found on my finger his seal-ring in place of my own, which he had taken. And, oh, my brother, my heart was seized with love of him at first sight, and for the violence of my passion and longing I have never savoured the taste of sleep, and have no occupation save weeping away and repeating verses night and day. And this, O oh my brother, is my story, and the cause of my madness. Then she poured forth tears and repeated these couplets. Now love hath banished all that bred delight, with that heart-nibbling fawn my joys took flight. Lightest of trifles, lover's blood to him who wastes the vitals of the hapless white. For him I'm jealous of my sight and thought. My heart acts spy upon my thought and sight. Those long-lashed eyelids rain on me their shafts, guileful, destroying hearts where'er they light. Now, while my portion in the world endures, shall I behold him ere I quit world sight? What bear I for his sake I'd hide? But tears betray my feelings to the spies despite. When near, our union seemeth ever far. When far, my thoughts to him, I, nearest are. And presently she continued, See then, O my brother, how thou mayest aid me in mine affliction. So Marzawan bowed his head groundwards a while, wondering and not knowing what to do. Then he raised it and said to her, all thou hast spoken to me I hold to be true, though the case of the young man pass my understanding. But I will go round about all lands and will seek for what may heal thee. Haply Allah shall appoint thy healing to be at my hand. Meanwhile, take patience and be not disquieted. Thereupon Marzawan farewelled her, praying that she might be constant, and left her repeating these couplets. Thine image ever accompanies my sprite for all thou art distant from the pilgrim's sight. My heart wishes e'er attract thee near. What is the lightning speed to thought's swift flight? Then go not thou, my very light of eyes, which when thou art gone, lack all the coal of light. Then Marzawan returned to his mother's house, where he passed the night. 
and when the morrow dawned having equipped himself for his journey he fared forth and ceased not faring from city to city and from island to island for a whole month till he came to a town named al tayrab there he went about scenting news of the townsfolk so haply he might light on a cure for the princess's malady for in every capital he entered or passed by it was reported that queen budur daughter of king gayur had lost her wits but arriving at al tayrab city he heard that kamar al zaman son of king shahriman was fallen sick and afflicted with melancholy madness so marzawan asked the name of the prince's capital and they said to him it is on the islands of khalidan and it lieth distant from our city a whole month's journey by sea but by land it is six months march so he went down to the sea in a ship which was bound for the khalidan isles and she sailed with a favouring breeze for a whole month till they came in sight of the capital and there remained for them but to make land when behold there came out on them a tempestuous wind which carried away the masts and rent the canvas so that the sails fell into the sea and the ship capsized with all on board and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the one hundred and ninety-fifth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the ship capsized with all on board each sought his own safety and as for marzawan the set of the sea carried him under the king's palace wherein was kamar al-zaman and by the decree of destiny it so happened that this was the day on which king shahriman gave audience to his grandees and high officers and he was sitting with his son's head on his lap whilst a eunuch fanned away the flies and the prince had not spoken neither had he eaten nor drunk for two days and he was grown thinner than a spindle now the wazir was standing respectfully afoot near the latticed window giving on the sea and raising his eyes saw marzawan being beaten by the billows and at his last gasp whereupon his heart was moved to pity for him so he drew near to the king and moving his head toward him said i crave thy leave o king to go down to the court of the pavilion and open the water-gate that i may rescue a man who is at the point of drowning in the sea and bring him forth of danger into deliverance peradventure on this account allah may free thy son of what he hath the king replied o oh, thou wazir enough is that which hath befallen my son through thee and on thine account haply if thou rescue this drowning man he will come to know our affairs and look on my son who is in this state and exult over me but i swear by allah that if this half-drowned wretch come hither and learn of our condition and look upon my son and then fare forth and speak of our secrets to any i will assuredly strike off thy head before his for thou o my minister art the cause of all that hath betided us first and last now do as thou wilt thereupon the wazir sprang up and opening the private pastern which gave upon the sea descended to the causeway then walked on twenty steps and came to the water where he saw marzawan nigh unto death so he put out his hand to him and catching him by his hair drew him ashore in a state of insensibility with belly full of water and eyes half out of his head the wazir waited till he came to himself when he pulled off his wet clothes and clad him in a fresh suit covering his head with one of his servants turbans after which he said to him know that i have been the means of saving thee from drowning do not thou requite me by causing my death and thine own and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the one hundred and ninety-sixth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the wazir did to marzawan what he did he thus addressed him know that i have been the cause of saving thee from drowning so requite me not by causing my death and thine own asked marzawan and how so and the wazir answered thou art at this hour about to go up and pass among emirs and wazirs all of them silent and none speaking because of kamar al-zaman the son of the sultan now when marzawan heard the name of kamar al-zaman he knew that this was he whom he had heard spoken of in sundry cities and of whom he had come in search but he feigned ignorance and asked the wazir and who is kamar al-zaman answered the minister he is the son of sultan shahriman and he is sore sick and lieth strown on his couch restless alway 
eating not nor drinking, neither sleeping night nor day. Indeed, he is nigh upon death, and we have lost hope of his living, and are certain that he is dying. Beware lest thou look too long on him, or thou look on any other than that where thou settest thy feet, else thou art a lost man, and I also. He replied, Allah upon thee, O wazir, I implore thee of thy favor, acquaint me touching this youth thou describest. What is the cause of the condition in which he is? The wazir replied, I know none, save that three years ago his father required him to wed, but he refused, whereat the king was wroth and imprisoned him. And when he awoke on the morrow, he fancied that during the night he had been roused from sleep and had seen by his side a young lady of passing loveliness, whose charms tongue can never express. And he assured us that he had plucked off her seal-ring from her finger, and had put it on his own, and that she had done likewise. But we know not the secret of all this business. So by Allah, O my son, when thou comest up with me into the palace, look not on the prince, but go thy way, for the sultan's heart is full of wrath against me. So said Marzawan to himself, By Allah, this is the one I sought. Then he followed the wazir up to the palace, where the minister seated himself at the prince's feet. But Marzawan found forsooth nothing to do but go up to Kamar al-Zaman and stand before him at gaze. Upon this the wazir died of a fright in his skin, and kept looking at Marzawan and signaling him to wend his way, but he feigned not to see him, and gave not over gazing upon Kamar al-Zaman, till he was well assured that it was indeed he whom he was seeking. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 30 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 3